Histories of the Transgender Child by Julian Gill Peterson Published by Minnesota Press We fear the children we would protect. Catherine von Stockton, the queer child. A libel placed on the very existence of trans children. A vicious question mark snaked around being is what passes for a rational object of debate among adults every day in the media, online, in schools, in clinics, and in the social milieu in which trans children must find a way, despite all the odds, to survive, to grow, and to endure. Subject to radical skepticism and verification in the best instances, and to being dismissed as unreal or brainwashed in the worst, trans children's consistent experience in this country is to be excluded from having a voice, from having a say in the public battle over whether they should find themselves allowed to be, as if such determinations are not procedurally genocidal, and they're holding open the door to a world where trans life would be violently extinguished from growing in the first place. We have not yet begun to ask what it would mean to let trans children name their own desires and be recognized as entitled to direct their own affairs. Adults, whether anti-trans hate groups, trans-exclusionary feminists, conservative activists, parents, so-called interested observers, or even allies and advocates, tarry within the dangerously limiting circumstances of a system that continues to assay the value of trans children's being in terms not of their humanity and personhood, but via questions absurd in their abstraction for how they ask us instead to wonder if trans children prove something about the biological basis of sex and gender, or how identity politics have so injured a cis white heteronormative imaginary that cannot fathom the obvious fragility of its claims to universalism in the face of a defiant no. While anti-trans forces mobilize and collude to enforce binary childhoods in schools, in gender-segregated organizations, in the normative family, and in public accommodations that make trans childhood a life-threatening place to be every day, trans-inclusive and trans-affirmative voices struggle to find a way to protect trans children that does not imagine them as deserving of protection because they are, finally, the property of adults, not people with the right to gender self-determination. In the midst of this false fight, the real demographic majority of trans children who do not have access to medicine, who do not fit the white, middle-class, desexualized image trafficked in the media, and whose lives go on and grow in spite of the many denials being thrown at them, have no viable status in which to be recognized or welcomed. Trans children have been reduced to figures for what they are so clearly not, abstract ciphers of this or that etiology of gender, this or that political platform. Trans childhood, under such circumstances, has yet to visit us. Yet trans children already exist, left to fend for themselves in a culture that suffers from being unable to imagine children with a richly expressive sense of who they are. If childhood is already a dangerous time and space for children in the United States, trans childhoods, and, and, so much more specifically and insistently, black trans and trans of color childhoods, non-binary trans childhoods, low-income trans childhoods, disabled trans childhoods, and undocumented trans childhoods have been evacuated of formal meaning and abandoned by adults as less than human precincts. Caustic reminders of the effects of a culture in which the delusional adoration of the rosy figure of the child abuts the most heinous quote, quote <clears throat> excuse me, quoted in modes of violence in the lives of real children. We make children vulnerable by the force of law, the deprivation of their economic earnings, and the infantilization of their personalities, only to raid their bodies, minds, and souls to enrich an order of things that cannot stomach their savvy and envial divergences from normativity. This book works slowly and at length 
over diachronic and synchronic modes of historiography, to visit as much destruction as possible upon one central libel that limits the livelihood of trans children, that they have no history, that they are fundamentally new in somehow, therefore, deserving of less than human recognition. Throughout, my point of departure is that trans children's right is to be is not up for debate. Instead, the affirmation of that right directs my thinking. Such a project of, of historiography requires a certain way of writing and engaging with the grain of incredible 20th century archive of trans childhood, race, and medicine. But before entering that mode, which necessitates giving up others, let me speak a little differently to say that the urgency of giving up our foolish attachment to an adult innocence about trans childhood also motivates me in the pages that follow and not, say, a retrospective desire for trans childhood that I or anyone else might have had. The truth is, we don't know trans children because we have inherited, reinforced, and perpetuated a cultural system of gender and childhood in which they are unknowable and, what's worst of all, unable to be cared for except through forms of harm. The staggering, nauseating arithmetic of trans youth suicide and the truth that we have just witnessed again in 2017 more than any other year on record before it of the murder of black and brown trans women are two real costs of that innocence and its normative delusions about childhood gender and race in writing this book i have become possessed by the haunting insistence of many trans children who populate it archived under the circumstances of simultaneous violence and remarkable flourishing that inspire in me, and I hope you, a profound responsibility to understand that our relation to trans children is not given, but must be thoughtfully and carefully negotiated. Throughout the text I use, sick, to mark instances in which quoted materials contradict the pronouns used by the person being discussed, and underline my disagreement with discourses that have refused to honor trans, people pro trans people's pronouns. I hope that these trans children from the past are far from contained by it. On the contrary, they might erupt out of history and into the present, finding company alongside countless trans children, today and tomorrow, whose vulnerabilities are not really by reason of age, but actually engineered by adults who call upon us each to account for our complicity with a violent arithmetic of bullying, suicide, murder, and life deprived of safety and collective or self-determination. I find myself confronted at the end of writing this book with a certain knowledge that we are not worthy of the care of trans children we have accorded ourselves. Until we see that, and from such a realization work toward a radical reckoning with the way that a concept of childhood, binary gender, medicine, racism, and capitalism have transacted unbelievable degrees of harm in the name of care, guardianship, development, and pedagogy. We will find ourselves ever lacking in the company, comfort, rich knowledge, and inspiring worlds and tenacity of the trans children who, despite adults, call this world home. We scarcely yet know what it would mean to care for trans children, and in that way, they are not ours. And then there are some names listed, which I'll show, which I will read: India Monroe, Mesha Caldwell, Jamie Lee Wo Wounded Arrow, Jojo Stryker, Jacarius Holland, Tierra Richmond. China Gibson, Sierra Mc, McElvin, McElvin, excuse me, <laughs> Alfonza Watson, Kenny McFadden, Che Juicy Reed, MX, uh, Mr. M, it's MX, I don't know how to say that, Bostic, Cheryl Faulkner, Immer Alvarado, Kendra Adams, Ebony Morgan, T.T. Dangerfield, Guinevere Riversong, Kiwi Herring, Anthony Bubbles Torres, Derricka Banner, Ali Lee Steinfeld, Stephanie Montez, 
Candace Towns. Introduction Towards the Trends of Color Critique of Medicine Amid the accelerating and contested public visibility that trans life has accrued in the United States in recent years, certain figures have become oversaturated, made to carry starkly different narratives for mass consumption while simultaneously offering very narrow windows to contest the terms of their representation. Images of black trans women and trans women of color on the one hand and transgender children on the other circulate seemingly without end. These very different figures are, somehow, meant to signify and embody the so-called newness and nowness of trans life, as Laverne Cox and Janet Mock speak out from their perspective as black trans women or Chechi McDonald writes letters from prison. Jazz Jennings stars in a reality television show about entering high school as a trans girl, and Gravin Grimm pursues a legal case against the school board of Gloucester County, Virginia, over its transphobic bathroom policy. While there may be a growing awareness of the rising unmatched violence black trans women and trans women of color face, a seemingly never-ending stream of documentaries, independent films, journalistic profiles, novels, and digital platforms simultaneously circulates images and narratives about a new generation of children growing up as transgender during their childhoods. The public figurations of black trans women, trans women of color, and trans children have become pervasive but markedly distinct, with a profoundly different in significance and impact. The contrast is instructive about the fault lines of a seismic shifts underway in the U.S. trans visibility, but also incredibly misleading. The publicness of black trans women and trans women of color is registered, paradoxically, through ongoing forms of social death that reduce their personhood to the barest zero, zero degree, hiding it from view and converting their images and names more often into objects of necropolitical value. As scholars in Black Trans Studies, including Trevor Ellison, K. M. Green, Matt Richardson, C. Riley Snorton, Elias Cosenza Krell, Cyrus Marcus, Ware, and Aaron Durbin Albrecht have argued, this visibility is specifically predicated on anti-Black modes of subjection, whereby the surveillance and exposure of being visible elicits the extreme and paradoxical charge of non-existence. Trans children, meanwhile, are presented as powerful emblems of futurity, sanitized, innocent, and always highly med med medicalized. They are domesticated figures, either reassuring that the so-called trans tipping point heralds a new generation of liberal progress and acceptance, or to the transphobic agitators involved in political campaigns, focusing on bathrooms and schools, acting as proof that trans life deserves to be repressed in its incipient forms for the threat to the social order that its future would represent. Children by design deprived of civil rights and infantilized are easy targets for political violence, just as easily, it turns out, as concerned adults can claim them for protection. The problem the problem with this figural contrast, of course, is that it arbitrarily separates black trans and trans of color life from trans childhood. The dominant figure of the trans child trafficked in the public sphere today un underwrites, as a child has long done in the United States, a potent racial innocence. The empties trans childhood of its content, including race, rendering it a conceptually white while simultaneously libeling the existence of black trans and trans of color childhood. There is a tremendous damage in the figurative separation of racialized trans negativity and white trans childhood futurity, and the part played by the figure of the child in this process has received very little, if any, attention. Despite the overwhelming material vulnerability of actual trans children, most of whom live at a great distance from the imagined world represented in dominant media narratives, the figure of the trans child as emblem of a new and futuristic generation is part of a larger strategy that continues to disavow and naturalize the reduction of black trans women and trans women of color's personhood to nothingness, what Ava Her Hayward calls an attack on ontology, on beingness, because beingness cannot be secured. Yet an even more fundamental assumption about trans children that floats this contrast has yet to be challenged that they are, in fact, new and future-bound, 
The narrative that we are in the midst of the first generation of trans children is so omnipresent as to be ambient. It is repeated ad nauseum in the media, online, by doctors and by parents. Trans children, these various gatekeepers say in unison, have no history at all. Trans children are unprecedented and must be treated as such, with caution or awe. What happens is this consensus turns out to be baseless. The bleached and medical medicalized image of the trans child circulating as unprecedented in the 21st century is actually prefaced by an entire century of trans children, including black trans children and trans children of color. And trans children played a decisive role in the medicalization of sex and gender rather than being its newest objects. These are two of the key ruptures that histories of the transgender child uncovers. If the contrasting effect of contemporary figurations of black trans and trans of color life placed next to trans childhood is so damaging in its staging of an antinomy between negativity and futurity, this book argues that the 20th century provides a surprising archive of trans childhood that undoes, undoes them from the inside. Histories of the Transgender Child rewrites the historical and political basis for the supposed newness of today's generation of trans kids by uncovering more than a century of what came before them. In the 1910s, children with ambiguous sex were medicalized and experimented upon by doctors who sought in their unfinished developing bodies a material foothold for altering and, eventually, changing human sex as it grew. In the 1930s, some of the first trans people to seek out American doctors connected their requests for medical support to reports that sex changes on children were being regular, regularly performed at certain hospitals. In the 1940s and 1950s, five decades, decades of experimental alteration of children's sex directly led to the invention of the category gender, setting the stage for the emergence of a new field of transsexual medicine and the post-war model of binary transition and in the 1960s and 70s, as that field of medicine became institutionalized, many children took hormones, changed their names, attended school, recognized in their gender identities, and even underwent gender confirmation surgeries. Trans children not only were present, but also were an integral part of the transgender 20th century and the broader 20th century, century history of sex, gender, and race in medicine. If there are so many trans children hiding in plain sight in the past, how have we failed to see them? I argue that trans children were central to the medicalization of sex and gender during the 20th century in a very specific way, made valuable through a racialized discourse of plasticity. Examin examining the history of trans children through the shifting terrain of that plasticity helps to explain precisely why trans children have so easily gone unnoticed or been ignored. By limiting trans children's value to an abstract biological force through which medicine aimed to alter sex and gender as phenotypes, those children became living laboratories, proxies for working out broader questions about human sex and gender that had little investment in their personhood. Children were, by the design of medical discourse, meant to recede into the background of the alteration of sex and gender by being reduced to reservoirs of plasticity the raw material, the phenotype. Children became the incarnation and etiology of sex plasticity as an abstract form of whiteness. The capacity to take on new form and be transformed by medical scientific intervention early on in life. And the 20th century discourse of child, de child development naturalized this function in the medical clinic. In the early part of the century, this resulted in reading trans and intersex, as we shall see, children's abnormal or mixed sexual development through eugenic and evolutionist paradigms that sorted sexual morphology through racial typology. By the 1960s, it allowed the inaugural gatekeepers of transsexual medicine to an imagine an etiology of transsexuality in the indeterminacy of childhood gender acquisition, opening the door to the genocidal fantasy of eradicating trans life altogether in its developing forms, even as children also successfully transitioned and secured access to gender confirmation surgery. Far from being a progressive vector of malleability or change, the racial plasticity of sex and gender was a decidedly disenfranchising object of governance from the perspective of trans children, 
At its institutional best, it granted access to a rigid medical model premised on bi binary normalization. At its institutional worst, it allowed gatekeeping clinicians to reject black and trans of color children as not plastic enough for the category of transsexuality, dismissing their self-knowledge of gender as delusion or homosexuality. The value of plasticity came to stand in for the value of trans children's personhood, enabling their continual instrumentalization and in the service of medical science over and above any recognition of their embodied self-knowledge or desire. This book's uncovering of a century of untold stories is therefore not a recuperative or reparative project. I instead underline a massively overlooked way that children's bodies, because of their unfinishedness and plastic potential to be changed as they grow, have been key sites of the modernizing violence of medicine. Trans children have been forced to pay one of the heaviest prices for the sex and gender binary, silenced as the raw material of its medical foundation. At the same time, however, Framing trans children through a discourse of plasticity was a risky wager for medical science, as embodied plasticity itself, despite being ostensibly domesticated, domesticated through its racialization as whiteness, retained a demonstrable autonomy that threatens normal, normalizing models of the sex and gender binary, along with medical technique, to this day. In key moments throughout the 20th century, trans children's plasticity enacted forms of partial material refusals that threatened to cause a crisis for doctors in the categories of sex and gender. Plasticity, an invisible force in the trans child's body, seemed to always retain a certain material agency for itself, partly indifferent or oblivious to scientific rationality. Whether the strange forms of plastic growth that resulted from these moments, interrupting the orderly flow of medical reason, actually provided trans children any leverage, is a complex problem that this book unfolds slowly, over a century's worth of cl clinical history. While I argue against the current romance with plasticity in the humanities and STEM fields, showing how the concept of and its material referent encourage no particular form of political agency, the book's archives testifies to how difficult it is to imagine that trans children, already lacking patient rights, could have resisted its capture by medicine. Still, there are important and startling moments in the archive when some trans children's plasticity afforded them brief moments outward and away from the capture of modern medicine. While there is no clear cut scene that rises to the pitch of resistance or even subversion, and there is otherwise a great deal of violence, both epistemic and material, there remains something vital to consider about the limits of plasticity in building different features around childhood transition and pediatric medicine. To that end, this book does not investigate the enigma of trans children's plasticity, not so much as to affirm its value, as to look through it for ways to undermine the rationality of medicine, challenge, challenge the racialization of sex and gender as phenotypes, and imagine different futures for trans children that do not instrumentalize their living bodies and dismiss their self-knowledge. <clears throat> the Generational Trouble of Trans Children Histories of the transgender child wades into a subject about which we have almost nothing in the way of reference points. There are no existing accounts of trans children's history in the United States, only speculation and retrospective theorizing from the point of view of the present. The myth that there were no trans children until recently is so widespread and unchallenged that it is, no, that it is present even in the small but rich and growing scholarship on the trans child which of most focuses on the 21st century, pediatric endocrine clinic or media representation. In Child, a keyword entry in the inaugural issue of Transgender Studies Quarterly, Tay Meadow observed that a relatively new fo social form, we see no references to transgender children prior to the mid-1990s. Although in a strict sense, this is correct, because the term transgender did not come into widespread use until the 1990s and would have been unavailable to attach itself to children before then. The second dimension of Meadows' claim, that adults are confronted with a new social form in trans children, is an important clue as to why their history has been forgotten or erased. Much of the celebration and controversy over trans children today depart from the fact that they express self-knowledge about something as profound as their gender, flouting social, medical, and parental gender assignment. 
This initial focus frequently travels to fixate on medical therapies to pause puberty and pursue childhood transition as either a biologically reversible or irreversible, irreversible process. The ostensible concern is that the effects of these new hormonal technologies are in some important way unknown or that children are too young to undergo hormonal therapy or even make the decision to alter their bodies as if sex and gender were otherwise natural unmodified forms in cisgender bodies. This narrative also grants immense authority to medicine in making the trans child an ontological possibility, as if trans children were unsinkable, non-existent even, prior to puberty, prior to puberty suppression therapy. The novelty of today's medical technique is deeply questioned by this book, which traces an entire century of medicalizing trans children and their biological development, while also stressing the many ways in which trans children have had no need for medicine to live trans lives, even if medical technologies do not play a causal role in the production of new social forms. However, the social meaning invested in, in them does not seem to be very important for many adults today. In trans, gender transitivity and new configurations of body, history, memory, and kinship, Jack Halbertstam seizes on speculation in Meadows' work to dramatize this point. Halbertstam's interest in a perceived disjunction in transgender histories between today's trans children who are growing up in an environment where the trans child is a distinct and partially recognized social and medical category, and older trans and gender variant adults who came of age in a different political, cultural, and medical milieu during the second half of the 20th century. The issue boils down to a generational split. If today's trans children can have recognizably tran recognizable trans childhood with options to transition, Meadow proposes that this new generation may have wider latitude to disidentify with transgender history and those who came before them. That is quite a mind-blowing statement, Halbertstam interjects developing Meadows' speculation further. Unlike other social justice formations where young people might acknowledge and even thank the adults who came before them and made the world a more hospitable place, Meadow proposes that the support that many trans children now enjoy from their families and communities affords them a radically different experience of childhood that, than that of trans people even a decade older. While transgender individuals of my generation, now in their 40s and 50s, who often could not transition until they were adults, lack the complex language for their gender variants and how to live large parts of their lives in relations to gender identities with which they were at odds. Today's gender non-conforming children, Meadow reminds us, with parental support, may grow up trans rather than struggling through a long periods of enforced gender normativity. While that is cause for some amount of celebration, it also, Meadow hit, puts them at odds with the history that produced the conditions for their smooth -er passage from trans childhood to adulthood. While I agree that a potentially difficult generation gap is growing in the 21st century between trans children and adults, and I do not wish to interrogate Halbertstam's generational expertise, his book puts the significant pressure on the historical premises upon which this reflection rests. Setting aside for a moment the problem of which trans children Halbertstam is calling upon, given how racially ra given how highly racialized and class stratified access to competent medical care is in the United States, I would point out that the apparent disidentification of today's trans children with the trans past may in large part be premised on a fundamental misrecognition of that past. We do not know trans children's history because we have assumed they do not generationally belong in the trans past. The fact that trans children have been forced in the 21st century to fare without a history may itself be a major cause of generational tension that Halberstam identifies. How different would this passage look in the light of several key points that this book works to unfold? Today's trans children are not the first generation to identify and live openly as trans during childhood. They are not even close to the first generation to transition or to be medicalized during childhood and grow up as publicly trans. In fact, trans children outright precede the category transsexuality in the contemporary medical model. Trans children have a documentable past stretching the entirety of the 20th century, long before today's trans and gender variant adults were even born. 
with a distinctly different take on Meadow and Hopperstone's reflections, then, histories of the transgender child departs by considering the extent to which the 21st century framing of trans children as new and lacking historicity is actually complicit with their ongoing political infantilization, particularly by medicine. Investing in the idea that today's trans children are either new or represent a major break in the past may actually be a significant obstacle to forming cross-generational relationships between trans adults and children that do not do the latter harm or continue to render their actions of embodied self-knowledge unintelligible. And particularly of concern of this book, the myth of the trans children have no history has significantly, significantly reinforced the rationality of medicine by allowing the 20th and 21st centuries to be defined by the limiting parameters of transsexuality and puberty suppression therapy discourses that rely on children being the nearly visible plastic bedrock of medical technique or an etiology for gender in, in general. This presumes, of course, that there is a meaningful transgender child in the past rather than another projection of contemporary categories backward. I deploy an array of terms in a careful way to explore how we have arrived at a moment where it is possible to claim trans children are somehow new. But before focusing on the historiographical problems of the period that this book covers, it is worth laying out exactly what I mean conceptually both by transgender and child in this book. Trans is invoked throughout in an expansive sense, as it has been theorized in transgender studies, sometimes as a prefix and sometimes as with an asterisk, to mark a political distinction from medical or pathological meanings that have, crude, that have accrued to the term transgender in recent years, many of which have been borrowed from the earlier term transsexual. While it is technically anachronistic to name a child in 1930 trans, I do so precisely to make an intervention, as Susan Stryker puts it so well, to tell a story about the political history of gender variance that is not limited to one experience. The terms transvestism and transvestite also appear in this book as they had both medical and lay connotations in the first half of the 20th century, as well as relatively uneven adoption in the United States compared to Europe. I use them in precise historical contexts, largely before transsexuality and transsexual came into use. Simil similarly, I use the terms hermaphrodite, intersex, sexual inversion, and homosexuality when their appearance in archival documents matters. In many instances, these terms bleed over into trans domains, making their overlap important. Finally, I name transsexuality to explicitly, explicitly mark a medical discourse and biopolitical apparatus, a colonial form of knowledge with racializing and disenfranchising effects. Transsexuality arrogantly pretends to know and sees trans life as an object, making it a difficult concept to write with and against as Sandy Stone first theorized through the concept of the post-transsexual. More than some of the other terms in this, used in this book, transsexuality is an artifact of a dominant knowledge system to be con constantly questioned and undermined from the inside. Transgender studies has exalted the critical use of terminology to make sense of and challenge scientific and medical authority, but perhaps to my attention, to now obsolete categories or now politically incorrect terms may, at times, strike readers as awkward. What's more, it is likely that the categorical landscape of this book will continue to change in, in the future at some point, rendering the language of this book anachronistic, something, something that I embrace. Here I follow Leslie Feinberg's lead in Transgender Warriors. Since I am writing this book as a contribution to the demand for transgender liberation, the language I'm using in this book is not aimed at defining, but at defending the diverse communities that are coalescing. If it seems odd, by contrast, to take the time to define what a child is, there is good reason to be equally critical and careful. Rather than taking for granted the existence of children as a demographic group defined somehow by age, this book takes a fairly simple approach to defining who is a trans child. Anyone under the medical age of consent during the 20th century, typically 21, but sometimes 18, is a child in the pages that follows. I draw on the medical age of consent not because it refers to a meaningful distinction, but, but precisely because it arbitra 
but precisely because its arbitrariness and its obvious construction illuminate how the figure of the child and actual living children are entangled products of historical processes of Western subjectification, rather than representing a natural category of human life. While there are infants, toddlers, five-year-olds, teenagers, and even 20-year-olds throughout this book, I refer to all of them as children because they were the subject to a specifically infantilizing form of governance. This is also why the category adolescent did not meaningfully come into play in trans medicine during this period. The medical age of consent, which deprived children of the ability to make medical decisions for themselves, proved to be a deciding factor in shaping their experiences and limiting their ability to act. Drawing on Paul Amar's critical reading of the field of childhood studies, I agree that the child is a dehumanized social form, the product of historical and political processes of infantilization designed to control various populations through sexual and racial difference, rather than to index meaningful age differences. As Amar, point, as Amar points out, one of the most pernicious effects of the production of children through infantilization is a failure to recognize children as agents, to render their lives politically informal, effectively unintelligible to adults. The Western form of the child and childhood is a powerful obstacle to seeing the mechanism and practices by which social actors, branded as children, challenge the regime of infantilization, whether through collective organization or individual it itineraries that stray from developmentalism. For that reason, this book names a trans child not as a distinct subgroup within the trans community, but as a politically disenfranchised person subject to a regime of racially and gender normative governance by medicine and other social institutions, including the family. While the children who populate this book, particularly those in the early 20th century, may not look recognizably trans by today's dominant definition, this is precisely because its signature effect of medicalization over the past century has been to restrict trans life to a singular definition, while simultaneously placing an etiological qu question mark upon trans people, and children especially, forcing them to constantly prove and account for their embodied self-knowledge instead of taking their transness seriously. The social reality of trans children across the 20th century in this book begins to, su begins to suggest some of the many ways that children, whose lives have differed from normative patterns for the sex and gender they were assigned at birth, actually multiply the meanings of trans, moving it in many different directions. In so doing, I stress that the being of trans children, the content of their transness as such, is not the place to ground the meaning of trans childhood. For that etiological discourse is precisely the one in whose name medicine has inflicted incredible harm. The trans child represents a further case of what Catherine von Stockton has described as a ghostliness of certain impossible children during the 20th century, not meant to exist at all in the present tense of their childhoods. The ghostliness of trans children over the past 100 years takes unique residence in the medical archive, hiding in plain sight, invisible to the inverse degree of being pervasively present, yet always slightly out of reach, even as they come into discourse. To pursue the trans 20th century through the perspective of trans children, as this book does, shows how Hobbertstam's assumed history that produced the conditions for their smoother passage from trans child to adulthood is not really is really not at all what we adults have come to imagine. The trans and intersex 20th century. This book begins at the turn of the 20th century, when sex was brought under the jurisdiction of a modernizing project of medicine that sought to alter its form and traces of the medicalization of trans children until 1980. The year in which the publication of the new edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual with an entry on gender identity disorder of childhood, inaugurated the medical matrix in which we still live today. By beginning in the early 20th century, the moment in which sex was redefined through the concept of plasticity by fields like endocrinology and urology, I read the medical archive to contest the historiography of trans past monopolized by the parameters of transsexuality. While this book is first and foremost an account of trans children's past, its broader historiographical intervention within transgender studies has four specific ends. 
to continue the work of displacing the 1950s as, as a default starting point for trans history, to undermine the rationality of medical science from the inside by reading trans people as complex per participants in the production of scientific knowledge rather than as objects, to highlight the overlooked entanglement of intersex and trans bodies during the half of the 20th century, and to uncover the vital but unexamined role of the child's body in the medicalization of sex and gender as racially plastic, alterable phenotypes. These four characteristics of the trans 20th century played decisive roles in shaping the lives of trans children and vice versa. The 1950s have been granted too much weight in the transgender studies and popular accounts as a reference point for the 20th century, overrepresenting the advent of transsexual medicine in Christine Jorgensen's celebrity. The shadow cast by the mid-century also comes in the form of historical argumentation, like Paul B. Preciado's in Testo Junkie, which imagines something especially distinct about the post-war era that enabled the emergence of transsexuality and its correlate medical techniques. This thinking runs perilously close to reproducing the kind of techno-determinism that characterizes Bernice Hausman's reading of history of trans medicine in Changing Sex, which has been roundly critiqued from Jay Prosser on for what he terms the transphobic conception of transsexuals as constructed in some more literal way than non-transsexuals. It is also historically inaccurate, as Joanne Mayerowitz points out, considering that medical procedures to change human sex long predated the willingness of American doctors to actually provide them to trans people, a shift that this book re-examines. In reality, there was no revolutionary technological or medical shift in the mid-century. Transsexuality is, rather, a medical discourse that di distracts from forms of knowledge and being that are disqualified by its rationality and its time scale minimizing a half-century of trans life and interaction with medicine that precedes and forms it. Since institutional medicine typically involves meticulous record-keeping and voluminous discursive practices, and because it claims unrivaled authority to know and govern trans life, it represents a significant source of information on the trans past. The distinct challenge of the early 20th century before transsexuality is that we still do not know very much about trans life or actual medical practice in this era. While there is an established sense that in some places, like in Europe, particularly Germany, trans people had access to various forms of medical support and built vibrant social worlds in urban centers as early as the 20s, their experience in the United, in the United States were not always comparable. As the second chapter of that book explores, what we do, not, what we do know about the concept of sex change and the hormonal theories of interwar endocrinology is framed in largely schematic discursive terms through published medical texts and journalistic sources. Mayerowitz argues on this basis that the entire concept of changing sex for trans people took root first in Germany, not the United States, because of a vocal campaign for sexual emancipation. Yet there are no clinical histories in, in the United States that examine what exact actually went on in the hospitals and doctor's offices where sex was made plastic and alterable, or what happened when trans people began to seek out those doctors for assistance with their transitions. Nor do we have a concrete sense of how trans people understood their relationship to medicine beyond their interaction with popular press accounts of dramatized sex changes. In the face of this prevailing lack of evidence, one of the central contributions of histories of the transgender child is to reconstruct clinical histories at key places around the country, including a long-term look at the John Hopkins Hospital from the 1910s to the 1960s. I show that trans people readily sought out American doctors in the absence of a category like transsexuality as early as the 30s, but not because they needed a medical discourse to make sense of their lives. That there were trans social worlds in the same period that Berlin was renowned for its trans community, and that even in the early 20th century, a few trans childhoods made it into the medical archives. Still, there is disagreement over the very viability of claiming early 20th century figures as trans rather than lesbian or gay, because of the absence of a clear separation between categories. Or rather, it would be more precise to say that our contemporary sense of categories 
the lineup around separable phenomena of sex, gender, and sexuality, did not exist until incredibly recently, coming into being perhaps only over the past 40 years. This has resulted in a very slow recognition of obviously trans individuals who led public lives well before the availability of synthetic hormones or the concept of transsexuality, and several of them appear in the first few chapters of this book. And this problem has dogged the crossroads of queer fairy and trans studies in particular. Take Ralph Werfer, who went by the name Jenny June, and whose particular 1919 text, Autobiography of an Androgyne, details her life as an invert and lower class fairy in New York City from around the 1890s to the 1910s. In his introduction to a reissued edition, Scott Herring underlines the fascinating ways in which June's text at first glance serves a modernizing discourse of transatlantic sexology, adopting and commenting on Richard von Kraft Ebbing's typology of inversion from Psychopathia Sexualis, and making frequent use of Latin to describe frank scenes of sex and cross-sex life in the underworld. Perhaps a skirt obscenity censors, the ob- Autobiography was published by a medical press, complete with an authorizing introduction by a well-respected physician, who framed the text as an account of the congenital homosexualist. Yet Herring also points out how June turns on the sexological premises of the narrative in key moments, offering powerful critiques of the legal and social ostracism in the era, making the autobiography one of the inaugural acts of queer theory Queer social theory in the United States. Why queer social theory? Why not trans social theory? Although Herring is careful to point out that we know very little about the real person behind the nom de plume, Ralph Werfer, he nonetheless claims June for the history of queer sexuality as a figure whose life writing undermines the sexological framing of modern gay American sexuality. Yet it is far less clear within the text itself why June's repeated profession to be really a woman whom nature disguised as a man. Having wished to be a girl from early childhood, using using the name Jenny from a young age, wearing woman's clothing from childhood on, wishing to have her genitals recognized as a woman's, and eventually choosing to be medically castrated, would not invite a strongly trans reading. Alfred Herzog, the... Alfred Herzog, the doctor who wrote about the introdu- Alfred Herzog, the doctor who wrote the introduction to the in- original text, speculates about June's castration procedure that he hated above all the testicles, those insignia of manhood, and had them remu- removed to be more alike to that which he wished to be, a woman, or as June puts it herself, were it not for certain masculine conformations of the body, I ought to go about in dresses as a woman and always identify myself with the female sex. In the retrospective frame of post-war American identity politics, where transgender has frequently been styled as a successor to gay and where trans studies has sometimes been cast as a successor to queer theory, June's account of inversion has inaccurately been routed through the same implicitly teleological model. In transgender history, Susan Stryker names Jenny June as a trans woman in her review of the era before transsexuality, and there are compelling reasons to make that claim, not the least of which is that even June's definition of inversion reflects not quite proto-homosexuality as we would expect it from our contemporary vantage point, but in an entirely different epistemology of sex, one that is not well known anymore. June employs a scientific thesis on the natural bisexuality of the species, that was very much in vogue at the time of the publication of the autobiography, explaining that there exists in the human race no sharp dividing line between the sexes. Within that paradigm, June observes that there are innumerable stages of transitional individuals between masculinity and femininity, including those described as inverts by sexology. June actually goes so far as to explain her life through a concept of sexual plasticity, a protoplasm theory of inversion, according to which the presence in the male body of a particular kind of governing corpuscles or germs, ordinarily found only in the protoplasm of females, results at birth in a mixed body in person, somewhat male, somewhat female. While Herring reads this inversion as a harbinger of 
modern homosexuality, the very resistance to modernizing sexological narratives he identif identifies in the autobiography also undermines the reading of June's life as gay instead of trans. The specifically trans quality of this life narrative is based in a live epist epistemology of sex plasticity, not a binary of homosexual and heter heterosexual personhood. The point is not to decide for trans over gay in a categorical sense, but to understand that the European sexological concept of inversion was a much more complex blend of what today is separated into sex or gender on the one hand, and sexuality or sexual object choice on the other. <clears throat> What's more, as Emma Haney explains in The New Woman, the discourse of sexology that produced inversion is premised on a staggering misrecognition and confinement of the rich social reality of trans feminine life and experience in this era. Quite unlike Herring, Heaney argues that Jenny June bridges vernacular and medical understandings of trans femininity. Histories of the Transgender Child follows Heaney's important historiographical intervention into the early, early 20th century, that the emergence of trans feminine as a field distinct from both male homosexuality and cis womanhood is a weighty historical corollary to the emergence of homosexuality. Heaney shows that the growth of sexological and medical paradigms at the turn of the century was not the teleo teleo teleological apprehension of trans life by science, as it has often been framed, but rather the emergence of a distinction between cis and trans femininity that did, that did not pre previously exist socially in Europe and the United States. In this context, I argue for reading certain historical individuals as trans when the available evidence is clear, because otherwise we risk missing key evidence, such as June's reliance on a concept of plasticity to narrate her embodied transfeminine knowledge. More important than litigating any competitions between queer and trans studies, as Peter Coviello argues about the consolidation of American sexuality, is that in an obsession over the emergence of discourses, we have grown accustomed to overlooking what was simultaneously curtailed by modern forms of knowledge and being around sex, in undermining the inevitability of today's dominant discourses by looking at the tr transitional overlap between epistemes, Coviello directs attention to any number of broken off, uncreated futures, futures that would not come to be. His Histories of the Transgender Child takes a similar position from within transgender studies. Indeed, trans children's history is a powerful case of a completely overlooked field of lived experience, knowledge, and embodiment that has been lost through the positivist mythology of, of 21st century medical discourse, narratives of American identity politics, and the partial biopolitical normalization of certain trans subjects. Many early 20th century trans people, like June, also drew on the language of intersex embodiment, the most often called hermaphroditism, to describe themselves as sexually intermediate types, somewhere between male and female. This was in addition to a growing medical discourse on hermaphroditism in the early 20th century that was based around experiments on infants and children born with ambiguous genitals, genital, genitalia, and other morphological characteristics that could take on many non-binary forms. For that reason alone, this book reads intersex children alongside trans children. Yet it turns out that it was precisely the same doctors and psychiatrists who saw both groups of children, too. What's more, experimental medicine practiced on intersex children, typically without either their consent or even their knowledge, directly founded the modern medical protocol for assigning a sex and then reassigning a child's body to fit that sex, first surgically and, later, hormonally. The second chapter of this book, which covers the 1910s to the 1940s, shows that the applicability of intersex medical protocols and techniques to trans people was actually proposed by trans laypersons, long before doctors were willing to consider the same. In this moment, trans people actually anticipated the important medical links that would not be institutionalized by doctors for more than two decades. By seeing trans people as active participants in the construction and contestation of medical discourse in this way, rather than as passive objects of no knowledge, I emphasize that at many key moments, trans people's embodied fluency in medical science far outpaced institutional medical knowledge. The broader point is that trans life 
had no causal reliance on medical upon medicine during the 20th century, and that the trans people who did interact with doctors brought their own embodied knowledge of the social realities of their transness with them to the clinic. What's more, the medical model of consisted, consisted of a strategy to deny the social reality of trans life and confine it to a wrong body narrative by suggesting that trans women and men were not already women and men, as their lives frequently testified, but they are somehow aspired to become women and men. For the first half of the century, trans people's embodied knowledge borrowed heavily from intersex discourses to negotiate this growing power of the doctor and the clinic. The ongoing intersex trans dialogue led in the 1950s to the invention of gender, a signal event with deep consequences for all human life. Scholars working at the crossroads of intersex and trans studies, including Jennifer German, Sharon E. Preves, David A. Rubin, and Jemima Repo, have reconstructed how the concept of gender was built out of a clinical experimentation on intersex infants and children born with ambiguous genitalia or secondary sex characteristics. Reassigning the sex of intersex infants led to a theory of gender that co coordinated the development of, bi of the biological body with the physiological acquisition of an in erat ineradicatable identity, installing a new difference between sex and gender, a distinction that would have very little intelligibility over the preceding 50 years. The second and third chapters of this book, which reconstruct four decades of experimental medicalization of intersex children's plasticity at the John Hopkins Hospital, greatly expanded our understanding of how intersex children informed the invention of gender by the psychologist John Money and his colleagues in the 1950s. Reconstructing such a detailed history of intersex medicine also serves to undermine Money's referential position, which, whether lauded or critiqued, as the ostensibly decisive factor in producing gender. I argue, instead, that money only interpreted the results of many decades of complex surgical and hormonal experiments upon intersex children's plasticity at Hopkins, importantly smuggling the racialized sense of sex as a phenotype into the post-war era, so that gender was designed to function as a phenotype too. In this book, money emerges not as a singular historical force, but more as a relay point between the pre- and post-war eras, joining discourses and practices of intersex and transsexual medicine by way of the invention of gender. The persistence of the entanglement of intersex and trans life in the bodies of children has been underappreciated, in fact. It has been underappreciated. In fact, it endured well into the 1950s, if not later. It lasted nearly as long as we have had the discourse of transsexuality, and yet it has radically faded from contemporary conversions about the plasticity of sex and gender. Overall, histories of the transgender child contest and carefully rereads the normative medical archive by beginning in the early 20th century and working to undermine the model provided by transsexuality for making trans life intelligible. The final chapter attends to specifically tr to trans boys, in part to open up the problem of how a transsexual definition of surgery has become an implicit measure by which to judge the relative degree of reality of trans life in the past, producing a highly gendered asymmetry revolving around bottom surgery for trans women and girls, making trans men's and boys' transitions, which are more likely to revolve around top surgery, less legible not to mention all who do not seek out surgery or do not have access to medicine. This book militates against the implication born of the discourse of transsexuality, that trans people need medical knowledge about themselves to name or understand their lives. Ironically, it is the medical archive itself that shows this to be untrue. The records of many trans people who have interacted with American doctors contain the rich reminiscences of childhoods, adolescence, and years lived openly as trans, often with the acceptance of local communities, without searching for or even wondering about medical support or terminology. Very often, medicine became important only after children and adults had lived significant trans lives, and medicine was transformed by its experience with their trans lives as much as the inverse was true. These interventions into the trans 20th century contribute 
to a broader movement in transgender studies that seeks to revisit the role played by trans people in scientific and medical research and to undermine the Western rationality and secularism too often reproduced by the field. Several key figures early several key early figures in European and American trans medicine, after all, were trans men who became doctors and were in some cases able to experiment on themselves. In England, Michael Dillon, likely the first trans man to undergo testosterone therapy in the 40s, became a physician and penned what could be read as a major volume of trans knowledge before transsexuality, Self, a Study in Endocrinology and Ethics. In the United States, Alan L. Hart, a physician, radiologist, and tuberculosis researcher, was one of the first trans men to transition with medical support, including surgeries even earlier in 1917 to 1918. Other laypersons, such as Louise Lawrence, a major trans community leader in the San Francisco Bay Area, and the head of a national network of trans correspondents, actively sought out and challenged medical experts and practicing clinicians, significantly shaping on transsexuality at at mid-century. More and more, I see the need, as Dr. Alfred Kinsey once told me about my appearance before the staff at Langley Porter Psychiatric Clinic in San Francisco, she wrote in a letter to 1953, to educate the doctors, to give them a thought to work on that doesn't come out of a textbook. Throughout this book are numerous trans people who decided, whether voluntarily or through exigent circumstances, to work with, and almost as frequently, to antagonize doctors. Some of them were trans children, like Vicky, who appears in Chapter 4 and whose persistent letter to the endocrinologist Harry Benjamin in the 1960s interrogated his gatekeeping role from the perspective of a trans girl living in rural Ohio. Appreciating the active role played by trans people in the 20th century medical science calls not just for an expanded sense of the medical archive, but also for an interpretive practice that works against the rationality of the categories transsexual and transgender. In their writing on the life of Reed Erickson, a wealthy businessman and trans man who founded the Erickson Educational Foundation, EEF, in 1964, after his own medical transition, Aaron Dever and Nicholas Mate have worked to shift thinking in this direction by personally overseeing the dispensation of millions of dollars in philanthropic funding from the 1960s to 80s. They argue Erickson's directly financed much of American transsexual medicine in the post-war era. His funding provided Henry Benjamin, often canonized as a founding figure, with the actual resources he needed for his clinical work. The EEF provided Hopkins with the money needed to open its gender identity clinic in 1965, and the vital professional networks for researchers and doctors treating trans people in these decades were likewise financed by the foundation. Devor, Devor and Mate argue that the contemporary landscape of trans medicine and social services in the United States is in large part the result of Erickson's specific philanthropic vision, not only Benjamin's or Hopkins' approach. Rather than support a field of medical science with his money, Erickson took an active role in shaping it, meaning that his perspective on transition, transsexuality, and transmasculinity all played a role for for too long underappreciated. Erickson's place in transgender studies, in particular, has remained marginal in comparison to the influence that Dever and Mate reclaim. In part, Abram J. Lewis argues this is because of Erickson's many non-scientific and ostensibly irrational pursuits. As he got older, he funded a massive amount of New Age research into mystical, magical, and supernatural practices and knowledge. Erickson also became a chronic drug user, exploring psychedelic and transcendental practice before becoming a serious addict, and by the accounts of his contemporaries, descending into a period of paranoia and delusion toward the end of his life. Rather than reading Erickson's notorious eccentricity as evidence that these irrational matters were separate from or contaminated his work with medical science and represented a failure to live up to his empirical commitments to transsexual science, Lewis argues that Erickson's life instead precisely challenges the epistemological coherence of trans life as an object of knowledge. Erickson's interest in psychedelia and parapsychology were not, as they have appeared in his historiography, he explains, mere footnotes to the work on transsexualism. 
Lewis asks how positivist connotations of the discourse of transsexuality might change if New Age mysticism, psychedelic drugs, and research into animal communication were understood as integral threads of the ostensibly rational ration, of integral threads of the ostensible rationality of transsexuality, rather than its convenient foil. Reflecting on the experience of researching in the trans archive of the 20th century, Lewis underlines an, underlines an odd contrast between primary documents and the historiographical narratives existing in existing scholarship, possibly in an effort to resist popular notions of transgender people as once insane, tragic, and absurd. This literature has seemed, if anything, he suggests, to promote histories of agential and politicized communities of subjects of sensible, self-interested aspirations. While that may be understandable in its context, perhaps unsurprisingly then, he adds, much of the transgender archive is even more perplexing than secondary accounts might suggest. This tendency has both overvalued and overrepresented the authority of medical science, while underplaying the role of trans people who, like Erickson, may have had complex political agendas that in an unexpected ways undercut medicine's rationality through, ostent through uh, ostensibly irrational or non-secular commitments. As Lewis suggests, trans studies need irrational concepts, such as trans animisms, to understand not only figures like Erickson, but also trans activist efforts that, put, that took place outside the medical context, such as a 1970 protest against the police murder of gay and black trans people in L.A., which involved an attempt to collectively levitate the Rampart police station in the hope that it might be made to disappear. Reina Gossett connects the manifestation to the present day as a both trenchant critique of the normalized organizing tactics preferred by the nonprofit industrial complex and a demonstration of being accountable to the unborn, the dead, and the living, a potential shift in connection that would create more space in our movements to hold more people, more levity, more magic, less isolation, and less shame. Histories of the Transgender Child contributes to and extends Deborah and Mate's, Lewis's, and Gossett's careful reading of the archive, working to undermine medicine's self-appointed authority and self-referential self -referential rationality from within by emphasizing the ways that trans people were actively involved with the contested production of medical knowledge, despite lacking, in most cases, expert education, and, especially in the case of trans children, often producing theories of trans life that drew as much from magic or fantasy as from science. While the trans 20th century uncovered here is drawn primarily from archival research in major medical institutions, including the Johns Hopkins Hospital, the University of California, LA Medical School, and Harry Benjamin's private practice in New York City, the depth and breadth of the archive's contents move well beyond these focal points. Trans children lived in every single region of the United States. The coasts were also far from the only locations in which trans children or adults encountered and interacted with medicine or one another. Indeed, it would be difficult to maintain any pretension to a trans metronormativity during the early 20th century, even if major urban centers such as San Francisco and New York were important places for trans social life, community building, and activism. In this book, as much space is devoted to rural trans life and childhood in states like Ohio, Alabama, Missouri, and Wisconsin, as to urban trans life and childhood in LA or Washington, DC. What does typify the, demogra the demography of medical archive, however, is its overwhelming whiteness. To reckon with the implication of that pervasive whiteness in relation to trans of color life, this book draws on and contributes to trans of color studies. Trans of color studies in medicine. If the 20th century medical archive is compromised by the limited perspective of its rationality and by its overrepresentation of white middle class trans life, how can trans of color studies reckon with reliance on that archive? Why not abandon the medical archive for alternative forms of knowledge? In reconstructing the history of trans children, this book could have begun, for instance, with Sylvia Riviera. Trans street kids are essential to her political work and legacy. 
Rivera was also a tram street kid herself in the late 1960s, running away from her grandmother's home on Long Island to New York City at the age of 11. Rivera found her way to Green, Green, Greenwich Village, where she was adopted by a few young, but older than I was, drag queens, and soon thereafter joined a community of trans and queer street youth, including a teenage Marsha P. Johnson as a sex worker on 42nd Street. Rivera lived in openly and def Rivera lived openly and defiantly in her childhood, even wearing makeup to elementary school. She was also held at the Bellevue Psychiatric Ward after a suicide attempt and shortly before running away from home. Rivera's and Johnson's participation in the Stonewall riots, their affinities with and critiques of gay liberation activism, and their trains of color liberation activism at the turn of the 1970s present a rich tangle of categories, politics, and priorities that undermine the increasingly sanitized and progressive narratives that collapse retrospectively into the U.S. LGBT movement or the creation of a generalized transgender subject in the narrative of Stonewall and the gay liberation movement, which, as Anne Nuffing points out, celebrate Sylvia Riv Rivera's visibility as transgender, concealing her status as a broke woman of color. Rivera is also a difficult figure to reconcile with contemporary political taxonomies of sex, gender, and sexuality. As a child, she recalled, I was an effeminate gay boy. I was becoming a beautiful drag queen, a beautiful drag queen child. Later on, of course, I knew that Christine Jorgensen was already around, but those things were still waiting on the backs of people's minds. Donning and contesting the political identity of gay in the early 1970s and referring to herself here and there as a drag queen and a transvestite in the expansive idioms of the era, not adopting the term transgender in the, until the 2000s, Rivera remained mostly aloof from the medicalization of transsexuality. In an interview about their work in Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, Star, Johnson asked Rivera about the difference between the terms drag queen and transvestite, and she responds, A drag queen is one that usually goes up to a ball, and that's the only time she gets dressed up. Transvestites live in drag. A transsexual spends most of her life in drag. I never come out of drag to go anywhere. Everywhere I go, I get all dressed up. A transvestite is still like a boy, very manly looking, a feminine boy. You'd wear drag here and there. When you're a transsexual, you have hormone treatments and you're on your way to a sex change, and you never come out of female clothes. When in response, Johnson asks, you'd be considered a preoperative transsexual then. You don't know when you'd be able to go through the sex change? Rivera responds, almost likely this year. I'm planning to go to Sweden. I'm working very hard to go. Johnson points out that surgery in Sweden would be cheaper than at John Hopkins, to which Rivera agrees. It's 300 for a change in Sweden, but you've got to stay there for a year. Yet, sometime later in 1990, during an interview, the historian Martin Duberman asked Rivera about hormones. Duberman's notes record that Rivera said that she took them for a while, but came to the conclusion that she did not want to be a woman. I like pretending. The whole world for me is a stage. I like to dress up. I don't want to be a woman. I don't think about the sex change. I didn't think about the sex change. That's not what I want. Even if Rivera is a complex figure around whom to write a history of trans children, why are the street kids of major cities in New York not already recognized as proof that trans children have a past? Why are they not brought up in present-day conversations about the newness of trans children? Their radical politics which would hardly be compatible with the modernizing progressive narrative of medicine and corporate political lobbying, is surely one reason. Rivera's and Johnson's work in Star undoes the progress narratives of gender and sexuality. They prioritize the tr trenchant critique of the police, gay gender normativity, and institutional racism, and pursued a celebration of Latinx and Black trans life that led to their own marginalization within activist circles almost as soon as they began organizing. Another reason, however, is that their lives are incredibly ephemeral. Most street kids are anonymous as historical subjects, an unknowable diversity of experience hiding behind the collective noun.
Even though Rivera and Johnson have generated perhaps the largest amount of archival documents and scholarly interest of any known street kids, even the account to which we have access is organized around a relatively sparse set of repetitive narratives that provides only small snapshots of what the lives of black trans and trans of color street kids were like in the 1960s and 70s. Starr's work on behalf of trans children nevertheless offers an important set of contrast to the clinical history that anchors this book. Formed in 1970 and led by Rivera and Johnson, Starr focused on survival, countered social injustice, and asserted a revolutionary and unapologetic transvestite identity. In the face of an increasingly hostile and gender normative gay liberation movement dominated by cisgender white men. Starr's efforts were guided, argues Jesse Gann, by Rivera's hope of enacting a very grounded kind of social change, creating a home for the youngsters, the underage street queens who, like her, had begun working on the streets at age 10 and who not long afterward ended up dead. She and Johnson materialized this aim through the creation of, star, of a star home, a place where street kids could live together, pool resources, and develop practices for addressing violence in the sex work industry, police brutality, and over-incarceration. In its first iteration, the Star Home was a park trailer in an outdoor parking lot in Greenwich Village, where around two dozen street kids lived. When the trailer was suddenly driven away by a trucker, Rivera and Johnson decided to get a building, hoping also to get away from the Mafia's control of the bars. They found a place to rent in the East Village, teaching themselves to make repairs and renovate the space, Leslie Feinberg explains. They envisioned the, the, top, floor a the top floor as a school to teach the youth, many of whom had been forced to leave home and live on the streets at a very early age, to, to read and write. Johnson and Rivera worked to make sure that the children were fed and clothed. We went out and hustled the streets. We paid the rent. We didn't want the kids out in the streets hustling. By prioritizing the lives of trans of color street kids and sex workers, Starr had an extremely fractious relationship with the Gay Liberation Front and the Gay Activist Alliance, which culminated in Rivera's infamous exclusion from the 1973 Christopher Street Liberation Day rally, to which she responded by physically fighting her way on stage to deliver a scathing speech indicting gay men for ignoring the beating and rape of trans people in jail. Narrator's note, this is a very good speech. I'm going to link it, link it in the description just because it's that important. Because Star built itself through the situated knowledges of the ar arguably poorest marginal constituency of the trans community, it also did not address institutional medicine much during its short existence. Like Rivera, Star did not identify itself through the medical model of transsexuality although it was certainly aware of it. What little work Star or its affiliates directed at medicine at the turn of the 1970s addressed access to other basic life-sustaining healthcare. For instance, Bob Kohler, a gay activist and friend of Rivera, and one of the only people who maintained a friendly relationship with the homeless and with the street kids of New York, worked with the Mattachine Society in the East Side Village Youth Project to bring a mobile medical theater trailer to serve the medical and psychotherapy needs of street kids in, 19, in late 1969. Rivera also focused some of her activist energy in psychiatric institutions, particularly Bellevue Hospital, where family members or the state had many gay and trans people confined, confined on spurious pretenses. Stars, black trans and trans of color political organizing to provide livable world for street kids also took place at the end of the historical period that this book covers making it too late to serve as a starting point for some of the interventions I make. <clears throat> Still, the many differences between this account of trans of color childhood and the accounts that are assembled in, across histories of the transgender child are instructive in avoiding the reduction of tr black trans or trans of color life to singular narratives. Star and the ephemeral perspective of trans street kids of color are also an important model for trans of color studies as it works to dismantle medical, state-sponsored systems of being and knowledge that continue to marginalize and extract 
necropolitical value from black trans and trans of color, life and death. Something with which transgender studies must continue to reckon as it becomes further institutionalized in the university. Trans of color studies, of course, does not name a unified or even necessarily an extant field. It functions here instead as an invocation across several fields of a vital point of departure for this book, one that Rivera's and Johnson's lives reflect. Race is not a new matter to add to transgender studies. Multiple and differing racial formations, including blackness, coloniality, Latinidad, indigeneity, and immigrant diasporas, are not and should not be new areas of inquiry for transgender studies to encounter or discover. In We Got Issues Towards a Black Trans Studies, Allison Green, Richardson, and Snorton argue for seeing black trans theory as an impetus to investigate a series of questions about repressed genealogies that might come into view through a more sustained engagement with blackness as an issue that is both overseen and unknown. Drawing on Edouard Glissant's work, they offer, you, they offer his concept of transversality as a collateral genealogy, or an encounter with a past that also contains an ethical confrontation with the collateral damages involved in blackness as overseen and unknown. The relation of blackness to trans life, as well as the relation of anti-blackness to transsexuality and transgender, represents political problems of knowledge and being opened up through historical, historical and politically engaged scholarship rather than a frontier of new thinking to be discovered by more inclusive methodologies. Blackness problematizes the category trans and vice versa. Trans of color studies not only argues that race is integral to transgender studies then, but also responds to a particular problem of black and trans of color hypervisibility with which the field is frequently complicit. In the introduction to the transgender studies reader too, Susan Stryker and Aaron Z. Izura observe that, trans that current trans of color critique resists imperialist forms of knowledge production precisely by calling attention to which transgender bodies, and they are almost always the non-white ones, are made to represent the traumatic violence through which claims for rights are articulated. In that volume, Snorton and Jim Harita Warren's essential essay, Trans Necropolitics, names as the most urgent present task of trans of color critique, explaining the simultaneous devaluation of trans of color lives and the nominal circulation and death of trans people of color. As they argue, this circulation vitalizes trans theory and politics precisely through the value extracted from the trans of color death. This critique is particularly pre prescient in the wake of the ongoing biopolitical turn in transgender studies, which has been incredibly generative in identifying how trans life has been operationalized by normalizing and governmental techniques, but also tends to follow Michael Foucault's lead in abstracting the category race out of its own histori historiosity. Abandoning the centrality of colonialism and transatlantic slavery to the racialized modernity of the human. Instead of taking Foucault's account of the modern biopolitical, biopolitical body for granted, scholars working toward decolonial, decolonializing the field and concept of transgender are increasingly looking to Sylvia Winter's work on the overrepresentation of Western man and the production of alternate, alternate genres of the human for scholarly coordinates they extend the work of trans studies in more productive directions. Alongside growing conversations involving trans studies, Afro-pessimism, and indigenous studies is work that draws on a decolonial framework to think of transgender and transsexuality as imperial formations of knowledge that circulate transnationally but uneven unevenly across the global north and the global south. Joseli Maria Silva and Marcio Jose Ornat explain the decolonialist approach succinctly as the opportunity to develop a strategy with which to overcome the notion of the primacy of scientific knowledge over those who suffer the effects of epistemic violence. As the editors of Transgender Studies Quarterly Special Issue, Decolonializing the Transgender Imaginary, put it, the term transgender, grounded as it is in the conceptual underpinnings that assume a sex-slash-gender distinction, as well as an 
an analytic segregation of sexual orientation and gender identity slash expression is simply foreign in most places and times. Histories of the transgender child adds that one of those places and times might actually be the 20th century United States, if we read the medical archives through an interpretive practice aimed at its decolonialization. This book makes two arguments about the racialized genealogies of transsexuality and trans medicine on the one hand, and the dis- disqualification of trends of color life and knowledge from them on the other. First, its trends of color critique of medicine illuminates how the medicalization of trans life has always fundamentally racialized it in more than one sense. Sex and gender were reconceived as plastic phenotypes during the 20th century, one makes which makes all human embodiment, including cisgender forms, a racial formation. Second, because the concept of plasticity was abstractly racialized by medical science as a synonym for whiteness in the clinic, it, in the clinic it had real demographic effects. The overwhelming majority of trans patients seen at institutions of medicine were white, even in the most pathologi- pathologizing and disenfranchising medical models. The abstract whiteness projected onto the white trans body justified the attention given by doctors. Black trans and trans of color patients were much rarer because they were they were by design not welcome within that discourse. The broader racialized and class disparities in access to American medicine were also particularly acute in trans medicine, making it far more difficult for trans people of color to find competent and caring professional attention whether in 1920 or in 1975, or for that matter, today. In this way, the medical model built during that 20th century disavows its own racial knowledge and racial violence, a set of practices that, as C. Riley Snorton has shown, run much longer into the 18th century, at least, where chattel slavery functioned as one cultural apparatus that brought sex and gender into arrangement. The John Hopkins Hospital, which is a central focal point of this book, is emblematic of the disavowed racial genealogy of modern American medicine, built in a historically black neighborhood in the late 19th century on the presumption of special access to black people's bodies for experimental research that was frequently non-therapeutic, practiced without consent, painful and destructive. Hopkins produced many modern medical protocols out of experiments that were seen through a lens not of white plastic potential, but out of black fungibility. This held true for the Hopkins clinics involved in the production of protocols for altering human sex, where I show that black trans and black intersex life was framed in atavistic terms. This is the particularly pernicious racial effect of medicine in light of Snorton's rigorous detailing in Black on Both Sides of how captive flesh figures on a critical genealogy for This is a particularly pernicious racial effect of medicine in light of Snorton's rigorous detailing in black on both sides of how this is a partic in black on both sides. This is a particularly racial effect of medicine in light of Snorton's rigorous detailing in black on both sides of how captive flesh figures and critical genealogy for modern transness as chattel persons gave rise to an understanding of gender, as mutable and as an amendable form of being. The racial plasticity of sex and gender, whose history this book locates in the 20th century, is very much part of the inheritance from that racial history. A trans of color critique of medicine, then, insists on naming, following Susan Stryker, the spectacular whiteness of transsexuality as a colonial form of knowledge whose claim to jurisdiction over trans life must be contested. Through a detailed historical investigation of the construction of trans medicalization from the opening of the 20th century to the end of the 1970s, this book works from within the historicity of transsexuality and its predicates to demonstrate that medicine's reason is actually a highly impaired, partial perspective on trans life, and trans childhood especially, that can only masquerade as universal and objective through the constitutive violence that it disavows. Not only does the whiteness of medicine interfere with the intelligibility and livelihood of black, brown, indigenous, and other marginal trans people, but it substitutes for them a point of view rendered detached and transcendent through their exclusion.
Trans children stand out as powerful examples of this process of producing objective vision out of the forced disappearance of the personhood of patients. Trans children become valuable to doctors for an abstract quality, plasticity, which they exceptionally incarcerated in their growth from infancy to adulthood. Medicine made of children's living bodies, proxies for the experimental alteration of racial plasticity and human sex, not by listening to children's desires or demands for gender self-determination, but by making them into the raw material of medical techniques. The same plasticity of sex was racialized as white, making white trans children valuable in the clinic, also silence them, making their experimental treatment a means to other ends. Making the limited and partial perspective of medical science is a project whose roots I also find in feminist science studies and women of color feminism. Donna Haraway argues for a concept of situated knowledges to both open up this problem in dominant Western forms of scientific knowledge and find a theory of feminist objectivity that can usurp its place without having to reject the practice of science altogether. For Haraway, the difference between a dominant form of objectivity and a feminist objectivity is that the latter is a concern with the ethical problem of being held accountable for the production of a standpoint. Unlike institutional science or medicine in the production of situated knowledge, the scientific knower seeks to subject a position not, a, 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 not of identity, but of objectivity, that is, partial connection, which is quite distinct from the totalitizing act of fully grasping an object of knowledge. In other words, through a feminist practice of situated knowledge, which does not pretend to proceed from a transcendent, detached position, or to split the observer and the object of knowledge, we might become answerable for what we learn to see. Naming dominant epistemological practices and forms of scientific knowledge as situated, not universal or independent in their objectivity, is a powerful critique. Yet Haraway also offers a concept for building alternate forms of embodied knowledge, especially from the position of those whose lives have been long disqualified as unscientific, such as women, people of color, and colonized people. Still, Haraway is careful about not romanticizing the alternate production of knowledge from perspectives that have been subjugated. Many currents in feminism attempt to theorize ground for trusting especially the vantage points of the subjugated. There is good reason to believe vision is better from below. The, the positionings of the subjugated, however, are not exempt from critical re-examination, decoding, deconstruction, and interpretation. The standpoints of the subjugated are not innocent positions. On the contrary, they are preferred because, in principle, they are least likely to allow denial of the critical and interpretive core of all knowledge. Subjugated standpoints are preferred because they seem to promise more adequate, sustained, objective, transforming accounts of the world. But how to see from below is a problem requiring at least as much skill with bodies and language as the highest techno-scientific visualizations. <clears throat> this is a point that Chela Sandoval developed through a woman of color feminist lens in Methodology of the Oppressed, explaining that the, product, the production of situated knowledge from the perspective of the oppressed must be careful to avoid reducing that perspective to an identity. Sandoval cautions against a persistent problem where minority forms of knowledge such as black feminist theory, queer of color critique, or indigenous epistemologies are misrecognized as correlate to a particular identitarian scope that reduces their fear of applicability rather than consti constituting a theoretical and methodological approach in their own right. For Sandoval, these skills born of a decolonial process, processes would insist on a new kind of human and social exchange that have the power to forge a dissident transnational coalitional consciousness. A trans of color methodology of the oppressed might also be called a science of the oppressed, a concept that Mitra Cardenas has adapted and developed in recent work, connecting art, activism, poetics, and digital making. Trans of color studies grows out of these multiple genealogies, prioritizing prioritizing as much as possible the de-subjugated knowledges, named in Susan Stryker's introduction in the first Transgender Studies reader. There is a rich and growing bibliography of work that prob problematizes transsexuality 
as an artifact of colonial forms of knowledge and governance, critiques the disqualification of transcolor life and knowledge as unscientific and unworthy of personhood, and offers situated knowledges from the perspective of transcolor lives that are never reducible to a single or transcendent pos position, but instead implicate the researcher and the reader, asking them to confront the responsibilities of trans of color subjects and the varying responsibility of those trans of color subjects. This book's trans of color framework is built not out of a unified voice or referent, then, but out of a generative and internally discordant bibliography drawn from trans of color scholarship, black feminist theory, black queer studies, women of color feminism, queer of color studies, and decolonial studies. While I aim to cultivate responsibility to those fields, I also affirm the partially incompatible and contradictory elements involved in their mobilization together. There are distinct points of friction that I do not always try to resolve and that are p the particular risk of, form of the formulation. Trans of color. I do, however, mean to avoid flattening the category race, much as I aim to expand the meanings of trans. In this book, there are several distinct forms of racialization at hand whose historical entanglement is the object of inquiry. Naming modern sex and gender as racialized white through the medicalizations of plasticity in children's bodies, for instance, implies an exclusionary and dehumanizing relation to the racialization of black trans life. The racial formations of blackness and in indigeneity, in particular, are highly specific in the U.S. context and do not map onto Latinx or immigrant forms of race, that have often been forced into, into competitive relationships by the state. There are also important conceptual and political tensions within the theoretical perspectives mobilized in this book. Haraway and Sandoval's emphasis on situatedness, for instance, since in tension with work in black studies on what Fred Moten calls the refusal of standpoint and the proposition to think from no standpoint in the case of blackness. There is also an important tension in thinking about the relation of forms and symbolic or social death that have attached to black trans and trans of color life and the material lives of black trans and trans of color people. Admittedly, these large and ongoing conversations across fields are mostly beyond the scope of this book. Still, they insist as an importantly recurring problem. The frequent absence of black trans and trans of color children in the clinic's archives, in particular, is not only a product of medical gatekeeping or the whiteness of transsexuality, it is a, also a product of a distance practiced by black trans and trans of color people from institutional medicine, which was well understood to be a dangerous and frequently violent apparatus. But the 1960s and 70s, as formal gender clinics began to open in, in the United States, their overwhelmingly white clientele was contrast, contrasted the continuing use of willfully faulty homosexuality and schizophrenia diagnoses to reject an outright black to reject outright black tra trans children's personhood and to subject them to potentially infinite detention in psychiatric facilities as well as more literal forms of incarceration the black trans children who appear in this book particularly in the fourth and fifth chapters occupy a difficult and risky position in this narrative one magnified by the protocols of medical archival research or the need to anonymize dilutes even the smallest details of black life whose traces are left behind. Black trans children are situated in these chapters in contrast to the white trans children who lives, whose lives are overrepresented in clinical archives. Although to preserve anonymity, I do not use any real names from medical records in this book. It is worth pointing out that these black trans children frequently had no names recorded in these documents to begin with. They were also the least likely to have any pretense of their own voice recorded in interviews or to be discussed with even the most basic trappings of personhood. This is a dangerous situation to reconstruct out of the archive, for it risks reassigning a necropolitical value to black trans children, letting them vitalize the work of transgender studies without challenging the reduction to a social death in the archive. To read contrary to the facticity of the archive and locate some form of escape or resistance is also exceedingly difficult because of the brevity and sheer misdirection of the medical discourse in those documents. 
to argue that their blackness therefore always sits in an eruptive position in relation to transsexuality, in certain instances threatening to puncture the racial order of things, also risks casting these black trans childhoods in a romanticized role, as always outside the category transgender, not an easy position from which to find a livable life for a child. Taking these risks on as part of the ethical project of cultivating responsibility toward the real lives of behind historical discourses, I draw on Robert Ride Farr's post-humanist archival practice, informed by rich thinking in Black studies, on how Black social formations are forced to survive within the violent matrix of Western humanism's concept of man, how the Black operates in Western humanism as a non-subject who gives meaning to the awkward and untenable concept of man. For Ride Farr, the historical archive of Black sociality can reinforce the parameters of that humanism only if it is acquiesced to in to in advance. He argues convincingly that through the conceit of humanism would have us believe that our ability to address human being must by necess necessity be a radically demarcated endeavor. The lived reality of black life demonstrates an unusually broad set of procedures that have challenged and critiqued not only white supremacy, but also the smugness and certainty of the entire Western humanist apparatus. Drawing on Hortense Spiller's distinction between body and flesh, and renewed sense of the archive as a location for interpreting alternate accounts of social life, they find the conceptual coordinates and historically lived difference. Ride Farr names the responsive, responsive object of his posthumanist practice, archives of flesh. Rather than taking taking these uh, rather than taking the ejection of blackness from the human as a final word in the matter, these archives of flesh bring to the fore many moments of illogic, indeed of wildness and bestiality that one finds in humanist discourse, inviting its undermining through archival interpretive practices attuned to alternate forms of the human already existent in the past. If this book archives, if this book's archives of trans black childhood are, to a considerable extent, overwhelmed by the sheer force of medicine as a domineering form of humanism, yielding only to the slightest glimpses of the situated perspective of black trans childhood, this is, as Ride Far importantly reminds, less a reason to abandon the archive than an invitation to invent better interpretive practices that break from dominant epistemes and ontologies. By recognizing that domination has to be historically produced, but is never a done deal. It is also, however, a reminder that this book provides only one account of Black trans childhood's historicity. We need more of these histories. We do not need different archives, and, and we do need different archives that produce alternate forms of knowledge richer in the grain of Black trans and trans of color, embodied objectivities, than what this book can provide by focusing on the history of medicine. I turn to Star to frame my thinking about the collective project of trans of color studies, not only because it provides subjugated historical knowledge from before the contemporary liberal LGBT movement, but also because Rivera's life as a street kid reminds us that there are countless unstold, untold stories latent in the past that could be what Snorton terms fugitive moments in the hollow of fungibility's embrace. And even when they contrast with or outright contradict this, the account that I provide in this book, that contributes to, toward displacing the whiteness and rationality of transsexuality, suggesting black trans and trans of color futures that do not reiterate the exhausted closure of humanism. It matters, but precisely in ways that we can scarcely yet imagine in their profundity, as some of the trans children I write about in the last chapter of this book, were visiting Harry Benjamin's private practice in Upper West Side of Manhattan in 1970, across town and some 30-odd blocks south Rivera, was, pra was picketing Bellevue Hospital, where she had been held by medical authorities as a child. With these methodological and historiographical coordinates in mind, this book's conclusion argues against the etiological framing of trans children, whether by medicine, the helping professions, or the media. As I began to suggest in the preface, histories of the transgender child 
asks us to turn against and away from figurative thinking about trans children in general. Trans children must no longer bring us to some new knowledge of trans life or sex and gender, making them a means to some other abstract end. Rather, through the 20th century history, rather, through the 20th century history of the chapters that follow, I propose an ethical relation that calls upon adults to stop questioning the being of trans children and infirm instead that there are trans children. The trans childhood is a happy and desired form, not a new form of life and experience, but one richly, beautifully historical and multiple. Chapter 1. The Racial Plasticity of Gender and the Child In the late 19th and early 20th century, life sciences, sex, underwent two key transformations. Sex became synonymous with a concept of biological plasticity that made it an alterable morphology. And through experiments by largely eugenic scientists, it was racialized as a, as a phenotype. The framing of sex through racial plasticity occurred in a broader scientific milieu in Europe and the United States that defined living organisms, both human and non-human, as naturally bisexual, a mix of masculine and feminine forms. First operationalized through experiments in changing the sex and phenotype of animals, this racial plasticity was adapted for altering the human body by the emergent field of endocrinology between the two world wars. Yet, if plasticity named the inherent indeterminacy of sex as a biological form, scientists also began to wonder if that might not be inclined to take on binary form, at least in certain cases. On the one hand, defining sex in terms of the racial plasticity granted unprecedented technical access to altering living morphology. On the other hand, the material reach afforded by the plasticity held open the door to biological resistance to the imposition of rigid forms such as mutually exclusive masculinity and femininity, since plasticity is a quality, a capacity to generate and receive imprints of form, and not a visibly discrete part of the body, endocrinology called upon the figure of the developing child to serve as a stabilizing metaphor, as a metaphor for an invisible but material plasticity. The child organized sex and growth along parallel phylogenetic and ontogenetic scales, Yet this metaphor also preserved and kept alive the tension between indeterminacy and form at the core of sex. As a result, the sex binary moved closer to a conceptual collapse the more it became scientifically alterable. By returning to the era that precedes the emergence of the medical category transsexuality, what Henry Rubin calls the prehistory of experimental endocrinology, we encounter sex as a wide open field of biological form was highly racialized in significance in the heyday of eugenic science. Early 20th century endocrinology contextualized how the child's body became a living central laboratory for trans medicine over the rest of the 20th century, while at the same time actual children were, were rendered passive and invisible within the closure of its discourse. This chapter, then, is not about trans children directly, but rather works, up to, works to open up the key concept of plasticity that shaped the trans 20th century. This chapter is not quite, for that matter, about many actual children at all, but more so about the strangeness of the child as a figurative form of life. One of the historical problems endemic to Western childhood is that an abstract concept of the child has profoundly overlaid, sometimes overdetermined, the, the lives of actual children. The tension between abstraction and material life is precisely incorporated into the child as a strangely living figure, or what Claudia Castaneda aptly calls a figuration. One of the key historical effects of this figuration is that it allows for the child to serve as a me metaphorical representation of other concepts often ones that are too inhuman to stand on their own, including plasticity. By calling attention to how scientific cultivation of the racial plasticity of sex relies on a metaphor, I do not mean to suggest that it is for, the, for that reason unreal or some kind of ruse. On the contrary, as we will see, it is precisely the partial misfit between plasticity and the child greased by the mechanics of metaphor 
that was so productive for medical science over the ensuing century. Metaphor is, after all, a well-established explanatory technique in the sciences. The rhetoric of science has been investigated through the metaphors that govern its composition, while the techniques of scientific research and theoretical inquiry have been read in terms of the metaphorical relationships between models and the phenomena under investigation. The history and philosophy of science have also paid close attention to the ways in which metaphor, among many literary, poetic, and aesthetic commitments, explains the emergence of European science from a specific Romantic tradition in the 18th and 19th centuries. Still, in those accounts, metaphor tells us much more about the language and practice of science than about the objects, animals, and silence bodies subjugated through scientific practice. The object is to reassess not only the position of the scientific observer, but also the object of observation in scientific discourse. As Gillian Beer observes in Darwin's Plots, a focus on metaphor is not an argument that scientific discourse is a set of literal fictions. In the case of Darwin, Beer argues that it was a precisely his awareness, conscious or otherwise, of his use of metaphor in his writing that allowed him to generate a theory of evolution through natural selection that, read closely, continues to exceed totalization. Donna Haraway also investigates the central function of metaphor in, bi in biology in Crystals, Fabrics, and Fields, her first book. The premise is perhaps deceptively simple. Science is not a transcendently objective description of the real world, nor should it be. Drawing on Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions and Mary Hess's Models and Anal An Analogies in Science, Her Haraway undertakes an analysis of metaphor that is the launch point for a po post-positivist study of science. For Haraway, a metaphor is generally related to a sense object, such as a machine, crystal, or organism. A metaphor is an image that gives concrete coherence to an even highly abstract thought. In other words, metaphors in science operate much in the same way as metaphors in literature, but with rather distinct effects given to the putative purchase of science on real-world objects, or in the case of biology, on living organisms. Metaphor is also a crucial way for humanists to access the practice of science, rather than only the critique of its ep epistemological basis. As metaphor illuminates the active role of language in form in the production of scientific knowledge and their entanglement with the material world being described or observed, they are mutually informing. Biological metaphor, Haraway explains, gives boundaries to worlds and helps scientists use real, using real language to push against these bounds. In so doing, it ensures that language is neither outside those worlds nor an imposition on or misrepresentation of them. Although metaphor imports ostensibly non-scientific or non-objective meanings that shape the intelligibility of scientific data, and for that reason is of concern to critiques of biology, this originary, this originary contamination is not itself a problem to be overcome. In offering an account of production in the history or of the life sciences, the analysis of shifting metaphors opens up its discourses, data, and historical effects to a kind of dynamic analysis that includes critique, contestion, and the potential for creative mutation and difference. The point <clears throat> Haraway rises is that a better meta the point Haraway rises is that a better metaphor can make an epistemological and political difference. In the product in the the point Haraway rises is that a better metaphor can make an epistemological and political difference. In the production of situated knowledges, struggle over operative metaphors is a method for producing responsible relational perspectives that emphasize the entanglement of the so-called object of scientific discourse with the scientific observer. An exclusively cultural analysis, which would regard metaphor as a contamination or a product of ideology or a byproduct of ideology avoids responsibility to objects and beings such as children who have been made into a poorly fitted metaphors metaphor remains a vital avenue for the production of non-teleological -tele non-reductionist branches of biology and science 
as much as it has been the historical vehicle of its dominant objectivizing forms. Rather than oppressing, opposing metaphors entirely, the task is to imagine different ones that would reshape the practice of science in the production of biological knowledge from the situated perspective of the long presumed passive object. If biological metaphors are images or ideas that guide the life sciences without corresponding to an actual object, we could understand almost any abstraction of human or non-human life through this framework. Sex and gender certainly could be considered rather broad metaphors for human form, more precisely as phenotypes that pretend to derive from themselves straightforwardly from an imagined genotype. They are metaphors that go too far in relation to biological life, over-determining it with poorly fitted meaning. The endocrine system, as an anatomical abstraction, would also qualify well as metaphorical. When it was first conceived in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the endocrine system was proposed as a way of differenti differentiating <clears throat> certain bodily functions from the popular nervous systems of the era. The supposition that chemical messengers secreted by organs travel the blood system, integrating and coordinating disparate parts of the body, was founded on an abstract image of the circulatory system and accessory glands. This chapter turns to two related but far less obvious metaphors, ones that have no correspondence to the visual anatomy of sex. They are instead implicit or latent metaphors for life, as it becomes human animality and child development. Since the plasticity of living organisms cannot be isolated as a discrete physiological object, endocrinologists relied on metaphors from the human, inhuman constituents of the human to animate its coherence as an endocrine system that could be partially manipulated. Given that medical science has been able to leverage th that metaphorically animal or childish plasticity to induce real change in the phenotypic forms of the human body, it matters quite little whether plasticity really exists, somewhere in the flesh, or to put it differently, the impossibility of disarticulating actual material plasticity from the discourse of plasticity is not a hard limit on thinking critically. Plasticity has already had a real historical effects through the work of metaphor. The child and the animal are metaphors as formal ideas and material actors, as Haraway suggests. To say that sex and gender are metaphors for the human comprehends the historically specific material, biological effects of those images on, in, and as the animal and child body in the lab, the chemical, technical, and effective forms of masculinity and femininity that have invested and sculpted the flesh down to the tiniest of scales. Yet biological life and the objects of research are also involved in the metaphors medical science deploys to engage with them. The organic names, precisely that paradoxical entanglement of an indeterminacy in form that a metaphor gets just right enough to do something real in the body without ever controlling or exhausting what it can do. Animals and children were much more than abstract reference that rhetorically directed scientific and medical accounts of endocrine system. The, although that is in part what they were. In the early 20th century, animals predominantly, but also infants and children, as we will see in the next two chapters, were the experimental objects in, in the laboratories and the clinics of endocrinologists during the first half of the 20th century. Theirs was the flesh through which the endocrine system was abstracted as raw material and given new form of plastic sex. For this reason, the child and animal metaphors cannot be the vehicle of an exclusively discursive critique of the ideological basis of science and medicine, but instead on the organic centrality of animality and childness to sex, gender, and the forms they keep alive. Life bisexuality in the 19th century. The emergence of a concept of biological plasticity in endocrinology and elsewhere is embedded in a much larger 19th century debates between mechanist and vitalist views on life. A range, of, a range of emergent European and American disciplines and fields, collecting under the umbrella of biology, sought to investigate a set of common questions about the relations in, between form and genesis, <clears throat> inheritance and impressibility, and the individual and the species. <clears throat> 
While the mechanists retained a faith in atomism, chemistry, or later, physics to describe the basic unit of processes that made organic matter, the vitalists explored a range of explanatory concepts for the special addition or force that made it the inorganic alive. Over this time period, the metaphor of the organism was proposed to resolve the entrenched opposition of both camps. Meanwhile, the study of sex and anatomy, physiology, embryology, and endocrinology refined the focus to center around life's apparent natural bisexuality, the conceptual pre predicate to plasticity. Sex, a concept broad enough to signify in this era, both sexual differentiation in organisms and sexual reproduction, was made accessible to science to the degree that it was intrinsically amenable to alterations in form a capacity verified by and rooted in its original, originally bisexual disposition. The earliest figures in European endocrinology came to this consensus by way of animal experiments. Arnold Adolf Berthold's study in 1848 and 1849 of chickens in Germany significantly advanced the hypothesis that a unique system of internal secretions governed much of the biological life of the animal. In technique, Berthold was repeating a set of experiments on the gonads of fowl that had been undertaken countless times before, perhaps most famously in the 18th century by an English physician, John Hunter. Berthold first caponized a group of cocks by surgically removing their testes, observing that they subsequently underwent a radical feminization in morphology and behavior, not only looking like hens, but also acting like them. He also transplanted some of the removed testes back into the birds from which they were taken, but in their stomachs. Berthold's goal was to disprove an older somatic model of sex by demonstrating that the gonads were not part of the nervous system. By severing any potential nervous connection at the moment of excision and placing the gonads in an, in an entirely different part of the body, Berthold sought to determine whether they uh, were able to continue functioning by some means other than nerves. When these birds exhibited the normal behavior of uncastrated fowls after the testes were placed in the stomach, he argued, it follows that no specific spermatic nerves exist. Instead, Berthold explained, it follows that the results in question are determined by the productive function of the testes, i.e. by their action on the bloodstream, and then by corresponding reaction of the blood upon the entire organism. The concept of a system of chemical communications between various ductless glands in the body by means of the circulatory system laid the basis for a specifically endocrine body, and for Berthold, sex, directed by the gonads, was the primary means of access to that body. Berthold's choice of animal subjects was not made exclusively to avoid the much more complex possibility of human experiments. Rather, Endocrinology drew on centuries of informal knowledge in animal husbandry. Farmers had long cultivated sex, breed, and phenotype to maximize certain characteristics over others. The notion that sex changes were possible by rationally manipulating the chemical output and communication of the endocrine system was well established by the end of the 19th century, if still based on a great deal of speculation, namely the hormone mo molecule was unknown. The theory of life's natural bisexuality and its amenability to cultivation simply jumped, by analogy, to the human species. In the variation of plants and animals under domestication, for instance, Charles Darwin explains matter-of-factly that in every female all the secondary male characteristics, and in every male all the secondary female characteristics, apparently exist in a latent state, ready to be evolved under certain conditions. Citing the earlier studies in birds, before moving on, he adds, we see something of an analogous nature in the human species. The key transformation indexed by Darwin's reference to research on birds and its applicability to human form is that the persistent latency of bisexual characteristics, which could revert under cer certain conditions, carried a primitivist meaning. Such latency of the sexual form in humans was almost entirely metaphorical. It had never been directly observed, nor had researchers yet removed the testes or ovaries of humans in analogous experiments. If the latency to which Darwin referred had no physiological correlate in the human, then it could be imagined as a stored primitive capacity that was actively observed in lower animals. Hence, only, 
Hence, only under those metaphorical certain conditions would a sex change like the ones achieved by Bartold take place in humans. This primitivist sense of a latent bisexual animality on an evolutionary scale, phylogenesis, is, an important, is Im important because it would soon be recoded and extended through a parallel time scale. The individual development of the child, ontogenesis, sex would become the form that it could bind evolutionary time and individual lifespan through a materialist concept of plasticity. By the time of Darwin's remarks, the natural bisexuality of life seemed to poise to herald a new era for medicine and scientific research. The simultaneous transformation of the individual body and the species through the hormonal manipulation of sex. It is worth emphasizing again that sex in this era meant both sexual differentiation of the organism, its growth from one cell to maturity, and sexual reproduction. Ernest Starling, who coined the term hormone in 1905, worked to introduce the new field of endocrinology to medical science in the first several decades of the 20th century. Stress that the function of the endocrine system was precisely to integrate differentiation of and, and reproduction. Sex, which was governed by hormones, simultaneously regulated the metabolism and the phonetic type form of the body, height, weight, bone structure, genitals, secondary sex characteristics while ensuring the transmission of these traits to the next generation, employing the same organs for both tasks. If in its regular somatic commerce, sex was originally and naturally bisexual, this suggested that sex granted access to the real manipulation of form and transmission, and the transmission of that form's heredity to future generations. As the 20th century wore on, then, this bisexually identif bisexuality identified in lower animals was recorded into a general concept of biological plasticity that would direct endocrinologists toward the child. The identification and naming of the hormone took place at the start of the 20th century in the course of research on the role of pancreas in indig indigestion. William Bayliss and Ernest Starling aimed, much as Berthold had, to disprove a reigning nervous theory of the organ. That view held some from nervous reflex govern each stage of the digestion of food, analogous to the secretion of saliva, sugared at the presence of food in the mouth. Bayless and Starling looked at the relation of the pancreas to the small intestine in dogs by surgically removing part of the later parting of the latter during digestion, scraping off its surface and distilling the chemicals there present they, hypo they hypothesized that some chemical agent produced in the mucous membrane, activated by the entry of stomach acid into the small intestine, was responsible for the secretions of the pancreas during digestion. When they injected the distilled solution into a dog, they found that it induced the pancreas to secrete in the absence of the stomach acid. Bayless and Starling named this speculative chemicals secretin in 1902. Although they were unable to speak either to its molecular composition or to its actual mechanism of action or on the pancreas in their findings, they speculate on the possibility that there are similar mechanisms in relation to other secretions throughout the animal body. Starling, who in, 19, who in the 1905 Croonian Lectures at the Royal College of Physicians of London, provided an important sketch of the new field of endocrine medicine to his peers, extrapolated secretin to the broader category of the hormone. While the nervous system had dominated the medical conception of the body for some time, Starling ambitiously proposed that the hormonal body was more of a fundamental evolutionary organization. Many organisms lacked a nervous system, after all, whereas chemical communication was ubiquitous down to the unicellular level of life. Even in complex forms like humans, he suggested that the role of chemical reflexes, rather than nervous reflexes, had been greatly underappreciated in spite of the con continuing ignorance of the actual operations of hormones. Starling described hormones as the chemical messengers which, speeding from cell to cell along the bloodstream, may coordinate the activities and growth of different parts of the body. The hormonal economy of the body is distinguished for him by two modes the increase and decrease of specific organ activities, and the growth of tissues or organs. One cannot, however, he cautioned, draw a sharp line between reactions involving increased activity or dissimilation of an organ. <laughs>
and those which involved increased assimilation or growth, since under physiological circumstances, the latter is always the immediate sequence or accompaniment of the former, the endocrine system rather incorporates a vital, if strangely mixed, degree of growth and transformation of the biological body into its quotidian operations. While the original research into the pancreas had no obvious connection to sex, in the Kroonian lectures, Star Starling stressed its comparative importance. The largest group of correlations between the activity of one organ and the growth of the others, he said confidently, is formed by those widespread influences exercised by the generative organs. As Darwin had earlier claimed, without the model of the hormone, so did Starling posit sex as the most intense side of the endocrine body's intrinsic transformability. His final Croonian lecture focused on the largely speculative but alluring and growing consensus that there exists a homology between sex and growth as hormonally regulated aspects of human form. Beginning with the long-standing experiments on the removal of the testes in birds, Starling had then reviewed contemporary work that it had established the ovaries as hormone-secreting organs. Research into the mammary glands in pregnancy seemed to him to promise in 1905 the most densely ent entangled amalgam of sexual differentiation and somatic growth, combining fetal, placental, gonadal, and possibly neurological dimensions of the endocrine system. As is well known, Starling pointed out in a nod to the theory of natural bisexuality, at birth, these mammary glands are equal in extent in both sexes. While the suggestion of a homology between bisexuality and plasticity was largely latent in Starling's 1905 lectures because the actual mechanisms of hormonal synthesis and communication remained almost entirely speculative and based in analogies, near the end of his career, in 1923, he reflected in much stronger terms on the potential of the endocrine body to experimental medicine. It seems almost a fairy tale that such widespread results, affecting every aspect of man's life, should be conditioned by the presence of or absence in the body of infinitesimal quantities of a substance which by its formula does not seem to stand out from the thousands of other substances with which organic chemistry has made us familiar. With the passage of time, his confidence in the primacy of sex in the endocrine system has only increased. Speculating that this repro the reproductive organs are possibly even more marvelous than any other hormone-secreting glands, Starling sums up nicely the consensus of the life sciences of the 1920s. The whole differentiation of sex and the formation of secondary sex sexual characteristics are determined by the circulation in the blood produced either in the germ cells themselves or, as seems more probable, in the interstitial cells. Thus, it is possible by operating at an early age to transfer male to into female and vice versa. Berthold's experimental sex change in chickens had been concretized, concretized in a fully, into a fully-fledged model of an endocrine body whose sex and growth were governed by the circulation of specific hormones. What's more, as chemicals, if sex hormones could be synthesized, that economy could be directly manipulated by science and medicine altering the sexual differenti differentiation and reproduction of the species. To understand how, in several decades, a vague and largely metaphorical picture of chemical messengers could lead to confidence in the scientific changeability of sex in animals and possibly humans, we need to examine more closely the recoding of bisexuality as plasticity. Starling's qualification of, at an early age, is key. The still vague developmental language growing in an endocrinology would be made explicit by the introduction of the child as a metaphor. From bisexuality to plasticity. At this early 20th century juncture, the metaphor of prim primitive animality, used to explain the plasticity of sex, was transformed into a much more potent metaphor of child development. Drawing from the closely related field of embryology, early 20th century endocrinologist wages that the recept receptivity to transformation of sex life was much higher in its juvenile stages. Indeed, the embryo was probably the most plastic of all life, with that quantum of plasticity diminishing gradually during fetal life, infancy, and childhood, until it was nearly gone in adulthood and old age. 
In doubling animality's primitivism from a phylogenetic temporality to a second ontogenetic temporality, developmental plasticity offered a clear material target for medical science. Intervene into the growing organism before it has finished sexual differentiation, and its eventual form could be cultivated rationally. As microscopic technology grew in refinement and cell theory began to take shape in the 19th century, a pointed interest had arisen in protoplasm, the direct conceptual predecessor to plasticity. The Czech anatomist J. E. Perkine, who coined the term in 1839 through microscopic examination of an animal embryo, in 1846, the German physiologist Hugo von Mohl also proposed the theory of cell division, describing the tough, slimy, granular semifluid in plant cells as protoplasm, arguing it, arguing it was the original material out of which the nucleus of new cells is formed. While protoplasm's material referent was, in a literal sense, that observable liquid, specula speculation simultaneously arose as to its invisible action, opposed to the possible abstract force of life. A potential correspondence between cell division and or organismic growth. This interest in the protoplasmic qualities of the cell and by analogy of living creatures composed of many cells fed into a broader theory of the plastic materiality of biology and by the turn of the 20th century. Given how conceptually abstract and unrepresentable protoplasm was as a force, although cell division could be observed, the actual mechanism by which it took place could not. The theory of biological plasticity could find itself in need of a more compelling metaphor were it, be, were it to become alterable in the lab. While researchers in the mechanist camp of the life sciences still help to identify special, specific chemical or physiological basis of protoplasm and to picture how it drove cell division and the growth of life forms, they were continually frustrated by its recalcitrance. The field of embryology, therefore, began to adopt techniques of experimental anatomy, physiology, and physiology, rather than merely describing its biological structures. Diffusing the interest in protoplasm and plasticity throughout the rest of the life sciences. In an important experiment in 1891, Hans Dreisch artificially shook apart two cell, two cell sea urchin embryos. In the dominant mechanist paradigm of the era, he expected that the two now separated cells would grow into deformed half organisms, for each would have been otherwise destined to grow into a specific predetermined part of it, of the adult sea urchin. When the two separated cells instead went on to form whole embryos, albeit about half their normal size, Dreisch was formed to reconceive the embryo as an equivalent as an equipotential system, where each part has a material capacity to grow into a whole. In other words, a distinct field of plasticity seemed to pervade the embryo, allowing it to radically adapt to changes from its environment and to maintain a certain form, although this plastic plasticity could not, strictly speaking, be observed under the microscope. Dreisch could only see its effects. In 1907, Ross Granville Harrison, an embryologist at Johns Hopkins University, published a paper on a success in this first culturing of live tissue without an attached body, adapting what was known as the hanging drop method. Harrison removed neural tissue from a frog and was able to culture it in a liquid solution so that it grew in three dimensions. His summary of the implications of this experiment dwell on how the culture cultured nerve fiber develops by the outflowing of protoplasm from the central cells. In other words, an intrinsic plasticity is the vital engine of live tissue, coaxed by the hanging drop apparatus to grow into an incipient form out of its embryonic indeterminacy, and without the body of the frog organizing it. The absence of a body in tissue cells suggested that a plasticity was a fundamental quality of life at various scales rather than a property or part of specific biological structures, like the organism or the body. The Harrison technique went on to play a central role in a massive amount of scientific and medical research over the 20th century on cancer, organ regeneration, and transplants, for instance. The plasticity of living tissue, now successfully cultivated in the lab, promised to grant a new mode of access to the biological body for the life sciences,
be added as an invisible latent force of both growth and receptivity to a form, this emergent sense of plasticity still lacked coherence. Protoplasm, or as it was increasingly rendered, plasticity, needed a metaphor because, in its visual absence to researchers, except in its effects, it was unable to break the deadlock between mechanist and vitalist. Either the plastic quality of life was a series of chemical reactions that had yet to be observed due to inadequate scientific instruments, or else plasticity was just another name for a metaphysical vital force of life that was beyond rational influence or of alteration. Neither of those options have provided much opportunity to work with and cultivate plasticity in the lab, and work by embryologists like Dries or Granville could definitely prove neither. In this context, the child could serve as a much better metaphor for plasticity, combining cell theory with the concept of life's natural bisexuality through the narrative drama of development. As the child study develop movement, as the child study movement grew on both sides of the Atlantic, alongside the development biologists of the, excuse me if I mispronounce this, Entwick Slung Mechanic School, the traffic between fields and favorable was favorable to the production of the child as a particular kind of metaphor. Within the child study movement, G. Stanley Hall looms large not only because he established a category of adolescence, but because of his ad because of his dedicated interest in the life sciences. In 1904, foundational work Adolescence is grounded in a psychobiological and rigidly evolutionist materialism. Borrowing heavily from physiology, embryology, and endocrinology, Hall made of adolescence a critical period of plasticity, where the natural openness of children's open growing bodies and minds demanded to be cultivated for teleological ends in his narrow and racist vision of the human species. Hall granted the physiological and spiritual, spiritual development of children and young people in a direct analogy to biological development so that the psychic and somatic unfolded as part of the same material process. Adolescence also reflects the consolidation of a strict teleolo teleology of child development. Growth was coded as unidirectional and parallel at the individual and species level, binding childhood to a highly charged evolutionary concept of race as inheritable phenotype. <clears throat> the discourse of development registered a as a problem of timing, and the multiple senses of pacing stages and thresholds after which plasticity waned and could no longer be manipulated. In Hall's ardently recapitulationist view, children and adolescents were neo-atavistic, much like ancient human ancestors in form and structure, but ready to grow to higher ends in a rapid period with the right environmental input. Children and adolescents were henceforth incarnations of a temporary plasticity subject to natural and artificial variation that can produce correspondingly normal or abnormal growth. Yet even as he offered this plasticity as an object to be governed by scientific technique, Hall had to concede to a certain agency to its unpredictability. Some linger long in the childish stage and advance late or slowly, as Hall put it, while others push on with a sudden outburst of impulsion to early maturity. Without the intervention of science, medicine, and education, that plastic indeterminacy would not be counted upon to achieve the specific, and fundamentally racist, form of the human that Hall advocated. Biology alone was not enough. It had to be cultivated. At the same time, it might resist or thwart cultivation. Hall defined adolescence precisely as the age of modification and plasticity and his characteristic overconfidence in the material basis of plasticity indexed its widespread acceptance at the turn of the century. For biology and the plasmata in general, and the protoplasms in particular, under many names and aspects, occupy a position ever increasing interest and preeminence. Unlike either, the still more hypothetical background of all physical existence, protoplasm, is a tangible reality accessible to many and ever more subtle methods of study, and its all-dominant impulse is to progressive self-expression. It is the creator of ascending series of types of species and plants and animals, which become its habit of self-formulation. It unites successive generations into an unbroken continuum so that they bud the later from the earlier, 
each ontological line organizing a soma of gradually lessening vitality, doomed to death, while it remains immortal in the phylum. This account of the protoplasmic elan of life from the cell upward to the species verges on, on an imaginative vitalism. More important is that Hall identified the plasticity of life as its vector of material growth. <clears throat> one that is temporarily impressible during childhood. Hall saw the science of a child study as leading directly to the practice of cultivating children and adolescents into normative adults, for nature alone was insufficient to the project of evolution. Even if, if it be prematurely, he explained in the case of schooling, uh, schooling the growing child, he must be subjected to special disciplines and be apprenticed to the higher qualities of adulthood. For he is not only a product of nature, but a candidate for a highly developed humanity. Such apprenticeship could be straightforwardly educational, but even that was based for Hall on a biological metaphor. For the apprenticeship of natural plasticity, the, the directed cultivation of an ideal, mature form or phenotype for the human, for Hall, not surprisingly a white, binary, male body. Timing asserted itself as the most important problem here because the plasticity was neither permanent nor constant. Never again, after the ages of 8 to 12, Hall felt, will there be such susceptibility to drill and discipline, such plasticity to habituation, or such ready adjustment to the new conditions. Disease was recoded in this developmental sense as a pathology of precocity, arrest, or belatedness, all indigenous to childhood. Some disorders of arrest and defect as well as excessive unfoldment in some function, part, or organ may now, after long study and controversy, be said to be established as peculiar to this period. Moreover, and quite importantly, nature alone could not ensure the normal development of children, for corrupt or abnormal growth was stored and transmitted to the next generation by sexual reproduction. The momentum of heredity often seems insufficient to enable the child to achieve this great revolution and come to complete maturity, Hall opines, and there is not only arrest but perversion at every stage and hoodlumism, juvenile crime, and secret vice. The slip from arrest in developmental progress to perversion and secret vice is hardly incidental, for sexual differentiation was of a uniquely intense concern to Hall, but borrowed from endocrinology the view that sex housed the primary plasticity of life during development and its method of transmission to future generations through reproduction. For that reason, sex was at once the most robustly powerful and fragile dimension of the growing child's body. In matters of sexual development, Hall pronounced, life reaches its maximal intensity. Hall's concept of development places plasticity in a stage model according to which different moments of differentiation express plasticity to different degrees, while well, the overall trend is toward the withering plasticity by adulthood and old age. Describing the sexual differentiation of body parts during puberty, Hall reasoned, such changes are far from numerous and more rapid in the infant, and still more so in the growth of the embryo, but in these respects they are analogous in their nature, although later growths are less predetermined, rapid, or transforming. The protoplasmic quality of the embryo was an ever-diminishing return as it accomplished the growth of the human, with important spikes in infancy, childhood, and finally, adolescence, before firming up into an adult morphology. So puberty is not unlike a new birth, Hall could say, when the, when the lines of development take new directions. With a nod to the neo-Lamarckian camp in biology, he adds, there is much reason to believe that the influence of the environment in producing acquired traits transmissible by heredity is greatest now. Hall's work on child development provided a stable way to imagine the alteration of racial plasticity in human bodies in endocrinology, which would take up his work in an abstract metaphorical form to move closer to the point of being able to alter human sex. The Racial Cultivation of the Developing Endocrine Body by the early 20th century, human development had been rendered as a biological de declension narrative of plasticity into form. The intrinsic tension between indeterminacy and form had not actually been resolved, 
but was given new life in the body of the child, with a temporal frame of development ostensibly providing organization and justification for the incredibly narrow phenotypes that, ha that scientists like Hall judged to be the proper end of the human. As endocrinology came into its own during the first several decades of the 20th century, the child as metaphor for plasticity enabled the field to move from animal experimentation toward imagining the hormonal alteration of the human body, a prospect that eugenicist endocrinologists agree greeted with enthusiasm. In Europe, Vienna became the anchor of a socialist and eugenic community of endocrine research. During the first several decades of the 20th century, experimental organ organotherapy, glandular transplants, and early attempts at hormone administration attempted to modify the plasticity of animals and humans during their juvenile stages, as well as encourage the passing on of more refined normative phenotypes to future generations. For Eugen Steinach, who would achieve more renown for his endocrine therapies, sex was therefore nothing less than an interrogating component of the life concept. Steinach's fame came in part from his incredibly popular rejuvenation surgery, offered to aging men to revitalize and reawaken their physical and psychological youth by reactivating the dormant plasticity of the gonads. In reality, the surgical procedure amounted to a vasectomy, but testimonies of dramatic revitalization from legions of men around the world led to great demand for the endocrine's rejuvenation in the 1920s and 30s. Steinach's personal clients included the likes of Freud, who was also an avid consumer of Steinach's published work on bisexuality. Prior to his acclaim, Steinach began his career by recreating the animal castration experiments of his predecessors, including Hunter and Berthold, preferring to work on small rodents or gonadal transportation. He reaffirmed in a series of papers in 1912 and 1913 that the implement, implantation of the gonad of the opposite, opposite sex, the guinea pigs, transformed the original sex of the animal. A hormonally induced sex change reinforced the thesis of life's fundamental bisexuality, which he quickly analogized to humans. Absolute masculinity or absolute femininity may in any individual represents an imaginary ideal. A 100% man is as non-existent as a 100% woman. Retracing the line of thought that had been emerged from, child, from the child study movement, Steinach narrated endocrine development as a teleological arc from natural bisexuality to a stable sexed form. Long before puberty, at, at the dawn of their individual existence, male and female human beings show no sharp differentiation of form apart from their organs of generation. Rather, differentiation appears later and is at first gradual. Steinach often referred to the gonads as the puberty gland, and his references to the cubhood of young boys and the difficult teens of girls. He was fully enmeshed in the discourse of a puberty as crisis that shared much with Hall. The physiology and psychological tumult of growth and adolescence for Steinach was a case of external manifestation of, working, of extensive workings under the surface, a secret and fateful activity of internal functioning glands. In his endocrine model, the hormonal body was, a de was developmental in organization, and his experiments on animals were interpreted through the metaphor of the child. Steinach's interest in the racial plasticity of puberty was expanded in his work with his colleague, the biologist Paul Kammerer, with whom he offered a paper cl titled Climate and Puberty in 1920. Kammerer was a strong partisan of the neo-Lamarckian theory of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Together with Steinach, he hoped to draw on the newly developmental model of the endocrine body to demonstrate how morpho morphological characteristics were both acquired and inherited. Unsurprisingly, they argued that sex, comprising both differentiation and reproduction, played host to, the pro to that process. They also proposed the endocrine system which also played such an important role in metabolism, effecti effectively medicated between the living organism and its environment. In two parts, the essay draws an analogy from their experiments on rat growth to human development through a superficial reading of its colonial anthropology. Their experiments had demonstrated that rats reared in warmer temperatures developed quicker than those in temperate environments, 
Equally important, the warm-tempered rats apparently grew more prominent secondary sexual characteristics. These sex forms also appeared to be heritable. When after, after several generations of warm climate, the rats were moved to a cooler environment. Their offspring continued to grow into the morpho morphology of their warm weather ancestors. The second half of the essay makes a leap to human populations described in anthropology to argue that the warm climate resulted in the hypersexualization attributed to non-European peoples by encouraging the overdevelopment, first, of the puberty glands and, consequ and consequently of the secondary sex characteristics. Similarly, the authors asserted the neuro neurosphenic exhaustion of European settler con colonists from the endocrine overactivity induced by warm climates explains their frequently neurotic sexual pathologies. This theory of the inheritance of acquired characteristics through the sexed form of the endocrine system had two important effects. First, it reaffirmed a racist evolutionary hierarchy of human societies through the hormonal body, drawing a homology between a hypersexualized body of a color and a species level primitism, primitivism. The sex form of the internal and external body was coded as an explicitly racist form. Second, and quite importantly, the binding of sex and race relied on the concept of plasticity. If environmental information, such as heat, could influence the sex form of the growing body and be transmitted to offspring, a feat replicated in rats in the lab, then the possibility of affecting analogous changes in the humans was opened. Steinacht and Kemmerer mobilized the endocrine system's now established developmental plasticity to bind sex to race. In so doing, it was no coincidence that puberty was the object of their analysis. For the child, metaphor animating their version of the endocrine body made the plastic period of growth prior to adulthood the sensitive movement moment of environmental input that led to the acquisition and transmission of new sex characteristics. This binding of sex to race gave plasticity a eugenic significance. Both Steinach and Kammerer were involved in a community of socialist eugenicists in interwar Vienna, attempting to apply their research to uplift the stock of the working class through manipulation of the inheritance of acquired characteristics at the population level. In the United States, endocrinology also took on a eugenic logic during this period, albeit without the same politics. And in its earliest forms, eugenic science in America aimed itself at children. In turn-of-the-century California, for instance, the botanist Luther Burbank argued that children were not like rats, but plants. Independent of the circulation of Gregor Mendel's work and the rise of genetics, Burbank undertook countless plant hybridization experiments at his Santa Rosa farm. Not only did his hybrid plants have major impact on the practice of U.S. agriculture, but also his emphasis on the cultivation of biological form in plants lent itself to a great deal of eugenic writing and advocacy. His curious 1907 book, The Training of the Human Plant, is dedicated to 16 million public school children of America. Combining his expertise in the crossing of plant species with the principle of natural selection and a neo-Lamarckian understanding of the environmental impressibility, Burbank argues for the adaption of the principles of plant culture and an improvement of a more or less modified form to the human being. Burbank felt that the United States was aptly suited to, to creating what he called the race of the future because of the widespread mingling encouraged by immigration. While sex as reproduction alone would provide for some hybridization, it was in the planted cultivation of children's developing bodies that Burbank saw the greatest potential and most urgent matter for eugenesis. All animal life is sensitive to environment, he wrote, but of all living things, the child is the most sensitive. Every possible influence will leave its impress upon the child, and the traits, of, traits which it inherited will be overcome to a certain extent. In other words, a child absorbs environment. Were that absorption to be scientifically directed toward the perfection of human phenotype, the racial stock of America could be enhanced through each generation of children to come. At the heart of this earliest American eugenics was the assumption that in the body of the child, as Burbank put it, nowhere else is their material so plastic.
while Burbank could not advance much further than romantic naturalism, suggesting good sunshine, clean air, and good food as the basis for cultivating children like plants. Endocrinologists could turn to the newly modeled hormonal body for a more precise program of human enhancement. One such important figure for endocrinology in the early 20th century was the biologist Oscar Riddle, remembered most for the discovery of the hormone prolactin and its function in the pituitary gland. Riddle joined the Cold Spring Harbor Eugenic Research Station in Long Island, New York, in 1913 as a research associate. Although he did not get along very well, politically or intellectually, with Charles Davenport, the station's director and the de facto figurehead of American eugenics, the two coexisted for many years. Prior to joining the premier American eugenics research lab, Riddle had spent time in recently annexed Puerto Rico with the U.S. Commissioner of Fisheries, cataloging and examining the island's fish in the service of, service of colonial science. He had also spent time teaching in Berlin in 1910 after completing graduate school, where he became well-versed in the broader European life sciences. At Cold Spring Harbor, Riddle's research was broader in scope than the pituitary gland. His interest in the racial plasticity of sex led him to countless experiments in the alteration of animal phenotype through endocrine experimentation. For years, he bred ring doves, experimenting with the planned refinement of different forms and morpho morphologies. Riddle's long-term study of pigeons, likewise, translated the promise of plasticity into a critique of the rising field of genetics and its chromosomally determinist account of life. The field of modifiability, his phrase for plasticity, is not only the more alluring aspect of development, it promises results of more practical importance, he explained. Though we may not have hope to take from or give to the chromosomes of mankind, the temporary transformability, not mere modifiability, of probably all alternate genes of every human being and every organism is a scientific possibility which awaits only the work of the investigator. In connecting sexual differentiation and reproduction to the metabolic activities of the rest of the body's ductless glands, Riddle's research intensified the still largely enigmatic relationship between sex and growth, first in identified by Bayliss in Sterling's work on the hormone. In rats and pigeons, Riddle also examined the spe specific effects of nascent synthetic hormone therapy on growth and sex through the gonads pituitary, and the adrenal glands. In an experimental sex reversal in the pigeon, the findings of which he published in 1924, he explained that the sex of numerous pigeons have been reversed in the earliest gamete, or egg stage, by the application of partially synthesized hormone compounds. Among his conclusions was, it, was that this could mean that the hermaphrodite birds might actually be a sex reversal that had yet to complete. Although he had never conducted research in humans directly, he referred to the child as a metaphor for plasticity to lend a developmental organization to sex in the pigeon studies. The sheer plasticity of the pigeon embryo was understood to constitute the right moment of sensitivity to induce a sex reversal by the application of hormones. Riddle's technical approach was underwritten by the embryo's natural bisexual character, primed for the influence of hormones to develop into a distinctly sexed form. By applying hormones, Riddle understood himself to be artificially inducing sexual development and the direction of his design. Riddle's confidence that sex change in animals were, was both a common occurrence in nature and achievable in the lab by technical means had major implications for trans and intersex medicine during the early 20th centuries, as the next two chapters explore in detail. The concept of a mutually exclusive, biologically grounded, two-sex binary popular today was, not sim was simply not an established concept in the early 20th century. In this era, sex was commonly and scientifically understood to mean an organic, original bisexuality that, although quite capable of differentiating into male or female, nevertheless retained the latent possibility of reversal. A revision of Darwin's concept of reversion at the same time, the growing medical interest in intersex bodies and sexual inverts suggests that the human species, too, 
harbored a dramatic range of sexed morphologies, rather than hewing strictly, strictly to a binary. For endocrinologists, the application of the child metaphor to work with animals established the viability of sex reversal as a possible future endocrine therapy in humans, where it would seem quite natural to begin with children. The tensions in the child metaphor between indeterminacy and form remained latent, hiding just underneath the veneer of a developmental timescale that purported to convert sex into phenotype. A purely mixed bisexuality would never obey a doctor and dif differentiate into male or female, so the notion of a progressive sequence was added to bring a temporal order to sex. Yet the material actions of plasticity in laboratories simultaneously undermined that developmental schema, leading to a confusion that was well summarized by the biologist Alan Ezra in the 1920s. One may well ask, is any human completely sexed? In the face of that increasingly complex question, Ezra reflects the growing consensus of the interwar era, claiming that 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 sex is the expression of a combination of male or female characteristics within an individual, so that a completely sex individual is a result of a variety of forces acting in sequence on a progressively changing substratum. The tension in this account between the notion of a completely sex individual and the progressively changing substratum of sex preserved the significant conceptual paradox at the heart of endocrinology's interest in plasticity. While the era of normative bisexuality seems to have been largely forgotten or overlooked in the history of gender, sexuality, and trans medicine, so too have its eugenic foundations. Although children occupied a rather visible space within the project of the American eugenics movement in the early 20th century, notably, notably in Better Baby contests and public health and education campaigns, Riddles or Steinach's reliance on an abstract metaphor of the child to, to developmentally organized research speaks to a less visible historical role played by the child. Children do figure in the historiography of American eugenics, but their importance is framed mostly in the sense of being born or not being born. While the more visible and violent forms of race, hygienic, and eugenic medicine were contested in the aftermath of the Second World War. Recent scholarship has dismantled that declension narrative, arguing that eugenic ideas and practices, in fact, have found their most pervasive reach in the post-war era. There is no meaningful, non-ideological difference between so-called positive and negative eugenics. The historical binding of race to reproduction remains largely unchallenged, which is to say, unmarked and unspoken. In medical science to this day, the modern endocrine body incarnates important, an important instance of the persistence of eugenic logics after the war, as later chapters in this book explore in greater detail. The child metaphor was in large part what allowed the cultivation of sexual plasticity through development to proceed without reference to its eugenic heritage and without much acknowledgement of, of children at all. The figurative purchase of the child in, in endocrinology brought plasticity under the jurisdiction of experimental med medicine, and the potential for more complex sex reversals, including in humans, grew over the next 50 years in ways that Riddle or Steinach could have scarcely imagined. Figurative life. Toward the end of strange dislocations, Carolyn Steedman makes an enigmatic claim about the relation of literary figures of the child to the life sciences in the 19th century, explaining that she has attempted a partial description of some of the knowledge by which strange acts of personification took place, that is, the giving of abstract information about children and children's bodies, shape, and form in actual children, not by bringing statues to life through the force of prosopopeia, but by using living bodies as expressions. To clarify, she adds, meaning and knowledge, remembering and effect, you actually come into existence in human bodies. I have chosen a literary figure or trope, that of personification, to, to describe the kind of act of making of some, something out of ideas, an act of embodiment. The figurative existence of the child is always premised on abstraction, but as Steedman notes, it is an abstraction whose form is paradoxically expressed in the real living bodies of children.
something that something about children's bodies incarnates and takes living form in large part as the personification distilled from an abstract concept. The child, paradoxically as it may sound, is a living figure, or in her incisive words, one of the defining characteristics of the history of modern Western childhood is that children became the problem they represented. This is so in one sense because the child does not exist without relation to actual living children, as this chapter has examined. It is also so because the child has made a metaphor in Haraway's sense for the plasticity of sex. The child has, has been made a living fe- figure in biology because children can metaphorically accommodate the ultimately paradoxical relationship between form and plasticity that somehow grows into the human and can be altered by medical science. This is a historical situation, not an ontological one. Children are not intrinsically prone to figurative life nor is that form the only one to which they are perpetually consigned. In the same way, the 20th century association of children with the racial plasticity of sex was not inevitable, nor must it necessarily endure into the future. Steedman's choice of personification over metaphor to describe this historical process, however, implies a unidirectional account of the materialization of children's bodies by abstract knowledge. Perhaps matters are less straightforward than that. We might say that the growing child was a compelling metaphor in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, not merely because plasticity was, strictly speaking, an invisible quality of biological life, or that protoplasm was too abstract an idea to guide the life sciences. More important, the child metaphor granted a real access to altering the human body for science and medicine by turning the developmental model refined by the child study movement Endocrinology was able to re-describe the life of the cell and the unfinished organism's glands as pervaded by a plastic field sensitive to hormonal information, whether natural or synthetic, even if that field could not be seen under the microscope or in the clinic. At the same time, however, this child figure made to slide from cell to infant to adolescent to adult and back was only a partial success. As Haraway reminds, Metaphors only work insofar as they are imperfect descriptions, linking two disparate concepts together. For that reason, they remain unstable and open to contestation, including the situated perspective of the disavowed object, in this case, the child. The metaphor of the child was meant to manage the paradox between indeterminacy and form that sex is racial plasticity ignited, but it actually served to keep that tension alive, including in actual children's bodies as their sex was medicalized in the early 20th century. Plasticity as a concept that has no literal or physiological referent would turn out to be more unruly than Starling, Hall, Steinock, Kammerer, or Riddle might have wished. The child is an alluring living figure of racial plasticity because children grow so quickly and dramatically before the eyes of adults. But the distinction between the child as a figure and children as actual biological bodies produces an ineffable gap in knowledge about race and sex, rather than extinguishing it. Some of the many historical consequences of this choice of metaphor are taken up in the next chapters. I have spent so long on the details of -of turn-of-the-century endocrinology because the clinical histories that follow in subsequent chapters rely directly on the key concepts that were invented and experimentally established in this era. The rest of this book shifts focus from the child as as a metaphor in medical knowledge, in medical scientific discourse, to to actual children's bodies in specific clinical settings, examining how plasticity ramified in medicalization of intersex and trans children over the 20th century, as the endocrinologists in this chapter began to imagine a transfer of the concept of plasticity from the animal to the human body via the child, physicians in the United States started to make that jump, clinically through the 20th century treatment of of intersex children, who seemed to literally represent the thesis of natural bisexuality, while finding themselves in the course of of that work confronted with some of the first trans people to seek medical support for altering their sex. As the trans early 20th century took shape, the involvement of biological life and the metaphors used to describe it began to frustrate clinicians and children alike. Scientists and doctors maintained no pretense of being in control of sex and growth as much as they clung to dogmatically binary and racialized definitions of sex. 
They could hope only to influence, nudge, and contour still largely metaphorical processes that began in, naturally bi- in natural bisexuality and, according to them, were meant to end in binary form. For the eugenicists, meanwhile, this indeterminacy of sex occasioned a litany of racist anxieties over the individual pathology and population level degeneration. In opening up plasticity to its historical context, something so often missing from its celebration in recent years by feminist science studies, neuroscientific work, and neomaterialism's Haraway suggestion that the referent of a metaphor has its own organic agencies is useful. The eugenic heritage of endocrinology informs the medicalization of sex, gender, and trans life in the 20th century, but it hardly exhausts plasticity's meaning for forms. If intersex and trans children, as we will see in the next several chapters, have been forced to grow in the dislocation between the figurative and material existence of race, sex, and plasticity, they may have accrued or encountered strange and unexpected plastic agencies along the way. If, as Steedman speculates, figurative existence is a form of historical existence, we cannot assume that the overriding power of the child metaphor was able to completely disenfranchise children, even if, most of the time, it nearly did. Chapter 2. Before Transsexuality. The Transgender Child from the 1900s to the 1930s. How can we name a trans early 20th century, given the myopia of the medical archive in the era before transsexuality? For all the zealous attention focused on the plasticity of sex and the life sciences, particularly between the two world wars, the practice of medicine was by comparison quite conservative on the question of changing sex in the absence of psychological physiological abnormality. While endocrinologists carried out the idealistic and eugenic sex experiments on non-human animals explored in the preceding chapter, surgeons, physicians, and psychiatrists confronted with human bodies remained reluctant to adopt the ethos of their scientific colleagues. At least, that was the prevailing situation in the United States. The dominant context for the changing for changing the sex of the human body in American medicine prior to the 1950s was a chaotic matrix of intersex diagnoses gathered from the catch-all term hermaphroditism, whose morphology was as elusive as it was visible in medical discourse. Synthetic hormone therapies were not practically available into the mid to late 1930s, and even then it took a great many years of research just to establish a basic sense of how the administration of estrogens, testosterone, and cortical steroids would affect the body's plasticity. For most of the first four decades of the 20th century, urological and plastic surgeons, rather than clinical endocrinologists, directed the medicalization of sex and plasticity, and they remained largely dismissive of otherwise normal people who wished to change their sex. In Europe, particularly Germany, the sexological paradigm championed by Magnus Hirschfeld's Institute for Sexual Wissenschaft provided medical transition for trans people as early as the 1920s. Hirschfeld's sexological community fostered a productive dialogue between the German sense of intersexuality and a new category of transvestism, which referred not only to the desire to cross-dress, but also the desire to live as a different different from the one assigned at birth. American medicine, by contrast, showed little practical interest in the concept. As a consequence, the slippery diagnostic matrix that attempted to manage the relations that linked homosexuality, sexual inversion, hermaphroditism, and transvestism, all of which shared core connotations, is a very complex place to read recognizably trans life unless we emphasize that discourses of transness in this era were not confined by the limited binary vision of the post-war model of transsexuality, and so were free to take on multiple forms. Sex change, transformation, and transition were ostensibly split in the United States between experiments in the life sciences on animals on the one hand 
and the mostly surgical approach to hermaphroditism in medicine on the other. The lives of people we might read as transvestite or transgender were meant by medical design to be excluded from those two projects, putting up an archived obstacle to locating early 20th century trans life. This gatekeeping is a source of the challenge for historical work on trans life in the early 20th century, and this chapter works to address both the affordances of an era without the narrow terms of the post-war medical model, and the limits of an archive in which doctors very clearly did not wish for trans people to be identified with the concept of changing sex. Despite the br brusqueness of American medicine, the archive still holds the traces of many people who can read as trans. In 1917 and 1918, Alan Hart became one of the first trans men anywhere to transition with medical support. Upon graduating from medical school at the University of Oregon in 1917, Hart had consulted a psychiatrist and with him made a complete study of my case, my individual history, and that of my family. After a physical examination, the diagnosis was, in Hart's words, complete congenital and incurable homosexuality, together with a marked modification of the physical organization from the feminine type. Life having become so unbearable that I felt myself confronted by only two alter alternative courses, either to kill myself or refuse to live longer in my misfit role of a woman. Hart decided on the second. After an explanatory laparotomy surgery for the purpose of establishing definitely and indisputably my proper role, Hart achieved through an operation and transformation that included a hysterectomy, the result that I left the hospital as a man. Despite facing slander, discrimination, and prejudice from colleagues, Hart went on to a distinguished medical career in Oregon, Montana, and California as a radiologist and tuberculosis researcher. Despite an earlier claim by the historian Jonathan Ned Katz that Hart was a lesbian, scholars now agree that Hart's profession of being a man and his having pursued a medical sex Change as uh, medical sex change ought to be taken seriously, and that the term homosexuality in these documents cannot be taken literally through its contemporary definition. The fact that trans life could fall under the sign of homosexuality is actually an important clue for how to read the early 20th century medical archive for the wider category of sexual inversion regularly mixed gay and trans connotations. Hard, of course had access to medicine by virtue of education and vocation. The possibility of reading trans children in the early 20th century is more complex. Some of the first trans children to collaborate with doctors in the 1940s and 50s in the emerging field of transsexual medicine recalled their childhoods lived during the 20s and 30s, and among them were a few experiences with medicine, like that of Val, one of the first trans women to try, albeit unsuccessfully, to obtain access to surgery in the United States in the 40s. Val had the blue chip endorsement of endocrinologist Harry Benjamin, the sexologist Alfred Kinsey, and Carl Bowman of the Langley Porter Psychiatrist Clinic in San Francisco. In 1948, while dozens of doctors at the University of Wisconsin-Madison's General Hospital quarreled over whether to grant permission for surgery, Val, who was then in her early 20s, recounted her childhood to a psychiatrist at age two, she had become unwilling to wear boys' clothes, and her parents relented, letting her dress full-time as a girl. When she started school around 1930, her parents, who were on the local school board and who were close to a county judge, arranged for her to officially attend school as a girl. Special arrangements for toilet, etc. were made, and even though classmates knew Val was actually a boy, they treated her with respect and apparently did not tease or shun her. When she was 10, Val even joined the 4-H club and took cooking and flower gardening. A local doctor, probably drawing on the developmental theory of human bisexuality, advised the family that the condition was one she would normally grow out of at puberty. When that did not happen, and the local high school was even more hostile, Val dropped out and had spent the subsequent time at home doing woman's work. Later reading, a good deal about her condition, including several books and articles on operative procedures which feminize men. Bisexual, bisexologists like Havelock Ellis and Hirschfeld 
Val decided to pursue surgery and hormone therapy. Repeatedly, however, hospital boards, including the one in Wisconsin, forbade any procedure, so she later tried, with the help of Kinsey and Benjamin, to find options in Europe. Hart and Val are rare evident examples of the interaction between trans people and medicine in the first half of the 20th century, but their childhoods can be established only retrospectively. Most trans childhoods, like much of trans life in the area before the term transsexuality, remain implicit. We are left to wonder just how many more trans people had had no reason at all to be archived. This is not to say that self-identified trans adults from the mid-century necessarily understood themselves in those terms to earn their childhood either. Val seems to have understood herself from a very young age to be a girl, convincing her parents to let her live and attend school as such. Whether she, her family, her doctor, or her school entertained a concept of her belonging to a distinct sex category seems unlikely. Unlike in Europe, transvestism was a rarefied concept in the United States until around the 1940s, and it is hard to imagine that many children have had access to sexological texts that, rarely translated into English, had a minuscule readership among professional adults. Indeed, even Val did not encounter them until she was 20 years old. Other than the vaguely general pronouncements of a local doctor, her trans childhood had no substantive relation to medicine, nor did it evidently need one. In spite of these epistemological and archival challenges, this chapter takes Val's childhood as a launch point for investigating trans life and trans children in the medical archive for the first half of the 20th century. There are compelling, if partial, records from this era that suggest interaction among trans adults, children, and doctors. The fragmented quality of this archive is not a flaw or a symptom of damage to the historical record, but a valuable interruption of how the trans 20th century has been too often narrated by beginning in the 1950s with transsexuality. Returning to the decades that precede that moment opens a, com a complex field of medicine and its interactions with trans people, one in which intersex children occupy the stage of trans children. The abstract value of the child's growing body as a guiding metaphor in the life sciences and the process through which its plasticity was brought under the jurisdiction of medicine hold our attention. Intersex children were forced during these decades into a decisive role as the experimental subjects in whose bodies the abstract theories of endocrinology were translated into real medical technique for altering human sex. The very medical feasibility of Val's request for surgery in 1948 was predicated on decades of medical sex reassignments performed on infants, children, and teenagers diagnosed as hermaphrodites. This chapter and the next explore the various impacts of the medicalization of intersex children on our understanding of trans history. Intersex children are just as much a part of the history of transgender children as they are an integral part of the broader 20th century history of sex and gender. Another important reason to consider intersex and trans people together is that, is that they wanted to visit Another important reason to consider intersex and trans people together is that they visit, visited the same doctors at the at the John, John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, the, the Paramount American Institution for Medical Research on Sex. Children's growing bodies were made to manifest what had remained speculative in endocrine theorizing about the plasticity of sex and its racialized meaning as human phenotype. Experimenting on intersex children's unfinished bodies provided the founding protocols of sex assignment and reassignment for all human bodies, including for those who would be called transvestites and transsexuals with regularity only later. Some early 20th century trans people attempted to claim a space for themselves in that medical discourse, drawing on the relative porosity of categories like intersex and inversion to argue that their bodies represented a mix of masculinity and femininity that could be altered by doctors too. While the impulse, looking back from the present day, may be to separate trans and intersex life, this was precisely the undecided tension at hand between doctors and patients in the early 20th century. This chapter shows that as sex became more alterable through experiments on intersex bodies, 
it became less obvious why trans people's request to change their sex would be disqualified from the same procedures, because in the absence of a medical discourse like transvestism, the sheer similarity between trans and intersex embodiment empowered some trans people to simply argue that they were intersex. In the face of this situation, doctors could only scramble to mobilize an ill-fitting narrative of psychological homosexuality to deflect trans people from the clinic. And within this complex field of diagnosis and experimental treatment are key archival traces of trans children from the early 20th century. The trans child before transsexuality, however, does not tie up all these leakage points between categories. In fact, the trans child casts significant doubt on the utility of a before transsexuality paradigm altogether. This chapter shows how the disorganized field of sexual inversion, hermaphroditism, homosexuality, and transvestism in which children were caught undoes the pr presumption that modern medicine played a causal role in defining the parameters of trans life. Rather than serving as a prehistory of what came before transsexuality then, this chapter moves forward framing multiple trans childhoods with multiple definitions of transness, including non-medical forms of knowledge and identity, each with competing definitions that exceed the binary terms to which transness in general and trans childhood have been confined in the post-war medical. The transatlantic circulation of endocrinology, sexology, and eugenics. One of the reasons that it is difficult to look in the early 20th century medical archive for allegedly trans life is that the most visible Western sex sexological categories through which it circulated, transvestism, appeared only on the margins of American medicine. One particular obstacle was that major works of German sexology like Hirschfeld's lengthy study, Die Transvestite, Transvestitin, were not translated into English. The British sexologist Ellis, who coined the term Ianism to describe the desire to dress and live as a sex different from the one designed at assigned at birth, did write in English, but his terminology never really caught on. Sexology was also regarded quite differently on the two sides of the Atlantic, while in Europe, many physicians, endocrinologists, and surgeons who practiced medicine found it intuitive to stay apprised of the work undertaken at Hirschfeld's Institute in the United States. In, in the United States, sexology remained mostly the province of psychiatrists and social scientists who were rarely well versed in the German literature. In an era when Freud's reception was both slow among and highly contested by Americans, Hirschfeld and Ellis were likewise re regarded with skepticism. When Val read sexological work on transvestism in the late 1940s, she was actually at the avant-garde of American reading public, professional or lay. Nevertheless, clinical experiments at John Hopkins on, the, on intersex and trans bodies did not happen in isolation. And despite a general resistance to German sexology, there is one endocrinologist who is in his biography and career worked to bridge the European and American paradigms. Harry Benjamin. Perhaps best known as a founding figure in the 1950s and 1960s of transsexual medicine, which he pursued from private practice on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Benjamin, early in his career as a, as a physician, specializing in endocrinology, blended German and American approaches. Benjamin anchored his view of the endocrine system in the German concept of intersexuality, he felt strongly that sex, although it was entangled with a psyche, should be understood as a foundationally biological form. For instance, he maintained throughout his career in the United States, and quite against the prevailing mood, that Freud was not a Freudian, but rather that he would be shocked if he saw what went on today. He was much more of a biologist. Graduating from German medical school in 1912, Benjamin traveled to the United States a year later, lured by the promise of a treatment for tuberculosis. When that did not pan out, he decided to return home, but the outbreak of World War I prevented his boat from passing a Royal Navy blockade. Forced into temporary exile, he settled in New York and opened an endocrine and geriatrics practice. After the war ended, Benjamin immersed himself in the cutting edge of European research on sex and hormones, 
During the 1920s and 1930s, he made almost annual summer trips to Vienna, where he spent months working on Eugen Steinach's endocrine lab. He also befriended Paul Kammerer, the eugenicist biologist who collaborated with Steinach on hormonal rejuvenation and the theory of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Benjamin led the effort to circulate the pair's work in the United States, bringing both on lecture tours in the 1920s. He was also a major proponent proponent of Steinach's rejuvenation procedure in the United States, promoting the cause of endocrine therapeutics as offering eugenic improvement of the virility in old age. While keeping up with the latest in experimental endocrinology, <clears throat> Benjamin also embedded himself in the German sexological circles in which transvestism was being studied and medicalized. Benjamin had first met Hirschfeld in 1906 or 07 through a mutual friend and had been taken by him but to visit gay and transvestite bars in Berlin. During the 20s, he visited Berlin frequently during his summer trips to Europe, spending a great deal of time at the Institute and attending Hirschfeld's lectures. In 1930, he also arranged, helped arrange for Hirschfeld to visit the United States. In the late 1920s, Benjamin met someone he considered his first transvestite patient. Otto Spengler was a German immigrant living in New York City, who at the opening of the 20th century had, had been briefly involved in Hirschfeld's circle of transvestite researchers. In 1906, Spengler had given a lecture on sexual intermediaries to the German Sci Scientific Society of New York City, perhaps the first public lecture on, the, on a trans subject in the United States. Spengler was also one of the transvestite cases profiled by the sexologist Bernard Talmy in a lecture given to the New York Society of Medical Jurisprudence in 1913, published the following year as an article in the New York Medical Journal, and also in his 1919 medical manual, Love, a Treatise on the Science of Sex Attraction, which contained five case studies of Tommy's transvestite patients. Tommy did not do much other than observe, describe, and try to theorize the potential meaning of transvestism. He did not discourage his patients from dressing and living as women or men, but neither did he offer much concrete medical support. When Spengler became Benjamin's patient in the late 20s, they began to collaborate on experiments with hormonal transition and feminization. Benjamin prescribed the earliest version of an estrogenic compound, as well as x-ray treatments to sterilize the testicles and, it was hoped, deactivate their endocrine activities. Spengler explained the treatment in a letter as aimed not so much at rejuvenation, but feminization, as belonged to the class of transvestites. When the recip recipient of that letter forwarded to Benjamin, annotating, is this a man, a woman, or a lunatic? Benjamin replied somewhat tongue-in-cheek, believe it or not, this person is a man, a woman, and somewhat of a lunatic, so you guessed 100% right. To be serious, he is a married man, father of several children, children but is a transvestite. Sick. That is, his passion is to go on in women's clothes. Despite the humorous tone, Benjamin's characterization of Spengler's as once a man, a woman, and, sometime, and somewhat of a lunatic points to how much the first two categories were not mutually exclusive when the third was present. In the 1930s, Benjamin also worked to arrange funding for research into the isolation of male hormones, advancing the path towards the synthesis of testosterone for clinical experimentation. As he built a career as a practical bridge between German sexology and American endocrine medicine, Benjamin was also actively involved with eugenics research in the institutions. More precisely, the endeavors overlapped. In the mid-1930s, Paul Papineau, the Secretary of Human Betterment Foundation, began corresponding with Benjamin to acquire about the physiological effects of the Steinach procedure, the hormonal theory of sexual and racial rejuvenation. Benjamin also struck up a relationship with the decorated biologist Oscar Riddle. Based out of the Cold Spring Harbor Eugenics Laboratory in Long Island, New York, Riddle is remembered best for his work on the pituitary gland. The eugenic context of his research has been less appreciated, despite his long-term residence at the premier American eugenics research institution. <clears throat>
Riddle undertook decades of sex change studies on pigeons and other birds at Cold Spring Harbor, speculating on how the endocrine system's plasticity could be scientifically manipulated to predict predictably alter the racial phenotype of a species. Benjamin had met Riddle in Berlin in 1926, while both were presenting at a conference. A few years later, he wrote to Litt Riddle after reading an article of his in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Benjamin expressed interest in translating Riddle's re uh, relatively abstract sex change experiments on birds into medical therapy for humans. You know of my interest in Steinach's re researches and, being a practicing physician, in their practical application to men, he explained, you speak in your article at some length of the importance of the experiments that prove the reversibility of sex. Benjamin goes on to make a rather petty point, that Riddle unfairly did not cite Steinach's animal experiments in his article. Riddle was gracious in accepting the criticism, but pointed out the advance of his work over Steinach's. But now note carefully that from my standpoint, and that of the biologist generally, as he put it, that sex reversal is demonstrated only by forced developmental reversal of testes into an ovary or reverse. Of course, Steinock's beautiful studies do not even touch this point. His results showed the reversal of secondary sexual characteristics. Riddle claimed to be able to induce sex changes in the actual gonads of animals, rather that, rather that the secondary morphology of the sex influenced only by hormone circulation. Whether there, were, there was a viable way to translate this method into a process for changing human sex, however, was unclear. Benjamin invited Riddle, in 1931, to join his newly founded, formed Medical Society for Sexual Sciences, which he explained would consist of a research committee, a committee for medicine and therapy, dealing with the fields of urology, and endocrinology, psychoanalysis, etc., and a sociological committee, dealing with such problems as birth control, eugenics, sex education, etc. The invitation was refused, as Riddle felt, I am not myself a medical man, reflecting the American norm of maintaining a gap between the life sciences and the practice of medicine. While the two never collaborated more closely, they still found themselves in dialogue, often at the same conferences. Benjamin's career is an important backdrop to the early 20th century, because it took shape at an atypical convergence of intellectual and research traditions. German sexology, experimental sex change research in animals, early endocrine ther ther therapies in humans, eugenics movement, and work with transvestite community. By traveling to Europe nearly every year between the two world wars, Benjamin imported a great deal of speculative thinking about the plasticity of sex and the viability of changing sex in humans to, to the United States. He also, he also helped to import the European racialization of plasticity as a eugenic alterability of sex as phenotype from colleagues like Steinock and Kemmerer. This later point seemed to get the most traction with American eugenicists, who during the, the 20s and 30s were very interested in the potential medical applications of research on sex in the biological sciences. Ultimately, Benjamin's work during these decades was not widely diffused. Other than Spengler and, his un and unlike his colleague Tommy, he did not see other transvestite patients, nor did he succeed in widely popularizing Hirschfeld's, much less Steinach's, work. These decades would prove germane only later, at the end of the 1940s, when Kinsey introduced Benjamin to a young trans girl in San Francisco, who, with the support of her mother, was looking for access to sex reassignment surgery. The reason for turning to Benjamin first in this chapter is to underline a deferred continuity in the era before transsexuality to the post-war era. The early 20th century theory of the plasticity of sex, its eugenics racialization as alterable phenotype, and the German category transvestism were all preserved and carried forward into the category transsexuality by Benjamin, who, extremely long-lived, continued to practice medicine until 1979. The emergence of transsexuality in the mid-century was not the result of a major paradigm shift or technical advance in medicine, but actually took up multiple competing early 20th century concepts, dressing them in new terminology without being able to extinguish their terminal internal tensions. Benjamin will return in the chapters of this book that look at the 50s and 70s.
look at the 50s through the 70s. While his attempts to merge animal experiments in human medicine found limited success in this era, experimental research on children at the Johns Hopkins Hospital did translate the abstract plasticity of sex from experiments in endocrinology into clinical medical technique, yet, strangely enough, at first without hormones. Sex Reassignment Without Hormones The earliest cases of hermaphroditism seen at Brady Urological Institute of the John Hopkins Hospital established the basic protocol, followed for the next four decades for, for, for producing a binary sex out of the intersex body. Hugh Hampton Young, the surgeon in charge of the institute, always began with a head-to-toe physical exam, recording in great deal the appearance of the entire body and vital organs, with emphasis on the appearance of the genitals. Through external and internal palpitation, he attempted to ascertain the existence and position of any gonads, glands, and organs governing sex, including a phallus, clitoris, testes, and or ovaries, a prostate, uterus, and fallopian tubes, and or a vagina. The physical exam was usually followed by a cystoscopy, during which an instrument was introduced inside the front of the bladder to illuminate it and search for a vaginal cavity. Frequently, an x-ray would fall in an attempt to picture the rest of the inside of the abdomen. These initial procedures to map the external and internal sexual anatomy of the body were typically followed by an explanatory laparotomy. The rationale for the surgery was that it represented more or less cutting open the abdomen to look inside for a truth to sex. Young began his tenure at the Institute in a gonadocentric paradigm, according to which the presence of a testis or ovary was interpreted as the true ar- the arbiter of a true sex, regardless of the rest of the body or the patient's sense of self. The scopic regi- regime of surgical technique produced a truth by looking inside the body, and biopsed microanalysis of gonadal tissue was given great weight in Young's advice for sex reassignment. The Institute opened its doors in 1915. As Hopkins rapidly expanded in the early 1920th century, it was an integral part of the hospital's modernizing program for clinical research, experimental practice, and the training of medical professionals. Young helmed the Institute in an attempt to standardize the field of urology in the United States. It was responsible for popular, popularizing new techniques for picturing the inside of the body, such as a cystoscope, and for surgically altering internal and external anatomy under increasingly controlled and sanitary conditions. It also reflected the prevailing ethos of Hopkins as a medical institution that, as much as it was run on an ostensibly char- charitable mission to serve the poor, expected in return total access to those bodies particularly those of the local African-American population in East Baltimore. Research at Hopkins was often coercive and non-therapeutic as it was curative, and from the facility's opening rumors spread through the black community in Baltimore that warned of the danger of the night doctors and other medical men who would rob graves, kidnap people off the street, and treat black patients as disposable experimental objects rather than as persons. The Institute's eight floors were divided equally between wards for patients and a set of laboratories, clinical, pathological, chemical, bacteriological, physical, and experimental surgical. A machine shop on, instit- on site provided the ability to design and build new diagnostic and surgical instruments as needed for experimental procedures. A basement wing housed labs for experiments on animals. As a urological surgeon, Young directed the Institute to conduct clinical research, train medical students, and undertake experimental medicine on a massive range of conditions involving the urological anatomy. His work with the kidneys, prostate, adrenals, gonads, bladder, and genitals became the most well-known. The Institute's capacious understanding of internal medicine also meant that it saw many women, not just men, as patients. Children who were also frequent patients, especially for conditions involving sex, despite the existence of the pediatric Harriet Lane home at Hopkins. In fact, the Institute was the primary place that intersex children were admitted from the 1910s to the 1930s, because during these decades, the Harriet Lane home had neither an endocrine nor a psychiatric ward, 
In the 1920s, only two children at Harriet Lane were diagnosed with hermaphroditism, and both ended up being sent to the Brady Institute for consultation with Young, while in the 30s there were a mere four. The advent of synthetic hormones and the hiring of Lawson Wilkins to head pediatric endocrine research in the mid-30s eventually shifted admissions. In the 40s, the number of hermaphroditism admissions at Harriet Jane jumped fivefold, and in the 50s, the number had soared to 150. The difference has to do with the dominant medical techniques for altering sex in those two moments. Young employed a surgical urological model, while Wilkins preferred hormone therapies to be followed by surgery as a supplement. There was also sporadic involvement with Leo Kanner, the canonized child psychiatrist who reshaped much of his field in the United States from his position in the Harriet Lane home. This chapter focuses on this era without widely on the era without vi- widely available synthetic hormones from roughly 1915 to 1940. Well, the next chapter examines Wilkins' hormonal, field, hormonal work in detail. Young was not well-versed in endocrinology, relying on colleagues for advice. Yet from its opening, the Brady Institute began to see so-called hermaphrodites among its patients, making the endocrine system an important part of its clinical, clinical work. From 1915 to the 1950s, the Brady Institute recorded 139 admissions for hermaphroditism. Some admissions overlapped with Harriet Lane Home, so the total number of intersex patients at Hopkins is somewhat unclear, although it numbered in the hundreds. The vast majority were children. Young was not especially interested in providing a theoretical explanation of hermaphroditism. His focus was the medical production of binary sex. And while hermaphroditism and sex were only two areas that the Institute's work covered, Intersex bodies seemed to hold a particular fascination for him and his colleagues. This extended to making some patients submit to motion picture filming of their bodies, a rarity usually preserved for, reserved for operations. We have now numerous motion pictures in color of those patients who came in female dress, are discovered to be males, and undergo operations to transform their status so that they finally leave in masculine attire. Young wrote in 1940, with typical condensation, some of these strip teases are most amusing. Prior to the 1930s, at a time when synthetic hormones did not exist, Young practiced a certain flexibility with sex reassignment after laparotomy, unable to influence the plasticity of intersex children's bodies to a great extent. Particularly when patients were very young children, he often followed a sort of wait-and-see policy, letting them grow into puberty. At that time, Young would try and follow the lead of the patient's body, so to speak, suggesting plastic operations that conform to whatever sex seemed to him to have them become dominant. This was hardly a concession to the autonomy of the patient. Young, Young's was a highly developmental reading of the child's plasticity, and he intensely aestheticized the morphology of the body to match idealizations of masculinity and femininity. He developed a series of surgeries to strengthen out and lengthen the hypospadic penis, as well as to amputate the vagina in patients assigned as male, while standardizing clitoral amputation and vaginoplastics procedures for patients assigned as female. As the historian Allison Reddick argues, Young also felt perfectly justified in contradicting the dominant sex of children if their romantic and sexual desires might turn out to be homosexual. Sex reassignment was in many cases an attempt to medically produce and enforce heterosexuality. One of the Institute's very first patients in 1915 was a child named Robert Stone Street, who was diagnosed with hermaphroditism. Because his life was made a spectacle in the press years earlier, Stone Street's name is a matter of public record. For that same reason, however, 21st century federal privacy regulations governing health records also prevent disclosure of the contents of of his original medical file. I can only draw on information already published to narrate his time spent at Hopkins, despite the existence of an unredacted information in his medical records that might undermine Young's and his colleagues' published account. Still, even with that limitation, Stonefleet's life illustrates the way that Brady Institute's founding protocols for sex reassignment translated the library 
laboratory isolation of sex plasticity in animal life into practical medical technique. Where researchers like Riddle had found methods of altering the endocrine system in juvenile animals, affecting changes in their racial phenotype, <clears throat> Young began to assemble a set of techniques that could attempt the same in children's plastic bodies. In his memoir, Young describes a case that did not end happily to introduce Stone Street. A young, as Young remembers it, a boy was brought to us years ago for operation on account of his genital defect. Dr. William Quinby discovered that the patient was a girl and advised the father to allow him to carry out operations to make his child normal. Quimby, a surgeon at the Institute, eventually published an article on the case in the Bulletin of the John Hopkins Hospital. Like Young, Quimby was most interested in the possibility that the overactivity of the adrenal glands from fetal life on had resulted in the masculization of Stone Street's body, leading to his assignment as male at birth, despite his having female gonads. Stone Street had been raised without question as a boy for 10 years and unambiguously understood, understood himself to be a boy. Indeed, when Stone Streets brought their child to the Institute, the reason was hypospadias, a condition in which the tip of the penis is located on its underside, and undescended testicles, not hesitation over his sex. Young and Quimby undertook an external and internal physical exam, followed by radiographs, a urine test to establish kidney function, a syphilis test, a blood pressure test, and a blood count. Suspecting that the adrenal glands were involved, they also administered pharmacodynamic tests, injecting Stone Street with different doses of adrenaline and measuring the reaction of his blood pressure. Finding nothing of the ordinary, aside from the appearance of the genitals, they moved on to an expiratory laboratory, finding in an infertile fetus with tubes and ovaries of normal appearance. Young and Quimby were faced with a contradiction. According to the gonadocentric paradigm, the presence of ovaries would trigger a diagnosis of female pseudohermaphroditism and sex reassignment as a girl. The sex of an individual must always be determined by the nature of the gonads, regardless of the presence of abnormalities, either of parts of the genital system or the secondary sexual manifestations of the body as a whole, Quimby explains in his bulletin article. Consequently, he argued, this patient is of the female sex, and this is in spite of so many secondary sexual characteristics of the opposite male sex. Yet the masculine forms of evidence were numerous, including voice, the hair on the face, general bodily habituate, hab habitus, and the mental processes. In every way, biologically and physiologically, Stone Street appeared, felt, and expressed himself as a boy. His life seemed to openly defy the gonadocentric paradigm. Despite Quimby's confident assertion of the meaning of Stone Street's ovaries, it is evident, even in his published account, that gonadocentric that the gonadocentric paradigm had to be ignored in clinical practice, for too many intersex children exceeded its narrow definition of true binary sex. Quimby, therefore, had to look elsewhere and turn to endocrinology. The rest of his article attempts to translate that field's thesis on the plasticity of sex into urological practice. There has been of late years a rap there has been of late years a rapidly increasing amount of evidence, both experimental and clinical, tending to show that the proper development of those attributes which constitute the sex ensemble is dependent on normal activity of the endocrine system, though it is to be doubted that internal secretory processes play any role in the primary determination of sex of the gonad itself. It is certain that such processes are responsible for the normal, normal progress of events from a very early age. The present teaching is well stated by Barker when he says, We are simultaneously, in a sense, the beneficiaries and the victims of the chemical correlations of our endocrine systems. This is one of the earliest attempts to translate abstract endocrine research on the plasticity of sex and animals into a practical framework for human medicine. Quimby's bibliograph bibliographic citations in this paragraph 
are to works by German and French endocrinologists. His reference to hormonal processes that are responsible for the normal progress of events from a very early age indexes his adoption from them of the abstract metaphor of child development. A child's growth, defined as a developmental trajectory that unfolds from the fetal stages through puberty, was understood to be the material axis through which sex incrementally achieved recognizable bodily form. In other words, became a phenotype, out of an originally plastic potential for either sex. The ideal itinerary of the child was from plasticity, mixed sex, to a single sexed form, and the economy of internal secretions functioned to regulate that process in controlled stages. If most children were binary beneficiaries of these various chemical correlations during development, then, according to Quinby, Stone Street was one of the victims for whom growth had gone astray somehow. The plasticity of <clears throat> the plasticity of his sex had become receptive to a form that strayed from the normative developmental path. It had formed into a body that was masculine despite having female gonads. If the ovaries alone were not the guarantee guarantors of femininity, couldn't be suspected it was Stone Street's adrenal glands that had intervened at a develop, de developmental developmentally. If the ovaries alone were not the guarantors of femininity, Quinby suspected it was Stone Street's adrenal glands that had intervened at developmentally sensitive moment to form masculinity out of his body's plastic potential for sex. It will be recalled that the adrenal cortex is developed from the Wolfian ridge, Wolfian ridge, that is, from the same rudimentary tissue as the sex gland, he noted, turning to embryology. Clinical and pathological evidence demonstrates the remarkable effect that lesions of the adrenal cortex exert on various factors constituting sex, as well as the regulation of growth, nutrition, and especially the reproductive organs. The adrenal gonad relation was evidence of, of the way that sex and general development were intimately bound together, mixed in the timeline of a child's growth from plasticity into form. The functioning of adrenals, therefore, could have produced developmental effects in Stone Street's, Stone Street's plasticity, altering his sex from female to male. Since he was now approaching puberty, the developmental imperative to intervene had only grown stronger. The window for medically altering his plasticity was closing. Quinby's attempted translation of endocrine experiments into urological practice did not have the chance to move beyond theory, however. According to Young, when Quinby advised Stone Street's father that the patient was a girl, the, responses was, the response was that he had six girls and that this boy, although only ten, was a valuable worker on the farm. He refused to have another girl added to his family and departed. Young may have invented that explanation to render the refusal of diagnosis irrational, or perhaps it really did happen that way. The Stone Streets might have also recognized their child's self-identity as a boy as real, choosing to reject the medical model. Either way, they left Baltimore, although not before nude photographs were made of Robert's body for Young's and Quinby's research. In one of the photos, the ten-year-old's expression is painfully agitated as he tries to cover his chest with his hands, as if to resist being made an object and spectacle by the doctor and the camera's gaze. In a second photo, the doctors have forced him to put his hands at his side, exposing his entire body. Qu uh, Quimby published the photos in his bulletin article without comment. Twenty-one years later, Stone Street returned to the Brady Institute, now in his thirties. He had lived his whole life as a man and was engaged to marry a woman. Their priest, however, had refused to perform the ceremony because Stone Street's father had told him about the childhood hermaphrodite hermaphroditism diagnosis. Stone Street now demanded that Young provide medical proof that he was a man, not a woman. After careful study, I had to tell him, Young claims, that no mistake had been made. The two left in tears. Three days later, Young was summoned to the Institute. He found Robert there on his deathbed. An autopsy found that he had, co he had committed suicide by taking a lethal dose of mercury.
Young took advantage of his death to verify his theory of adrenal hyperplasia during the autopsy. A few years later, he published photographs of Stone Street's autopsied adrenal glands in his memoir. Jesus fucking Christ. Ending in suicide, Stone Street's experience testifies to the violent and often traumatic effects of medicalizing intersex children as living laboratories of plasticity. Even in circumstances where no medical sex reassignment took place, the obsessive production of binary sex frequently went against the personal feelings, lived experience, or family wishes of those subject to research in exchange for medical care. The protocol for determining and reassigning sex fundamentally relied on the plasticity of children's bodies for its biological footing. Even as it simultaneously disqualified their autonomy and self-knowledge as lacking scientific scientificity Scient scientificity it is not surprising then that pa patients and families were frequently critical of young's advice or refused to comply with his recommendations other times the costs of medical treatments were prohibitive leading families to leave before surgery could be performed or, an or unable to pay when bills arrived intersex children were also seen for years on end without closure often because plastic surgery operations fell short of Young's aesthetic and functional ideals, leading to painful complications like incontinence and the development of fistulae. Young also insisted that children return to the Institute annually for a physical exam in order to contribute to his research program. If that was not possible, he would sometimes correspond with their family physician for updates. When Young's diagnosis went contrary to a child's self-identity, or how the child had been raised, the labor of forcibly resocializing the child and parents was often tortured. The social work department at Hopkins might get involved, as well as social, local children's aid societies or religious charities, trying to strictly govern how families announce the new sex of their child and paying visits to their home to ensure compliance of the doctor's orders. These organizations also kept records on the bullying, ostracism, and trauma faced by some of these children at school. Social workers, social workers and charity workers spoke condescendingly of any resistance to the medical model from children, their family members, or the community, especially when it came from black residents of Baltimore. In many instances, black families in their communities in Baltimore were evidently kept accepting of intersex children to the point of being skeptical of the need to accept a medical decision in binary sex. In response, physicians and social workers tried to disqualify their beliefs as unscientific or irrational. And in the detached language of case files, there was little room for children to speak in their own voice. Every so often a chilling vignette, every so often a chilling indirect vignette appears in the case of a child who had been reassigned to a sex that contradicted their sense of self and who was referred to an ophthalmologist. The ophthalmologist found nothing wrong with their eyes and was then puzzled. The, rec the recorded complaint from the Brady Institute staff was that this child's eyes tear constantly. Apparently, the doctors could not even imagine that constant crying might have been a traumatic effect of their aggressive medical protocol. As Young saw more and more cases of intersex children, whose adrenal glands in particular had caused them to change sex, from female to male, his decision on whether to pursue sex reassignment began to crist crystallize, not around gonads but around age. Young began to attempt to reverse the masculinization of adrenal hyperplasia in younger children. The surgical procedure he developed involved an invasive in entrance through the back to avoid expose the adrenal glands. Using a clamp tool he had designed, Young was able to hold, back hold the back cavity and access both glands during long surgeries. In patients with hyperplasia, the adrenals grew massively large often to more than a dozen their times their typical size. At first, Young excised a portion of each adrenal, trying to return each of them to normal size. 
Later, he found it safer for the patient to instead remove one adrenal entirely and leave the other. The procedure yielded tepid success. Although the removal of one of the overreactive glands would result in a major decrease in the amount of adrenal androgens in the bloodstream that led to a masculinization. Young had to admit that this did not seem to necessarily stop, let alone reverse, childhood growth into masculinity. What's more, the surgery was risky, involving a difficult recovery that killed some children. Having performed a number of adrenalectomies in the 1920s and 30s without being, made, being able to definitively change the sex of his intersex patients from male to female, Young was, only able, was able only to effectively alter the appearance of the genitals. The intersex plasticity of the children at the Institute flatly refused to yield any more of its autonomy. In the mid 1930s, a toddler who had been assigned female at birth was brought to Baltimore from Pennsylvania for a second opinion on their genitalia. <clears throat> Young felt that at this age, the infant's body was too small for a proper cysto cystoscopy. <clears throat> he recommended waiting for the child to grow a few more years before continuing, until we know definitely the condition of the ovaries, he specified. I think no treatment is indicated. Should later examinations show fairly normal ovaries present, the operation to remove the enlarged clitoris and bring down the vagina to its proper position would be indicated. My recommendation is to do nothing at present and to encourage the parents to understand the situation is not serious and that it can be corrected at a proper time. Two years later, the family returned and Young felt he was observing a very unusually developed child. The phallus, in particular, is larger than before. Still, he felt this child was too small for a safe laparotomy and asked the parents to return again in another year. James Howard, who consulted with Young, suspected that this patient is one of adrenal hyperplasia and not a male. At the end of the 1930s, the laparotomy and plastic surgeries were finally carried out. Young amputated the clitoris slash phallus and performed a vaginoplasty, and he felt the operation was a perfect success, following the exact model, following exactly the model for sex reassignment as female outlined in his recently published textbook, Genital Abnormalities, Hermaphroditism, and Related Adrenal Diseases. Two years later, the family returned so that Young could make a definitive, definitive diagnosis of adrenal hyperplasia. This involved his bilateral exploratory surgery procedure. When he found two very large adrenals as predicted, he removed one. The recovery from surgery was extremely difficult. The child was constantly sick and the wounds became infected. Why did Young decide to put this child through the severe process of bilateral adrenal surgery when in other cases he simply left the adrenals alone? While it was true that the presence of ovaries and a uterus found during lapar laparotomy were a factor. This had not even been enough in many other cases, including Stone Streets. Young could not could have removed the ovaries and the uterus and performed plastic surgery to lengthen and straighten the phallus into a penis. Instead, he decided to amputate it and undertake a vaginoplasty. What made the difference? The child was very young, under 10 at the time of the adrenalectomy. This meant that the masculinization caused by the adrenals had not yet solidified during puberty. There remained a developmental window of opportunity to intervene in their plasticity and attempt to direct their phenotype towards its feminine form. At least that was Young's theory. Translating the alterability of plasticity from the abstract realm of endocrinology into an actual child's body proved quite difficult. The adrenalectomy alone, he knew, would not be enough to make the child's body normatively feminine, even with plastic surgeries on the genitals. By the time puberty arrived, the body would undergo an intense masculinization. A few months after the surgery, then, Young had this child return for a follow-up and to reconsider a prescription for Stilbestrol, a new synthetic estrogen. A six-week trial of daily doses, Young hoped would encourage breast development, Enlarge, enlargement of the internal genitalia, 
and may inc decrease masculinity. It is also intended, intended to depress the activity of the adrenal cortex. The patient's family doctor in New Jersey, where the family now lived, administered the hormones. Stilbestrol was a Stilbestrol was an extremely new hormone. Stilbestrol was an extremely new hormone. It had not yet even received an FDA approval, and it took some doing to get access to it from a new lab, from a lab in New Jersey. After six weeks had elapsed, Young and the family doctor decided to continue with the therapy. A few months later, the doctor reported there, there had been some visibly feminine development, but not much. Young recommended keeping the child on the hormone for the rest of their childhood. Even though this would induce at an early puberty, he felt it was better to preempt the inevitable masculine puberty caused by adrenal hyperplasia. The effects of this speculative therapy on the child's plasticity were, however, unpredictable. Severe back acne as well as rapid growth of breasts led to harsh criticism, criticism from the mother, who wrote to Young to complain. He then decided to stop the silbestrol and try another newly synthesized hormone, lutecilol, which he thought might suppress the production of adrenal androgens by inhibiting the pituitary hormone. When it did nothing at all, he abandoned the idea. Toward the end of the 1940s, as urine analysis were developed, it became possible to verify the precise degree of overactivity of the adrenals. By now, all of Young's attempts at sex reassignment had been resisted by this child's actual growth. He wrote to the patient's mother and suggested the family see Lawson Wilkins, the new head of pediatric endocrinology at Harriet Lane Home. As the next chapter explores, this shift in clinics represented a broader movement toward a hormonal paradigm that sharply redefined Young's role in altering children's sex. Although Young had adapted an endocrine perspective and had translated it into basic model for surgically altering children's sex, according to the relative plasticity of age, his approach was met with a great deal of resistance to in body, in the body to binary sex. Young's protocol banked on a naturally available plasticity in the growing body that would induce phenotypic changes during childhood growth. Yet sex, not, yet sex was not given by plasticity. It had to be grown. If it was plastic, then there was no guarantees that the, on, that the originally mixed character of an embryo or infant, infant would inevitably, inevitably reach a binary form. The instability was precisely what drew researchers to experiments on intersex bodies in the first place. For in displacing the gonadocentric paradigm that they cast serious doubt on whether humans were really sexually dimorphic, even as medically prom promised to capitalize on their plasticity to produce the binary. To resolve this instability, the plasticity of sex was coded in this clinical research as an abstracted form of whiteness, a latent capacity, capacity to be reformed and transformed into something new. That most of Young's intersex patients were white indexes has an abnormal body of a child diagnosed with hermaphroditism could be made valuable through its plasticity. The promise of alteration and normalization through medical intervention. That the few black inter intersex children and families who spent time at the Institute were regarded as its by its staff as more difficult, combative, irrational, and ultimately disposable points to the racialization of plasticity in this era. Young saw an abstract sense of alterability in white children, while he projected a fungibility onto black children that has a genealogy in American medicine stretching back to slavery. As was the case more broadly at Hopkins, doctors like Young regarded black children as suitable experimental subjects because of presumed access and disposability, whereas white children who were subject to similar procedures were framed as exhibiting the potential for normative, normative cure, or at least improved normative, normality. The movement in these decades from research on sex and animals to practicing on humans was also highly charged with racial significance. In a 1935 letter to Young about a black child diagnosed with hermaphroditism, Edwards A. Park, the head of Harriet Lane Home, enclosed two scientific articles about sex and evolution, which were meant to help Young with a paper he was writing. Park explained that one contains a complete review of the subject in different forms of life, 
while the other discusses the basics of basis of hermaphroditism in animals. From the picture of the patient, I ju judged that the condition which you'd found in the little colored girl has been duplicated in mammals. Park analogizes intersex embodiment in this black child to a form of primitive animality, imagining an evolutionary regression toward supposed visual equivalence between the black intersex body and the sex bodies of non-human mammals. He also sees in this black human body an equivalent to a laboratory experiment on animal sex, where the plasticity of white children's intersex bodies, in spite of being abnormal, was nevertheless valuable for its biological potentiality that medicine could cultivate. Black children's sex plasticity, plasticity was framed as atavistic. This differential between the abstract whiteness of plasticity and the visual regimes of race and anti-blackness that inflect inflected the clinical treatment of actual ch children is a central feature of the modern medicalization of sex, one whose changes over time this book follows across the rest of its chapters. As Hopkins became the principal American hospital for experiments on intersex children, by the 1930s it had to deal with the fact that the, world, that the word was spreading that young could change a person's sex. Soon the first recognizably trans patients came to the institute. Sexual Inversion and the First Trans Patients at Hopkins From the 1910s to the 1940s, a messy set of ambiguous diagnoses that included sexual perversion and sexual inversion and homosexuality was applied to a wide range of patient, patients at the Brady Institute for reasons that included sexual impotence in heterosexual men, lesbian and gay feelings, accusations of homosexuality, masturbation, and concerns about individuals that we can read as trans. The Harriet Lane home, by contrast, did not use any of these categories, so as there is no particularly visible as evidence that children who came through its doors might have been, might have wished, like Val, to live as a different, as a sex different from the one assigned at birth. Looking globally at the hundreds of cases of children diagnosed with herm hermaphroditism at Hopkins during the first half of the 20th century, it seems unlikely that any of them invite a strong trans reading. This is not to say there is no relation between the categories intersex and trans. On the, on the contrary, for many trans people, the idea of overlap was central to their request for transition and surgery until well into the 1950s and 60s. Many publicly trans figures in the United States and Europe used the language of intersex or endocrine abnormality to legitimize their transitions in the public eye as a question of medicine repairing mistakes made by nature. Despite that, physicians at Hopkins demonstrated a strong gatekeeping impulse to keep anyone lacking visibly abnormal physiology out of the orbit of intersex medicine and especially sex reassignment. Doctors employed the medical category of homosexuality, not hermaphroditism or transvestism, to frame trans life in a way that could justify rejecting requests for support. This was possible because of the tangled meaning of sexual inversion, the 19th century sexological progenitor of both homosexuality and transvestism. That being said, the prevailing use of homosexuality at Hopkins is best described as confused, in, in his 1937 textbook, Genital Abnormalities, Young pondered how some of his patients seemed to mix homosexu homosexuality and intersex conditions. Individuals, apparently not otherwise abnormal, occasionally assumed the entire mannerisms and habits of the opposite sex, he admitted. Some of these cases also become homosexual. The etiology is often obscure and may possibly be due to glandular and endocrine abnormal abnormalities as complex as the, those encountered in hermaphroditism. Jung's description of these individuals sounds quite a bit like Hirschfeld's definitions of transvestism, which blended sexual inversion and a vaguely intersex notion of some unknown glandular component. At the Institute, however, Jung called upon not sexology but psychiatry to adapt a vaguely Freudian model of inversion for trans people diagnosed as homosexual. Despite this psychological turn, Jung's small gesture toward the endocrine system held open the door to, to an overlap between intersex and transsex reassignment surgery. <laughs>
a detail that did not go unnoticed by trans people seeking medical support. The earliest diagnosis of trans inversion at the Institute was recorded in 1916 for an army officer complaining of sexual impotence. In the 1920s, there were a few scattered diagnoses, but Jung's interpretation of them was highly improvised. Endocrine medicine was an experimental moment defied by organotherapies that used living tissues from non-human animals or normal human bodies to try to influence the body's plasticity. In that context, although, in that context, how, although he was no by no means an expert, Jung came closest to integrating the insights he was generating around the intersex body into the possibility of altering the homosexual and trans body. One of these cases involved a child. In 1922, an important figure in national rabbinical organization arrived in Baltimore with his teenage son in tow, delivering him to the Institute. The father reported that his son's problem with masturbation had forced their trip to Hopkins, but Young's recorded diagnosis was perversion, homosexual type. Apparently, their stay was brief. The father left town on business. After being evaluated, the teenager was sent home to Virginia without any treatment. Not long afterward, Young received a letter from the hospital superintendent in Virginia who was very close to the family. Apparently, the superintendent who had been the one who referred them to Young. Possibly, I should have sent you to sent you the boy's history before he came to see you, he explains in the letter. For, upon to his return to the city, the father told me the only report you made was that the boy could get married, from which I judge you meant that he was free of syphilis or gonorrhea. <clears throat> The superintendent was convinced that you did that you do not know the exact state of affairs. It is quite possible that the boy did not tell you the whole truth and that you were misled, sick. In the actual in the real object of my sending him to you, the boy's history is as follows. According to the superintendent, about a month after the family sent their Chinese ch teenage child to a religious school in Ohio, the parents received a telegram of informing them that he had been expelled. The doctor, father, telephoned the head of the college and asked the reason for the telegram. The answer came, a very serious charge, and he would not be permitted to return. Since the father was struck on business in the Southwest at the time, the superintendent traveled to, in Ohio and his place to investigate, finding a most distressing state of affairs. To save himself from the reformatory, being under 21, I learned that he had to leave the city at once by request of the mother of the boy whom he had assaulted. The superintendent did not shy away from spelling out the content of that assault. Apparently the teenager had told the mother of his schoolmate that he was a homosexual. He told the president of the college that it was a disease with him and that his father knew it, which was, of course, untrue. What's more, he went on, since returning to the city, I have been told that this frightful practice has had been going on before he left Virginia. And these facts lead me to believe that he mentally he is a pathological type, possibly inheriting some glandular deficiency. Yet the superintendent also added that the boy is not the type that you would think homosexual, as he is fond of our outdoor sports, likes to be in the company of nice boys and girls, and is wonderfully kind to his invalid mother. He possesses a very lovable personality with all. While I find this episode interesting on its own, own terms as part of the history of queer sexuality, I am not arguing for reading this child as trans. Rather, the important detail is Young's reaction to the letter. After thanking the superintendent for putting an entirely different light on the case and agreeing that the problem is much more serious and difficult than originally thought, he conceded, I hardly know what to suggest. If his homosexual desire should continue, it might be well to try to transplant, to try transplantation of the testes from some normal individual who might die as a result of an accident. In a recent case, we might we obtain testings from a man who is hung in our penitentiary, and the transformation of the individual was remarkable. Young was exaggerating the remarkable effects of testicular transplant. Nevertheless, he was following the lead of other medical researchers in the 1920s, using incarcerated bodies for orga organotherapy experiments. <clears throat>
Young hopes that the replacement of supposedly abnormal testicles with normal ones, although it is not clear why Young is considered a criminal sentence to, to death normal, would result in a more virile, masculine endocrine system. Young did not end up pursuing this idea with a teenager from Virginia, but the fact that he could imagine hormonal organotherapy for cases of sexual inversion illustrates how the experimental environment of the 1920s harbored a short-lived mixing of intersex and inversion models. While the teenager from Virginia reads as gay, not trans, the categorical overlap between homosexuality and trans life in the early 20th century makes this case an important reference for Young's later trans patients, who took note of such possibilities. Organotherapy quickly fell out of fashion. When synthetic hormones became available, on the rare occasion that Young did not pres did prescribe hormones to patients diagnosed with sexual inversion, it was only to encourage a gender-normative heterosexual effect. When te testosterone therapy failed to do so, as it inevitably did, Young referred patients to Thomas Rennie, a resident psychiatrist at the Hopkins Phipps Clinic, who had similarly little success. As improvised attempts to hormonally treat inversion failed, Rennie's psychiatric, psychiatric model became the dominant lens through which the Brady Institute framed inversion. By the mid-1930s, psychological perspective seems to have totally won out over endocrine experiments. For instance, when Young and his colleague John Howard saw a gay man in his early 20s from Washington, D.C. in 1936, Howard expressed a confident consensus. My impression is that so far as endocrine abnormalities of secretion are concerned, they probably do not exist, he wrote in his case notes, and that the disorder is entirely a psychological one. Therefore, my impression is that so far as endocrine abnormalities of secretion are concerned, they probably do not he exist, he wrote in his case notes, and th that the disorder is entirely a psychological one. Therefore, it does not seem to me that there would be any benefit from the possible use of andro androsterone or other endocrine pro products. This swing in the pendulum over 10 years from organic endocrine hypothesis to, psycho to a psychological one, however, brought little efficacy to the clinician's toolkit. The psychiatric approach was weakest in the face of trans patients who, fluent in the idioms of intersex and endocrine plasticity, sought out young, hoping to undergo sex reassignment, rather than be cured. In 1938, Bernard, a textile worker in his late 20s, journeyed from Alabama to Baltimore, claiming vaguely of a congenital malformation. Performing a physical exam on Bernard, who was assigned female at birth, but identified as a man, Young recorded an enlarged phallus and that he had sexual relations with one woman, and his definite gratification and sexual desires have always been towards the female sex. What's more, patient has always been jealous of her sick brothers because they are boys. She feels the phallus is bound down, i.e. hyperspadiac, an intersex condition. She believes she urinates through the phallus. She has felt definite mass of, or testicle and right groin. Patient's voice changed at an early age. She shaves once a week and definitely wants to be a man. Bernard, in other words, was hardly the case of a homosexual, hardly the typical case of homosexuality, c claiming what looked mo much more like intersex embodiment. When Young consulted his colleague in endocrinology, Samuel Vest, for a second opinion, however, Vest put a great deal of pressure on Bernard's intersex narrative. I think the patient is deluding herself concerning the growth of hair, he argued. Glitters is of a normal size and appearance, as are both labia, he added, questioning Young's evaluation. No palpable masses in inguinal area, urethral and vaginal orifice is normal. While Bernard had presented himself using a legibly intersex narrative, implying that he might have been mistakenly assigned a female assigned as female at birth and apparently convincing Young, Beth felt that this some kind of front. I believe this case is entirely mental uh, and homosexual, he concluded. She has a very typical mannish haircut, wears a stiff man shirt with tie, etc. Vest was probably not aware of the details 
of how Bernard found his way to Baltimore. Young had received a letter from him concerning what is to me a most vital, a most vital subject. I have been reading recently of sex changing operations such as Mark Weston case in England and others. I wrote to Dr. David H. Keller, editor of Sexology Magazine, and his reply that you were the foremost authority on the subject reached me today. Bernard explained that I have always liked boyish things such as games, books, and clothes. I wear my hair cut short and tailored clothes all the time. I feel much more at ease in men's clothes than in women's. Putting his main question to Young, he mixed the endocrine language of hermaphroditism, inversion, and the plasticity of sex rather than a psychological theory of homosexuality. As I understand it, a person may have secondary sexual organs, which control his mental and emotional life, while the primary organs of, are of the opposite sex. What I want to know is, can these secondary organs really be developed in a way, such a way that a person who has been known as a female becomes a male? I know that sex books say that no one is really 100% of either sex. If this can be done, I would like to know about what it, the cost would be and the time required. I have read that most of these operations are yet in the experimental stage, but I am perfectly willing to become part of the experiment. To conclude, he clarified, I hope that this letter does not seem too foolish to you and that you will not regard it as mere whim. I think that you can understand I need help badly, and if it can be maintained in this country that you can give it. Young replied by asking him to come to Hopkins for an appointment. The letter cuts out a fascinating line through a, what, the web of hermaphroditism, sexual inversion, homosexuality, and transvestism. Presenting himself as intersex, Bernard comes across a, as a well-read on the theory of natural bisexuality and expertly deploys it to, legitimate, to legitimize sex reassignment. Although it seems that he had no actual endocrine or physiological evidence of being intersex beyond a phenomenological feeling, he made a strong connection between news reports of sex-changing operations happening across the Atlantic and young surgical experiments on intersex children at Hopkins, sex Sexology magazine, like many other popular sources of scientific information on sex in the 30s, would have been a productive relay point between the trans reading public and institutional medicine, reaching as remote a location as a small town Alabama. Hoping for medical support in this country, Bernard may have reasoned that using the language of an intersex condition would be the best way to get Young's attention. Hence, his claim to have undergone an organic voice change to need to shave regularly, and to feel a potential testicle in his adam abdomen may have been part of a strategy. Or he may have really believed himself to be intersex and felt those things about his body to be true. There is no way to be sure. Regardless, the effect is clear. He succeeded in getting Young's attention. After two physical exams, Young decided to refer Bernard to Rennie. In his report, evidently overwhelmed, Rennie took the opportunity for a long attempt at theorizing, in the absence of a concept of transsexuality or even transvestism, what Bernard's claims about his sex might mean. Using the only frameworks he could muster, Rennie assembled a, a roughshod melange of Freudian psychology and endocrine theories of plasticity, all the while trying to drive a hard wedge between them and to recuperate Bernard into the archetype of homosexuality. The resulting document is a fascinating look into the confounded state American medicine had created for itself. Given the stubborn resistance of psychiatrists and physicians to accepting a patient's embodied self-knowledge as meaningful, Rennie could only attempt to aggressively theorize his way through Bernard's life. Rennie began, began by characterizing Bernard in terms that read as legibly trans rather than lesbian, and by adding an important detail to his biography. Bernard has come to John Hopkins because she feels that she is really a man in spite of her female body build. Rene explained, and because she wish wishes to have an operation to give her male organs, she says she must have done because she has been in love with a young lady in her hometown for the past five years and now wishes to marry her. In recounting his biography, Rennie noted that Bernard was of Dutch and also native Indian extraction, 
although he attributed no particular meaning to either. He went on to confirm a long-standing wish to be a boy, one that stretched back to early childhood. When she was told told as a child that she would could turn into a boy by kissing her elbow, for example, she remembered doing it hundreds of times. Rennie noted also that he liked to wear her younger brother's overalls and trousers as a child, and her parents never objected. Bernard's father was a physician, and he states with evident pleasure that she looks exactly like her father, that she has, pic she has pictures taken of herself wearing his clothes, and that people are always fooled by these pictures into thinking it is of her father. Like his father, Bernard once hoped that she would be able to study medicine, but it was not possible. Rennie corroborated that he always had the feeling as a little child that she must have male sex parts somewhere inside, and said she often gets the sensation to this day that she must have a male organ concealed somewhere inside. In one of the rare moments that she quoted Bernard directly, Rennie wrote, For years a patient states, I have thought I was the only person in the world like that, and have only lately heard that there are people with the same feelings. As for Bernard's explanation of trans embodiment, Rennie reported that he feels that she must be a peculiar biological mixture and suggests that since twins run in her family, she might have intended originally to have been a pair of mixed twins, but that somehow both sexes have been combined in her. Wow. This was not an entirely idiosyncratic theory. The, this feeling is reinforced by some popular scientific reading she indulged in. Rennie explained. She was probably referring to the biologist Frank R. Lilly's paradigm-shattering 1916 study on free Martin cows, a condition in which a specific fetal endocrine situation in a cow pregnant with opposite-sex twins causes the female and the pair to masculinize the circulatory influence of androgens from the male twin. The study had been incredibly consequential in reshaping endocrine theories of the plasticity of sex, for it suggested, much as the patient did about himself, that biological organisms could be female in some ways and yet be masculized enough to change their sex. Lily's work was widely, was widely read outside professional medicine, and it is easy to imagine Bernard accessing it in Alabama through something like Sexology magazine. Rennie, of course, did not subscribe in the least to this theory, Yet neither did he make any prescription for trying to cure this case of homosexuality because of the fact that the patient wanted to return home at once and because she was not interested at all in any psychotherapy, but merely in the matter of surgical intervention. He explained that not much could be undertaken. It was merely suggested to the patient that in view of her own history, there might have been strong psychological influences, which led her to wish to be a man. Bernard left for Alabama never to return to the Brady Institute. Rennie, however, continued rambling for several more pages in his report to Young, scrambling for an expert opinion. There are many conflicting theories for the origins of a condition like this, he noted, although he again failed to name what, precisely, that condition was, if not textbook homosexuality. One stresses the constitutional ingrained aspect of the problem. Another is a psychogenic origins based on various types of life experience, reflecting on how the tendency has been present from earliest life. For Bernard, he wagered that we are perhaps more justified in speaking of a constitutional type. Rennie was, as a psychiatrist, quite skeptical of endocrine bases for inversion. As with hormonal status, where we find both male and female sex hormones in every individual, there are those who claim that every position has a homo and heterosexual component in the makeup. He observed, and that the difference depends upon the balance of the two components. Unconvinced, Rennie believes that the presence of estrogen and testosterone in varying degrees might correspond instead to the difference between an active homosexual type and a passive, more feminine type. He added, moreover, that the homosexual is often immature and infant infantile looking. Here, inversion was translated into a developmental condition. The psychoanalyst sketched the development of mature sexuality as follows. The infantile phase is one of curiosity and manipulation, essentially hedonistic and self-gratification. 
There is then a latent phase, beginning around 5 or 6, extending to the age of 10, 11, or 12, puberty, when the average child shows little or no interest in girls. With a prepubertal phase, he is strongly homosexual, and that is the period when the young girls get crushes on each other and boys gang together, having no interest in girls. With adolescence, there comes a burst of heterosexual interest and a slow maturing of adult pattern. Homosexuality, therefore, in some cases, is the failure to develop beyond a certain phase. Thus, it will be seen that in early adolescence, homosexuality is not so serious and is certainly a fairly common causal experience in boys' schools, etc. Rennie's reliance on a Freudian model that takes a male child as a universal reads as the sloppy considering that Bernard was raised as a girl. But the passage executes the key maneuver of making inversion the failure to develop beyond a certain phase, much like the reigning fairy of hermaphroditism. Much like the reigning fairy of hermaphroditism. It is a, the plasticity of sexual development that underwrites both the normal outcome of, sexual, of childhood heterosexuality and its abnormal arrested version, homosexuality. This line of thinking clarifies why the Harriet Lane home did not diagnose children with sexual perversions, inversions, or homosexuality, and why Hopkins kept intersex children as separate as possible from homosexual or trans cases of inversion. If children were naturally inverted to some degrees during childhood, then there was little reason to assign them diagnoses like homosexuality that were understood to be meaningful only insofar as they indicated arrest. Inversion, in other words, was, was significant only in adults. In children, it was not yet pathological. One of the consequences of this development, developmental model is that trans children who might have passed through Hopkins would not have been very visible within the epistemology of inversion. This expansive review of the medical literature spanning hermaphroditism, inversion, and homosexuality notwithstanding, Rennie ended his report as deprived of an object as when he began. In our patients, he emphasized, the tendency is fixed and probably unmodifiable. Bernard's rich account of himself and his biological body dissolved in the hands of a psychiatrist who could not fit him into the American medical model that separated intersex from inverted life. Yet by spending so much time redirecting an obvious request for sex reassignment and transition into the psychoanalytic framework of arrested homosexual development, Rennie produced an effective justification for refusing Bernard's request to change his sex. Indeed, the deployment of homosexuality in this case and the practice ignorance of the staff of Hopkins over the concept of transvestism, were powerful forms of gatekeeping. I read this case as evidence of how American medical science produced for itself an advantageous state of ignorance. A trans man from small town Alabama, who had some college education and was employed as a textile worker, produced a far more sophisticated theory of trans life and the feasibility of transition than anyone at Hopkins wanted to imagine. Bernard's self-taught expertise was precisely the reason for which he was disqualified from the medical support he requested. During the same period that Bernard visited the Institute, Karen, a trans woman in her mid-thirties, made the trip to Baltimore from Michigan. Young coded her through the category of homosexuality too, noting that the patient comes for advice and possible correction of his tendency to seek satisfaction sexually with members of his own sex, which has been present for as long as he can remember. Wary of any sick diagnostic overlap with hermaphroditism, he added that, to the best of his knowledge, he has no physical deformity sexually, but has noticed female fat distribution and small hands. When Dr. Drew, a Hopkins psychiatrist, was brought in for con a consultation, he likewise paid the most attention to her sexual history, recording it in great detail. But Drew also recorded that her real desire is to have his external organs altered to match its personality and permit normal relationships with a loved one. Rather than being a homosexual man, Karen classifies himself as a male physically with female passive personality. <clears throat> in Michigan, she had owned a small business and 
and later taught music, but is not doing anything now, in the middle of the Great Depression. For reasons that are not recorded, Karen left after these initial exams, but returned to the Institute two years later, when John Howard examined her. In this report, Howard noticed that she is quite concerned about the social and moral stigma of his chief complaint. However, he feels that this tendency developed naturally in him about 20 years ago and, except for the worry attached, he has no desire to change his status. He thinks psychiatrists would also, would, could do him no good. He came here hoping that Dr. Young could perform an operation on him. Howard agreed with her psychi psychiatric treatment would be irrelevant. Whether or not alterations of circulating sex hormones are present in homosexual individuals, he continued, is so far as I am aware, still at an unknown point. We could do determination of a male and female ho sex hormones, if Dr. Young feels this is indicated. It would be a far cry, but perhaps worth trying to see how testosterone might influence his patient. Howard's suggestion that they explore hormonal treatment found no audience. As was the case of Bernard, Young ignored the possibility. Karen left Baltimore after her second exam. Considering that a request for surgery was rejected, we can imagine why she did not return. The Archive of Early 20th Century Trans Childhood While some trans adults who were well-versed in medicine, like Bernard and Karen, personally sought out Young, embodying the overlap between intersex and trans embodiment, physicians and psychiatrists consistently refused to take the request seriously, pushing them into a model of homosexuality that obviously did not fit. Where does this leave the question that opens this chapter? What case can be made for a distinctly trans early 20th century, before the category of transsexuality? If we rely on, medical archive li on a medical archive limited by the partial perspectives of its categories and our retrospective investments in them, Bernard and Karen, like Alan Hart, had to travel under the medical sign of homosexuality but stood apart from its growing psychological framing, grounding their self-account of sex in a plastic narrative that borrowed extensively from the medicalization of intersex children. Each of them had the means to inform themselves about the medical models and technique and to seek out leading clinicians in the United States. But what about trans children from this era? Given that inversion, like intersex conditions, was defined in increasingly developmental terms, it was easy for Young and his colleagues, including Rene, Rennie, to imagine that trans life was meaningful only in adults. Children's bodies held a different sort of value to them as indeterminate, unfinished, and plastic. And the line between normative and abnormal growth needed to remain blurry to float their experimental agendas. It seems likely that most children who understood themselves in terms that we might read as trans did not interact nearly as much as adults with medicine. As in the case of Val, evidence for trans child in the childhood in the early 20th century remains mostly implicit or retrospective. Although the records of the Brady Institute do include the diagnostic category transvestism, its use was both belated and brief. John Money likely brought it with him to Hopkins, where in the early 1950s he took over research on intersex children. The earliest records date from around 1953 and 1954, but only a mere eight patients were ever given this diagnosis. Overlapping with Christine Jorgensen's media storm and the moment in which Harry Benjamin published his first articles on transsexualism, these trans men and women were able to get much closer to obtaining hormones and surgery in the United States than anyone before them. Half of them continued on in Hopkins Gender Clinic that money would go on to co-found in 1965. By then, the term transsexuality and its various co cognates had come into widespread usage, supplanting transvestism. A few of them also described their childhoods. A few of them also described their childhoods. By far the oldest was a retired trans woman from Ohio, who was interviewed by John Money in 1954 and who recounted her early childhood in the 1890s. One but a few years old, she explained, in order to establish the longevity of her knowledge that she was a woman, I wanted a, a doll and a doll buggy very much and enjoyed it. 
Although she had not found the social possibility to live full-time as a woman until her retirement. Wow. In 1959, a trans man in his mid-30s contacted the Brady Institute from his home in New York, wondering if it would be possible for me to enter your hospital for a complete medical examination. I have read several times of the work done at this hospital to help persons who appear to be male or female, but feel like a member of the opposite sex. When he arrived in Baltimore and visited the Institute, the urologist W. W. Scott recorded the in initial confusion of the staff because this man had, had been accepted for admission to Brady because of a breast abscess and in the belief that there was a problem of hermaphroditism. Actually, the patient was recognized by the admitting doctor as a transvestite. It turned out that the breast abscess was probably a strategic complaint. When the psychologist John H Hampson interviewed the man, he noted that he had hoped a penis might be fashioned through some miracle of plastic surgery, but most of all considered that her sick emotional burden would be eased if her large pendulous breast could be removed. In fantasy, she had come to Hopkins hoping her breast abscess might provide an acceptable surgical rationale for breast amputation. Hampson's interview also recorded a partial account of this trans man's childhood in rural New York. In the late 1930s, he left school because of the excruciating sense of embarrassment at being obliged to wear girls' clothes. Scott's case notes add a more complete picture. At age 13, he dropped out of school but also began working in his family's lumber business and has dressed as a man since then. Without interruption, Patient's father, the report continues, was disappointed that she was female and was always proud that he had a daughter who could work so hard. The patient has dated girls, and several have begun to hint at marriage. At that point, he explains his condition of biological female, but feelings of a man. It seems that this trans man had lived his teenage years in the 1930s and 1940s as a boy, with at least the tacit support of his family, working in a male-dominated profession. And without much difficulty in a rural town, he did not seek out medicine until much later. In the 1950s, when trans transsexuality had become a highly visible object to the American public. A trans woman in her, in her 30s, referred by a doctor in New York in 1959, told Hopkins plastic surgeon Milton Edgerton of an experience with med medicalization during her childhood in the early 1940s. Although she had felt herself to be a girl since a very young age, her family was not very tolerant. There was some argument on the part of the father and the mother, Edgerton surmised, having dropped out of school at the ninth grade level. As soon as she returned 18, she decided to leave home and began living full-time as a woman, building a well-paying career as a professional dancer in the Midwest and Northeast. Not long before leaving home at age 17, she had been to see a local doctor in her Missouri town. This doctor apparently found a large portion of circulating female hormone, and it was his idea that an exploratory operation should be performed in order to determine whether or not ovarian tissue was present. Presented with this medical opinion, a good bit of correspondence was carried out with the parents at the time, but the operation was not carried out because the patient's father felt the doctor did not know what he was talking about. These two patients are called living openly as a trans boy and a trans girl in rural spaces from their teenage years on. In the 1930s and 1940s, and this they share a similarity with Val, whose children opened the chapter, they found livable ways to grow up as trans children without needing a sexological category like transvestism or requiring any particular medical discourse to set the terms of their lives. Interesting, is Interestingly, however, both also interacted with intersex discourse to a degree that strongly undermines the gatekeeping logic that doctors at Hopkins tried to impose during those decades. <clears throat> the trans man from New York who had lived publicly as a boy since age 13 took on the language of the intersex body to seek out top surgery and possibly bottom surgery, while the trans girl in Missouri was framed by a doctor through intersex language at 17. What these brief pieces of evidence point to is how the trans child and the intersex child traveled together in the early 20th century. Despite the ostensibly discursive separation of hermaphroditism from sexual inversion, 
homosexuality and transvestism, in reality, there was an informal understanding on the part of the trans children, adults, and some doctors that there was reason to see trans life in at least partially intersex terms. As the thesis of plasticity of sex migrated from the endocrine experiments in animals to medical technique at hospitals and clinics, it knit the fate of intersex and trans children together in a way that became a major point of tension between medical gatekeepers and laypersons. On the one hand, the measurable plasticity of intersex bodies provided proof that it was possible for someone's sense of self to differ entirely from their body's morphology. In a moment where there was no dominant medical explanation for trans life in the United States, hermaphroditism offered a compelling source of, source of information on inversion and transvestism to medical professionals and lay people alike. To be clear, then, I'm not arguing that trans people in this era were actually intersex or even perceived themselves to be truly intersex. The development of, protocol, of a protocol for altering the plastic sex of intersex infants and children rather serves as proof to interested trans people that they, too, might change their sex. The growing collision of these concerns from the 1910s to the 1940s led to the situation in which Young and his colleagues tried to keep trans and intersex patients separate in the face of their demand for medical support. Given this overlap and ambiguous terrain, what is the stakes of claiming a specifically trans early 20th century for children? Does the fact it was intersex children whose bodies were largely medicalized, while trans bodies were intentionally misrecognized as homosexual, not weak in the case? My argue it, argument is slightly different and follows the historiographical lead of Emma Heaney's rereading of trans feminine life in the early 20th century in The New Woman. This chapter serves not just to provide sorely needed detail of our understanding of the first hour of the first four decades of the trans 20th century, but also to undermine any over-reliance on the mid-century parameters of transsexuality to direct historiography. The issue is that is not that the 1950s are not important, but that the decade has accrued too much causal force in trans historiography. In Testo Junkie, for example, Paul B. Preciado frames his concept of pharmacopornographic mode of biopolitics through an impressive litany of transsexuality collected at the end of World War II. John Money coined the term gender and famously affirmed that it is possible, using surgical, endocrinological, and cultural techniques, to change the gender of any baby up to 18 months. Harold Gillies was performing the first foul plastic surgeries in the UK, including work on Michael Dillon, the first female-to-male transsexual to have taken testosterone. US soldier George D. Jorgensen was transformed into Christine, the first transsexual person discussed widely in the popular press. And Harry Benjamin syst systematized the clinical use of hormone molecules in the treatment of sex change and defied transsexualism a term first introduced in 1954 as a curable condition. Preciado is right that the Cold War military, scientific, political, and capitalist milieu of state and medical biopolitics resulted in new diffusions of techniques for making sexuality of the sex body productive, and to that extent transsexuality was an artifact of that mid-century moment. And this book will return to that era, too. too. Yet, beginning with World War II and its aftermath, overlooks that sex reassignment was practiced long before the concept of gender existed. The phalloplasties were performed by surgeons like Young before Gillies, the Jorgensen was not the first celebrity to transfigure, and the Benjamin's work with trans people had begun three decades earlier, in the 1920s. Perhaps more important, framing the 20th century through the first time of transsexuality can reinforce an implicit techno-determinism perhaps most infamously infamously demonstrated in Bernice Hausman's dehumanizing argument in Changing Sex that medical discourse somehow literally produced trans subjectivity. Although Hausman's work has been roundly criticized, critiqued, the underlying problem of drawing on the authority and rationality of the medical archive to narrate the past is not so easily overcome. Writing the history of transsexuality is inherently risky for the ways it can serve to reinforce the category's colonizing form rather than undermine it. A different way to understand both the fragmentary ephemeral quality of those trans childhoods 
lived at a great distance from medicine, and their overlap with intersex discourse is to insist that trans childhood or children's transness has no ontological reliance on medicine at all for defi de definition. The trans child before transsexuality, then, offers no grand narrative to supplant a history of transsexual sexuality that begins in the 1950s, nor should it. Rather, this chapter's archival detail, its long parsing of an entangled field of inversion, hermaphroditism, homosexuality, and transvestism, means to undo the stubborn presumption that modern medicine played a causal role in defining the parameters of trans life. It did not. Trans life evidently pre-existed any early 20th century medical discourse that could claim to know it. Trans children and adults in this era lived at fairly wide distance from doctors, but this distance was not a product of a lack of knowledge or a language to describe themselves. This considering that the archive records a boy records a boy living out his teenage years in a lumber mill in New York, a girl in Missouri moving out on her own at 18, and a girl attending elementary school in rural Wisconsin. None of these children began living a trans life after encountering medicine. On the contrary, medicine was significantly challenged by its, its encounters with them. Rather than looking for a specific trans childhood in the early 20th century, then, it is better to say that there were multiple trans childhoods in play in this era. <laughs> that the definition of transness characterizing children takes a range of differing and competing forms without any discursive resolution. While this may feel like shaky ground to stand on historiographically or even a dilution of the meaning of transness, those feelings are actually retrospective ideological effects of the medical model of transsexuality, which has worked so hard to confine trans life to a singular binary driven definition. Our inability to grasp exactly what the trans childhood of a teenage boy in New York, a teenage girl in Missouri, or a young girl in rural Wisconsin might be distilled into is not an epistemological problem if we recognize that there is an opacity to transness in its multiple and, especially, non-medical forms. It becomes a problem only when trans historiography concedes to a limiting medical model that was not even in play in this era. When trans children did interact with doctors prior to the 1950s, their embodied plasticity was hardly domesticated by the medical model. Instead, the informal mixing of intersex and inversion models in their lived experience threatened to disrupt the very architecture of the sex binary. If all children were naturally intersex or inverted to a certain degree, as doctors and psychiatrists at Hopkins had begun to speculate, then the rationality of binary sex itself was put into question. Perhaps trans childhood and trans life were important, but not pathological or even exceptional forms of humanity. This looming epistemological crisis of sex was acute enough as the mid-century approached that it would motivate two of the psychologists who conducted interviews with trans people at Hopkins in the 1950s, John Money and John Hampton, to craft a new category of embodiment in psychology called gender that, they hoped, might finally achieve a level of control over plasticity, cementing the sex binary once and for all. The inevitable failure and widespread impact of that project, to which I turn next, is largely responsible for the ways in which we have failed to see the richness of trans life and trans childhood in the early 20th century. Chapter 3. Sex and Crisis. Intersex Children in the 1950s and the Invention of Gender. By 1950, sex was in crisis. After a half-century of research on its plasticity in the life sciences and clinical sex reassignment of intersex children, both biology and medicine had worked themselves into the position of being perilously close to lacking a rationale for the sex binary altogether. When trans people began to seek out doctors like Hugh Hampton Young in the 1930s, hoping to change their sex, the intersex narratives they presented to enhance their medical requests may have been rebuffed, but they were hardly received as groundless. Sex had become an unwieldy biological category 
now composed of genotype, gonads, hormones, genitals, internal organs, secondary anatomical features, and psychology, with none of them exerting what amounted to a deterministic influence. If human sex naturally started out life in infancy, and childhood is indeterminate, harboring the potential for both masculine and feminine growth, then it was quite plausible that the plasticity medical science had come to operationalize and the service of producing and reassigning sex under a binary model might endorse the opposite conclusion. It increasingly seemed plausible that human life might not be binary, that intersex and trans embodiment were but two facets of life's natural variation. While scientists and physicians, while short of actually promoting that viewpoint, they were certainly anxious that it was becoming an irre irrefutable interpretation of their work. It was under the backdrop of this looming epistemological crisis that John Money, a doctoral student in psychology at Harvard University, visited the Judge Baker Guidance Center at the university's Children's Hospital in the late 1940s. During the visit, which Money's graduate seminar had undertaken in order to meet with some of the intersex children on the ward, he and his peers encountered a teenager who, raised a boy from birth, had grown increasingly feminine during childhood and now, during puberty, passed as a girl. Many years later, Money suspected in retrospect that the child likely experienced a form of androgen insensitivity syndrome, which left their body unable to make use of the androgen use of, make use of the androgen the endocrine system produced. As a result, from the fetal stage through childhood and puberty, their body's plasticity would have grown into an increasingly feminine form, dramatically transforming sex. At the end of the 40s, such a diagnostic framework did not exist. However, Money was instead struck by the child's living contradiction of reigning endocrinology and psychology. and the gonadocentric paradigm of the moment, doctors conventionally assigned a body with testes as male, but nothing else about this child's body seemed masculine. Since the parents had been advised by doctors at birth to raise their child as a boy, there was a second psychological complication that caught Money's attention. Independently, independently of this hormonally feminized body, he felt from observation that her mind is masculinized. The intersex body of the child incorporated a growing paradox of sex, caught between hormones and psychology. A gonadal definition male, this child nevertheless appeared morphologically and hormonally a girl, and yet also felt psychologically more of a boy. The doctors at the Baker Center were unable to settle on a medical sex assignment. Money left the hospital intending to write a term paper that would challenge the Freudian theory of sexual differentiation through the intersex body. This unnamed child was one catalyst for the subsequent invention of a new category of sex life that we now call gender. Although gender has come to be associated with cultural malleability in feminist political projects, as far as, as far as its conditions of emergence are concerned, it is better described as a medical device mobilized to face the potential conceptual collapse of binary sex. As Jennifer German explains, feminists in the 1970s who popularized, popularized the term gender outside medicine turned to, work, to, turned to the work of sexologists, psychologists, and psychiatrists, especially Money and his colleague Robert Stoller, to leverage the category against patriarchal definitions of sex as biologically determined. Yet at the same time, as she points out, it has become something of a received wisdom that gender was the invention of feminism. In reality, however, even the analytic separation of sex and gender was actually a product of Stoller's work in the 1960s. For Money and Stoller, of course, the distinction between sex and gender was never meant to undermine sex or advance feminist projects. On the contrary, the concept of gender was meant to save the sex binary from imminent collapse by offering a new developmental justification for coercive and normalizing medical intervention into intersex children's bodies. Gender would make non-binary morphology into underdevelopment, allowing medicine to claim that sex assignment was merely its normal completion. Yet from the 1970s on, feminists and, later, queer and trans projects seem to have increasingly lost sight of the conservative historical context of gender's invention. Work at the Crossroads of Trans and Intersex Studies by Sharon E. Preves, David A. Rubin, Jemima Repo, and Paul B. Preciado had only recently begun to revisit the significance of gender's historicity 
and to re revise its misattribution to politically progressive projects. While the impact of gender on human embodiment, psychology, and subjectivity is monumental, it also has a particularly important place in the history of transgender children, which is why it figures so prominently in this book. Although the overlap of intersex and trans life has proven productive in the early 20th century, the increasingly aggressive gatekeeping of clinicians had by the 1950s more or less extinguished the avenue of access to medicine. What changed at the time is that money's protocol for assigning a gender to intersex children laid the immediate foundation of the Protocols for American Transsexual Medicine, which was, which was part emerging and finally beginning to catch up to its European counterparts. The consolidation of hormonal, psychological, and surgical standards for transition and changes to the sex of intersex children were transposed to the new medical category of transsexuality. Even as, as it abandoned the older sense that trans embodiment might have some sort of intersex basis, even though trans children do not explicitly surface in this chapter, then the invention of gender was a signal event that set the context in which the trans children and the rest of this book engaged with medicine. Given the contemporary stakes for trans children in defining what counts as gender, moreover, a return to the category's emergence is an important part of contextualizing present-day pediatric endocrinology and its critics. Both sides tend to rely on an implicit reading of money's work. Although the conservative import of gender has been forgotten in certain ways since the 1970s, money's historiographical role in its invention has at the same time been given far too much weight. Picking up where the previous chapter ended, at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in the 1940s, I claim that we should locate the emergence of gender in work with intersex children of adrenal conditions before money arrived at Hopkins. This chapter underlines the connection of the 1950s to the early 20th century work of Hugh Hampton Young at the Brady Institute and focuses on the endocrine clinic run by Lawson Wilkins at the Harriet Lane Home for Children. More important than the earliness of gender's emergence, however, is my argument that the clinical medicalization of intersex children in the 1940s and 50s shows how the concept of gender was able to stabilize the crisis in the concept of binary sex by promulgating a developmental framework that made gender identity the endpoint of a teleology of growth out of plasticity. At the same time, the clinical history shows that the actual plastic bodies of intersex children constantly undermine the fiction of that temporal order. In other words, the discursive uptake of intersex plasticity into the concept of gender as a racialized discourse of malleability became haunted in clinical practice by the embodied plasticity of children. Although I insist heuristically in this chapter, then, on the gap between the discourse of plasticity and the actual embodied plasticity of the children seen at Hopkins, my argument is that the indissociability of discourse about plasticity from bodies from the body's material plasticity is precisely the problem that gender's emergence marks. While gender may have redefined the terrain of sexed embodiment, signaling the close of an early 20th century era in which trans and intersex life were entangled, it still rested on a tenuous and volatile clinical relationship to plasticity in the bodies of children that undermined its apparent resolution of the crisis of binary sex. The refusal of children's embodied plasticity to fully cooperate with the theory of gender has been seriously underestimated, and the racialized meanings of plasticity from the early 20th century were smuggled into the post-war era by attempts to resolve that issue through, def uh, through defining gender in severely developmental terms. <clears throat> in this chapter's reading of the invention of gender, money is hardly a singular historical force while the concept of gender is simultaneously a signal event, but one that fails to live up to its own discursive claims. The broader point of this chapter within this book is to show how money and the concept of gender serve as more of a functional relay point between early 20th century intersex medicine and post-war transsexual medicine. Racializing the Plasticity of Gender Ian Moreland has argued that the medicalization of intersex bodies and money's uptake of clinical research into a theory of gender was a form of medical humanism that equated humanity with a racialized plasticity, an abstract whiteness that signals the capacity for the scientific transformation of the body 
and mind in the broader service of the human species. Looking at the post war shift in the sciences away from the scientific realism, racism associated with the biological reductionism and evolutionary hierarchies, Moreland found definitions of the plasticity of humanity in important venuses such as the UNESCO state statements on race, as well as the model of psychological development emblematized in Alfred Adler's work, each of which informed gender laterally. As he put it, the congruence between Money's claim about gender and contemporary scientific debate about race gave his work a self-evidence that was crucial to its broader uptake. Gender was able to present itself without an acknowledgement of the racial normativity of plasticity, precisely because the post-war episteme of cultural or population science. <clears throat> Gender was able to present itself without an acknowledgement of racial normativity, of plasticity, precisely because the post war episteme of cultural or, cultural or population science, rather than removing biology from race as it claimed, actually made it more t intangible and latent than it had been before. The equation of humanity with plasticity helps to explain why the violent and non-consensual surgical alteration of infant and children's bodies in the 1950s was still, after so many decades, considered not harmful or traumatic, but humane. The whiteness of intersex children's bodies at both the abstract level of their hormonal plasticity and the concrete level of dem demography, the vast majority of intersex children seen at Hopkins were white, signified to doctors their need to be instrumentalized in the service of a broader medical improvement of the human form. Moreland cautions, therefore, that I am unconvinced that we can straightforwardly demarcate inhuman from the human treatments, treatment, even though it would be reassuring to do so. I argue that the history of humanism cannot decide the meaning of a humane response to atypical genitalia. In other words, we cannot discover the right way to treat individuals of intersex anomalies by determining what it means to be human. So long as the ununiversalized, un so long as the universalized human equals plasticity, plasticity racialized as whiteness, critiques of the inhumanity of medical normalization remain trapped inside the post-war turn to cultural forms of race. Yet the abstract whiteness of medicalized plasticity has deeper roots if we trace its clinical operationalization from the previous chapter into the 1940s, before money arrived at Hopkins. The humane meaning attached to non-therapeutic and painful surgeries was based on in a metanomic slide from life-threatening circumstances that sometimes accompanied intersex conditions to benign variations in morphology. This slide as metanomic was on as metanom this slide as metanomic was ontologically groundless but it took advantage of a powerful material foothold because the plasticity of intersex children's actual bodies, as we will see, made the two fields inseparable. In the gap between physiological conditions that greatly affected quality of life and arbitrarily binary models of sexual differentiation grew the abstract whiteness that Moreland named humanist. Clinicians continued to try to cultivate intersex children's plasticity, as they had since the early 20th century, into forms that equated sex with human phenotype, the proper end form of normal development. In this way, the older eugenic connotation of plasticity that originated in the life sciences was not extinguished by the events of World War II and as scientific bodies such as UNESCO purported to do, but were actually translated into new forms at the level of medical technique. The plasticity that Money worked with in the early 1950s had been isolated and operationalized over the preceding decade by Lawson Wilkins, the head of pediatric endocrinology at Hopkins. Wilkins' clinical work in the 1940s and early 1950s shows how two concepts that we might presume are separable from gender's malleability, technicity and race, were in fact grown out of the same organic milieu, the bodies of intersex children. In that context, the apparent paradigm shift of gender its aggressive recon reconsolidation of the sex binary was shadowed by, by the threat of its own undoing in children's bodies in the clinic. Wilkins spent years developing a potent new hormonal therapy for children with intersex conditions 
caused by the overactivity of the adrenal glands, a condition that had frustrated doctors at Hopkins since Young's adrenalectomies in the 1920s, when a new synthetic hormone came on the market that could directly address the hyperplasia of adrenal glands and their sex effects, it seemed to reframe the field of clinical endocrinology, affecting what looked like the first primarily hormonal, rather than surgical, sex change. This event proved decisive for Money's model of gender, which interpreted Wilkins' data on the assumption that children's bodies were radically plastic before gender imprinted at a certain developmental moment. While Money presumed intersex children's biological plasticity in his theory of gender, the actual clinical history of pediatric endocrinology at Hopkins undermines his foundation. The treatment of what was by the 1940s called the congenital adrenal hyperplasia, CAH, confronts us with unruly, indifferent, and volatile forms of body plasticity that express a capacity to cause death as much as to alter sex. Wilkins did not simply impose a binary form on intersex bodies through a new hormonal pro protocol of sex reassignment. He embroiled in a constant negotiation with plasticity and an inescapable need to solicit biological consent from the sex body of patients for new hormone therapies to produce predictable and reliable effects. The emergence of gender, which began not with money but with adrenal hyperplasia in the 1940s, leads us to a different sense of the malleability or political potential of gender as plastic. For money had to solicit the same consent from the body before imposing a gender assignment. The problems generated by this reliance on plasticity would carry forward into the transsexual medicine too. Significantly, significantly shaping the terrain for trans children in the post-war era. Pediatric Endocrinology at the Harriet Lane Home Although it was only one of many intersex conditions medicalized at the Harriet Lane Home, CAH captured Wilkins' attention because of the sheer number of admissions in whom it was, pre in whom it was present as well as persistent resistance to the treatment approach Young had developed over the preceding 20 years. One variation of CAH included a dangerous salt-losing symptom that led to immediate metabolic health crisis and, if left untreated, almost certain death. <clears throat> Most other intersex conditions, especially non-normative or non-binary genital appearance, had no life-threatening implications at all. One of the reasons that Jung had never found a way to directly remedy the hyperactivity of the adrenals is that the psychology of CAH remained poorly understood until it was re-theorized in light of more precise hormonal analyses in the 1940s. Wilkins now knew that CAH was, metab was a metabolic disorder in which the adrenal glands were congenitally unable to produce the steroid hormone cortisol or would produce it in small amounts. In the absence of adequate quantities of cortisol circulate, circulating in the blood, the pituitary gland's compens compensatory response would be to secrete massive amounts of adrenocortisotropic -cort hormone that, in turn, causes the adrenal glands to secrete very large amounts of androgens. The regular circulation of so many androgens causes profound transformations in growth and a virilization or masculinization of the body including the genitals and the so-called secondary se sex characteristics. In children who would otherwise be assigned as male at birth, CAH causes a form of precocious puberty, including the premature, premature fusion of the bones, stunting eventual height. More common at the Harriet Lane home were cases of CAH in children who would otherwise be assigned as female at birth. In these children, masculinization of the genitals sometimes occurred in utero, <clears throat> so that the baby was assigned at birth as a boy until doubts arose during childhood. Other times, this physical masculinization occurred rapidly during the first months or years of life. Children assigned as female at birth and raised as girls would begin, seemingly without warning, to dramatically masculinize. Only in cases accompanied by a life-threatening inability to retain salt would immediate hospitalization be almost guaranteed to bring a child into a clinic. Otherwise, Many children with CAH lived as boys and never saw a doctor unless complications arose or changes in their sex body caused enough concern in parents or other adults that they sought out medical attention. When Wilkins was hired to read, that, read the Harriet Lane Holmes' new endoc endocrine clinic, 
1935, admissions of intersex children began to shift from the Brady Institute to the clinic because of Wilkins' research program centering on hormones. However, it took many years of improvis improvisation and trial and error just to establish how hormones could affect children's plasticity. While intersex embodiment was far from the only area in which he worked, Wilkins devoted a great deal of time to this area of research. Many of the infants and children he worked with were local, referring from elsewhere in the hospital or from Baltimore. But by then, Hopkins had built such a reputation, the family seeking a medical sex assignment would come from around the country. In 1942, a family made the trip from California with their child, Alex, who was less than 10 years old. Assigned as a girl at birth, Alex had begun to rapidly masculinize and outpace their peers developmentally around age five. A local doctor consulted by the parents suggested that they already had the bone age of a nine-year-old. That doctor wrote to Hugh Hampton Young for advice, and Young referred to the family to a urologist in their hometown. After finding that Alex had no vagina, the urologist made a diagnosis of female pseudohermaphroditism due to adrenal hyperplasia. But, unlike what Young would have done, added that he strongly advised against the adrenalectomy or plastic operation. Upon arriving at the Harriet Lane home, Wilkins ordered a daily urine analysis and an adrenal function test to establish a data flow on Alex's endocrine system. In his case's notes, he questioned the older surgical framework for CAH, reasoning that it seems more logical to try to stimulate female development by the use of large doses of estrogens. In this way, the male characteristics can be suppressed. Although, he added that it is questionable whether such treatment will suppress the activity of the adrenals, and that long-term estrogen therapy would probably lead to atrophy of the ovaries and sterility. He argued that the principal objective should be the development of secondary sex characteristics and the suppression of the male. With these rigidly binary aesthetic criteria in mind, he added that surgical removal of the clitoris and possibly later plastic operations on the vagina seemed desirable. Wilkins sent Alex for an exam by a gynecologist who felt that an explanatory laparotomy was needed to see if the intra-abdominal structure felt during palpitation proved to, proved to be an ovary, <clears throat> in which case nothing should be done. If, however, it should prove to be a testicle, it should be removed. After which, patient could go through life quite normally as a female, except, of course, for her sterility. After the laparotomy was scheduled and found normal ovaries, the surgeon amputated Alex's phallus and Wilkins prescribed a daily estrogen regimen. Wilkins also asked a child psychiatrist to interview Alex, providing a more intimate, if still highly me mediate mediated, account of Alex's experience at Hopkins. The psychiatrist used a mental standardization test, thereby archiving something of their perspective, although it is, high, it is highly obscured by adult fears around innocence. Apparently, Alex's mother was very anxious about whether they knew they were intersex, so Dr. Tietz, the psychiatrist, only asked only vague questions, like, why did you come to Hopkins? To which Alex replied, because I am so tall, rather to be a little smaller, have trouble finding shoes that fit me, Children of my age are smaller, would, would rather look young. Tietz also interviewed Alex's mother, gendering her concerns over medicalization as a hysterical symptom of constant emotional strain. <clears throat> she mentioned to him that she had read as many books on hermaphroditism as she could and is up to date. Her biggest worry is how to break the news to the child, whom she believes is not aware of her condition, followed by whether or not child's name would would not finally turn out to be a boy instead of a girl. After Alex had recovered from a laparotomy and phallic amputation, Wilkins sent the family back to California with a five milligram daily dose of still bestrol, still bestrol, noting that it was very high and probably smaller doses would be found effective over time. Their family doctor was to oversee the hormone therapy. A Wilkins remarked that stilbestrol had the value of ease of administration for treatment at home. Not long after returning home, the mother sent Wilkins a letter to Alex 
had to be hospitalized for a sinus infection and bronchitis, followed by the measles. During these illnesses, the estrogen had produced a severe side effect of abdominal pain and nausea. The family doctor had the daily dosage to reduce the discomfort. As for changes in sex, the mother reported that her voice is a little higher and appearance is more feminine. Alex's medicalization indexes the shift in approach from Young's older surgical paradigm to a hormonal one. Wilkins led with hormones, despite the unpredictability of their effects, and turned to surgeries only as a supplement of medical sex reassignment. Yet both Young and Wilkins knew well that estrogen therapy would not do very much other than cause slight changes in appearance for children with CAH. Chemically, it did nothing to under un address the underlying adrenal condition. The specific hormone to address it treating CAH was the absence of cortisol. During World War II, Louis uh, Serrett, a chemist working for the pharmaceutical company, Mark and Company, was successful in partially synthesizing cortisol in a lab, something desired by the military for the potential biological enhancement of soldiers. After the war ended, Mark decided to make the synthetic version of cortisol, which they termed cortisone, available for medical research, having also significantly improved its chemical quality and reliability over the intervening several years. The initial trial application of the synthetic hormone was in rheumatoid arthritis, which seemed to be miraculously cured with regular cortisone administration. Wilkins speculated that it would probably be useful in treating CAH too. A team of doctors working with intersex children at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston pursued the same avenue, and both those doctors and Wilkins announced their findings in December 1949 that cortisone would treat CAH. The clinical difference made by cortisone was astonishing. Many of the Harriet Lane Holmes' existing patients, who, like Alex, had undergone surgeries and received mostly ineffective estrogen prescriptions, were now prescribed cortisone, inducing what amounted in many cases to binary sex reassignment. Cortisone's effectiveness even changed Wilkins' decision about medical sex reassignment itself. For instance, a child raised, raised as a girl in the Appalachian coal country arrived at the endocrine clinic in 1947, just before cortisone became available. Wilkins was certain that this is a case of female pseudohermaphroditism due to the congenital hyperplasia of the adrenals, and ordered urine analysis to confirm the correlate androgen levels. <clears throat> in his case notes, Wilkins pointed out that the correction of the adrenal condition by the removal of one half, one and a half adrenals was frequently been tried by Dr. Hugh Young and others without any benefit. With a lack of other options, given the relatively useless, uselessness of estrogen therapy, Wilkins, faced with the question of whether one should attempt by any means a surgical and hormonal treatment to feminize or masculinize the patient. Unconvinced by the soundness of either option, he deferred to the child psychiatrist Leo Kanner, who indicates that she would probably, probably be happier as a boy and living a male life. Wilkins echoed the wait-and-see policy that Young had often employed since the 1910s, writing that, she, that, sh that the wisest, most successful, and easiest course to follow is that of following the direction of the predominant sex hormone which is being produced, legitimizing the child's masculinity. The parents apparently agreed, and the case was referred to social service to help make plans for the major adjustment in their lives. For reasons that are unrecorded, when the family returned to the West Virginia, their child did not socially transition to being a boy, but continued to live as a girl. In 1953, the family returned to Baltimore because puberty was causing so much masculinization that the girl was finding it socially difficult to continue living as a girl. Wilkins now offered his new cortisone therapy. For three weeks, the child submitted a daily urine test to establish a baseline for their androgen levels. <clears throat> Wilkins then prescribed 50 milligrams a day of cortisone. After observing the initially slow fall in androgen levels, he increased the dosage twice over the following three months. About six weeks into the therapy, a clitoral amputation and vaginoplasty were also undertaken to feminize the genitals. After the child spent three months on the ward receiving cortisone, Wilkins reported some beginning development of breast tissue as the adrenal gland shrunk, a massive masculine masculinization 
of morph morphologically converted into feminization. Sent home with an individualized cortisone regimen based on exhaustive study of daily urine samples, this child continued to return to the Harriet Lane home about once a year. When Wilkins corresponded with their family doctor to stay appraised, prized of the course of their feminization. By the, mid, by the mid-1950s, when the child was in their mid-teens, their CAH had been dramatically mitigated by cortisone therapy, and Wilkins was satisfied that their body was going through a feminine puberty. Years of medicalization, social ostracism at the hands of other children, and the alternation between medical assignment as a boy and a girl had also taken a toll. However, when Money interviewed this child and followed up with them in the mid-1950s, he noted a serious depression that showed no signs of abating. Many other patients that Wilkins had seen since infancy and who had been originally medicalized under their young surgical paradigm returned to the Harriet Lane home in the 1950s to resume cortisone because of its potential to affect a medical sex reassignment as a girl. A newborn form from New York a newborn from New York who, in 1935, had undergone plastic surgeries by Young to feminize the genitals, for instance, returned in 1950 to see Wilkins for the first time. During the 1940s, this child had been given intermittent prescriptions for stilbestrol, but they had failed to inhibit masculine growth. The cortisone treatments, however, affected a rapid reversal into femininity. By 1956, as the patient was completing college and applying to medical school, Wilkins noted in his follow-up notes that they were easily, easily socially recognized as a woman. Wilkins and his team analyzed changes in breast development, the vagina, the clitoris, menstruation, basal temperature, hair, acne, and voice in order to track the transformation of the body's plasticity during cortisone therapy. In, chil in children older than infants, those genitalia were not regarded as very plastic. Normalizing surgery was often re recommended to achieve the rigid aesthetic standards governing the morphological appearance of the female body. The reduction of the size of the clitoris or phallus was the most common, even though there was no medical, medical necessity at all for the procedure. While not a cure for CAH, insofar as therapy would probably be required for the rest of childhood and puberty, Cortisone had the profoundly visible, profoundly visible effect of normalizing the sex of intersex children into a binary form. CAH was not a singularly sex condition, but carried with it certain long-term cardiac and cancer risks from exceptionally high androgen circulation, <clears throat> which cortisone therapy minimized as it changed the body's sex. Still, cortisone therapy to reverse the masculinization of children, the doctors felt, should have been assigned female at birth, cannot be disentangled from purely surgical interventions with the, with the genitals that had no medical justification beyond aesthetic norms. Such surgeries produce their own justification only retroactively by locating the normality of the sex binary out of altered genital appearance. Raising children with CAH as boys when they might have been assigned as girls or letting girls grow into a particularly masculine body, whether the, with the body hair, a large clitoris, or the latent specter of same-sex desire were all considered a self-evident were all considered self-evident pathologies akin to cancer or cardiac arrest risk. <clears throat> As intersex studies scholars have argued so well, this normalizing slippage justified the coercive and non-therapeutic alteration of intersex children's bodies, at the same time as it let doctors also claim normalization as proof that sex should be rendered binary, even when it did not always grow that way in its own. <clears throat> this is how the abstract whiteness of intersex children's plasticity was already well established before the 1950s moment that Moreland examines. And the slippage between medical conditions that could affect the livability of intersex children's lives, including cancer and cardiac complications, and the entirely benign question of their sex morphology, especially their genitals, Wilkins framed binary sex as the proper phenotypic outcome of the cortisone treatment by including genital surgeries in this protocol, something that, strictly speaking, did not affect the course of adrenal hyperplasia. Hormonal plasticity did not uh, hormonal plasticity gave cortisone its traction, reversing hyperplasia, 
but it was also given a second meaning through the inclusion of genital surgeries, as if both were equally re relevant to the long-term health of an intersex child. This slide from the adrenals to the genitals and sex reassignment, however, was less a perfect accomplishment of cortisone therapy than a speculative gambit. The entanglement of the part of Wilkins' protocol concerning sex change and the part concerning the general metabolism of the adrenals also raised the specter of biological resistance in medicine from intersex child's and body plasticity. While genital surgeries were meant to shore up the normative boundaries between masculine and feminine, the treatment of CAH in the specific case of its salt-losing variation illustrates the very weak basis for these medical interventions because of the partial refusal, if not radical indifference, of embodied plasticity in some cases. This autonomy of the plastic bodies profoundly undermines Money's subsequent interpretation of Wilkins' work into a theory of gender acquisition and reassignment. Salt losing CAH and embodied plasticity's autonomy. When children with a salt losing variation of CAH were admitted to the Harriet Lane home, the stakes were high, for without immediate treatment they would Im inevitably die of dehydration or heart attack. While Wilkins noted in detail atypical genitalia as part of the diagnostic assessment of these children, the lion's share of his attention was drawn to stabilizing the electrolyte balance of the body while simultaneously suppressing the adrenals and, only if both of those could be harmonized, subsequently focusing on an aesthetic sex reassignment. The immediate priority was to resolve the cell crisis through massive doses of sodium. Once imminent death was no longer a concern, Wilkins would add cortisone to the daily regimen, usually starting with a high dose. During their stay at the Harriet Lane home, children would have their urine analyzed exactly every 24 hours. On two data points, the excretion of 17 ketosteroids, which measured the androgens being produced by the adrenal glands, and the various electrolyte levels that indicated to what degree salt was being retained. The practical difficulty of analyzing urine from newborn babies on precise daily cycles was, in and of itself, a massive undertaking for the clinic staff. Growth rate and bone development were also tracked over a longer term. With this continuous flow of data established, the main task began to work to find the minimum effective dose of cortisone that would suppress the adrenals, while also figuring out how salt intake could be reduced in the same proportion as its retention increased since too much salt was also dangerous. Crucially, Wilkins found that, found that although he could not explain how, how or why, cortisone improved salt retention in some incalculable way. Although cortisone could not alone cure the electrolyte problem, its effects could not be separated from it either. Integrating the interpretation of these two sets of daily readings while simultaneously guiding them toward the electrolyte and androgenic statistical norms for a child's age was exceedingly difficult work because the exact relation between cortisone and salt retention was unknowable. Wilkins found that sex and gender metabolism were deeply entangled in a way that, that the binary discourse of sex plasticity could not contain. In the face of this pra practical epistemological and material limit, he created an elaborate me metabolic chart system to try to bring the two indeterminate data sets under his jurisdiction. Charting daily, monthly, and long-term changes, some infants remained hospitalized for years, he would constantly adjust the dosage of cortisone, salt, and for some patients, a second cortis cortisterone, cortisterone hormone given to enhance salt retention. Relying on his ability to partially graph the moving relation between the input of hormones and salt and the output of data, Wilkins attempted to calibrate the therapeutic regimen to harmonize the child's electrolytes, growth, and sex. Anything less than resonance between the moving parts of this clinical apparatus will put the child's life at risk again. Unfortunately for Wilkins, the conversion of daily urine analysis into separate data fields of electrolytes and androgens was a poor pre predictor of how adjusting hormonal and salt dosage would move the numbers the following day. The constant threat of dehydration, infection, vomiting, loss of appetite, rapid weight loss, or massive weight gain, growth, and irritability rarely subsidized or could start up again without warning. Trying to harmonize the resonance between general endocrine metabolism and the specific dimension of sex in a child 
admitted at seven weeks old, for instance. Well, it can significantly change the treatment regimen 19 times in 18 months before achieving sufficient stability to warrant discharge from the Harriet Lane home. Colleagues and students who worked with Wilkins noted his fastidiousness and long hours required for a strenuous commitment to the technology of patient charts. Normalization of the child's child CAH body, far from opposing a binary on the non-binary intersex body, consisted of a chaotic, non-linear engagement with the organic entanglement of sex and salt materialized in living metabolism. Claude Midgian, at the time a visiting research fellow, recalled the process thusly many years later. In the evening of each working day, the ketos, results were posted on patient file, on each patient file. The files were pinned on a bulletin board in the secretary's office. After the secretaries had left, Dr. Wilkins was joined by Lit Gardner, John Krigler, and me. Often, there would be one or two interns as well as one of the numerous visitors to the clinic. Long discussions would take place about modifying the treatment of each patient. It seemed that out of these daily meetings came the elaboration of the proper treatment for CAH patients. Midgen's reminiscence that it seems that this rumination on data and its relation to dosage led to the proper treatment evokes a central problem at hand in this clinical history. The method developed by Wilkins' team never came close to a hormonal control of somatic and sexual growth, where control would mean the imposition of a binary form as an orthopedic device or the suppression of non-binary forms. Wilkins and his team never found a stable relation between salt and cortisone that can function predictively. The clinical reality amounted much less coherently and much less confidently, as Midgen's choice of phrase reveals, to a kind of chasing after the plasticity of the child's growing body through its doubled metabolic forms. Cortisone was a chemically potent but highly indeterminate tool that acted simultaneously on the electrolyte and the se sexual dimensions of the metabolism, but without a clear relation between the two. In salt-losing cases of CAH, Wilkins relied profoundly on the biological consent of the child's plastic body to transform salt and sex, a consent that he would hardly count upon. We often frame the medicalization of intersex children, as Paris put it, as based on an impetus to control intersexual deviance that stems from cultural tendencies towards gender binarism, homophobia, and fear of difference. Yet the clinical history of the Harriet Lane home leads to a different argument. Wilkins labored attempts to reconcile electrolyte metabolism and its sexual version through the technologies of hormones, salt, and patient charts describe a scenario where control is at most a perpetually deferred horizon, not an outcome. Cortisone therapy is more consonant with Repo's argument that the hermaphroditic subject was a subject of biopolitical potentiality a subject who, through the surgical alteration of genitals, could be psychologically managed into a different sex, desiring subject, different sex desiring subject, and hence become a subject useful for the reproduction of social order. Cortisone therapy was meant to address the young child's plasticity in a normalizing sense, to remedy the adrenals at the same time that it feminized the body, recalibrating development along a binary trajectory. However, and its salt-losing version, incredibly virulent embodied plasticity constantly interfered with the isolation of sex as a distinct part of the body, frustrating the metonomic slide from the life-threatening medical conditions to arbitrary binary models of human phenotype and genitals. This inability to isolate sex was a dramatic incarceration, incarnation of the epistemological crisis of sex and that plasticity had generated over the first half of the 20th century, and it manifested specifically on the endocrine ward as a radical metabolic openness to the environment. As Wilkins so often found, diet and stress in the clinical setting often overrode the action of cortisone in the midst of treatment, throwing resonance off without advance warning. There are two entangled modes of embodied plasticity at hand that Wilkins struggled to put into discourse. First, there is the sexual plasticity of the adrenal glands, whose masculinizing effects could be suppressed and transformed by cortisone, changing the outward morphology of the sex body from masculine to feminine. Second, 
there is the much more volatile plasticity of general metabolism, partially regulated by salt. While those two forms of plasticity were not coincident in the child's body, their invisible relation as parts of the endocrine system was given a metonomic relation in the patient charts. The entanglement of these two modes frustrated Wilkins' attempt to govern either, preempting the question of genital surgery altogether and revealing it as an arbitrary add-on of the treatment of CAH. The more radical suggestion made by this entanglement was that sex could not be reduced to a binary form because virulent metabolic plasticity constantly interfered with its stability. And where is the intersex child's personhood in all of this? Metabolic plasticity is not a straightforward concept through which to extract a sense of agency. As Hannah Landecker has explained, metabolism is best understood as a third concept, upending the distinction between organism and environment. <clears throat> Whereas a model based on an organism-environment split would see Wilkins as intervening from without to induce specific orthopedic effects on sodium retention in sex, that is not what happened that is not what happened in the clinic, as the limited success of patients' charts and technology shows. The possibility of cultivating resonance between salt and sex points to a third concept of metabolism, where both organism and environment, body and medical technology, are affecting and being affected simultaneously. This overwhelmingly lively plasticity carries no inherent political or social significance. The child's life is imminently at risk, but, successfully, but successful treatment also included a rigid binary cultivation of the sex body. This is a kind of plasticity that remains underappreciated by feminist, intersex, and trans studies. If we continue to think of intersex medical history as one of an imposition of sex and gender norms on the organism entirely from the outside, then cortisone would be a mere instrument. It turns out, however, that the real gender trouble has less to do with the categories of sex and gender than with their living res residence in the child's body, and personally autono autonomous non-human agency expressed in, in body and plasticity, one that was quite successful in forestalling the question of genital surgeries, but at the great cost to the child's health. If the, if the actual children whom Wilkins saw at the Harriet Lane home had seemed mo even more distant from the medical narrative in this chapter than the, in the previous one, it is because they were extremely instrumentalized rendered not only silent, but often kept entirely uninformed about what was being done to them by doctors. Yet even in this highly disenfranchised clinical setting, their own plasticity continued to assert its own agency, albeit one that hardly acted in the children's interest. The reason that Wilkins was, to willing, was willing to cling to binary sex in cases of salt-losing CAH, I argue, even when that could put the life of the patient at risk, is that the binary imperative was a racialized phenotype. The crucial detail was scrupulously recorded by Wilkins in a 1952 article he published in Pediatrics. Each of the patients upon whom he experimented to produce the protocol for salt losing CAH was a white female or a white infant. That whiteness names an investment in a racial normativity that had previously been articulated as eugenic stock during Young's surg surgical paradigm. As the transition to the post-war era heralded the end of an explicitly eugenic language of race improvement and extermination in the life sciences, the eugenic preoccupations that had typified endocrinology during the interwar period rhetorically faded. That would, It would be a mistake, however, to assume that the eugenic techniques underwriting modern endocrinology similarly ended in the 1950s. On the contrary, the experimental use of cortisone illustrates continuity in practice. Wilkins aimed to resolve a metabolic condition that would simultaneously normalize the growth rate, metabolism, and sex of the body, directing it toward a binary phenotype that was merged with the resolution of their salt-losing crisis. The whiteness of the, these children was so valuable as a racial formation that allowed Wilkins to justify putting children's lives at risk to achieve a binary sex as humane practice, presaging Moreland's argument about money. Stated somewhat differently, the precise measurement and manipulation of plasticity proved impossible for Wilkins. Salt losing CAH is such a strong example of how plasticity, having tipped on its own agential force toward being inimical to the life of the child, 
tended to disobey the endocrinologist's technical or discursive prowess, as much as it simul simultaneously enabled it. That partial autonomy was, again, paradoxically, also the material means by which Wilkins was able to partially manipulate metabolism through synthetic hormones, changing the sex of the body, and is designating femininity, not masculinity, as the proper phenotype for children assigned as female at birth, with CAH. Wilkins' persistence in the face of a lack of resonance between sex and salt describes his investment as an abstract racial formation of sex. The shadowy second meaning of the phrase, a white female, left behind in his public work. Wilkins made a risky choice in trying to make such powerful forms of embodied plasticity fit into phenotypic models of a sex binary, for there was no way to extinguish the constant threat of a loss of resonance that his patients' charts record. And while the invention of gender was meant to save the sex binary from an imminent conceptual collapse, Money's reliance on Wilkins' work with CAH preserved the instability and threat of collapse inside, that, inside the new category. Gender as Plasticity's Analog When Wilkins hired Money at the outset of the 1950s to work with fellow psychologists Joanne and John Hampson, they built the theory of gender upon what they took as, coherent, as a coherent outcome of Wilkins' work with cortisone and other hormone therapies. The children's plasticity was incredibly receptive to medical intervention early in life through coordinated hormone therapy and plastic surgery. In other words, they brought into the metanomic slide from medically significant conditions to arbitrary binary phenotypes. The theory of gender was a new interpretation of long-standing clinical research into children with a field of overlapping development in sexual disorders, increasingly refined hormonal syntheses aimed at harmonizing and normalizing specific metabolic and sexual processes and normalizing plastic surgeries in the genitals. As a psychologist, Money was neither trained nor permitted to direct hormonal or surgical intervention, so he made theoretical and diagnostic inferences from the available clinical data produced by his colleagues. Those practicing endocrinologists, psychiatrists, and surgeons, in turn, informed their clinical practice with Money's theories. Money and the Hamptons saw upward of 60 hermaphroditic patients, both children and adults, before publishing several articles in the Bulletin of the John Hopkins Hospital in 1955, in which they outlined the conce medical concept of gender, articulating their specific interest in cases of contradiction between gonadal sex and sex of rearing. They published a table in the first article that mapped those characteristics through endogenous hormonal sex, sex type, of type of hermaphroditism, and what they now called the gender role of their patients. To explain this new category, they wrote, the term gender role is used to signify all those things that a person says or does to disclose himself or herself as having the status of boy or man, girl or woman, respectively. It includes but is not restricted to sex, sexuality, and the sense of eroticism. The statement was repeated more or less verbatim in the subsequent articles they published that year. More important was their finding that gonadal structure, per se, proved the most reli unreliable prognosticator of a person's gender role and orientation as man or woman. Assigned sex proved an extremely reliable one. While their colleagues, Young and Wilkins, had long distrusted the gonadal model because it held no predictive value, Money and the Hamptons felt that the sex in which the child was raised did play a determining but not deterministic role. The immediate goal of the 1955 articles, then, was to overturn the gonadocentric paradigm and to save the sex binary from a conceptual collapse caused by the indeterminacy introduced by plasticity. New research on chromosomes had excited research hopeful of a genetic determination of sex, but had fallen apart just as quickly as chromosome tests became available. If it turned out that XX and XY were unreliable sources of meaning, and that there were also many more chromosomal combinations in humans, that cast doubt on the presumed binary logic of the system. By the time Money and the Hamptons began their research, it was also well established that gonads did not direct the sex hormone circulation of the body in causal sense, and ovary or testes might be present, but not secrete any meaningful estrogen or testosterone, or it might secrete both. 
but one or both would not be processed by the rest of the body. The body was also capable of converting one hormone into the other. Estrogens and androgens did not really have feminine or masculine meanings at all, or as in the cases of CAH, other glands such as the adrenals might cause sexual effects. Facing the looming conceptual crisis of binary sex, gender, ma gender made a key difference. Money and the Hampton suppressed the concept of intersex as a mix of two sexes so that they could eliminate the concept of natural human bisexuality that had dominated the life sciences for a, sec for a century. The concept of gender referred to a psychosocial dimension of sex rather than a separable ontological entity. Gender role was introduced as one of many components of sex that explained, they explained, clinicians could look to, to in cases of intersex children for guidance on sex assignment. Chromosomal makeup, gonads, external genital morphology, hormonal sex, the sex assigned at birth, and the gender role established and ingrained through years of living in sex already assigned. Money and the Hamptons were very careful to insist that there is no ontological reason to assume that any of these components exerts a deterministic role in sexual differentiation. Rather, their argument was drawn from a clinical observation and practical efficacy. First, chromosomes have essentially no pre predictive value. And second, the gonads are equally weak, even, in, even relative to hormone rel levels of testosterone and estrogen in infancy or early childhood, are poor predictors of eventual somatic and psychological development, given what the researchers described as the frequent difficulty of predicting hormonal sex before puberty, and of the possibility of corrective hormonal intervention. Unable to offer a deterministic framework for sexual differentiation, Money and the Hampton strategically changed the context of the debate. Henceforth, their question had not to do with the ontology of sex, but exclusively with the life adjustments of the patients in our, se in our series, how normal they felt or how well they adapted socially with that twist. A gender role that contradicted the visible body could be identified as pathological because it might lead to social stigma or psychological distress. The phobic origins of this concept of dysphoria. The twist is well known to feminists, queer, trans, and intersex critics, for it consists of the arbitrary production of medical abnormality out of social norms, rather than endogenous risk to the life of an intersex person. What has not been as well noticed is the part played here by a discourse of posticity. Like Wilkins before them, Money and the Hamptons had to consent to the partial biology but autonomy of a child's plastic body in order to normalize it. Plasticity was a vehicle that would generate the intersex children's bodies. Plasticity was a vehicle that could guarantee that intersex children's bodies could be made to fit the assigned gender role that they argued was so predictive, arguing that gonadal structure per se, gonadal structure per se proved the most unreliable prognosticator of a person's gender role and orientation as man or woman. They claimed instead that assigned sex proved an extremely reliable one because the body's alterability could be psychologically internalized by the child. The most controversial and often critiqued argument of money's theory of gender is that choosing a sex that matched or could be matched to the external genitals, assigning it to the child, and re rearing it with minimal doubt could ensure a concordant gender role. This point has often been described as an extreme form of behavioralism, if not a perversely fundamentalist kind of social constructivism, but those interpretations miss how money in the Hamptons relied on an analogy to material biological plasticity whose implications they could not control. Like Wilkins, they proposed to chase after and optimize sex in the body to the greatest possible technical extent by consenting to the agency of its plasticity. Their advice to clinicians presented with intersex newborns or infants makes this clear. It should be the aim of the obst obstetrician and the pediatrician to settle the sex of a hermaphroditic baby once and for all. Within the first few weeks of life, before the establishment of a gender role gets far advanced, it is our recommendation that, in assigning the sex in those ambiguous instances, consideration can be given first to the appearance and morphology of the external genitals. If the external organs are so predominantly male or so predominantly female that no amount of surgical reconstruction 
will convert them to serviceably and erotically sensitive organs of the, easier se of the other sex. Then the sex of reassignment should be dictated by the external genitals. Alone. All, physical, all further surgical and hormonal endeavors should be directed towards maintaining the person in that sex. If the external genital anatomy of the neonate is as fairly ambiguous and the possibilities of surgical reconstruction are equally promising in either direction, then gonadal and hormonal considerations may be more heavily weighted. Clinicians are directed to assay the relative plasticity of child's growing body to assign sex on the basis of whatever the body seems most receptive to forming, as well as what the clinical team is capable of doing through surgery and hormones. At the time that Money and the Hampsons were conducting their research, clitorectomy and vaginoplasty were much more effective procedures for producing normative-looking genitals than surgeries for hypospadiac phalluses or phalloplasty. Money and the Hampsons often felt that choosing to assign an intersex baby to the female sex because it would be easier to create female external genitalia was a self-evidently better option than raising a child as a boy with a small penis. While this is an incredibly arbitrary and normalizing contention, it is also a technical discursive concession to the plastic agencies of the body. Sex reassignment could not override and neutralize all intersex vitality to impose a binary. Sex reassignment paradoxically relied on intersex plasticity to accomplish transformations in the body through hormonal and surgical intervention, but also met their limit in the embodied plasticity's, plasticity's agency. The profound limitation Wilkins encountered in trying to make salt and sex resonate was not resolved by the introduction of gender. If anything, it was merely deferred under the cover of social stigma and adjustment. How could gender simultaneously be based in an analogy with biological plasticity and yet seek to extinguish the theory of natural bisexuality and mixed sex? The crucial difference was made by child development. From their first published paper in 1955, Money and the Hamptons deployed an analogy to language acquisition as a form of developmental plasticity to secure their argument about how gender was formed. While continuing to defer the question of gender's etiology, they explained that a person's gender role as boy or girl, man or woman, is built up cumulatively through the life experiences he encounters and through the life experiences he transacts. Since the precise nature of such transactions is unknowable, they went on to say that gender role may be likened to a native language. Once ingrained, a person's native language may fall into disuse and be supplanted by another, but is never entirely eradicated. So also a gender role may be changed or, resembling native bilingualism, may be ambiguous, but it may also become so deeply ingrained that it, not even flagrant contradictions of body functioning and morphology may displace it. The analogy to language suggests that plasticity is forceful and unstable early on in human life, but it has a definite window, after which it is meant to recede. Child development as a temporal form restricts plasticity to a profoundly conservative narrative, domesticating it in the service of a newly rigid sex binary. Money and the Hamptons argued that cases involving older infants and children are therefore the most problematic and difficult problems of sex assignment encountered not because older children might be able to consciously resist or contest their medicalization but as an infant, but because their plasticity was fast receding. As with any analogy in medical science, there was a major impression imprecision to this argument. They conceded that it, it is not possible to state, to state a fixed age at which gender awareness becomes established, but then went on to argue in their next breath that such awareness takes place somewhere around 18 months of age. Money would repeat the same general line for the rest of his career, adjusting the age parameters every so often, but without being able to substantiate the claim. Of course, he precisely did not need to prove the point, for it was the imprecision, imprecision of the analogy that animated its clinical operation. Gender allowed Money and the Hamptons to undo the idea that humans were naturally bisexual or sexually indeterminate. Instead, though children were born exceptionally plastic, that plasticity now proceeded to grow into a developmental direction, either male or female, to prevent social stigma. The sex binary, which had nearly fallen apart in medicine over the previous 50 years, had new life breathed into it by gender, 
justified not on an ontological basis, but by a developmental matrix. Masculinity and femininity were recodified as the only two phenotypes into which a child could grow. Medicine is tasked to normalize the development of intersex or gender nonconforming children so that they could grow up to be either a man or a woman and nothing else. This shift entailed the effective end of an older discourse on hermaphroditism, which, despite its viciously dehumanizing connotations of natural, monstros of natural monstrosity and its racist associations with evolutionist primitive primitivism, had also incorporated a radical threat to the sexed order of things. If intersex bodies were of nature, then perhaps there was nothing natural about the sex binary. Perhaps the sex binary was a mess of rec misrecognition of biology. Or as many interwar endocrinologists had believed, perhaps all humans were, to a certain degree, normally intersex, so that masculinity and femininity were mere tendencies rather than absolute forms, and human life existed along a range of benign variation, including trans life. Money and the Hamptons were, all, were quite anxious about the risks in making such a profound shift, let it find form in the problem of counseling child patients and their pa parents. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, the public construes in a hermaphrodite as being half boy, half girl. The parents of a hermaphrodite should be disabused of this conception immediately. They should be given instead the concept that their child is a boy or a girl, one or the other, whose sex organs did not get completely differentiated or finished. A few simple embryological sketches show the original hermaphroditism of all human embryos in the indifferentiated phase, and the late stage at which external genital similarity of males and females is still apparent are of inest inestimable help inestimable are of inestimable help in conveying the enlightened concept of genital unfinishedness. There are echoes here of the previous medicalizations of intersex children, going as far back as Jung's surgical approach, which was or organized by the developmental age of his patients. The difference is that gender significantly consolidated the fear that bisexuality was a single temporary stage in development, the undifferentiated phase, it was normal so long as it did not persist too long. Money, therefore, counseled clinicians to quash any notion of mixed masculinity and femininity in the minds of parents and intersex children, and to replace it with the idea that the child's development was incomplete, that genital unfinishedness was a pathology that could, paradoxically, be corrected through hormones and surgery because of that very same plasticity that had resulted in the original condition. Intersex embodiment was redefined as a developmental condition where sex was no longer mixed, but unfinished. While the difference made by development was powerful, however, as a metaphor for children's growth, it went too far, leaving itself vulnerable to the material resistance from embodied plasticity that had frustrated Wilkins. From intersex to gender, the metonymy of plasticity and phenotype. There was an important series of metonymic slides in the 1940s and 50s when the child's generally plastic body, including sex, to the specifically intersex body, and back to the new universalizing scale of gender. Indeed, so effective was such metonymy that it would soon enable a further slide from clinical theory of gender developed for intersex children to, to a clinical theory of transsexuality. With the availability of potent new hormones, the transformation of the sex body during development promised itself anew to endocrinology, in a way that made such slides attractive to clinicians like Wilkins, Money, and the Hampsons. As poor as the ground for those movements may have been epistemologically, they would be rather easy to deconstruct their reliance on the discourse of development to justify arbitrary binary models couched in geni genital appearance. To dismiss them on the, those grounds would ignore how, as Donna Haraway counsels, it was precisely because there was a poor metaphorical fit at hand that the slide materially affected a new treatment protocol that worked in practice, at least for the most part. Plasticity filled the metonymic gap in Wilkins' work between medically significant conditions associated, associated with CAH, such as cardiac complications, cancer risk, metabolic crisis, and benign variations in genitalia and body morphology.
which carried no health risks. Cortisone had effects on both, after all. Cortisone had effects on both, after all. Money followed his lead, attempting to domesticate the agency of children's plasticity even further by reading it through a developmental framework that gave it a pretext for being forced into binary form. In doing so, he carried forward Wilkins' racialized sense of plasticity as an abstract whiteness that necessitated altering the body without consent and in non-therapeutic ways in the name of universalizing humanity. This is where Moreland's concept of plasticity as humanism came from at Hopkins. The plastic meant white, made gender work as an experimental technique for sex assignment. The folding of binary sex normalization into conditions also included life-threatening and other metabolic irregularities, marks the place where the plasticity of the endocrine body is both activated and racialized. The line between medical necessity, for an instance, preventing death from salt loss or preventing potentially carcinogenic and cardiac, cardiac side effects of high amounts of androgen, and the aesthetic normalization of the body and genitals necessarily blurs at the level of technique. This proves significant to gender's clinical efficacy. Money, like Wilkins, justified interventions into the intersex child's body on the grounds of a humanism that read, read those children's bodies, both abstractly and visibly, as belonging to a whiteness that could not coexist with non-binary phenotypes. Instead of cardiac risk or cancer, money used the language of social stigma and adjustment to cover over the arbitrariness of deciding on sex and gender without the consent of the child. Non-binary child children needed to be forcibly normalized because their whiteness precluded the social stigma they might otherwise endure. Although it's not really new, the racialization of plasticity and gender was in, in a way more pernicious than in the post-war era than it had been previously than it had been previously, because the abandonment of explicitly eugenic science and medicine was also an alibi for a very different to see racial normativity. It makes sense to say that in its invention, gender was a form of race. The morphology of the sexed and gendered bodies was a racial formation in Money's scheme of development. To put more simply, gender was a phenotype, much as sex had been during the preceding 50 years. By neutralizing the theory of natural human bisexuality, however, gender was a much more rigid phenotype than sex had been, obviating any claim that the human body could be naturally mixed in masculinity and femininity, or that it might grow in non-binary forms naturally. This is also where Paul B. Preciado's careful attention to the invention of gender in Testo Junkie falls dramatically short. In contextualizing money and his con <clears throat> in contextualizing money and his contemporaries in the Cold War and capitalist milieus of post-war American imperialism, techno-scientific ideology, and emergent modes of capitalist subjectification, Preciado agrees the gender mark a decisive moment in the 20th century. If the concept of gender has introduced a rift, he has written, the precise reason is that it represents the first self-conscious moment within the epistemology of sexual difference. In other words, with the notion of gender, the medical discourse is unveiling its arbitrary foundation and its constructivist character, and at the same time opening the way for new forms of resistance and political activism. In neglecting the racialization of gender as phenotype, however, Preciado calls for an array of politics of physical experimentation and semiotechnology, in the vein of practices of auto-intoxication or an auto-experimental form of do-it-yourself bioterrorism -ter of gender. Misfires. Deinstitutionalizing the techniques of sex and gender's medicalization in and of itself did not break with the racially normative logic of the alterability of sex and gender as human phenotypes. Access to the tools of a distant endocrinology was always stratified by race and class, for one thing. At a more abstract level, the gender-hacking body Preciado calls for would also be racialized white in its uncritical affirmation of plasticity's capacity for creative transformation and reinvention. Making use of the same techniques as the medical system, albeit without the endorsement of doctors, did not undermine the racialized economy of plasticity concretized in the 1950s.
for it misrecognized the degree to which instability and indeterminacy were incorporated into the clinical invention of gender. What's more, just like Wilkins and Money, Pregiato makes the risky assumption that gender's embodied plasticity is actually available for political work, that it has no agency of its own to resist or ignore its technical cultivation. For that reason, it is doubtful that children could even include themselves in such micropolitics, for their dehumanization by medicine as living laboratories has so severely impaired the exercise of their personhood that it underwrites the model of political agency that Chester Junkie promotes. Preciado makes much, much of the case of Agnes, a transgender girl who stole estrogen tablets from her mother starting at the age of 13 and was able to convince doctors at the University of California, Los Angeles in the late 1950s that she was intersex in order to get access to sex reassignment surgery. For Preciado, Agnes represents copyleft gender politics, where new possibilities for sexed and gendered life were built through leakage points in the state's control of fluxes. Yet I would argue that such leakages are uh, leakages in control are better understood as already incorporated into the medicalization of sex and gender through the oper operationalization of plasticity in the clinic. Wilkins conceded as much in his difficult attempts to treat the salt losing CAH, and the concession to plasticity's unruliness was codified by money in the Hamsons in the redefinition of it as a temporary and developmental. Plasticity was never meant to be completely controlled. It was always meant to leak out of its institutionalization. That is precisely the work that racial normativity accomplishes for medicine. Moments of per partial failure actually re regenerate the clinical apparatus and make the human form continually available for further alteration. Agnes may have been able to manipulate her doctors and psychiatrists, but the availability of estrogen pills in her white middle-class home in the 1950s Los Angeles was an integral part of why she was of such interest to doctors. Though she may have subverted discourses of gender and sex, she hardly occupied a subversive position within the racialized politics of plasticity. Could Agnes have broken free from the instrumentalizing interest in her white body that brought so many children like her into clinics? She returns again in Chapter 4, which considers these questions anew on the emergence of the new field of transsexual medicine in the United States. At the moment of the invention of gender, however, the reigning mood at Hopkins was to disregard and minimize anything re resembling claims to personhood, autonomy, or self-knowledge from children. While many intersex children were too young to speak or be aware of the therapies administered and the procedures and performed on them without consent, and many were never told what had been done to their bodies, some children were old enough to talk back to the staff at the Harriet Lane home. In one of their 1955 papers, Money and the Hampsons narrated the case of a child first admitted at age three and a half, identifying as a boy. He was diagnosed with hyperadrenocortical female pseudohermaphroditism. Although at birth, doctors felt uncertain about the baby's sex, they decided several days later to advise the parents that their child was male. At the Harriet Lane home, he presented a challenge for money. The Hampsons and their staff, who were of the opinion that he should be raised as a girl instead, at, at, at the Harriet Lane home, he represented a challenge for money in the Hampsons and their staff, who were of the opinion that he should be raised as a girl instead, as many reported. As soon as, as, he, rec as, soon as he recognized my face as unfamiliar, he approached me, saying over and over again, got to call me my mommy. There was a look of stark terror about him and a note of frantic urgency in his voice. He did not object to a genital examination, but kept perseverating pres uneasily. The nurse cut my wee-wee. I could not find much logical coherence between this and other reiterated sentences. It could not understand some of his baby talk pronunciations. I was left wondering whether this child has some kind of cerebral defect. This recall, this recall, money was saying of a three-year-old. He ordered an IQ test, which came back with dull, normal-level results, hardly a smoking gun. Money went on to say that, with familiarity, the child's speech became easier to understand. The case summary emphasizes the rep repetition of phrases. The nurse cut on my wee-wee. The nurse hurt me. Cut on my wee-wee. And the recurring call to see his mother. 
Money dismissed the constant concern, retorting that, in a typically childish way, he had grossly misconstrued his surgical experiences to signify that his penis was being mutilated and perhaps might suffer the fate he conceived that had befallen his sister's genitals, i.e. lack of a, a lack of a penis. Money's rhetoric stood on a rather obtuse adult innocence, as if it had never occurred to him that a three-year-old might express anger and fear at the non-therapeutic surgical alteration of his body without his permission. Money even went on as far to say that, in an older person, this kind of reiterated illogical thinking would be identified as delusional and psychopathological. It is not so completely benign, however, that one cannot afford to treat it casually and with indifference. The longer such misconceptions stay unrectified, they become increasingly ineradicable. The longer such misconceptions stay unrectified, they become increasingly ineradicable. The echo in this er interpretation of his theory of gender to the phrase increasingly ineradicable is unmistakable. Money labored intensively in, in the case summary to neutralize the meaning of this intersex child's speech to render it irrational. If they did not act soon, the child's elected gender role, which was at odds with money's, would become ineradicable. This time, at least, money was not to have his way. Despite the child's body being considered by doctors to be female in all ways except cortisol overproduction, money finally conceded that for this child, the risk of sex change, for this child, the risk of a sex change ending in psychiatric disaster was judged too great to justify the change. This child, who identified as a boy, was permitted to re remain a boy. The possible damage wrought by severe anxiety over being hospitalized and the power of adults to mutilate his body, of course, had already been done. Money's developmental wager on plasticity did not eliminate its capacity for embodied resistance. While he may have succeeded in suppressing this boy's speech, his decision not to try is reassigning him as a girl is an admission that he could not secure biological consent from this child's body. Plasticity may have been prized discursively for a capacity to take on new forms, but it had also been expressed, but it also expressed its own embodied capacity to grow into forms that disobeyed medical technique and discourse. And money knew that as well as any of his colleagues, and money knew that as well as any of his colleagues. Despite the shift from the era of young surgical procedures to the era of synthetic hormones, Money's fury still almost crumbled in the face of the three-year-old, who seemed to agree with his body's expressive masculine form. The thin scrim of developmental discourse, which had no real referent in the body, allowed Money to escape the collapse of his paradigm, as he could simply argue that this boy's gender identity had already been consolidated, that he was too old and no longer plastic enough to be raised as a girl. This self-conscious weakness of that argument is evident in Money's viciously ignorant dismissal of the boy's speech, the one thing Money thought he could control. The clinical scene is shattered by the knowledge that embodied plasticity, while floating the entire medicalization of sex and gender, also contained the capacity to refuse Money's coercion. Countless children, like this intersex boy, were forced into serving as living laboratories for the invention of gender. The fact that in less than a decade, money would help found the first gender clinic at a university hospital to provide transition and gender confirmation surgery to trans people is evidence of just how much these children inform the emergent discourse of transsexuality. The invention of gender also signaled a moment of discursive closure, not only because the sex binary was conceptually reinforced, but because the loss of the discourse of hermaphroditism included a loss of a certain ambiguity and overlap between trans and intersex life that had proved so profitable during the first half of the century. While clinicians like Young and the psychiatrist Thomas Rennie had exercised a gatekeeping role around trans and intersex patients' overlap as early as the 1930s, by the 1950s, the medical parameters had narrowed much more profoundly, even as the possibility for trans medicine grew exponentially. Set in the broader context of this book, where the 1940s and 1950s serve as a bridge between the first and second half of the trans 20th century, I am also arguing that the emergence of gender was responsible for the attempted reduction of transition to a binary model. If in the early 20th century, 
There were multiple definitions of transness as circulated between the lay and the medical domains. The post-war concept of transsexuality tried to double down on binary transition as the only acceptable model because the concept of gender greatly reinforced the binary coherence of sex. The irony is that the very medical paradigm that would finally permit institutional medical transition and gender reassignment in the United States on a large scale would also dramatically curtail the types of trans people eligible for such treatment and the forms of medical support that they would be allowed to access. Money's developmental argument helped to implant at the core of transsexual medicine the idea that the only acceptable transition was from one visibly binary sex to another, installing passing as a medical goal. Non-binary and intermediary forms of social and embodied life that had characterized trans life and its interaction with medicine over the previous five decades were deeply restricted now that binary masculinity and femininity have been reinforced as developmental phenotypes for all human beings. While these restrictions have been under construction for several decades, the concept of gender gave them a vicious clinical force that disqualified less medicalized or non-medicalized forms of trans and intersex life that had retained some aut autonomy from the clinic in the early 20th century. But money, like Wilkins and Young, ultimately risked too much on the premise that he could direct plasticity into predictable binary forms. And the next two chapters show how the imposition of binary transition by the model, medical model of transsexuality was unable to extinguish the multiple definitions of transness that had flourished in the early 20th century, particularly in the case of children. Plasticity and development's multiple itineraries continue to antagonize clinical practice well into the post-war era, while the resistance of a three-year-old who had challenged money on his medical authority and the violent effects of such normative logics were dismissed by him as so much childness. Transgender children who had to fight their way into the clinics in the 1960s would take up their embodied plasticity to, in creative and unpredictable ways. Chapter 4, From John Hopkins to the Midwest, Transgender Childhood in the 1960s. The opening of the Gender Identity Clinic at the John Hopkins Medical Hospital was framed as a watershed moment for the new field of transsexual medicine at the time of its announcement in November 1966. Fearing that it would, in fact, be too monumentous an event for a controversial field, the Gender Identity Committee that oversaw the clinic, composed of senior figures in obstetrics and gynecology, psychiatry, pediatrics, and plastic surgery, including Lawson Wilkins and John Money, had actually never intended to go public. They had come close to exposure once after the clinic's first patient, a black trans woman referred from New York by Harry Benjamin, received a cash offer from the Baltimore Afro-American to cover her story. The doctors managed to discourage her from doing the article, and her gender confirmation surgery was undertaken in relative secret. A few months later, however, the New York Daily News described a stunning girl who admits she was male less than a year ago and that she underwent a sex change operation at of all places, John Hopkins Medical in, in Baltimore. When the article prompted a phone call to the clinic from a New York Times reporter, the committee decided to hold a press conference to get in front of the story. At the press conference, the committee explained that the clinic had been created to deal with the problems of the transsexual, physically normal people who are psychologically the opposite sex. At the press conference, the committee explained that the clinic had been created to deal with the problems of the transsexual, physically normal people who are psychologically the opposite sex, and that it had been in operation de facto for one year, though only the one person so far had advanced to the surgery stage. Other patients were working their way through the clinic's incremental process, which included extensive medical and psychiatric examination, hormone therapy, and a pilot requirement of living publicly in one's gender identity for at least a year before surgery. Money served as something like the intermediary between the clinic and Harry Benjamin's practice in New York, which referred most of the first patients who had not already been to Hopkins. The funding for the clinic was also, like Benjamin's, underwritten by the Erickson Educational Foundation, a philanthropic organization funded by the oil magnate and trans man Reed Erickson and dedicated to trans causes.
While before the press conference, the clinic had received around 100 requests from people in the know seeking transition and surgery, after going public, the number of requests skyrocketed, with more than 1,500 reaching Hopkins over the following two years. Dedicated, dedicated exclusively to a trans clientele, the Hopkins program p- positioned itself as a brand new type of clinic in the United States, and it is, descri- is described as such in most transgender histories. What its doctors did not disclose at that press conference, however, greatly revises the way we understand trans life in the 1960s. In 64, a year before the clinic was established in secret, Money and several of his colleagues have been aggressively lobbying to take on as, as a full-time patient, uh, someone they had recently diagnosed as transsexual. In, 19, in January 1965, they succeeded. The criminal court for Baltimore City, where the prospective patient was on trial for burglary, issued a court order for surgical sex repair at Hopkins in lieu of incarceration. The judge was convinced by money and his peers that the defendant's criminal record was really a side effect of a misunderstood medical condition, transsexualism, and that surgery would break a spell of delinquency, arrest, and state institutionalization to stretch back some five years. The patient, G.L., was transferred from jail to a ward at Hopkins to await surgery. At the time, however, G.L. was only 17 years old. Their mother had to consent to the judge's order and signed the medical consent form for the surgery. Psychiatrists at Hopkins have been in con- contact with GL since age 13. When GL was, was referred to the hospital by school officials for delinquent behavior, GL's case history indicates that the first ge- official gender confirmation surgery for a trans patient at Hopkins was actually arranged for a child, or rather, it should have been. Conserv- conservative forces in the psychiatric f- faculty at Hopkins succeeded in delaying the surgery date several times, and in the interval, GL ran away from the ward, never to return. What does it mean that this watershed moment from, for transsexual medicine is shadowed by the absent presence of a trans child a year earlier? The 1960s were a decade of proliferation and early consolidation for transsexual medicine, as Benjamin, Money, and other lesser-known doctors greatly elaborated on his nosology and basic protocols and began a sustained public relations campaign with the help of trans people to establish its legitimacy. Some doctors also began providing gender confirmation surgery with regularity across the United States for the first time. During the same period, trans activism took on a more public and combative role. The Compton's Cafeteria Riot, for instance, happened in San Francisco only a few months before the press conference at Hopkins. Yet the scrutiny applied to this decade has not considered the ways in which children understood themselves to be transsexual, too, let alone were able to seek out and be recognized by doctors. Some trans children, like GL, found doctors who were willing to oversee hormone treatment, public transition, and even gender confirmation surgery under the pretense that it would constitute an experimental test case. Some trans children, like GL, found doctors who were willing to oversee hormone treatment, public transition, and even gender confirmation surgery under the pretense that it would constitute an experimental test case. For other children, by contrast, doctors were more interested in trying to extinguish transsexuality during childhood, now theorized as a developmental period of its onset. These latter clinics tended to favor psychotherapy or psychoanalysis over endocrine therapy, Although when the psychological approach consistently failed, it was often followed, if reluctantly, by hormones. What both clinical approaches have in common is that the plastic body of the child had become so naturalized that it served as the foundation upon which medical and psychological interest in self-identified trans children became meaningful. Children were of immense importance to the first full decade of transsexual medicine because they incarnated the alterability of of the biological body in development promising the future growth of the field of medicine in every sense of the word. But the part children played in this decade has been completely overlooked, only underlines the immense purchase of the racial plasticity of the trans child's body in the post-war era. Children were meant to recede into the background of the gender identity clinic to remain the developmental and plastic bedrock upon which doctors conducted their work, even though plasticity itself was in reality far from a passive force. Trans children, too, were far from passive and compliant with this project.
G.L.'s life was forcibly rendered into discourse by the language of law and medicine, leaving nothing else behind in the archive, particularly in the way of their own self-knowledge, voice, or perspective on their arrest, trial, and time spent at Hopkins. However, some trans children in the 1960s punctuated their increasing objectification and instrumentalization, if only momentarily. At the same time that doctors were cataloging and theorizing the childhood onset of transsexuality, the instability of plasticity emerged especially sideways in the accounts of trans children gave of themselves, particularly, particularly in their letters to doctors children demonstrated that the biological body manifested as a problem of form, where the potential meanings of grove were, were disrespectful of the developmental medical model. Particularly in their letters to doctors, children demonstrated that the biological body manifested as a problem of form, where the potential meanings of growth were disrespectful of the developmental medical model. Forms of growth, not yet, not quite binary, gendered yet not teleological, gathered in those letters, suggesting some of the ways in which trans children engaged their own lives on terms not wholly captured by medicine, however fragile and short-lived. In reconstructing children's role in the emergence of transsexuality, the weakness of medicine's pretension to have played a causal role in defining trans life is found in the ghostly surrounds of official discourse. Yet the undermining of transsexuality's rationality through the vibrancy, latency, and laterality of trans children also meets a second kind of boundary, a decidedly visual and visceral form of anti-blackness con constituted a much starker line between those trans children who were able to write into the formal problem of their bodies and those black trans and trans children of color whose traces of life during the decade are left behind in a more destructive context of institutions of confinement and deprivation such as the psychiatric ward. This chapter follows a trans child's body across the clinic, the written letter, and the psychiatric ward to limb some of the fragile apertures and harsh closures of the 1960s. The Formation of Transsexual Medicine Hopkins may have been the first American hospital to offer gender confirmation surgery for transgender patients in a formal clinic, but its opening was prefaced by some 50 years of work with intersex and trans people. The techniques of hormonal transition and surgeries, as the preceding chapters have explored, had been well established for some time. Still, until the 1960s, it was incredibly difficult and rare to find a venue in which to perform surgery without a recognized endocrine or genital abnormality, categories from which transsexuality was excluded because the biological body was judged normal. Rather than naming some technical or paradigm shift in the 1960s that would account for the transformation of American medical norms and the consolidation of a field of transsexual medicine, I argue that much of the key change in the attitude among professionals came from their increasing experience working with trans patients and members of the community who strongly advocated for themselves. It was patients who convinced the doctors to take their self-knowledge and requests more seriously although this task was much harder for children. While hormones were not very controversial, controversial, before GL, trans patients of all ages were st uh, stymied in their efforts to access surgery. When the Brady Urological Institute at Hopkins finally became the will in to diagnose patients with transvestism and soon thereafter, transsexualism in the mid to late 1950s, a, sh a shift in attitude slowly took root among those doctors who would later form the Gender Identity Clinic. In 1959, Milton Edgerton, a prominent figure in the plastic surgery department, brought a private client of his to the Institute, a trans woman from New York in her late 30s. Lane's record complaint on admission came in the form of an unambiguous direct quote, I would like to be converted from male into female as completely as possible. Edgerton reported that since the age of 18, when she left her hometown in Missouri, Lane had dressed and lived in the role of a woman in society, building a successful career as a dancer. She had lived with a man for eight years, to the point that Edgerton referred to in his notes to their marriage, although the relationship had broken off a few years prior. In 1955, Lane had found a doctor in New York who referred to her to a colleague willing to provide breast augmentation surgery. 
Edgerton remarked that she selected the woman physician because it seemed to her that a woman should know just more about a woman's body than a male surgeon might. Unfortunately, the Ivalon mammoplasty, which was a brand new procedure, led to a complication in one breast, requiring that the implant be removed and put back in. Now that the issue was resolved, however, Lane reported feeling much happier. Edgerton asked her how her friends would describe her after surgery. She states that they tell her how... Uh, she states that they tell her that she is much more interesting, he recorded. There is now a gleam in her eyes that she is much more fun to be with. The patient verifies that these reflect her internal feelings, and she says, in fact, I am quite a different person. Edgerton's use of Lane's preferred pronouns in her medical records represents a significant departure from decades of a detached, disregarding view practiced by most medical professionals of trans patients. It seems that Lane had made something of an advocate out of Edgerton by the time he arranged for her to visit in the Institute. The patient would suggest to me that she is quite determined and consistent in her desire to remain as a female in her role in society, he explains. She has arranged with considerable competence to support herself to avoid serious emotional depression with a very difficult adjustment problem in the past 20 years. As a plastic surgeon, Edgerton hedged that it would be difficult for me to pass on the psychological indications for the surgery. But he nonetheless argued quite strongly that the patient could withstand the surgical procedures. Although he did not believe the operation has been performed in previous cases throughout the medical literature, referring, referring to the United States, Edgerton began to outline his plan for how, if we elect to go ahead with the surgery, there would be a team of endocrinologists at the Brady Institute with whom he would like to work and he summarized the technique of vaginoplasty he would like to undertake. We explained to the patient that we would not undertake surgery, surgery without the full consent and cooperation of the psychiatric and medical physicians who, had seen, who have seen her, he concluded. This last caveat proved to be insurmountable. Lane was interviewed by two psychologists, John Hampson, who worked on Money's psycho, psycho-hormonal team, and John Schaffer. The latter spent some eight hours with the patient, evaluating the patient's psychological state by various personality surgery and project tests. Lane then met with the psychiatrist Eugene Mayer, who penned a report to Edgerton. The operation requested by this patient is an unusual one, he suggested at the outset. Mayer was impressed that many of Lane's colleagues and friends did not know that she was a trans woman and that questioning elicits no break in patient's female self-concept other than some depression stemming from the breakup of her long-term relationship. Mayer emphasized in his evaluation the absence of any psychological distress, psychosis, or schizophrenic trends. Indeed, he went so far as to say that, I have no evidence that the patient's personality, level of anxiety, or state of psychic organization is such as to definitely contradict, contraindicate any operative procedure. Writing to Edgerton alone, Meyer was quite candid. My initial reaction to this proposal and serious contemplation of its implementation by surgery was a distinctly negative one. My first reasoning was that anyone contemplating and seeking, seeking such an operation, by definition, had to be mentally unbalanced to a major degree and, therefore, any operation could only supplement and deepen neurotic or psychotic trends. In an uncharacteristic moment of honesty for a psychiatrist, however, he went on to say, After seeing the patient and talking with doctors Hampson and Schaefer, this first perception or view has been altered. Admitting the lack of a local precedent, at least in his mind, for such an unusual and rare operation, as well as vague legal aspects, Meyer nevertheless concluded that it is conceivable, although it defies most deeply ingrained assumptions, that the operation contemplated would result in a measure of psychologic sick relief. It seemed to me that the decision must be made in light of these facts. However, Lane's medical file ends after this letter, although the precise reason is not archived. It is mostly likely that the willingness of Meyer to sign off on the psychiatric rationale and if Edgerton to undertake the surgery was met with a firm refusal from the senior staff at the Brady Institute or elsewhere at Hopkins. Still, in convincing the two of them to endorse his, her goals, 
Blaine exemplifies the real difference trans people were making in their concerned effort, concerted efforts to challenge medical professionals to listen to them and fulfill their requests. Interestingly, Money's name is conspicuously, conspicuously absent from Lane's records. It seems during the 1950s that he played a fairly aggressive gatekeeping role at the Institute, attempting to, attempting to dismiss trans patients when they came looking for support and access to surgery. In 1954, when a retired trans woman from Ohio came to Baltimore, Money wrote her a lengthy letter. The main body of this letter, he explained to his colleagues in a separate report, is used in reply to all homosexuals and transvestites who write seeking information about treatment. The text is quite difficult to interpret. It makes several claims that appear outright disingenuous coming from money, given his simultaneous work on the sex reassignment of intersex children and the new theory of gender he was preparing to publicize. To a certain extent, the letter suggests a rhetorical strategy at the very conservative medical institution, where money would have had to work carefully behind the scenes, for more than a decade before getting his first approval for surgery, for GL, for GL. At the same time, the letter also testifies to the harsh clinical reality of the decade during which transsexual medicine emerged. Doctors were perfectly willing to diagnose, evaluate, and study trans patients in detail for the benefit of their own research before brusquely rejecting their actual requests. Money began by drawing a hard line between two quite distinct types of sexual disorder, intersex embodiment, physical disorders in which the sexual organs are improperly formed and other sexual features of the body do not develop properly at the end of childhood, and non-physical disorders, like homosexuality and transvestism, in which there are peculiar peculiarities in the growth and development, all of which are subject to learning, especially in the early, earliest period of childhood. While the separation of intersex and trans categories has been growing at Hopkins since the, at least the 1930s, Money's further distinction between intersex cases, which were physical, and trans cases, which were non-physical and subject to learning, anticipated the new framework of transsexuality. Breaking with the model of the early 20th century, he stated that there is not a fragment of medical evidence to suggest that these disorders are caused by abnormalities of the hormone-producing glands. Although, as we will see, some of Money's peers disagreed with him on this point. Despite the early outline of a differential transsexual diagnostic model, Money's main point teetered on the disingenuous. Changes of sex, about which you asked, he wrote, in this country are not performed on the physically normal people unlike yourself. This was not inaccurate. On the whole, since no U.S. hospital had as, has yet officially sanctioned surgery, his substance Tiation of that point, that it is impossible to undo the work of nature, however, ignored even his own research projects at Hopkins, anticipating a central transphobic argument from the political right and trans-exclusionary feminists, Money claimed that a man cannot be turned into a woman. It is possible to remove all the male sexual organs surgically, but it is not possible to supply all the female re reproductive organs, so that the patient ends up neither male nor female. Similarly, he contended that it is possible to give hormones so that the breasts will grow on either males or females, but in a male, the beard continues to require shaving and the voice remains as masculine as ever. Much of this character characterization of transition and surgery was simply medically inaccurate, and it's likely that many of the patients to whom Money sent this letter knew that. Anticipating that this argument would, would read as ridiculous, Money added a second, the psychological one, although this stood on even less solid ground in light of his ongoing research on gender. According to all the available medical evidence, he explained, it is impossible for a person to change all of the habits of a lifetime as male, habits of thought, of feeling, and of action, simply because he gets hormones and undergoes surgery. Again, an anticipating trans-exclusionary feminist arguments, he claimed, you may wear women's clothes out, but you may wear women's clothes, but in spite of your conviction of yourself, you will never sink and feel like a woman through and through. The contrivance on display in this letter was reinforced by its ending, which backtracked to a fair degree, no doubt in recognition that these arguments were unlikely to convince any trans patient who made the effort to seek out the Brady Institute. 
Money advised the trans woman to whom he was writing to continue with this judicious combination of expressing yourself at some times and of holding yourself in check at others. This was in spite of the fact that the immense emotional strain of being able to live as a woman, only part-time, had caused her to experience periodic blackouts, one of the reasons that she had come to Hothpins in the first place. Unable to restrain his desire to study trans life, even when he simultaneously refused to consider the situated perspective of a trans person, Money closed the letter by asking that she keep in touch. Please feel free, please feel free to write again, he said, apparently without irony, if you think that we at the John Hopkins Hospital can be of further assistance. These abrupt blockades of access to medical care, medical care these abrupt blockades of access to medical care were not unique to Hopkins either. Even when doctors at other institutions were officially arranged surgery for trans patients, last-minute legal interventions from the local hospital board frequently prevented procedures from being carried out. When the former GI, Christine Jorgensen, returned to the United States from Denmark in 1953 to a massive media storm, her narrative of traveling to Europe to obtain surgery was instantly iconic, in part because it was relatively accurate. In the early 1950s to the mid-1960s, Benjamin kept track of the places to which his patients who had the means tra who had the means traveled in hopes of undergoing the conversion operation, and prominently among them figured Denmark, Italy, Morocco, and Mexico. In a few cases, some trans women were successful in having surgery performed ad hoc in the United States, but only after undertaking the dangerous step of self-castration to prompt emergency intervention. In 1965, when the Hopkins Gender Clinic opened, a few rare surgeries have been performed in New York City, San Francisco, Houston, and Memphis. The only serious attempt at regularly undertaking gender confirmation surgery for trans patients prior to the opening of the Hopkins Hospital was likely Elmer Belt's private urology practice in L.A. in the late 1950s. But by 1962, he gave up without having completed a single procedure, facing too much opposition and obstruction from local hospital boards. In 1958, Agnes saw the psychi psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Robert Stoller at the University of California, Los Angeles Medical Center. Assigned a boy at birth, Agnes knew from a young age that she was a girl and was now reaching adulthood, searching for a doctor to obtain access to gender confirmation surgery. When Stoller and his colleagues examined Agnes, they found her to be, by their standards, a normal, if feminine-looking, male with one glaring exception. Her gonads produced an incredibly high level of estrogen, no doubt a large part of the reason for her feminine appearance. Such a starkly biological suggestion of transsexuality had never been observed, and the case greatly excited Stoller at the beginning of a defin definitive endocrine theory that would legitimate and clarify the new field of medicine. After later undergoing surgery, however, Agnes returned to UCLA for a follow-up interview during which she confessed that she had actually started taking her mother's estrogen pills at age 13 in hopes of changing her body. She had not previously disclosed this to her doctors, and it turned out that her estrogen-producing testes had never really existed. Benjamin, who had been following the case, was deeply disappointed, but continued to hold out for a biological explanation for transsexuality. In the mid-1960s, he latched onto a new neuroendocrine research on the relationship of the gonads to the hypothalamus, hoping for a possible brain-based hormonal explanation. Importantly, these initial forays into the gonads in the brain served to reinforce the developmental framing of transsexuality's onset. Agnes' careful manipulation of her doctors is also one evocative example of how trans children attempted to work within the severe constraints of a model that took great interest in their plastic bodies but offer them no voice or autonomy in making medical decisions. The Agnes was also middle class white trans that Agnes was also a middle class white trans child whose mother had seemingly massive supply of oral estrogen tablets. However, is a second key detail in how about how the new category of transsexuality was racialized in the 1960s. While the straightforwardly biological explanation for transsexuality Benjamin hoped for never materialized, he contributed greatly to the consolidation of the field from the early 50s to the late 60s 
Five decades after Magnus Hirschfeld's work on transvestism, the word transsexual was first employed in English by the sexologist David O. Caldwell in, 19, in a 1949 article to describe a patient who, desire, who desired a sex change Five decades after Magnus Hirschfeld's work on transvestism, the word transsexual was first employed in English by sexologist David O. Caldwell in a 1949 article to describe a patient who desired to change sex but otherwise was considered to be biologically normal. Louise Lawrence, a well-connected trans woman in the San Francisco Bay Area who was helping Benjamin contact similar people at the turn of the 50s, introduced him to Caldwell's work from which he adopted the term transsexuality. Still, Benjamin also felt himself attached to the taxonomy and approach inherited from his old friend Hirschfield. Benjamin's informal experience with the trans patients at the turn of the 50s, adding to his pre-existing reputation as a leading endocrinologist, abridging the American and European traditions, amounted to a certain instant renown, not to mention his willingness to serve as a congenial patriarchal figure. In 1953, he met Christine Jorgensen, recently returned from Denmark. Benjamin took her on as a patient in his private practice, and they began strategizing about what to do with the countless letters letters written to Jorgensen seeking support in obtaining health care and gender confirmation surgery. As as was so frequently the case for Benjamin, the help and labor of well-connected trans community members like Jorgensen and Lawrence made his clinical research possible. And yet, while doctors were far from the only labor force behind the discourse on transsexuality, they received nearly all the credit and recognition. In 1953, Benjamin put together a symposium on transsexuality, which took place at the New York Academy of Medicine. In several articles that followed from its proceedings, he outlined the new diagnostic category. Reflecting his ties to to the pre-World War II era of endocrine and sex research, he proposed, he proposed that it is well known that sex is never 100% male or female. It is a blend of complex vi- variety of male-female components. The medical management of intersexes of varying character, degree, and intensity, moreover, makes sex a rather flexible concept. The ultimate point of this work was to reject transsexuality as psychosis and instead propose a psychosomatic outline of a condition coherent enough to merit hormone treatment and gender confirmation surgery. Reaffirming the centrality of a developmental biological etiology to sex- sexual morphologies of the body, Benjamin opined that the genetic and or endocrine constitution, often a psychosexual infantilism, has to provide a fertile soil on which the basic conflict must grow into transsexuality. In theorizing such a biological basis for, condi- for a condition primarily expressed psychologically, he added rhetorically, has not Eugen Steinach showed us in his highly suggestive experiments how the feminized male but guinea pigs behaved like females? In 1964, the Harry Benjamin Foundation was established through a three-year grant from the Erickson Educational Foundation, EEF. Indeed, without the financial backing of Erickson, a trans man, it is unlikely that transsexual medicine would have grown and professionalized in the 1960s. Benjamin used the opportunity to formalize his working relationships with most of the other prominent researchers and doctors in the field, building a national advisory board with several connections into Europe. A smaller, dedicated group of researchers who were able to make the regular trip to New York convened at a, tr- convened at a trustee meeting at which patients were presented and discussed across disciplines and institutions. When the Hopkins Gender Identity Clinic started to take shape the following year, it was integrated into the work of the foundation with a similar overture made toward the standard Stanford Gender Gender Clinic that soon followed. Yet the funding flow from the EEF was transient, and Benjamin had an extremely querulous relationship with his wealthy benefactor, Erickson. Yet the funding flow from the EEF was transient and Benjamin had an extremely querulous relationship with his wealthy benefactor, Erickson. By 1967, as the initial grant period was drawing to a close, Benjamin's foundation was particularly bankrupt and was therefore ceased to, forced to cease formal operations. Nevertheless, during its existence, the foundation served as a key vehicle for connecting and promoting the research that was the basis for transsexual medicine 
at otherwise disparate locations across the country. Benjamin also decided to write a book that could appeal to sympathetic but uninformed doctors, as well as prospective or current trans patients, eager for more information and scientific authority. When he sat down to write The Transsexual Phenomenon in 1964, Benjamin had records on hand from 189 trans patients at his private endocrine clinic. He began by running a series of data analyses on them that provide some insight into how children fit into the first few years of his transsexual practice and the foundation. His youngest recorded patient at the time was 17, and there were a half dozen other teenagers under the age of medical consent in his roster. They are presumably with the consent of their parents. Benjamin was very interested in the childhoods of his patients for the elaborating on the onset of transsexuality, or what he speculatively called the psychosexual infantilism. In 1953, in, ni- in 1950s, Benjamin was very interested in the childhoods of his patients for elaborating the onset of transsexuality, or what he had speculatively called psychosexual infantilism in 1953. To that end, he examined his patient data to see the first evidence of their sense of gender identity. Nearly all his patient records returned the a- returned answers such as always or as long as remembers. He always noted the age of onset of puberty and various kinds of evidence of childhood conditioning that might explain his patient's cross-sex identifications. The transsexual phenomenon that resulted in a roaming, undisciplined text that attempts to introduce a range of skeptical or curious readers to a new field of medicine draped in rhetorical mystique, while mounting a polemic in favor of a legitimizing gender confirmation surgery. Benjamin's most pedagogically mode Benjamin's mostly pedagogical mode of address covers a range of subjects, couching transsexuality in a Steinock derived theory of human bisexuality and plasticity, adjusted to the post war era. With a nod to Money's work from the 1950s in particular, Benjamin explained that gender is a non-sexual side of sex, which is to say, the psychological manifestation of what, trained in the German tradition of medicine and biology, he had long just called sex. More important than nomenclature, according to Benjamin, was the fact that the advancement of biologic and especially in genetic studies has eliminated any absolute division in the sexes. In his estimation, the dominant status of the genital organs for the determination of one's sex has been shaken, at least in the world of science. Benjamin summarized up to ten or more separate concepts and manifestations of sex that compose each individual, positing that the exact balance of genetic and environmental factors remains unknown, asking readers to keep in an open mind. Nevertheless, true to his field, He still emphasized that masculinity and femininity are, to a large extent, results of the endocrine sex, which, as he impressed upon readers, is mixed in every person, to an even greater extent than any other factors. Therefore, Benjamin concluded with his characteristic confidence, we are all intersexes, anatomically as well as endocrinologically. This broadly intersex explanation for sex in general and transsexuality in particular may seem somewhat counterintuitive in view of Benjamin's goal of legitimizing a new field of medical specialization. In claiming that biology teaches that we are all a mix of male and female, he teetered on the edge of of the radical claim that transsexuality is unexceptional and potentially a universal tendency in sex life. This broadly intersex explanation for sex in general and transsexuality in particular may seem somewhat counterintuitive in view of Benjamin's goal of legitimizing a new field of medical specialization. In claiming that biology teaches that we are all a mix of male and female, he teetered on the edge of the radical claim that transsexuality is unexceptional and potentially a universal tendency of sex to life. Something like a morphological counterpart to Gail Rubin's proposal of benign sexual variation, as a model for thinking about sexual practices and cultures. The implication was hardly one that Benjamin endorsed, and the rest of the transsexual phenomenon veers into an armchair slumming account of perversion and tragedy restricted to a small minority of the population, as if to violently undo the prospect. Still, 
The plastic value of biology and the endocrine body were both such that Benjamin felt convinced that the treatment of transsexuality as a mental state required not psychotherapy, but hormones and surgery. The lack of specificity in defining transsexuality in relation to intersex conditions constitutes an epistemological problem that the transsexual phenomenon, like the new field of medicine to which it contributed, could not resolve. It had been growing, after all, since the early 20th century. To avoid misunderstanding, Benjamin clarified at one point that transsexuality has nothing to do with hermaphroditism, but without a substantive explanation as to why. His insistence on the naturalness of life's bisexuality could not contain the con cross-contamination between the two ostensibly abnormal categories, transsexuality and intersex, and the ostensibly normal category, a cisgender body, which, as Benjamin had already established, does not even exist in reality. Only the developmental timescale of biology in childhood is able to bring order to this matrix of sex and gender by making intersex and transsexuality two, two underdeveloped forms of life, as he puts it. Incomplete versions of male or female human form requiring medical intervention to achieve normal articulation. The child, in other words, intervenes once again to organize the field of sex and gender along a teleological progression from an original bisexuality to a mature masculinity or femininity. The arbitrariness of that teleology, though, haunts the transsexual phenomenon, as it had Hugh Hampton, Young, Wilkins, and Money before him. Benjamin also feigned the nosological challenge of distinguishing the new category transsexualism from transvestism, the later, which for Hirschfeld at the turn of the century, encompassed both erotic and cross-dressing, both erotic cross-dressing and living in the sex, different from the one assigned at birth, could not easily be left behind. Not in the least because many patients were not especially invested in drawing a distinction or adopting the new medical category. Louise Lawrence, for instance, was happy to call herself a transvestite in the late 1950s, and while she lived full-time as a woman, she felt no need for hormone therapy or surgery, observing that the Christine Jorgensen trend was a generational shift at best, rather than a medically true for passing fat at worst. To manage the varying degrees of biological or cultural tint to transvestism and transsexuality, Benjamin concocted a sexual orientation scale, SOS, with seven degrees of cross-dressing and or the desire to change sex, hopeful that it would work well enough descriptively to encompass most of his patients. Only the most extreme cases on his scale, that is, a seven, would qualify in his mind for gender confirmation surgery. Benjamin also had to distinguish transsexuality from homosexuality, still laminated onto sex and gender through the historical residue of the 19th century discourse of inversion. Indeed, he lamented, he lamented the transsexual phenomenon that Americans assisted that the terminology of homosexuality refers to the realm of gender identity, even though the German idiom of intersexuality. Indeed, he lamented in the transsexual phenomenon that Americans assist, insisted that the terminology of homosexuality refers to the realm of gender identity, even though the German idiom of intersexuality in its estimation is more tolerant of the biological and psychological intricacy, intric intricacy demonstrated by human life. Nevertheless, Benjamin also staked a relatively unambiguous claim to analytical separation of gender from object choice, one that would become integral to the medical gatekeeping around transsexuality. The sex relations of the male homosexual are those of a man with man. The sexual relations of a male transsexual are those of a woman with a man, hindered only by the anatomical structures that an operation has to alter. Benjamin's interest in, tran in the trans childhoods of his adult patients is evident in his observation early on in The Transsexual Phenomenon that true transsexuals, in his, in his experience, invariably date the beginning of their deviation to earliest childhood. While it is quite possible that such statements may merely express the wish that it be so, Benjamin emphasized that transvestic tendencies in the great majority of all cases were noted in the first five or six years of the child's life. The developmental framing he borrowed from Money's new concept of gender, according to which any natural bisexuality at birth must grow into either masculine or feminine form by adulthood, 
made the child a necessary core of Benjamin's category of transsexuality. Although he could never satisfactorily prove his speculations about his neuroendocrine basis, the scientific and medical consensus on the incredibly, plas the incredibly plasticity of children's bodies and minds carried enough force to travel with his research and writing into the 1960s. Benjamin's clinical research on trans children also remained largely theoretical and retrospective, since he saw only a handful of teenage patients at his practice on the Upper West Side of Manhattan prior to the 1970s. It was on the other side of the country that one clinic began taking on many trans children of all ages, and in doing so, found quickly that the plasticity was much more autonomous than the new discourse of transsexual medicine desired it to be. Childhood Transition in the 1960s, UCLA's Gender Tran Identity Research Clinic. The Department of Psychiatry at the University of California, Los Angeles, founded a gender identity research clinic in 1962. Since this clinic never offered gender confirmation surgery or explicitly suggested it was created for trans patients, it has gener generally not been considered to precede the Hopkins Clinic, despite having opened earlier. With funding from the National Institute for Mental Health, NIM, it lasted into the 1970s, although by then its work with young children had come under heavy fire, mainly from gay activists who protested psychotherapeutic attempts at eliminating effeminacy, or proto-homosexuality, in young children. At the time of the clinic's founding, a memo circulated by the Department of Psych Psychiatry explained that it would study and provide treatment for intersex patients, but this was probably a strategic misdirection. Despite stressing that we are not at this time offering diagnostic treatment services for anatomically and endocrinal endocrinologically normal homosexuals, transvestites, or other sexually perverse patients, such patients precisely became the main focus of the clinic. The historical porosity of intersex and trans life, inherited from the early 20th century, still provided enough cover for an interdisciplinary organization that saw a wide ran range of trans and gay patients, including many children as young as three to five years old. Not offering surgery, UCLA made itself more accessible to a range of patients who did not necessarily fit the new diagnostic archetype of transsexuality, and helped to secure direct funding from the university and from NIM, which was exceedingly rare during this decade. The clinic's architects were also more interested in psychology and psychoanalysis than any of their contemporaries, especially ben Benjamin and Money. The psychiatrists, psychologists, and psychoanalysts who ran the clinic during the 1960s were generally skeptical of the prevailing obsession with endocrinology in, in diagnosing and treating transsexuality, transsexuality. They felt that psychotherapeutic approaches had not been exhausted, and the children, in particular, represented a unique opportunity for such treatments. However, through their opposition, at, opposition the clinicians at UCLA were just as entangled with the problem of the plastic body as were their colleagues on the East Coast. Robert Stoller, who directed the clinic for much of the 1960s, is emblematic of the psychological take on the plasticity of gender. Trained as both a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst, he directed the clinic with Richard Green, who had studied under Money in medical school. From UCLA, Stoller developed a distinct critique of Money's vision of gender identity and sex assignment, one that did not quite oppose psychology to biology but at least argued that the former could be used more profitably to overcome any variance in the latter, in many ways an inversion of Benjamin's paradigm. As the 1960s wore on and the hope of an endocrine explanation for transsexuality continued to evade researchers, notably in the high-profile case of Agnes, who had apparently made a resentful enemy out of Stoller by outwitting him, UCLA became a home to work that was both hostile and suspicious of trans children while well, ironically going much further with homeward treatment and transition for children than the ostensibly welcoming clinics on the East Coast. Stoller's account of the psychodynamic etiology of transsexuality during the childhood was similar to arguments by, by, made by psychoanalysts about the genesis of homosexuality in the 50s. He argued that too much closeness between an infant assigned male at birth and his mother at a developmentally sensitive moment precipitated an originary identification with femininity in the baby. That first identification, given time, would eventually grow into a adult transsexuality. 
whether or not milder versions of the same process explained homosexuality or effeminacy was a question that Stoller tried to clarify, with as little success as Benjamin had had. In making this argument, Stoller's work on transsexuality assigned to itself the ambitious task of rewriting Freud's theory of infantile sexual development. Basically, a debiologizing reading of sex sexuation. What Freud fought was an elemental quality, masculine protest, or repudiation of femininity in men, Stoller explained, rather than reflecting a biological force, is a quite non-biological defensive maneuver against an earlier stage, closeness and primitive identification with the mother. Comparably, in females, earlier than penis envy in little girls, is a stage of primary femininity, the biological lies steeper, deeper still. This theory of too much mother, while barely distinct from contempor com contemporaneous, this theory of too much mother, while barely distinct from contemporaneous models of the psychogenesis of homosexuality, drew its impetus instead from money's imprinting theory of gender identity, analogized to lang language. In the archetypal case of the transsexual. Stoller saw the mother's imprinting of femininity onto the child through too much closeness as the pathological assumption of gender identity during a crucial infantile stage of development. Unlike his psychoanalytic peers, Stoller saw no conflict at the core of transsexuality, but rather a pathological primary identification. In his contemptuously titled book, The Transsexual Experiment, published in the 1970s and based on his research at UCLA, he explained the distinction this way. I see male transsexualism as an identity per se, not primarily as the surface manifestation of a never-ending unconscious struggle to preserve identity. <clears throat> to me, transsexualism is the expression of the subject's true self, Winnicott's term. Rather than transsexuality being the symptom of a deeper conflict in gender and personality, Stoller repurposed it as a pathological absence of a conflict between normatively antagonistic masculinity and femininity. Through this move, Stoller located himself squarely within the developmental paradigm of sex and gender, for the acquisition of that Winnicottian's true self marked a threshold after which transsexual identity was effectively unalterable by therapy. The psychic plasticity of gender had by then closed had the psychic plasticity of gender had by then closed an assumption drawn by analogy from biological theories of sexual differentiation as much stoller claimed to present an alternative to biological approaches despite his open and virulent pathologization of trans people stoller was ironically willing to to reluctantly endorse the pursuit of transition for patients who had crossed that threshold for those young enough not to have reached that developmental stage, however, Stoller felt that a transsexual identification and resulting identity could be preempted, if not aggressively eradicated, by sustainable psychodynamic therapy. It seems impossible to treat the adult transsexual successfully, he suggested in The Transsexual Experiment. Even at age six or seven, our work is formidable. This intensified an emphasis on the childhood onset of gender identity magnified the importance of children to the medicalization of transsexuality during the 1960s, perhaps even more than Benjamin would have thought. As Stoller put it bluntly, treatment of the transsexual boy may be the only way to prevent adult transsexualism. Trans children, however, were rarely as obliging as Stoller imagined. Unsurprisingly, given the rigid reading of sexual difference in Freud, upon which this theory relied, Therapy for trans girls essentially consisted of attempting to induce an Oedipal complex through the transferential interventions of a male therapist. Given the phallocentric presumptions of male transsexuality and too much mother that lay at the heart of Stoller's model, he also had very little to say about the transmasculine experience, save for the rather clumsy chapter in The Transsexual Experiment, in which he inverted the terms of his theory of transfeminine patients. Yet the hard-line quality of his published work was not reflected in Stoller's clinical practice, not to mention the work of his colleagues at UCLA's gender clinic. Many so-called effeminate boys were brought in by highly anxious, overwhelmingly white and middle-class parents 
for consultation in psychotherapy. In these cases, which became the subject of outrage for gay activists, the prescription often mimicked the stark terms of the transsexual experiment, at least at first. Green worked with many of these children and their parents, and a transcript from one consultation is undertaken in 1969, suggests a pervasive social anxiety over white masculinity and the developmental basis of gender identity that drove this aspect of the clinic's work. Dr. G. How did you hear about my work here? Were you referred? Mr. We read about it in the LA Times, she, the mother, asked our own family doctor about some of these mannerisms of his, and we suggested that we wait until five years of age. Mrs. He said at the time it's hard to tell whether it's pathological. Dr. G. Tell me this now. How far, how long ago did you first have these concerns that there was something effeminate about him? Mrs. I'd say in the past year we were beginning to become concerned about it. Mr. We read an article in Newsweek magazine where it talked about homosexuality. One thing it sort of summarized was that one thing they noticed about all of them and that that was boys are quite a bit criers. And that got us to thinking because, boy, we've got a crier on our hands. This clinical scene reflects the project of trying to prevent the development of gay men by aggressively subjecting effeminate boys to normalizing therapy. Green's role in this business is brilliantly taken to task by Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick in her foundational essay, How to Bring Your Kids Up Gay. Yet in the medicalization of effeminacy, queer fairy has overlooked just how many other children were diagnosed immediately as transsexual, eventually receiving support from doctors and psychologists and transitioning during their childhoods, despite the reigning pathogenic discourse. Ultimately, it mattered quite little beyond theory for the faculty involved in UCLA's gender clinic whether femininity in children assigned as boys as birth was interpreted as proto-homosexuality or transsexuality, as was the case more broadly for researchers who undertook similar work in the 1960s. The common problem of developmental timing drove consultation and treatment. Not that the gender clinic faculty involved were uninterested in the intellectual problem, Al, the psychiatrist, Alan Rutterberg, who began reading, receiving referrals through the clinic in 1964, stressed the importance of making a diagnostic distinction between childhood homosexuality and transsexuality in a conference paper he gave in the late 1960s. In describing to his audience one of his five-year-old patients, whom he had diagnosed as transsexual, he found it fascinating that the psychiatric literature is almost devoid of any description of the particular entity. In case his audience was not following him, he continued, I want to make it clear that I am not referring to the well-elucidated category of effeminate little boys or boys of transient cross-gender identifications, familiar to child psychiatrists. What I wish to describe is a little boy whose feminine identification was so strong, secure, and consistent as to justify the use of the term transsexual to describe him. And yet in this very case, as Ruttenberg noted, the five-year-old had been had first been brought in by his parents, worried their child would grow up to be a full-blown homosexual. The categorical trouble encountered by Hugh Hampton Young in the 1930s remained, to be sure, but it was underwritten by a deeper consens consensus over gender and sexuality as developmentally organized phenomena. Lawrence Newman, another psych psychiatrist affiliated with the UCLA Gender Clinic, tried to synthesize these tensions by drawing on Money's theory of gender acquisition. The earlier studies of hermaphroditic children, he explained, had established that the way a child is reared during his first two or three years of life will determine thereafter whether he feels himself to be male or female. On that basis, Newman wagered, turning to his own colleague, Stoller has demonstrated a specific combination of family circumstances which lead to the development of profound femininity in boys. Where money advocated for endocrine therapy and surgery, however, Newman agreed with Stoller that psychotherapy should be pursued intensely with children. He sketched the problem thus. If we define a successful treatment of transsexualism as one would make the transsexual give up his cross-gender orientation and become comfortable with his physical sex, a treatment, for example, which would replace the male's transsexual femininity with masculinity, we must acknowledge that nothing approaching this exists. <laughs>
If profound cross-gender orientation is detected early in life, no later than by age five or six, an intensive individual therapy for the child and counseling for the family instituted on a regular basis, the reversal of gender orientation is possible. With feminine boys, the treatment is based upon interfering with the child's feminine fantasies, reassuring him that he is a boy and he will not grow up to be a girl while at the same time helping him to see that being a male has many rewards. In his clinical work with both trans boys and girls at UCLA, however, Newman failed to follow his own words and often ended up overseeing transitions for his child patients, precisely because such intensive individual therapy for the child and counseling for the family had absolutely no anti-trans effect. He tended to see the onset of adolescence as the practical threshold at which there was no point in pursuing psychotherapy anymore to change the patient's gender identity. Georgina, one of the trans girls he saw regularly in the 1960s, therefore began to live full-time as a girl when she turned 15. With Newman's guidance as a supervising psychiatrist, as well as the, the permission of her parents and school officials, she was able to transfer to a new school in the LA area, legally change her name, and complete high school as Georgina while continuing to visit UCLA for estrogen therapy. Much later, Newman recollects, she secured gender confirmation surgery. In spite of the hostility inherent in Newman and his colleagues' approach at the discursive level, they regularly oversaw transition and hormone therapy for trans children. Relying on on the developmental model of the child in which psychological plasticity comes to a close after a certain time, In spite of the hostility inherent in Newman and his colleagues' approach to the discursive level, they regularly oversaw transition and hormonal therapy for children, relying on the developmental model of the child in which psychological plasticity comes to a slow close after a certain time. The memoranda of the weekly Saturday clinic conferences, which serves as the primary way for faculty to share research with clients across the disciplines, record many snapshots of the wide variety of trans children who pass through the clinic's doors. In fact, many children and their parents were literally brought in front of the assembled clinic staff at those Saturday morning meetings, presented by their attending physician or therapist and subject to observation by the rest of the faculty. Some of the earliest memoranda from 1963 and 64 mention a five-year-old transvestite and a 15-year-old transvestite transsexual, who were scheduled to take part in a Saturday conference. Others from the later years of its operation, 1969 to 1970, scheduled visits for an adolescent female to male transsexual who insist on androgen treatment and completing high school as a boy. A 13-year-old female to male transsexual, a 12-year-old pre-transsexual boy, and a 9-year-old girl with transsexual fantasies. As the wide variations in age and terminology over the decades suggest, there was no single organizing rubric for trans children at UCLA, nor were meticulous records kept on just how many children were seen by everyone involved in the interdisciplinary clinic. The discursive centrality of the child's plastic body to transsexual medicine, as established by Benjamin and then inverted by Stoller and his UCLA peers, found itself mired in the clinical reality of treating children. The desire to fully instrumentalize the trans child's body for normalization or the eradication of trans life was forced to confront the partial autonomy of plasticity and the resistance to such capture. For that reason, the paradoxical situation emerged in the 1960s whereby those clinics discursively the most receptive of children. For that reason, the paradoxical situation emerged in the 1960s whereby those clinics discursively the most receptive to trans children such as Benjamin's and Hopkins, offered the least, in the, the least in the way of practical transition, while those that were discursively the most hostile, such as UCLA, oversaw the most thoroughly hormonal and public transitions. The remarkable, remarkable achievements of trans children and the families at UCLA in the face of intense institutional transphobia, however, probably have more to do with their tenacity and with the overriding value of the children's bodies to transsexual medicine than with any spirit of openness and dignity on the part of its clinicians. The doctors at UCLA were generally beneath the compassion in their day-to-day work. 
Stoller's intake notes on a 1963 consultation with a five-year-old possibly trans child, for instance, end on a chilling but typical punctuation. I would not want him for my son. Writing the body as a problem of form. The unprecedented discursive and clinical extension of transsexual medicine in the 1960s relied on at every turn on the child's plastic body to picture the onset of transsexuality and to imagine technical approaches to treatment and therapy in developmental terms, both psychological and hormonal. As UCLA's reluctant, if not over, overtly hostile approach to, it demonstrates, trans children were not taken seriously as subjects or participants in this endeavor, nor were they accorded any autonomy or voice by medical practi practitioners. However, the overriding value of trans children as plastic bodies also created an alluring, if fragile, aperture for those trans children to attempt to cultivate different relationships with doctors and medical science that did not reduce that did not reduce them yet again to the animate substrate of medical technique. One of the only traces left behind by trans children in the 1960s, where they do not materialize through a discur discourse spoken by others, is in their handwritten letters to doctors. Here, although the idioms and grammar of transsexuality necessarily remain in play to secure legitimacy and attention, the trans child's body also moves ever so slightly sideways out of the rigid constraints of medical discourse taking incipient shape as a problem of form that will not be confined, even if it never achieves the stability or intelligibility that might warrant well-worn terms like resistance. Benjamin's New York practice, particularly after he collaborated with Jorgensen, received a huge number of letters from trans writers, among whom were children as young as 13. When articles on transsexuality appeared in newspapers or the popular press across the country, Benjamin's name was surpassed in the number of mention, if, in the number of mentions, perhaps only by Jorgensen's. Indeed, the two often appeared one after the other at the end of articles to direct the curious readers toward the experts. With so little medical literature in print, even before the transsexual phenomenon came out in 1966, Benjamin's name was frequently attached to anything ostensibly medical written about transsexuality. Perhaps just as important was the trading of his address between trans adults or children, including through correspondent networks like Lawrence's or more informal pen pal relationships. Benjamin also maintained a friendship with the author of the popular Dear Abby advice column, ready to field letters from trans writers. When Jorgensen's autobiography appeared in 1967, it contained passages from Benjamin's work and an introduction he offered to authenticate her explanation of the medical side of transsexuality. Consequently, some children decided to write him after reading her book and either not receiving a response from Jorgensen or feeling too nervous about reaching out to a celebrity. However, they found Benjamin. However, they found Benjamin. Nearly all the children who sought his help or advice stressed first and foremost that they knew what transsexuality was and that the term accurately described them. One trans girl, a high school junior from high California, put it this way, for approximately five years, the wish to become a female has been, and still is, with me. This wish is very strong in me. When I read your book, my hopes were raised to their highest level. Many offered unsolicited variations on the soon-to-be standard autobiographical frame. I have felt for a long time like a girl trapped in a boy's body, trying to get out. Puberty was often a trigger for seeking out a doctor's opinion. One 17-year-old trans girl wrote Benjamin of a Further need for urgency in my case, related to her rapidly increasing height. Already six foot feet one inch tall, she surmised that I think it will be great. I think it will be great to be that size as a girl, but that the problem is that I'm still growing and life as a six foot five girl would be terrible. Seemingly well versed in the logic of endocrine therapies, she added, I understand that growth can be stopped with hormones. In that case, my treatment and growth can be controlled simultaneously. This can only be done if I start now. A 16-year-old trans girl from upstate New York likewise explained to Benjamin that androgen was something like an alien presence within her body that she had become extremely frustrated and humiliated by the hair that's getting thicker and darker on my body, by the, my voice that's getting deeper with every word I say 
with my rough, acneed skin. With every new day that androgen runs through my veins, I get more miserable. It has to stop. Androgen isn't me. Estrogen is. In hopes of fitting the diagnostic model of which Benjamin was of one of principal architects, many children were quick to assure him that they were not homosexual, that they wanted nothing to do with that, with, with what one 17-year-old trans girl called the gay life. Though she had tried living as a feminine gay boy for several years, this girl explained to Benjamin that last month she was in a bar and talking to another female impersonator, and she told me she was a transvestite. I asked her what it meant, and she said that she didn't want to have sex with men or women until after she'd have a sex change. I gave this matter a lot of thought, and it seemed to have put a whole new light on my life. Indeed, convincing doctors, as well as parents, teachers, and other adults to accept their claims to transsexuality frequently occupied the lion's share of children's letters, and in letters like this, they reflected the growing abandonment of an older sexual inversion model in favor of a 1960s form of sexual and gender identities. Benjamin and his colleagues' replies were so standard and repetitive that Virginia Allen, the practice's secretary, would often write back on her own if they were unavailable or out of town, or if repeated letters from a single child had begun to annoy the doctors. A typical reply outlines a three-part argument. You are very young and must give yourself a chance to mature, Benjamin wrote. In two or three years, life may look differently to you. Of course, some children, undeterred by the developmental rhetoric, would keep writing for the duration of those two or three years. And so Benjamin continued. If you feel very bad, you should talk, take your parents into your confidence. They are probably your best friends. Finally, he added, you should also consider t talking to your family doctor or to an understanding psychiatrist. Beyond this form letter, many responses from the practice included reprints of Benjamin's articles or a suggestion to purchase a copy of The Transsexual Phenomenon. Otherwise, replies from Benjamin and his colleagues were curt and generally dismissive. Using the alibi, otherwise, replies from Benjamin and his colleagues were curt and generally dismissive. Using the alibi of medical age of consent and, in a strange rhetorical twist for Benjamin, the developmental language of the unfinished body of the child to shut down inquiries. Many children expressed their frustration with this standard reply, the medical age of consent, and the unwillingness of doctors to see them, prescribe hormones, or authorize gender confirmation surgery. One trans girl from San Diego wrote Benjamin after the gender identity clinic at Hopkins told her to come back at age 21. Perhaps I am young, she conceded, but continued, I felt this way all my life, and I've tried. I felt this way all my life, and I've tried other ways of living my life, and now I know that by having the operation would be the best thing for me. This isn't something I have fought up overnight. I hope you'll give me the chance. A sixteen-year-old trans girl explained it in more general terms to Benjamin, and those who dismiss it as adolescency don't know what they're talking about. I felt like this for sixteen years, long before my adolescency. And just now I'm beginning to, I'm becoming increasingly aware of myself, both physically and psychologically. When Benjamin replied to her ongoing letters with a routine plea to wait several years, she grew impatient and turned the developmental discourse of transsexuality back on him. I don't want to wait until I'm growing old. I want to be a girl on the way to my old age. I want to be a girl now so that I can grow up the rest of the way as a normal girl. While in their letters, children tended to work carefully to stick to the parameters of transsexuality, hoping that their investment in medical narratives would be returned with help. The, trans the childish form of their writing and their lack of adult ex expertise with specialist language sometimes cracked the discursive veneer. Alongside their writerly genius are flashes of fascinating digression, as when a 14-year-old from Ohio had received Benjamin's address from a fellow trans girl, she knew, began reciting all of her friends at high school in an oddly repetitive list. I would rather have a girl for a best friend than a boy. A lot of girls are like me. Sharon, Cindy, Patty, Linda, Colleen, Connie, Patty, Linda, Dixie, Sherry, Tony, Yvonne, Diana, Cindy, Shayla, Debbie, but the one I like most is Paula. She's a fab. Only a few of the boys like me.
But some of them are just jealous because I'm smarter than them. This trans girl's pen pal, who lived in a different part of the state, turned out to be one of the most prolific letter writers to Benjamin's practice in the 1960s. For her, the trans body's growth wrote itself into the surrounds of her ostensibly medical letters, recording an interval of growth that began to spread out laterally from the rigid developmental narrative that otherwise confined her to the gatekeeping medical model of transsexuality. It was not Benjamin, but his colleague at his practice, Leo Woolman, who started to receive letters from his this young trans girl in rural Ohio in 1968. Writing under a pseudonym, Vicky, introduced herself as a 14-year-old boy who wants nothing more out of life than to be a girl. While she had already come out to her father, he is not understanding, and had withheld his consent for her to see a doctor in Columbus. In her first letter, she asked Woolman to write back to try and convince her father to let her see the doctor. Or perhaps, she wondered, could she just mail her a prescription for estrogen? Vicky also narrated an overview for her day-to-day -day life, mentioning that she was afraid at school because the kids are cruel, that her grades have been slipping, that she had to be on a diet because of weight gain from emotional eating, stemming from deep depression, that she had tried to commit suicide at least once. Virginia Allen prepared, for a, standard, prepared a standard response for a woman, which boiled down to one dismissive line. Be patient, finish your education, and see how you feel once you are matured. Undeterred, Vicky continues to write every few weeks to New York with various questions over the next two years. Is it possible for you to get some kind of permit to let me wear women's clothes? Could you give me a prescription for something for my nerves? Could she, could she, could she eat hormone cream to simulate the effects of estrogen therapy? At the same time, she kept Woolman apprised of her life. After coming out to her best friend at school in a written letter, she was publicly humiliated when the note was then passed around the class. I was never so embarrassed in my entire life, she wrote. Her peers were vicious. They're always hitting me and yelling at me. My arms are black and blue, and I can't help but not do anything. Woolman, who continued to let the secretary reply on his behalf, showed little interest in Vicky's reports. In the spring of 1969, Vicky sent exciting news. Finally, my father said I could have the sex change. With that permission, she continued, here is what I want you to do because I have tried to, tried but get too embarrassed. Please, please write him a letter telling why sex changes are performed and that they, me, do not have to be hermaphrodites. It is possible, it is possible that Vicky had made up the story about her having her father's permission in order to finally coax a useful reply that she could use to convince her father that she was trans, or perhaps it was true. Either way, Woolman never wrote the letter, and in fact soon left the office to resume a general practice in Brooklyn. Vicky continued to write to Benjamin. By the summer of 1969, she had moved in with her cousin in Columbus and went out in public as a 16-year-old girl. By her estimation, people have never questioned me. I've been in ladies' restrooms, I've been whistled at, even been helped with my coat. She also felt she also felt certain that her father would now finally pay for her to see a doctor in Columbus. The next letter I write, she added enthusiastically, will either be telling you I get the operation or that I was turned down. To that end, she appended a further set of questions about trans children. Who was the youngest female to become a male? Who was the youngest male to become a female? Can sex changes have children? What does it take to be a true transsexual? Who was the first sex change? When, when was the first sex change performed? Do you make all your patients having a sex change live one year on their new sex before surgery? Vicky's letters, at first glance, present a field of tensions indicative of the opening and closure provided by the plastic body for a trans child in the 1960s. She was able to articulate her thoughts, albeit awkwardly and with at, and at times childish flair, 
through the medical discourse of transsexuality to relate to doctors as authorities who, if only she could convince them of her need, might greater access to hormones and other supports. Woolman, however, used developmental discourse to reject her from her very first letter, as did Benjamin, touting the medical age of consent and the ostensible unfinishedness of the biological body at 14 to counsel her to defer her hopes and needs, where Vicky read the interval of childhood as a source of tremendous pain, Woolman and Benjamin preferred that she force herself to grow up before transitioning. In this version of their back and forth, there was not much to say that was extra discursive. The narrow intellectual value of Vicky's transsexual body to medicine was probably the only reason that medicine's practice would correspond with non-patients like her over the several years. Yet, if growing up, for Vicky, turned around the problem of whether she would become the girl and woman she knew herself to be, in her letters there were, were uh, unanticipated lateral modes through which her trans body articulated itself without totalizing capture by the medical world. Possessed by what Catherine von Stockton call, might call her childlike passion for signification, Vicky wrote about herself and her body, whether wittingly or not, as a problem of form intrinsic to growth and plasticity. What emerged infrastructurally in her letters was a thick web of references to fat and weight, a preoccupation with the kind of non-teleological growth and latency that fatness, fatness incorporates, beside how Vicky's body was part of a medical discourse that instrumentalized her growing body along a hormonal and gendered axis, axis. And the thickness of her writing her body also became a richly formal problem in its wayward growth into fatness instead of socially recognized femininity, or, for that matter, masculinity. In The Queer Child, Stockton coined the term sideways growth, to describe such unanticipated situations, powerfully particular to the publicly impossible child, whose identity is a deferral. Unable to be articulated during childhood, and so forced to find almost unintelligible, shadowy outlets. Stockton explored these circumstances as they are intensely pre present for the ghostly gay child. A kind of child not meant to exist in the 20th century, and who, therefore, can be birthed only retroactively from adulthood. These sideways growths looked lurking underneath normative timescales and models, instances where the child who, by reigning cultural definitions, can't grow up, grows to the side of cultural ideals. We work well to describe the 20th century trans child, the problematic normative conceit to open this book, that there somehow were no trans children in the past, doubles in its local manifestation here by Woolman's refusal to recognize Vicky as a trans girl in the present tense of her childhood. In Vicky's case, however, what we find in her letters is less of a lateral move away from the reproductive time that the queer child tra tracks than a volatile, fleshy scale of growth without teleological form, fat. In the interval of a refused but dwindling childhood, the way her body signified between fat and feminine leads us into moving suspensions of shadows of growth that circumvent both the childhood teleology of development and the burgeoning discourse of transsexuality in the 60s. In Vicky's letters, her fat incarnates the undecidable place where the desirable plasticity of the developmental gendered body that makes her intelligible to doctors as a possible transsexual dissolved into the unwilling willingness of biological form to obey the rigid confines of medicine, normative childhood, and the gender binary. Where the developmental scripted trajectory that moved in one direction, multiple modes of growth overran that neatness and spread the meaning of Vicky's trans childhood into non-teleological forms that show up only briefly in her letters. In other words, if woman refused to help her grow up into femininity, then in the interval her latency, animated by the pain and depression of virulent transphobia, was growing fat. These letters, whether, unwitt whether wittingly or not, illuminate some of, of the ways in which being asked to wait tr to transition falls upon its own developmental premise. Vicky's body did not stop growing just because she did not have permission to grow feminine. Crucially, Vicky's body did not stop growing just because she did not yet have permission to grow feminine. 
Crucially, the forms into which he grew also partially disobeyed what either Woolman or Vicky intended. In her first letter, Vicky described her body in detail in terms of shape and weight. Well, to begin, I am 5'10". My hands and body, hips and waist, are not shaped like other boys. My fingers are slim and soft like the girls at school. My waist is curvy, so last night I took my measurements and the results were 40, 33, and 40. I weigh 168. The dietitian said I should weigh 135 to 40. The indecision between growing fat and growing feminine is already present in this introduction, with Vicky suggesting that her fingers and waist were naturally more like a girl's than a boy's, but that her curviness has also been diagnosed as a pathological growth by her doctor. Hardly feminine at all, but also a symptom of the psychosomatic effects of transphobia. Or was that feminine curviness being sanctioned? misrecognized, really, as fat by her dietitian in order to undermine Vicky's sense of being a girl. It is hard to say with any certainty. I started eating last year or so because I found relief in the refrigerator, but found out it only added to my unhappiness, she continued. Now I'm on a diet and have already lost 10 pounds. In the first letter, Vicky also asked Woolman for a prescription for estrogen, among whose effects are weight gain and, redistri and a redistribution of fat, that might be at odds with the weight loss goals. Her living body was forced to grow in the shadow of a possible paradox of emotional eating, dieting, hormones, and transsexual diagnoses. Without having as much, without, without having to say as much, Vicky seemed to be working to accommodate those tensions. Enclosed with his letter were two small photographs of herself, ostensibly dressed in boys' clothes to help ill illustrate the matter of her dilemma in stark visual terms. In a close-up shot, her face is weathered by visible pain and an exhaustion that make her look much older than 14. In a wide-angle shot, taken in front of her house, Vicky is facing away from the camera but turns her head back to look at the viewer, as if she is both surprised by and guardedly expectant of connection. When Woolman replied that Vicky should wait until she reached the age of majority to begin taking estrogen, his attempt to dismiss her instituted a crucial deferral, an interval in which waiting was nonetheless an aperture for growing, paradoxically in hope, in both a hopeful and toxic sense. Well, since nothing can be done until I'm 21, Vicky replied, I'll just have to try and wait. In that interval, the fat body continued to surface in her writing, usually orf orthogonal to the point of her letters, but perhaps for that reason, all the more formally important. She asked, for instance, for a note from Woolman. They would get her excuse from gym class, where her peers were so cruel and violent that her body became paralyzed. I can't help but not do anything, she explained. The strangely increasing paralysis of her growing condensed into moments of conflict in spaces like the gym, growing possibly fatter or thinner, not, but not more feminine in the eyes of others, was so extreme in magnitude that it both kept her alive and yet also inexorably poisoned the quality of her life, almost to the breaking point. I sing about running away, she confided, but I can't. I've tried killing myself, but nothing happens. At the very worst, I, get, I just get sick. After a year passed since she first found out about a sex change, Vicky remarked, I don't know how I've managed to live through it. In the interval, she had not stopped growing, which would perhaps have been more desirable, for, for continuing to grow had been a disappointment to everyone who had held uneven jurisdiction over her life, her doctor, her father, woman, and herself. Elsewhere, Vicky began to wonder about some of the many paradoxes of eating and its relation to growing. Would it simply make her grow fatter, or could it help her grow more feminine, too? I read somewhere someone was eating hormone cream and what it did to them, she mentioned in May 1969. Well, I have found a place where I can get it. It said that a per person was eating two ounces of 10,000 units of estrogen a month. So I figured that I will only be able to eat half an ounce of 40,000 units of estrogen. I am still hoping it comes, because I sent for it 11 days ago, and, that, and it was in New Jersey. Perhaps the suggestion of her actually eating the hormones was too much, 
for Benjamin, who was now running back after Woman had left his practice, broke from his usual form response to say in no uncertain terms that she must not eat any hormone cream. What about the possibility of eating hormones to feminize rouse Benjamin out of his silence? Perhaps he was even unaware of the prompt, for, in another way, the doctor's response has only to the most dramatic shocks or punctuations in Vicky's letters seemed to reflect a rhetorical strategy that allowed him to miss the substance of her writing. The fix around to, to the content of her letters, mostly latent and effective, sometimes breaking ever so slightly into signification. Never did the doctors want to address the plasticity of Vicky's fat or recognize that it was addressing them. Her last letters in 1970, for instance, revolved around finally securing access to estrogen through a doctor in Columbus. Now 16 years old, Vicky expressed great optimism about her future, but the fatty tissue of, her, of the body saturated the space surrounding her signifiers in her final entry in the archival record. And I wanted to know if the hormone esteril will make my breast large enough without implants, because I don't want implants unless, it, unless necessary. After years spent trying to control, decrease, or slow down the plastic growth of her body to stop her from getting fatter while waiting for it to be given permission to grow into a form recognized as feminine, Vicky seemed to ask that her breasts grow on into their own, on their own, without implants. While it would certainly be possible to read Vicky's writing as symptomatic or straightforwardly emotional pain, such structures reveal next to nothing about her situated knowledge as a trans girl in deferral. How can we explain, after all, the doctors who in principle had nothing to offer still corresponded with her for two years? The initiative and boldness that Vicky explained by going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the leading figures of transsexual medicine deserved to be underlined. It was no small feat to carry on about diagnosis, hormones, and breast development with two endocrinologists. Perhaps part of that discursive work for Vicky was refining a way of talking about herself, so that when she found a doctor in Columbus, she was better able to negotiate with the clinic for about what she needed. Still, is the virtuosic practice of medicine expertise practiced by a trans child really an account of agency? The extreme limitations of the medical model could not be more apparent than in the constant refrain of no, coming from Woolman and Benjamin. The force that stretched the interval in which Vicky continued to grow, fat but not feminine, at such high cost. Her frequent references to suicide attempts being only the sharpest examples. There is no scene of resistance in the writing of trans children. However, the plastic body, which admits no material distinction among growing up, growing fat, and growing feminine, did accommodate strange moments of partial signification for children like Vicky. Organic detours where she where the indecision at the core of growth was a formal inter interruption of the rigid schema underwriting child development and transsexuality. What modes of autonomy or non-teleological vitality were occasioned or could have been cultivated by Vicky had those forms not been so quite quickly extinguished by medicine at every turn remained difficult to see. But only because children are forced into the position of lacking access to any language besides adult signification. So long as that remains the case, the forms occasioned in trans children's bodies and letters in the 1960s will remain, like Vicky's, whispers filling the space between the signifiers of medical discourse. There is no scene of resistance in the writing of trans children. However, the plastic body, which admits no material distinction among growing up, growing fat, and growing feminine, did accommodate strange moments of partial signification for children like Vicky. Organic detours where the indecision at the core of growth was a formal interruption of the rigid schema, underwriting child development and transsexuality. What modes of autonomy or non-teleological vitality were occasioned or could have been cultivated by Vicky, had those forms not been so quickly extinguished by medicine at every turn, remained difficult to see. But only because children are forced into the position of lacking access to any language besides adult signification. So long as that remains the case, the forms occasioned in trans children's bodies and letters in the 1960s will remain, like Vicky's, whispers filling the space between the signifiers of medical discourse.
The Psychiatric Ward, or A Black Trans Girl's 1960s. Vicky's access to a writerly voice that, in its encounter with a medical discourse, generated formal problems that crept away from the limits of transsexuality, also relied on her plastic whiteness in a way that stood in stark contrast to the positioning of black trans and trans children of color in the archive. There are very few of them, as middle-class white children disproportionately made it into the gender identity clinics and private endocrinology offices, given to the degree to which plasticity had become synonymous with whiteness. The trans child with the largest collection of documents I found in the archive was actually a black girl from New Jersey. Yet the volume of discourse surrounding her life was not enabling, but devastatingly obfuscating. A thick stack of psychiatric papers described in a different form of shadowy language. The life of a girl institutionalized for decades under the flimsiest of schizophrenic diagnoses. Growing up in a poor, black neighborhood of Trenton, she was committed to a psych- psychiatric institution through the foster care system, which had, been, which had taken custody of her years earlier because of her mother's unsupported disability. For the next 15 years, psychiatrists took her profession of gender identity as evidence of delusion, mental retardation, and sexual perversion, signing off annually on her continued confinement. The paper trail of her institute- institutionalization made it into the archive, in which I was looking only because in 1978, Jan Hoff, a psychiatrist and trans woman who took over Benjamin's practice after his retirement, petitioned to have her released. After interviewing the woman, who is now 30 years old, Hoff rebuked all of her transphobic diagnoses in a powerful letter. Through all the florid language of the psychiatric reports, there is an unmistakable moralistic disapproval of her effeminacy, effeminacy and homosexuality, but not the slightest hint that the diagnosis of of transsexualism was suspected. Even though it was quite evident from the details provided, she should be placed in the community, preferably living by herself, and she should be permitted to explore the various problems that arise from cross-gender living, hormonal therapy, and surgical gender reassignment. For this black trans girl, the 1960s were a radically different decade from the one examined in the rest of this chapter. The state and medical institutions having long colluded to confine and detain black people from their bodies and dispossess them of their personhood, took up her gender as evidence of insanity in order to suspend her childhood altogether, forcing her to grow up on a psychiatric ward. While this book argues for understanding the racialization of sex and gender through the equation of plasticity and whiteness, race here makes a second kind of crucial and highly visible difference. The racial innocence withheld from black children in the United States in order to justify forms of ongoing dispossession manifested as a withholding of the narrow parameters of the new discourse of transsexuality from black children. Only through an errand of mercy by trans affirmative psychiatrist by a, did the fly only through an errand of mercy by a trans affirmative psychiatrist did the files created by this girl's institutionalization make it into an archive of transgender history. Many other trans children of color in the 1960s remain visible. In the gulf that separates GL, who was forced into the new model of transsexuality, Georgina, who was able and willing to transition as a teenager against the inclination of doctors, Vicky, who was made to wait in an interval of growth, and this unnamed black trans girl, who had her childhood suspended by the state, we find a set of fractures birthed into the category of transsexuality from its very emergence. Chapter 5. Transgender Boyhood, Race, and Puberty in the 1970s In the summer of 1973, John Money received a letter from a doctor in upstate New York looking for advice. Having, re- having been recently referred a 15-year-old girl, an exceptionally bright, articulate, well-read, perhaps unfortunately, youngster whom I have only seen twice thus far, the doctor sought Money's counsel because the data thus far strongly suggests that a diagnosis of transsexualism will eventually be made. <laughs> 
While the doctor was not himself trained in transsexual medicine, at the risk of my sounding grandiose or naive, he explained that over the past several weeks he had read to the best I can ascertain everything written in English on the subject until 1970. Was the surfeit of new medical knowledge fresh in his mind, he articulated his primary concerns. That the process of diagnosis, evaluation, and management is a long and costly one. That the family of the 15-year-old trans boy had limited financial resources. And that he therefore wanted to make certain that they incur no extra steps in cost due to unnecessary duplication of tests or exams. Since there was no gender identity clinic in this particular city or upstate, he made his primary request. I would very much appreciate drawing from your experience for a suggestion as to when would be a good time to make a referral to your clinic for evaluation. In his reply, written a week later, Money articulated on his now standard diagnostic and treatment protocol for transsexuality, calibrated for a trans-masculine child. He more or less dismissed the doctor's worry about the importance of a gynecological and endocrine exam to make a diagnosis of transsexuality. If the findings are routine in the former, as I suspect they will, he wrote, then there will be no need for special endocrine examination. Similarly, he explained that psychologic testing may prove to be an, of ancillary interest in the establishment of the diagnosis, but is not sing qua non. Simply put, one does not establish the diagnosis on the basis of psychologic tests. Instead, Money counseled the doctor to interview corroborative informants, who knew the boy well but who, unlike his parents, were not too close to the subject to give presumably honest answers about his gender identity. I consider it diagnostically almost indispensable, he emphasized, especially in the case of a 15-year-old child. Having dismissed the doctor's initial concerns, Money outlined the core of his diagnostic model. In his mind, the one test of signal importance in the diagnosis of transsexualism is what I have called the two-year real-life test. During the two years in which this trans boy would live full-time in his gender identity, Money explained, he would prove that he w- could rehabilitate himself in the sex of reassignment. Success during those two years grounded his eligibility for surgery. In the case of female-to-male transsexualism, he explained, the final irrevocable step is hysterectomy and overectomy. Because of its self-consciously limited results, Money did not recommend pursuing phalloplasty. Until this point, Money's letter is rather unremarkable. It rehearses what had, by the 1970s, become a general model of assessment and increasingly rigid gatekeeping to restrict access to transition and surgery to only those individuals who could prove their adhesion to the wrong body model and their desire to pursue passing as the primary goal of transition. Yet here, money began to digress from the generic narrative for trans adults, returning to the child at hand, a 15-year-old boy. I am willing to consent to a mastectomy much earlier than other surgical procedures, money explained to his correspondent, because it does not make an occupational adjustment as, as a male much easier. What's more, he continued, it is not too difficult to do a breast implant. Should there be a change of heart at any time in the future, similarly, he went on, I definitely go along with the idea of because it does not make occupational adjustment as a male much easier. What's more, he continued, it is not it is not too difficult to do a breast implant should there be a change of heart at any time in the future. Similarly, he went on, I definitely go along with the idea of early treatment with male sex hormones. Many effects of androgens could be later reversed if need be, he explained. One, a cha- <clears throat> only a change in voice was irreversible and permanent, but even that could be modulated in a soft and husky way so as not to be too obvious and noticeable. Having made a case for hormone therapy and top surgery during char- childhood on the basis of its practical biological reversibility, money digressed into a point much broader in scope. Now that the legal age of voting in and adulthood has gone down from 21 to 18 in over half of the states, 
I do not see any special reason to fix the age of 21 instead of 18 as the age of personal consent for transsexual reassignment surgery. The most important thing to me is the evidence that the person has lived in the sex of anticipated reassignment for two years, has been treated by society as a member of that sex, and has personally experienced and adjusted to the challenge of living in that sex. In sum, Money concluded, I think you will find it very worthwhile to work with this patient. He advised the doctor not refer the child anywhere just yet, but just but instead allow him to live full time as a boy immediately, start on hormones, and pursue top surgery. If in two years he has seated, succeeded in living the life of a boy, then Money suggested that the referral for a gender reconfirmation surgery be made to his clinic at Johns Hopkins Medical Hospital provided that the parents' consent was obtained. While while historiographically remarkable for queer and transgender studies, as we will both see shortly, Money's reply to this doctor in upstate New York was also importantly typical for the 1970s. The growth of transsexual medicine at university research clinics in the 60s had cemented a basic, if controversial, academic and professional standing for the field. In addition to Money's home clinic at Hopkins and the UCLA gender clinic discussed in the previous chapter, major gender clinics had been established by the University of Minnesota, Northwestern University of Chicago, the University of Washington, Seattle, and perhaps most famously, Stanford University. With funding from the Erickson Educational Foundation, Money and Richard Green had also edited the landmark volume Transsexualism and Sex Reassignment in 1969 bringing together more than 25 clinicians and researchers to codify the emergent norms of the field. And as Joanne Mayerwitz had argued in the 1970s, has argued in the 1970s, the United States saw a quantitative increase in transition and gender confirmation surgery, primarily because uh, private clinics also began to offer services without requiring the lengthy two-year assessment that Money and his peers had used to try to limit access to medical resources. If adults were willing to pay and had enough money, it was somewhat easier for them to get access to hormones and surgery during this decade than the previous one. Given the central role that children have played in the consolidation of the field's diagnostic and treatment protocols since its founding, it is not surprising that in the 1970s, trans children continued to participate in the broader trends of this decade. Many transitioned under the supervision of doctors, living out in full time, taking hormones, changing their names, going to school, and, more commonly than in the 60s, securing access to surgeries during childhood. Yet this chapter begins with Money's letter in particular because it addresses a trans boy's childhood and transition. While this book has argued, through and through, for the importance of insisting that transgender children do have a history that stretches across the 20th century, there is a chapter and added there is in this chapter an added dimension to that insistence whether or not trans women's disproportionate visibility for much of the history of tw- the 20th century is a distorted effect of the obsessive focus on their bodies by medical science or non-committent conceptual and clinical disinterest in trans masculinity or some combination of both the question is even more strained in the case of children a second generational presumption, oddly yet to be challenged, comes into play. The sense that trans men and boys did not come of age demographically until the 1990s. It has been too easily assumed that prior to that decade, many people who might have at a later time identified as transgender or transitioned to some degree were instead butch lesbians. This chapter explores trans boyhood boyhood in the 1970s to investigate the generational and historiographical assumptions of the so-called border wars and the misplayed preeminence of the diagnostic and statistical manual in queer theory and transgender studies narratives about gender nonconformity in childhood. I suggest that both fields have gotten much of this time period in its aftermath wrong, mainly by overemphasizing generic medical discourse at the cost of specific histories of the clinic which often outright contradict the former. Not only were there many many trans boys here in the 1970s who are unrepresented in the scholarship and whose lives are more generally unknown, 
but also their, their childhoods and medicalized interactions with doctors both cut across presumptions of the transmasculine butch lesbian but border wars but also presaged a certain contemporary discourse around puberty and the reversibility of childhood transition in this final chapter of this book what follows disassembles and reconstructs the immediate history that informs the contemporary medical model of transgender childhood by arguing for the specific specificity of trans boyhood prior to the cultural cultural visibility of trans men in the 1990s. Much of the debate in, 20, in the 21st century around the suppression of puberty and the reversibility of childhood transition looks less settled in the context of 70s trans boyhood. Yet any desire to recuperate a coherent narrative or identify the trans boyhood also undoes itself when juxtaposed alongside the lives of black trans girls during the same decade. Proceeding through this impasse will take us ultimately to the tangled legacy of plasticity in pediatric trans medicine I discuss in the, in the conclusion of this book. But first, to understand the importance of the 1970s, we must displace the prominence of the year 1980. The Generational Politics of the Border Wars the year 1980 marks a certain kind of retrenchment for access to transgender medicine in the United States with the codification of the Gender Identity Disorder GID, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual DSM, of the American Psychi Psychiatric Association APA. The gatekeeping model of medicine developed by Harry Benjamin, Money, and their colleagues eventually won out over the diffuse range of private clinics that offered surgery to those who could pay during the 1970s. At the same time, while there had been numerous uncoordinated attempts since the 1960s to cover the cost of transition through state medical programs or private health insurance, the codification of GID provided a very difficult but important opening toward insurance coverage for trans medicine, one still extremely tenuous today. Yet the DSM has also been leveraged to mark an oddly uninterrogated set of historiographical and narrative divergences in queer and transgender studies, a split between homosexuality and trans embodiment and between trans masculinity and trans femininity. Both divisions ought to be more troubled by the experiences of trans children. From the onset of histories of the transgender child, I have argued that the prevailing narrative today about transgender children is that they are the, of the present and the future, that they have no past. If there is, any way, an implicit historiography of trans children, though, it takes its cue from the changes made to the DSM-3 released in 1980. David Valentine argues in Imagining Transgender that the 1970s witnessed a consolidation of a major categorical split between homosexuality, which as gay politics took shape, increasingly defined itself as gender normative, and transsexuality, which was not allowed to be sexual at all, but increasingly relied on asexual, wrong body narratives. For Valentine, the declassification of homosexuality by the APA in 1973 and the introduction of the GID in, in 1980 marked the decisive events in that process. By the time the DSM-3 was published in 1980, a new diagnostic category had been established, Gender Identity Disorder, GID. GID created a diagnostic place for people who had not previously been explicitly recognized as such in the pages of the DSM, transsexuals, and others who had engaged in visibly gender-variant behaviors and who had previously been understood, at least partially, through the categories of homosexuality and transvestism. Valentine adds, however, that this cleaving of sexuality as object choice from gender as identity, desired by gay activists who also is also the accumulated effect of a century's work of strain on the 19th century discourse of inversion, which mixed object choice and self-presentation in an all in an all-encompassing category of sex. It would be accurate to say that lesbian and gay politics more or less acquiesced in the, in the 1970s to a sexological model through the removal of homosexuality from the DSM and the splitting of gay and lesbian from trans politics. In her monumental 1991 essay, How to Bring Your Kids Up Gay, Eve Sedgwick makes a, made a striking claim about an effect of this shift. 
1973 to delete homosexuality from the DSM was in practice severely undercut by the introduction of the subsequent DSM-3 of GID. Reading psychoanalytic and psychotherapeutic work in light of the bait and switch, Sedgwick underlined the stark effect of, effect of the theoretical move of distinguishing gender from its sexuality. Far from eliminating homosexuality as a treatable condition, the depathologization of an atypical object choice can be yoked to the new pathologization of an atypical gender identification. In other words, the result of the change in DSM from 1973 to 1980 is that, while denaturalizing sexual object choice, it radically renaturalizes gender, and it is the child who has to pay the price. The material cost of the turn for Sedgwick is possibly the very life of the effeminate boy, who is utterly cast aside by the mainstream gay and lesbian politics that sought demedicalization through gender normativity, while being left newly while being left newly vulnerable to the psychiatric profession's displaced desire to eradicate all gay people by preventing their development during childhood. In such a situation, Sedgwick argues pers persuasively the effeminate boy becomes the haunting object of the ep epistemic shift from 1973 to 1980. Even an ostensibly gay affirmative therapeutic discourse, discourse sh could still participate in the genocidal impulse to eradicate homosexuality by leveraging GID to treat sexual object choice by proxy through childhood gender. Yet there is still another ghostly child here, one that neither Valentin nor Sedgwick detects. There is a way one could read the introduction of GID as a proxy for pathologizing homosexuality in proto-gay boys, while also excluding the many trans children who are also interp interpolated by the new classification. That is clearly not Sedgwick's intention, but in the wake of How to Bring Your Kids Up Gay, the trans child, unlike the effeminate boy, has received no attention in queer theory. This reading of the DSM lends credence to the idea that there were, somehow, no trans children in that moment. It, only when the psychiatric treatment of proto-gay boys for the effeminacy becomes politically intolerable in the 2000s would the label GID be applied to transgender children instead. Yet another displacement of the residual energy of inversion. As gay children were folded into the state as protectable under certain highly racialized circumstances, transgender children became the new focus of pathologizing discourse, or so the story might go. To be clear, this extrapolation does not exist per se in queer theory. It remains only an implicit takeaway from work on the DSM and gender nonconformity. Non gender nonconformity. It remains only an implicit takeaway from work on the DSM and gender nonconformity. It does, however, exist in media coverage of the first transgender children of the mid-2000s, on which refers again and again to the fear in parents and that their children might be lesbian or gay before they learn of the new categories of gender identity and dysphoria now being used to describe transgender children. A strange recapitulation of the analytic separation of sexuality from gender reoccurs. Despite Sedgwick's careful mining of the epistemic instability that entangles them, transgender is made the histori historical and medical successor of homosexuality. Or, more precisely, the transgender child is made the implicit successor of the proto-gay child. What's more, given the anxious obsession of therapists with effeminacy, and femininity in boys. There is little space to see how the trans boys who interacted w with some of the very same clinicians critiqued in How to Bring Your Kids Up Gay. The ghostly effect Sedgwick illuminates in the case of the effeminate boy replicates itself again by applying that transgender child childhood, not to mention boyhood, could not become a concern until after 1980. The broadest point here the broadest point here is that using the DSM as a starting point for a history of trans children is mostly useless. This book has, therefore, proceeded otherwise, since many of trans children's 20th century histories took place long before the codification of GID. The sense that transgender is a successor category to homosexuality in childhood is not supported by the history of the clinic. Over the arc of trans histories of the transgender child, for instance, Children's transness 
has already appeared through multiple discursive domains that undercut succession narratives, including intersex, sexual inversion, homosexuality, and transvestism. This chapter, while focusing on a decade in which the intense emphasis on binary transition seemed to preclude the persistence of multiple definitions of transhood, ch trans childhood, shows that in fact the continued indeterminacy of the concept of plasticity created a series of fault lines of race and gender inside the con concept of transsexuality, so that childhood transness retained its multiplicity, so that tr so that childhood transness retained its multiplicity. The actual experiences and identities of trans and queer children themselves, as opposed to the discourse, discourses mobilized to speak about them, are much more difficult to assay. Nevertheless, in this chapter, the 1970s offer a very different way into the border wars between butch lesbian and trans masculinities that turn upon this problem of succession. <clears throat> in female masculinity, Jack Halberstam carefully investigated the so-called border wars between butch lesbians and trans men, contextualizing them, like Valentine, in a longer history of sexology where the aftershocks of the medical model of inversion led to ongoing political and identitarian friction. I am less interested in questions of subjectivity and identity than in Halberstam's implicit periodization of trans masculinity and butch masculinity, which reinforces the sense of historical succession inadvertently established in the uptake of Sedgwick's essay. In an important moment in the book's chapter on the border wars, Halberstam writes, the border wars between transgender studies and the FDMs, F2Ms presume that masculinity is a limited resource, or else we see masculinity, masculinity as a set of protocols that should be agreed on in advance. Masculinity, of course, is what we make of it. It has important relations to maleness, increasingly interesting relations to transsexual maleness, and a historical debt to lesbian bushness. Taking a very long historical view, say, to the early 20th century and working-class lesbian social words in the United States, it, it is possible to claim that bushness produces a historical debt for transmasculinity. Or even earlier, there, there is a controversial claiming of Stephen Gordon's character in The Well of Loneliness as a lesbian, an invert, or trans. As the second chapter of this book explores, the earliest pre-transsexuality pre medical procedures for changing sex included transitions from feminine to masculine, although the, the discourses of homosexuality, inversion, and lesbianism frequently overlapped and haunted the, the surrounds of early 20th century masculine wives. By at least the 20s and 30s, there were public trans men like Michael Dillon, Alan Hart, and Bernard. In any case, Halberstam and female masculinity in the 1990s took a much more recent view on the public emergence of female to male transsexual, F to M. In the last decade or so, it is this slide from a rise in public visibility to an implicit histo historical argument of precedent precedence and succession between bush masculinity and trans masculinity, one that seems to have been largely left largely unchallenged in the wake of female masculinity and other earlier texts on the border wars that quickly becomes unfamiliar with the introduction of the archive of trans boyhood in the 1970s. For the 1970s were not a decade that defined non-normative masculinity exclusively in terms of lesbian life an advance of a category of trans masculinity that had yet to come of age. Rather, for many trans children, boyhood, even in its medicalization, undoes the histori historiographical presumptions on which the preeminent place of the DSM and the border wars both rely. What becomes less clear without the narrative certainty provided by the uptake of Sedgwick's, Valentine's, and Halberstam's work, however, is how to proceed if that boyhood ignites no epistemological clarity of its own, and the racialization of gender that this work in queer and trans studies has overlooked introduces a further problem for the efforts to recuperate a clear trans masculine subject out of this decade. Trans boys in and outside the clinic. It is difficult to say how much easier it became for children to seek out doctors in the decade that Meyerowitz characterizes as the liberal moment, but the overall climate seems to have become a more hospi hospitable in the 1970s 
than it had been in the 1960s. Money sense that the lowering of the voting age heralded something of the spirit of the era seems to have held more broadly. While the clinic in which he worked at Hopkins was actually shut down in 1979, after years of infighting among his faculty, others, both private and public, expanded during the decade. Harry Benjamin, now in his 80s, also retired at the end of his decade, while Charles Eilenfeld and Leo Wallman and his co-practitioners left the practice too. By the end of the 1970s, the office was taken over by Jeanne Hoff, a, a psychiatrist and trans woman who brought a new approach to the clinic that was in part informed by her own experience being subject to medicine. The medicalization of trans masculine bodies in the 1970s was still widely regarded by its gatekeepers as lagging behind the curve of trans femininity. While Manny's rehearsal of his genetic approach in the, later, in the letter that opened his chapter reflects the general consensus of the field. There had been relatively little change in its medical content in the 1950s. In that decade, Elmer Belt, a surgeon in Los Angeles who attempted to provide gender confirmation surgery to his trans clients before being shut down by local medical boards, had been in interested in pursuing transition and surgery for trans men. Belt corresponded at the time with Benjamin to strate strategize about the possibilities. Benjamin mentioned having once met Harold Got Gillies, the plastic surgeon who would become canonized for his work on phalloplasty in London. But Benjamin remained unsure whether the procedure Gillies had developed was worth recommending to clients. Belt, in fact, already had a client who was interested in and who had found a way to get top surgery from a different surgeon in L.A. Fortunately or unfortunately, Belt explained, the person had a cystic ovary that made it possible to also justify hysterectomy as medically necessary, opening the door in his mind to adding phalloplasty in the list of procedures he would undertake. While Belt was ultimately unsuccessful, the relative feasibility of top and bottom surgery at the end of the 1950s did not change a great deal in the two subsequent decades. While the architects of transsexual medicine, such as Benjamin and Money, had seen trans men and patient, as patients since the very beginning of, the, of their clinical research, they continued, like most practitioners, to give massively more emphasis to trans women. One of the, the, one of the distorting effects of this asymmetry between trans masculinity and femininity is that medical archive repeats a certain disqualification of trans masculine transition as somehow less complete judging it against the standard of trans femininity's protocols. It was in the broader context of this medical distortion effect around trans masculinity that trans boys came into contact with doctors in the 1970s. In, in the 1970s. From all over the United States, children took up the pen and wrote directly to clinicians. One 15-year-old from Tennessee wrote to Eilenfeld, who was still part of Benjamin's practice in New York City in 1975. I need your help, bad, he explained, for the pressures of everyday life and school are getting to me and I don't know which way to turn. He had already written to Erickson Education Foundation several times, which was how he had obtained Eilenfeld's address. I found hope and knew I, I wasn't going crazy when I read an article about transsexuals and the sex change operation. Having unsuc unsuccessfully visited his family doctor and psychiatrist, the latter of whom ran a test on my mind, the letter writer felt stuck. I don't know what to do next. I need to make my life as normal as possible. Sometimes I get so depressed and I just don't get where I live or not. But I'm still hanging on because I gotta get help. At this point, he reiterated, I'm a girl physically but I'm a boy in my mind and soul. I've read you have dealt with cases of people like me. In his reply, Eilenfeld did not simply dismiss the letter as Benjamin's office had routinely done in the 1960s with similar inquiries. Although you are very young, Eilenfeld nonetheless suggested that you write uh, to Ira M. Dushoff, M.D., providing an address in Jacksonville, Florida, before adding, of course, no ethical physician would treat you without the consent and cooperation of your parents. 
Why exactly did Eilenfeld recommend this trans boy to someone in Florida when he had written from Tennessee? Several years later, Deschamps had founded a private clinic in the had founded a private clinic, the Gender Identity Association, which operated without con- the constraints or the resources of a university, research clinic, or state-funded institution. Despite the private status, Deschamps worked quite actively with clinicians at major university clinics and frequently spoke at conferences, colloquia, and other major events in the field of transsexual medicine in the 1970s, suggesting why Eilenfeld would have felt comfortable making a referral in a letter. It is possible that Eilenfeld felt that the trans boy who had written him would have better luck accessing hormones or surgery options at a clinic, formed in many ways with that privatized goal in mind, especially if parental support was insecure. If trans boys from the New York City area wrote for advice, Benjamin's practice now frequently encouraged them to come in from a consultation, with or without the permission of their parents. Although without parental consent, Benjamin would go no further. When a 17-year-old from New Jersey wrote to Eilenfeld in the summer of 1976, he said that he felt his parents should not hold him back from medical transition. At this point, he was already living as a boy all the time, with the exception of school hours only. Although he resided with his parents, he clarified that I support myself. As for his parents, they consider me as a failure, a freak of society, and a poor investment. After a good deal of reading about my problem, he found that ex- experts all seemed to agree that the effects of hormone treatment, with the exception of the deepening of the voice, are reversible when the dosage is stopped. Under these circumstances, I feel that minors ought to be able to receive treatment without parental consent. The uncanny closeness between his rhetorical form and money's letter that opened this chapter suggests, indeed, that this 17-year-old had probably been reading his work closely and drawing on it. The new idiom of the reversibility of hormone therapy in the plastic body of the developing child emboldened him to argue, somewhat paradoxically, that as a responsible, mature person, he was ready to begin with this much-needed change without the consent of his parents. While flatly refusing to help me, he explained, his parents also state that they would not hinder me either. Although legally the barrier of parental consent remained effectively insurmountable, the practice's secretary, Virginia Allen, wrote back to invite the 17-year-old to contact her for an appointment. On the carbon copy of this reply, she annotated a few subsequent developments, noting that she had spoken to him the following week by phone and explained the clinic's fees and expectations and our routines, she added. We'll call back. Later that fall, he came into the office accompanied by his mother for an appointment with Agnes Nagee, who had recently replaced Islandfield. It seems that this was the only visit to Benjamin's clinic. It seems that this was his only visit to Benjamin's clinic, however. When Jean Hoff reviewed Benjamin's files after talking o- taking over the practice years later, she merely noted that the 17-year-old reported during that appointment that his family doctor did not believe he was actually trans, but she did not speculate about whether that had anything to do with why she- he did not continue seeing Nagui, or whether the mother's opinion and consent had changed. Medical figures like Money and Benjamin, who by this time commended a considerable reputation for expertise, also received many inquiries from other clinicians who worked with children who either identified as or were being diagnosed diagnosed as transsexual. By the 1970s, Money's voluminous correspondence in particular was preoccupied with a range of inquiries from doctors and other providers around the country and internationally who wanted to establish their own gender clinics and offer medical transition and reassignment, and who generally felt that his experience would be of benefit to their work. Still, more write to money about specific clients, often their first to raise the category of transsexuality. One therapist with a 16-year-old trans boy who is contemplating surgery for sex change sought money's published work and ordered both to refine his approach and to have something to give to his client to read. One clinical psychologist in Arizona who had already read Transsexualism and Sex Reassignment was looking for more up-to-date references in order to work with another 16-year-old trans boy. He also inquired as to whether Money knew of any medical facility in the Southwest that performs female-to-male reassignment 
ship my patient pursue surgery. But it seems that money did not reply, and the secretary instead sent reprints of some of his recent publications. While rarely clear in such letters, it seems likely that many of these trans boys had begun seeking seeing therapists with the consent of their parents. Indeed, many may have actually been dragged into therapy by parents, uncomfortable with or hostile to their gender identity. Yet other trans children who came into contact with medicine through more dis disciplinary institutions that had first detained them. Mental health wards and juvenile court or probation systems were two of the most common alternate routes into medicalization. And in many jurisdictions, these institutions effectively blurred into one another. One resident psychiatrist at an inpatient facility in Connecticut who wrote to money was quite vague about how the 17-year-old trans boy under his supervision had been committed, referring to both the desire for tr sexual transformation and a multitude of behavioral problems, present of admission. In this case, however, while the behavioral problems had more or less become non-existent since the patient's admission to the hospital, the wish for sexual change remained unchanged and intact, apparently convincing the psychiatrist of the validity of the, validity of the boy's desire to transition. Now that he was considering discharging the boy sometime in the next several months, the psychiatrist was concerned that the parents are unaccepting and believed that it was doubtful whether they would agree or authorize any medical procedure. Looking for advice on follow-up care for the child while he was still in high school, especially for a minor without parental authorization, Money forwarded the letter to John Mayer, a colleague in psychiatry at Johns Hopkins. In his reply, Mayer agreed that there was a general lack of outpatient facilities that deal with this type of issue, and that finishing high school would be of equal priority with transition. While Mayer felt that a 17-year-old would be quite welcome to pursue outpatient treatment at Sexual Behaviors Consultation Unit, left the psychiatric division of Hopkins, perhaps combined with attendance at a local boarding school, he stressed that he was also certain that it would require both parental authorization and parental support, since the patient is a minor child. The willingness, however reluctant, of these clinicians to advocate for their trans masculine clients is itself partially a distorted effect of the archive. Only those persuaded by the claim of gender identity to their clients and the viability of the category transsexuality would have bothered to write to someone like money. Still, the way that trans masculinity was even partially legitimized puts a great deal of pressure on the notion that butch lesbian identity was the obvious category in this era. A social worker at a psychiatric hospital in Missouri, for instance, wrote to the social service department of the Johns Hopkins Medical Hospital about a very intelligent 17-year-old female transsexual who, by definition, wishes to live and be accepted as a member of the sex opposite to her biological sex. This trans boy had been hospitalized twice in six weeks, first for suicidality and then to begin hormonal treatment until 21 i.e. surgical care if indicated. The social worker wanted advice on the social problems that arise from childhood transition. Successful and consistent binding, for one, presented a challenge. We are also concerned about helping her enter college as a boy. She added, at the moment, she added, at the moment he was finishing high school by correspondence from the hospital, and the school itself was unaware of the actual problem. The social worker expected that with college, by contrast, they could send in all ap application materials and this doctor will write the dean of students after acceptance. The Department of Social Work at Hopkins forwarded this letter to Money, who wrote back, generally who wrote back to generally affirm the plan proposed. Once again, he argued for top surgery during childhood, writing, I think it is unjustifiable to be obliged to fiddle-faddle with chest binding when mastectomy would achieve so much more for this patient who has already embarked on hormonal masculinization. The quick shift in this trans boy's hop hospitalization from suicide watch to hormone therapy, as well as the possibility of top surgery, reflects the, the degree to which trans boyhood was established, if only because deeply medicalized in this instance. Category in the... Ca the quick shift in this trans boy's hospitalization from suicide watch to hormone therapy, as well as the possibility of top surgery, 
reflects the degree to which trans boyhood was established, if only because of the deeply, deeply, if only because deeply medicalized in this instance, category in the 1970s. The lack of references to the specter of homosexuality or lesbian identity in these documents suggests that even as the generational claim that budge masculinity was more widespread than trans masculinity during this decade, holds outside the class and race demographics of the medical contest. There was nevertheless an established community of fears, a, a community of trans boys who attempted to ne negotiate the incredible authority of medicine to affirm their sense of self and embodiment without encountering the fictions of a border war. Yet the increasing reach of medicalization into trans boyhood was neither uniform nor as unproblematic as the case of this boy in Missouri might suggest. As more trans boys transitioned and more trans children in general accept excess surgery in the 1970s, the racialized plasticity of the child's growing body upon which medical science have long relied again shifted in form. Here the desire to affirm trans boyhood to overturn the generational narrative of the border wars encounters a series of important complications. Reversibility and the Racialization of Puberty the clinical affordances of the 1970s actualized the now well-established developmental logic of transsexual medicine to an unprecedented extent. Some children were able to undergo gender confirmation surgery before reaching the age of majority, something that, other than in a unique case of GL at Hopkins, John Hopkins in 1964, had more or less removed from consideration by the gatekeeping function of clinicians, had more or less been removed. The case of trans boys is more complex, however, because of the asymmetry through which bottom surgery was not granted the same status for boys and girls. Given money's insistence that top surgery for trans boys was highly advisable, but also not yet widely accepted, it is difficult to assess how many trans boys who encountered doctors during the 1970s access forms of surgery rather than being limited, limited to hormone therapy. The relative symbolic weight given to surgery for trans girls and women in this moment makes the fact of trans makes the fact of trans girls securing access during childhood quite remarkable too. Of course, this growth in access was hardly an index of emancipation, medical or otherwise. What's more, the changes to the DSM in nineteen eighty would more or less close the window in childhood surgeries, making the situation short lived and the window itself was founded on renewed racialization of puberty and plasticity through the incipient concept of reversibility. The latter move would persist well past the decade, founding the diagnostic and treatment matrix in which we still live today. The archive of 1970s medicine contains scattered references to trans children undergoing gender confirmation surgery during childhood, but always after puberty had set in. There was also a constant and a high degree of self-awareness on the part of adults about the potential controversy of granting children access to surgery. In a letter addressed to money that lacks a clear context, an adult from New Jersey recounts the story of a friend's trans daughter, who was able to get access to surgery in 1976. Two weeks ago, I met a girl of 16 who, three weeks ago, was a boy of 16, explains the letter writer who, consciously or not, followed the common rhetorical framework attached to the transition found in journalistic accounts. This trans child had apparently begun hormone therapy at 14 and switched school districts to begin attending as a girl with the support of both her parents and the principal. This went on until two or three weeks ago, continued the letter, until it was explained to friends at school that she was going to the, into the hospital over Christmas for some surgery on her ovaries and may miss a week or two in January. The surgery had to take place in New York City with a certain Dr. Granado, for the last analyst they visited in New Jersey, said, How dare you question me? I am a psychiatrist, rejecting the request for your referral. The anecdotal story concludes with a recollection that the girl's father was surprised by the understanding he received from school officials, but not from the medical profession in New Jersey. Renato, it seems, was able to provide surgery to trans children in the New York City area on more than one occasion in the 70s, 
perhaps having cultivated a reputation for access at a moment when surgery, when surgery during childhood was still on the whole quite rare. However, even if New York was in some ways at the forefront of an offering, ver an offering availability and access, this does not mean that other clinicians around the United States were uninterested or unmotivated to arrange surgeries for children. Indeed, some wrote to high-profile institutions like Johns Hopkins to see whether they could refer clients under 18 for surgery because there was a lack of local facilities. Or, in the case of a 15-year-old trans girl who had been seen at a psychiatrist clinic in Arkansas, the attending doctor wrote to money directly because the situation had provoked too much anxiety among staff for the patient to pursue surgery any further, in spite of parental consent. Our local obstre obstetrics and gynecology people are unwilling to consider working with the case, he explained, because of his minority f fear, f because of his minority, fearing possible lawsuits when the patient becomes 21. Unfortunately for both of these children, Hopkins itself had an extremely strict policy of not allowing anyone under 21 onto its programs. And so it remains unclear whether either of them was able to find access to surgery during childhood. The fact that some trans children did access surgery, including not just trans boys seeking top surgery, but also trans girls, did not go unnoticed. The periodical sexuality, the periodical sexuality commissioned Eilenfeld to write a general article titled The Transsexual for a 1972 issue. It seems that the original article was never never published, and that a story of a trans child was replaced in the final issue with a more generic story about a trans adult. The reasons for the switch are unclear, although it is difficult not to wonder whether a story about a child was rejected for being too controversial. In the unpublished draft, Eilenfeld recounted the story of Joanna, who arrived at Benjamin's practice with her mother at the age of 17. Joanna had first seen a psychiatrist when she was 12, although it was, not, although it was not clear then to adults what her femininity meant. At age 14, she went to another psychiatrist and said that she felt herself to be a girl, not a boy. However, in an example of one of the harshest psychiatric reactions in the era, she was diagnosed not as transsexual, but schizophrenic. After Joanna was hospitalized twice on that faulty premise for a total of six months, her mother read an article about transsexuality in a magazine that mentioned Benjamin and decided to pursue that avenue instead. The first thing we did for Joanna Eilenfeld, narr the first thing we did for Joanna Eilenfeld narrated, was to begin female hormone treatments. After nine months, Joanna's breasts began to develop as an adolescent's girls. A month later, Eilenfeld and Benjamin referred Joanna to a psychiatrist who could grant referral to surgery. It has been established that most of us by the time we're four have a clear sex identification, Eilenfeld interjected, ostensibly for the benefit of the readerships of sexuality. Joanna obtained gender confirmation surgeries at age 17. Eilenfeld seemed quite self-conscious about that scenario, despite how generic it was for the era. Not at all transsexuals, not all transsexuals undergo surgery so soon after diagnosis, he hedged. Indeed, D Dr. John Money, an authority on transsexualism, feels that he uh, felt that a feels that a transsexual should live at least two years as a woman first. Joanna's case is unusual, he concluded, in that most transsexuals do not get help so young. We can't treat patients under 21 without their parents' uh, permission, and very seldom do these people have parents as understanding as Joanna's. This draft article distinguished no single deciding factor that explained why surgery became more acceptable, accessible to some children, like Joanna, in the 1970s, while for others the roadblocks are too numerous or onerous. Still, an emergent logic around development and puberty among clinicians from the prior decade was also coming to maturity in a way that increasingly justified surgery for teenagers, albeit at a high cost to younger children. Chapter 4 examines the University of California, Los Angeles Gender Identity Clinic, where children ranging from 3 to 18 years old were seen by an interdisciplinary team of psychologists, psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, endocrinologists, gynecologists, and surgeons beginning in the late in 1962.
the gap between the published work of the major figures at that clinic and their actual clinical approach to trans children is taken up in that chapter in detail. What is pertinent again here is that the clinic's director, Robert Stoller, in particular, advocating using psychotherapeutic and analytic techniques with young trans children to prevent the development of trans identity by adulthood. Yet because such psychotherapeutic attempts were useless, in reality, most clinicians at UCLA, including Stoller, also reluctantly allowed their child patients to transition as teenagers, that is, once puberty had begun. As the 1960s wore on, the basis of this discrepancy at UCLA came to settle on the preposition, proposition that there was no biological or psychological use in trying to preempt the onset of transsexuality after puberty had begun. Stoller, who more than others held to the transphobic hope of intervening tr psychotherapeutically in ch childhood to eradicate trans life altogether, conceded that it seems impossible to treat the adult transsexual successfully, whereas success meant to erase their sense of self. But then, even at age six or seven, our work is formidable. For Stoller, transgender childhood was a decisive test case for transphobic psychiatry and psychoanalysis. Either transsexuality could be treated psychologically during childhood to the point of being eliminated, or else there was no use pursuing any further psychotherapeutic approaches at all. Although Benjamin was less overtly hostile to the viability of trans identity in a letter to a fellow doctor in 1971, he nonetheless referred to the work of Stoller and Green of UCLA, according to whom young transsexual children may indeed be helped, may indeed by helped by psychotherapy, whereas it is useless in truth transsexual adult. This emergent sense that something decisive about the interactability of transsexuality could be said to come into a factor in childhood had become a topic of intense interest for clinicians by the 1970s. The threshold meant to manage the difference between the malleability of childhood and the futility of anti-trans intervention in adulthood was precisely puberty. For a 1979 issue of the tra newsletter Transition, published by the news organization Confide, contributor, contributor Garrett Oppenheim interviewed Eilenfeld on the subject. The resulting article's title, Eilenfeld Cautions on Hormones, indexes the double bind of the expansion of medicalization in the 1970s for transgender childhood. As access to transition grew, the developmental and disenfranchising premises upon which it rested also intensified, rigid, rigidly constraining the forms that access would take. The article, which styled itself as a general Q&A with well-known practitioner, uh, essentially became an interview about the centrality of the child to transsexual medicine. Asked to what causes, asked what causes transsexuality, Eilenfeld first admitted that medical science had no answer, but Stoller's version of its own psycho, um, ostensible psychogenesis was not convincing. Then he launched into a digression on children and biology, which Oppenheim recounted thus. Still, there must be something inborn about transsexuality, Eilenfeld conceded, because when two children are reared in the same family, only one of them is likely to become a transsexual. For reasons such as these, Eilenfeld is against giving hormones to persons under the age of 18. In fact, he prefers that they be at least 20 or 21 years old before they start on this route. I did have one patient who, I ha who had surgery at 17 and is doing well, he said, but in general, Identity is still fluid in adolescence. There's a chance that gender feelings still might change. The internal inconsistency, inconsistency of Eilenfeld's reflection could, ha could hope to save itself, only through its developmental logic. If the trans child is fundamentally plastic, a quality here expressed as a fluid identity, then a transphobic treatment aimed at eradicating trans identity might find purchase at an early age, molding the child to cisgender ends. For Eilenfeld, this plastic possibility for normalization justified the refusal of hormones to anyone under 18 that Oppenheim reported. Yet, at the same time, the reference to something inborn is not just a fantas f fantasized biologism, but rather a recognition that the plasticity of childhood does not neatly resolve along the lines that Eilenfeld initially describes.
As we already saw, Eilenfeld's own clinic most certainly did prescribe hormones to trans children under 18. So his public stance on the caution necessary to in, in connection with the use of hormones in transition was contradicted by his own medical practice. That he refers to one patient who had surgery at 17 and is doing well, in fact puts, puts the contradiction on display for readers. The presumed plasticity of the trans child, the plasticity that floats the entire field of transsexual medicine, ends up underwriting the two opposite outcomes in the same paragraph. It suggests that transsexuality can be preempted, while it also suggests that the plastic body takes on too much of its own agency during puberty to accept the reversal of trans embodiment and identity. The article continues by noting that Eilenfeld cites the works of Dr. Richard Green at UCLA, who has attempted to identify potential transsexuals before puberty and to alter their gender identity. But it's difficult to identify transsexuals when they are children, he added. The operative phase in this otherwise cluttered interview is before puberty. The sense that puberty marks a threshold after which transsexuality cannot be eradicated by doctors or psychiatrists, backed by both the expansion and access to transition during adolescence in the 1970s, and a renewed push toward rigid gatekeeping that included Eilenfeld's claim that younger children might be excluded from access to hormones, never mind surgery. In many ways, this contradictory state was the predictable outcome of the developmentalization of plasticity since the early 20th century. Since endocrinology had established that plasticity materially exhibited no natural inclination toward any particular sex, form, or gendered meaning, the teleology of development had been mobilized to give it a significance and reliability that it had never really demonstrated. The metaphor of the child's developing body was meant to domesticate plasticity, but it could never accomplish that task because of its partial misfit with the phenomenon it was supposed to describe. Interestingly, then, in the very same issue of Transition, the Legal Posers section, which hosted anonymous letters looking for legal advice and provided, letters, re provided replies from a lawyer, ran a column titled Hormones at Age 17. The letter was from a 17-year-old transsexual residing in New York State who was eager to start my hormone therapy as soon as possible. The writer explained that my psychiatrist agrees that I should eventually go through a sex change, but my parents are dead set against it. Friends tell me that doctors are allowed to treat minors confidentially without the parents' knowledge or consent. Wondering if that could apply in my case, the writer concluded by asking, how long must I wait before I can start hormone treatments without my parents being able to stop me? Rachel D. Levidow, described by Transition as widely known as a champion of legal rights for transsexuals, provided the letter to this provided to this letter provided provided the reply to this letter. The outlook was grim. It will be difficult, if not impossible, for a 17-year-old who is not legally an infant in the New York State to receive hormone therapy without his parents' consent, he explained. Any doctor who prescribed hormones in the scenario the anonymous letter writer had described would be placing himself in considerable legal jeopardy. Having shot down the idea of treatment without parental consent, Levidow added that when the patient is legally emancipated, usually at age 18, he will still will then be in a position to commence hormone therapy if a psychiatrist and medical doctor believe this would be beneficial to him. Whether or not slightly the slight ambiguity of emancipation taking place, usually at age 18, was meant to open the door to a way of getting around parental consent, Levidow's response was on the whole emphatically negative. Between Eilenfeld and Levidow, the message to the readers of Transition was that both medicine and law were unanimous in barring transgender children from hormone therapy. At the same time, the psychiatrists, endocrinologists, and doctors were overseeing more hormonal and surgical transitions for trans children than ever before. They also undertook a rhetorical campaign to split the category of transsexuality through the threshold of puberty, attempting to disqualify younger children and keep the door open to the erasure of trans identity altogether by once again banking on, the, banking on the plasticity of child's growing body. Only now, plasticity was understood to undergo an important change in form during adolescence, becoming less receptive to cultivation 
by medical science, and more unruly in puberty before it began to recede altogether. Lawrence Newman, a psychiatrist at UCLA who, put, who in the 1960s began reluctantly letting children under his care transition, put it quite plainly in an article for Medical Insight magazine in 1970. Because transsexualism cannot be cured after puberty, it is imperative that the disorder be identified at an earlier age when curative treatment is possible. Again, the instability of this insistence is important. For, wi for, while, for while the child's plasticity might offer the suggestion of eradicating transsexuality before it consolidated, it at the same time implied equally that all children were to some degree normally unfixed in their gender identity casting doubt on the overall legitimacy of the gender binary. Here, the specter of the overlap between gender as identity and sexuality as object choice re-enters the frame. The future transsexual is a very feminine little boy who prefers to wear girls' clothing, Newman explained. This child prefers girls as friends and avoids boys and roughhouse play, will have to take care of his dolls and do housework, and, most malignantly, will on occasion say that he wishes to grow up to become a woman. The ascending litany of symptoms is unexpectedly fragile, for only the most malignant of them is drawn from the diagnostic model for transsexuality, and occurs only on occasion, while the others could just as easily have applied to the pathologization of proto-gay children. Newman seemed bothered by the implication and tried to explain it away by specifying that all children enjoy imitating the opposite sex on occasion. The issue here is the intensity of the cross-gender interests. Rendering childhood cases of transsexuality a more intense version of either proto-gay or entirely normal childhood development was a poor form of resolution. Newman therefore reinforced the sense that transgender children ultimately incorporate a moment of psychic and biological malleability in distinct contrast to the older transsexual whose gender misidentification has become irreversible, justifying intervention on the violent basis of the possible extinction of trans life altogether. Puberty signaled the end of a certain normal reversibility of sex and gender, at once a form of developmentally diminishing biological plasticity that could be receptive to hormones, and also the expression of a psychological fluidity, fluidity irresistible to psychiatrists and analysts such as those who ran the clinic at UCLA. The pernicious quality of the discourse of irreversibility is that it could at one and the same time enable money to advocate for hormone therapy and top surgery for trans boys, while also letting Eilenfeld and Newman imagine reversing transgender identity and embodiment out of existence. What's more, the new emphasis on puberty and the reversibility of childhood, sex, and gender marks an entangled chain change in their racialization. The plasticity of sex had since the late 19th century have been the plasticity of sex had since the late 19th century been racialized in a normative sense as a synonym for a eugenic form, an alterability stored latently in the human, open to cultivation in a project of species improvement. The invention of gender in the 1930s a uh, 1950s, smuggled the eugenic principle into the post-war era, sublimating it even further into the abstraction of the endocrine body. Now the temporal form of that racial norm normativity, the cultivation of sex and gender into phenotypic ideals of male and female, took on a more distinctive contour in childhood. The morphology of the body and mind could be reversed to a certain extent, but only prior to puberty. The ideal human form was one that could move fluidly through sex phenotypes prior to adolescence, when the developmental teleology of gender identity would apparently become so fixed as to be indifferent to psychiatric intervention. The significance of this refinement of plasticity into a partially reversible and puberty-bound phenomenon took place in the larger context of renewed medicalization of puberty during the 1970s, one highly charged with racial meaning. Most prominently, the tenor scale of puberty development, puberty development came into widespread usage. During the 1960s, James Tanner and W.A. Marshall had, had undertaken longitudinal studies of the bodies of girls and boys from childhood to adulthood, objectifying the timing and growth rates of genitals, height, weight, 
and secondary sex characteristics. In a 1969 study on girls and a 1970 studies on boys, both published in Archives of Disease in Childhood, they rendered a statistical progression of normal developmental processes for puberty out of the aggregate anthropometric data they had produced. Ostensibly, the resulting Tanner scale was meant to handle the overwhelming variability in child development. Yet in most ways, their method was lifted without acknowledgement from turn-of-the-century eugenic anthropometry, producing an ascending teleological scale of normal phenotypes that had no basis in anything other than their interpretation of statistical compilation. The The temporalization of a normal age range for pubertal development also enabled the uptake of a very old and persistent discourse in the hypersexualization of blacks, women, and Latinas, which from the 1970s on led to an obsessive focus on the supposedly earlier puberty of black and brown girls. While the racialization of puberty in the nascent era of reversibility signaled a continuing investment in abstract eugenic form of whiteness located in the flesh of the sex body and the depths of the gendered psyche, it was also laminated onto other forms of racialization that were hypervisible, with devastating consequences for black trans children in particular. While the medical mon- model continued to suture the category of transsexuality to a latent whiteness coeval with plasticity, with all of the gatekeeping and renewed surveillance that incurred for white trans children, black trans children found themselves in decidedly more precarious institutional situations. Black and brown trans children tended to be subjected to much harsher forms of confinement than transsexual medicalization, as well as to an utter dismissal and suspicion of their self-knowledge. Indeed, as had been the case in the 1960s, the fact of blackness often amounted to a disqualification from the discourse of transsexuality altogether. In 1970, the director of a juvenile mental health clinic at a hospital in Ohio wrote to money about about a 15-year-old patient, This trans girl, who was African-American, had been admitted to the hospital's emergency room after taking an overdose of 15 to 20 barbituric pills. After being stabilized, she was transferred to the juvenile psychiatric ward. The patient was known to be an avort homosexual, according to the director, and the intake procedures aimed not merely to assess the causes of the suicide attempt, but also to produce advice as to post-hospitalization treatment plan for the patient's problem in sexual identification. The director described the 15-year-old girl in physical detail, emphasizing fine features that were markedly infeminate. Also, he also underlined her general depression while in the ward, other than noting that she spoke in black ethnic style, using as few words as possible and often employing slang words which required further elaboration and definition. The psychiatric evaluation that the director enclosed with this letter did not consider what what it might mean to a black trans girl to be hospitalized. For instance, she reported great fear of being arrested and sent to jail, but this was dismissed as a delusional symptom rather than an acute awareness of her vulnerability to state violence. The ward's general suspicion of and disdain for this black trans girl is collected in the psychiatric evaluation's continual rejection of her claims to be a girl. The psychiatrist remarked that he does not think that the fact that wanting to be a girl or his homosexual activities were a problem. Yet her parents also reported that by age two, she preferred wearing girls clothing and participated in girls play. Apparently, she first told her mother at age 13 that she wished to be a girl. A year later, she asked to be admitted to the hospital. She came to the very same hospital in which she was now confined, where she and her mother met with a psychiatrist. She expressed then that she wished at that time an operation to become a girl, but apparently no follow-up was carried out. In 1970, when she was held on the ward after the suicide attempt, the evaluation concluded with two diagnoses, depression with suicidal attempts and transsexual behavior. In particular, 
The physical changes of puberty reportedly were causing discord between the patient's internal view of himself as feminine and the reality of his perception by others as male. In, real, in nearly every way, this narrative was generically emphatically trans for the era. Yet the psychiatrist immediately undercut his own diagnosis. One might speculate, he wrote in his recommendation section of the, his evaluation, that only becoming a girl literally could, name redacted, have peace of mind and resolving of internal conflicts. Rather than endorsing that impossibility, however, he instead suggested that a more thorough investigation along these lines may be necessary, and advised that the director consult with money. In a move that was stunningly unethical, money wrote back to the director that the best thing to do is to try and find and rehabilitate him as well as possible as a homosexual, even as a full-time impersonating homosexual. While money promised to send information on estrogen therapy, this also brought a racist caveat. The advantage of estrogen for this extremely effeminate homosexual, money wrote, is it gives him the breasts he wants. From my point of view, the great advantage is that it's also a functional castrating agent, which has a tranquilizing effect on behavior and on behavior in general. It may indeed temper behavior the temper behavior the beha the patient has been showing. Although this girl has had been given a diagnosis of transsexuality, and although the director had written to one of the most recognized clinicians involved in transsexual medicine, both the psychiatrist in Ohio and Money went on to disqual disqualify her from the category altogether, turning to its latent overlap with homosexuality as inversion to deny her self-knowledge that she was a girl and to open the door to hormones only in order to further the eugenic goal of sterilization as a form of racial hygiene. The disqualification and dispossession of blackness that structured this girl's experience of medicine and confinement adds an important counter-narrative to the transgender boyhood of the 1970s that the first part of this chapter recounts. The deeply compromised project of medicalization was actually a relative privilege for those white children whose plastic bodies were desirable enough to be folded into the category of transsexuality by its gatekeeping clinicians. In marked contrast to the trans boyhood this chapter has explored, black trans girls were subject to massive scrutiny during this decade, often arrested or confined to mental health wards in questionable circumstances. Those cases where a juvenile probation or parole officer, attending psychiatrist, therapist, or social worker decided to write it to a clinician like Money for advice, were ironically perhaps the most humanely handled. Not to mention those that would, could most easily make it into the archive of transsexual medicine. Despite this prevailing situation, small glances into the non-pathologized non lives of these black trans girls outside confinement are also scattered across the bureaucratic paperwork that work to maintain their detention. When a psychiatrist in Colorado wrote to a professor of pediatrics at Hopkins about a 17-year-old black trans girl he was seeing in his clinic, he mentioned in passing that she had plans, after graduating from high school, to attend the Art Institute in San Francisco. In a psycho psychologist's letter to Money about a 15-year-old black trans girl that he was counseling in Kentucky, interspersed with the generic evaluation narrative is a reference to her long frosted hair a la his heroine Stevie Nicks in a reference to her interspersed with the generic evaluation narrative is a reference to her long frosted hair a la his sick heroine Stevie Nicks sick in a psychological test that involved composing a story she told the story of Rhinema Rhinanon, the schizophrenic Welsh witch, a character from Fleetwood Mac album, in which the refrain is, Will you ever win? explained the psychologist. The Rhinanon of her story is a young, beautiful devil worshipper who is lonely but wants to be loved for herself. She has many lovers, but none of who, none of who love her for herself. So she finally remains alone and learns not to care and thinks about what she thinks. We are left to wonder 
whether she was able to find her in her own life in, in, in the same capacity that her imagined Rhinanon possessed. The ability to find within the situation an enforced vulnerability and confinement the space. We are left to wonder whether she was able to find her own life the same we are left to wonder whether she was able to find in her own life the same capacity that her imagined Rhinanon possessed, the ability to find within a situation of enforced vulnerability and confinement the space to think about what she thinks as an assertion of black trans personhood, of black trans girlhood. Of black trans girlhood. We are left to wonder whether she was able to find in her own life the same capacity that her imagined Rhinon possessed. The ability to find within a situation of enforced vulnerability and confinement the space to think about what she thinks as an assertion of black trans personhood, of black trans girlhood. The Queerness of Trans Childhood Although trans boyhood was a distinct category of embodiment and medicalization in the 1970s, it cohabited with a range of different experiences that cut gendered, sexual, and racialized lines across trans childhood in the category transsexuality. While in its most medicalized instances, trans boyhood did not seem to interact much with the specter of lesbian masculinity, the hypervisible difference made by race and anti-blackness does suggest that homosexuality continued to be leveraged against trans identity for many black trans children who encountered medical authorities, a form of trans erasure through gay visibility. At the same time, the renewed medicalization of puberty through an emergent discourse in the reversibility of sex prior to adolescence also tried to divide trans childhood not so much by masculinity or femininity, as by phenotypes of age and development, making early childhood and the anxious locus, making early childhood the anxious locus of continuing and widely unsuccessful attempts to eradicate trans life as it grew in childhood. The aims of this chapter then are not only to invalidate the generational presumptions of the border wars, the relative invisibility of trans boyhood and relative to trans girlhood or the implicit historiography they have founded in queer theory and trans studies. More important, trans boyhood and its counterpoints insist that we ask different questions altogether about race, gendered sexuality, and childhood. The black trans girls whose experiences of the 1970s clashed so profoundly with the white trans boys of the same decade make clear that there is no reparative general narrative of trans childhood from this moment to usurp those that have gone relatively unchallenged since the 1990s. Part of what we have lost, having framed queer and trans childhood in the post-1980 terms of the separation of sexuality as object choice from gender as identity, is the way that ch the child should pull us back into more troublesome territory. As Catherine von Stockton has argued, the queerness of the concept of the child really ought to radically undermine the neatness of such divisions. Reflecting on what has changed since the 2009 publication of The Queer Child, Stockton considers the lessons we can take from the way that gay and trans children have rapidly grown in visibility in the 21st century. She asks how, in other words, to square that the growth and self-proclaimed identity of her argument that the 20th, 20th century was characterized by a ghostliness in the child concept, incarcerated, incarnated by the case of the gay child, and the problem of delay to which it was now attached, and to which it was attached. In an illuminating note in this essay on the queer child now, Stockton textures the issue thus. Certainly, as I argue there in the queer child, transgendered and gender queer children have been subjected to harmful delays of unspeakable sorts by parents, medical and psychiatric authorities, and public discourse. The distinction of the ghostly gay child and why it figures childhood delay is, is, it, is its insistent and quite intense sexualization by authoritative sources, forces and its own sexual self-understandings. The sexual assumptions surrounding gay slide onto the gay childhood as a concept and thus have made its pre t present tense existence so precarious. Since these assumptions are deemed so adult, 
Trans kids get sexualized in various ways, but often their sexual object choice is actually downplayed, harmfully pre prejudicably, even by allies. And so, uh, and so, uh, even by allies, so as to focus on gender identity. The complex collision between trans and gay for many queer kids is beyond the scope of this present essay, though my current research takes it as a focus. If the gay child was the archetypically, archetypally ghostly creature of the 20th century, figuring the strangeness and impossibly possible sexuality of delay in the child concept more broadly, then certainly the trans child was ghostly during the century too, with reference to the, the developmental temporality of binary gender. That ghostliness was intensified by the problem of the desired separation of object choice from gender identity, the need to desexualize, desexualize trans children in a way that ultimately made their existence in the 20th century even less imaginable than it might have been otherwise. We are confronted by the deeply unsatisfying neatness of that split. The complex collisions between trans and gay for many queer kids comes up just as soon as we would exercise the ghosts of the past century, an exorcism distinct from the haunting situation of absence described by Sedgwick in How to Bring Your Kids Up Gay. Instead of the generational splits or borders, there is an indeterminacy at play. The queerness of childhood, Stockton names, precisely evokes this, the threatened to undo the entire situation bringing the narrative of the move from 20th century ghostly children to 21st century out and proud children down upon itself. How precisely is a child to know whether queerness as sexual object choice begins and transness and as gender identity ends? How can we claim to know either? For that matter, how could any authoritative discourse ever really know especially medicine or psychology? For that matter, how could any authoritative discourse ever really know, especially medicine or psychology? This chapter adds historical texture to Stockton's argument. In relying so profoundly on childhood plasticity to ground, childhood plasticity to ground its access to sex and gender, transsexual medicine worked itself into an impossible epistemological position. In the growing body of the child, there could be no ultimate distinction between queerness of sexual object choice and transgender as identity because the child needed to remain the most indeterminate of forms in order to flood the medical model. Indeed, identity was never the foothold of transsexual medicine, despite its obsession with the psyche and narratives of the self. Indeterminacy rather provided cover for the normalizing logic of transition and the transphobic desire to eradicate trans life psychotherapeutically before it grew up. Casting some trans children as desexualized while, willing, while willfully misreading others as gay to deny their transness. Yet the very same indeterminacy so cultivated by medicine also guaranteed that the growing separation of transgender from homosexuality that had received transgender from homosexuality. Yet the very same indeterminacy so cultivated by medicine also guaranteed that the growing separation of transgender from homosexuality that received such a boost by the end of the 1970s in the new edition of the DSM could never have any real traction in the body of the queer and trans child. Stockton sees the riddle here that the medical science will not let itself see, that the border wars will not let us see, and that the mainstream LGBT pollux will not let itself see. Taking a broader look than Stockton at the arc of the 20th century tracked across this book, it is also important to emphasize that the 1970s do not show the multiple definitions of transness that had flourished in the first half of the 20th century have been replaced with a single binary model. While from the 1920s to the 1940s, as Chapter 2 argues, transness in childhood took on a range of divergent connotations including intersex, inversion, homosexual, and transvestite meanings. That multiplicity of trans childhoods was not, finally, extinguished by the paradigm of transsexuality. On the contrary, the anti-black fractures of the discourse of transsexuality, read alongside the incorporation of a largely white trans boyhood and girlhood, 
underlines how multiple modes of the trans childhood were still very much in operation in this era. The unifier among them was not binary gender, but an investment in trans children's relative plasticity. In this case, organized by gender, the asymmetry between top and bottom surgery for boys and girls, and race, the anti-black logic of medical gatekeeping. And while the comparison of trans boyhood and girlhood for both black and white trans children may on the surface seem to imply a kind of congealing of the category trans in this chapter into something more solid than it signified earlier in this book, as if it had become more binary by this time, the point I am making is actually quite different. While insisting on the distinction of white trans boyhood or black trans girlhood might seem to imply that trans childhood was never non-binary or that it reinforced the gender, gender binary as such, that impression is an ideological conceit of the medical model in the post-war era, as chapter 3 shows. The instability of plasticity subtending that meta, meta, the the instability of plasticity subtending that model reminds that trans boys and girls who appear in the medical archive informing this chapter are far from representative of trans childhoods in this era. Indeed, they are in this chapter, perhaps more than others, highly unrepresentative. The, mass, the vast majority of trans children who did not interact with the doctors or the psychiatrist profiled in this chapter, only those who are pulled into a relation even one of rejection, with the discourse of transsexuality, are visible in this archive. But the unrepresentative quality of this account is not a wholesale limitation on the chapter's argument. Much as I argued in the case of the trans child before transsexuality, the partially and fragmentary quality of this archival account leads to a more important destabilizing point about trans childhoods. As we move closer and closer to the nineteen eighty in this as to nineteen eighty in this book, approaching the epistemological matrix of transgender medicine in which we live today. The 1970s ought to serve to undermine both the coherence of where we find ourselves and the sense that we are somehow in the midst of something new with trans children. The emergence of the discourse of reversibility and its concomitant con com racialization of puberty in this era is missing from the 21st century controversy over puberty suppression therapy. At the same time, pushing plasticity's most available phase back to before puberty has also resulted in a situation today in which childhood transition has become linked for some clinicians to what Claudia Castaneda rightly identifies as a form of developmentalism. The aims to eventually erase all visible trans difference. Some pediatric clinicians today promise a future where visible transgender difference will be preemptively eliminated by, transgen by children's seamless and plastic transitions that begin before puberty sets in. The trans child today promises the future stealth adult of tomorrow. The conclusion of to this book takes up these questions further in light of the histories of trans children and the plasticity that this book has tracked over the 20th century. Establishing the existence of trans boyhood in the 1970s, then, turns out to be a much less of an establishing gesture than we might have expected. It is important to challenge the generational narrative of the border wars and the overvaluation of the DSM and the historiography of gender identity, sexuality, and childhood, but that destabilizing project has new unified narrative or recuperated trans masculine subject to turn to as a replacement. The queerness and the transness of children under the developmental temporalities we have confined them to, as Stockton incisively reminds, simply will not harbor such stability. Despite itself, even trans medicine reveals that in its paradoxical attempts to cultivate children's racial plasticity, recovering a trans masculine subject from the 1970s would serve only to cover over these dark forms, these stark forms of anti-black governance medical objectification, disenfranchisement, and confinement to which some trans children were subjected in the 1970s. And yet, here I also pause. There remains something insistent, urgent, and indeed spectral about trans boyhood in the 1970s that feels unfinished even in the most medicalized precincts of the archive. And in an elusive but important way, G.N.'s Haas' assumption of Perry Benjamin's clinic in 1979, 
indexes a moment of palpable transformation when a trans psychiatrist was, perhaps for the first time, in charge of a practice for other trans people. Hoff's careful and exhaustive work in reviewing all of Benjamin's files and follow, trying to follow up with existing clients while simultaneously taking on new patients at her office in the Upper West Side of New York represents a shift that cannot be simply lumped in with the incredibly hostile and transphobic doctors and psychiatrists discussed in this chapter. Though the medical model was still based in gatekeeping and an unacknowledged racialization of gender, Hoff cared deeply about the well-being of her clients, to a degree that is viscerally embedded in the archive she gifted to the Kinsey Institute. Her work demonstrates a level of empathy entirely absent from transsexual medicine since its advent, not to mention its pre predecessors in the early 20th century, an ethic of care that, although greatly constrained by the material circumstances and history of psychiatry and endocrinology, was also entangled with her situated perspective as a trans woman. It is important to underline that Hoff represents yet another trans person who took an, who took an active and complicated role in medicine, rather than being its object. Hoff worked with children, including trans boys. Because she took the time to interview them without only reducing what they said to standard diagnostic biograph bio biographies, her notes offer comparatively richer glances, glimpses into the trans boyhood than those of her predecessors. When one trans man she was seeing mentioned that his catalyst for seeking support came at age 17, when he was praying at church and heard the voice of God telling him to become a man. Hoff did not pathologize the adolescence scene as an evidence of an immature delusion, as so many other hostile clinici clinicians did. Indeed, Hoff included a level of self-reflexivity in her notes that stands in stark contrast with the overconfident, dispassionate, and dissociated view most doctors took. For example, while talking with a young trans woman for the first time about her life, she recorded with a reflexive flair in parentheses, got female hormones from eight, at age 15 from a New York City medical clinic by asking for them. Amid a mountain of paperwork for medical examination and initial diagnosis, Hoff recorded rec about a 17-year-old trans boy that David Bowie is PTS idol and an evaluation from the gynecologist to whom the boy was sent as part of the initial entry process for the office, the doctor mentioned that the boy had found his way to Hoff through an article about trans tennis star Rennie Richards, who was then in the news. The boy was currently at a high school for aspiring artists and performers after being socially ostracized and physically attacked during junior high. The doctor added, and his mother is very receptive and willing to pay her expenses for access to medicine. Although the gynecologist did not use his pronouns in the letter, she too noticed that her present idol is David Bowie, and in fact, she resembles him strongly. She deliberately styles her hair like him and was wearing a David Bowie t-shirt the, the, the days that I saw her. These small vignettes, while ephemeral, texture the ghostly surrounds of the trans child in the 1970s, providing neither certainty on the relationship between gender and sexuality in the growing body of the child, nor outright resistance to the authority of medical science and its racialization of gender development. They nevertheless interrupt, if only slightly, the otherwise orderly flow of medical discourse. And so it seems, however anecdotally, that even the 1980s at Hoff's clinic were not necessarily marked by a severe retrenchment in access to medicine's resource for trans children, as occurred elsewhere in the United States. One trans man, for instance, began seeing Hoff in 1980 at the twilight of his childhood, having just turned 18. At first, he met with Hoff weekly while finishing high school and at getting access to hormones and, later, top surgery. By 1985, the appointments had decreased to once per month, but he continued to see Hoff until 1988. By then, he had enrolled as a medical student, and in 1999, although it had been more than a decade since his last appointment, he wrote to Hoff to tell her the good news that he was now a senior resident in internal medicine 
while providing no certainty and broader questions as the child fundamentally unsettles. This trends boy's trajectory out of childhood and of the clinic, and into the practice of medicine himself, underlines just how essential trans children have been as complex participants in medicine, not exactly redemptive architects, to be sure, but never its silent objects. Conclusion How to Bring Your Kids Up Trans The 21st century figuration of the trans child as futuristic does harm when its novelty erases the historical precedence to the demands for recognition, dignity, and a livable life that are being made by and on behalf of trans children today. This book has worked directly against the conceit of the newness of trans childhood not just to point out that it is historically inaccurate, but also to demonstrate that it has politically infantilizing consequences for trans children, now deprived of a century's worth of precedent that might enfranchise them. The political struggle for access to bathrooms, for instance, which connects public accommodation, businesses, prisons, and schools, has become a signal case of the limitations of trans childhood's dominant mode of futurity. A trans-inclusive Title IX policy was off first authorized by the Department of Justice for schools receiving federal funding in 2016, put on legal hold by the courts later that year, and ultimately rescinded in August 2017. The media coverage of this process repeatedly frames the right to a bathroom as a new issue, further undermining the legitimacy of trans children's fight and cloaking them with a libelous air of caution, as if the entire endeavor were experimental and risky. The New York Times re rehearsed this emphasis on newness when the paper called Gavin Grimm, a Virginia teenager who sued the Gloucester County School Board, after it barred him from using the boys' bathroom, the new face of the transgender rights movement for pursuing the lawsuit and organizing around school bathrooms. While the legal battle under Title IX is certainly new, casting Grimm as emblematic of a novel civil rights issue misunderstands the temporal structure of his own case. It turns out that Grimm was originally allowed to use the boys' bathroom with the permission of the school's administration for some time, without incident, until parents of other children at the school politically mobilized against him, no doubt hoping to take part in a larger legislative and political attack on trans bathroom access that has grown in fervor in recent years, and as a journalistic expose of the legal battle points out in passing. School districts that dealt with the issue for years under the radar on a case-by-case -case basis, are now trying to balance rules for concerning transgender bathroom access with privacy concerns of critics. The true newness of bathroom policy, it turns out, has much less to do with trans children being unprecedented than it does with a highly contemporary form of anti-trans backlash that has taken the convergence of trans visibility and vulnerability as an opportunity. The putative rhetoric of privacy concerns, safety, and the egregiously weak proposition that genitals or binary biological sex can usefully direct policy are convenient displacements for naked political violence against trans life. Beholden to futurity's temporality of perpetual deferral, the trans child continues to be a figure through which anti-trans forces can focus their efforts to undermine any future at all for trans people, while simultaneously suggesting that they have no meaningful historical precedent. If trans children cannot mortgage the future to pay for civil rights that they lack today, the past century might serve to deepen the public reality of their lives, challenging anti-trans forces. Think again of Val, whose trans childhood in the early 20th century I discussed in Chapter 2, 
When she began attending school in rural Wisconsin around 1930, her parents made sure she was able to attend as a girl, even going so far as to ensure that special arrangements for toilet, etc. were made. Far from a new concern, then, the archive of the trans 20th century shows us unambiguously a trans girl's use of the girl's bathroom at school almost nine decades ago. The historiographical basis of reactionary transphobic politics, whether it's from evangelical conservatives or trans-exclusionary feminists, both of whom presumed that in some fabled past the gender and sex binary was an unproblematic institution that smoothly organized U.S. social life, is outright negated by Val's childhood. And while Grimm's legal case has made him a public face of contemporary of a contemporary struggle, imagine how it might strengthen his position to be able to mobilize Val in his fight, pointing to a century-long precedent for bathroom access. What's more, the assumed cisness of children during that ch- century means that alongside Val and the other trans children in this book, were countless, unnamed others who experience is still hidden from view. Val existed. Gavin exists. Trans children are not new, and their lives cannot be deferred to a future by design not meant to arrive. Their vulnerability, whether political, social, or material, is a product not of their being children, but rather of the historical infantilization they have been made to bear. Throughout the 20th century, this vulnerability was manufactured to a major extent by medicine, which reduced trans children to a problem of plasticity, rather than recognizing their personhood. While plasticity was also the reason for which trans children have been so central to the medicalization of sex and gender, the value they thereby accrued came at an incredibly high cost. For white trans children, Being brought into the orbit of medicine involved being reduced to living laboratories, proxies for all kinds of theories and experimental medical techniques aimed at altering the sexed and gendered phenotypes of the human. For black trans and trans of color children, by contrast, the racialization of plasticity as white tended to disqualify them altogether from this medicalized framework on the presumption that they were less plastic and therefore less deserving of care. In many cases, intensifying state systems of detention and incarceration that took hold of their lives instead. The discourse of plasticity has prescribed one narrow form of futurity through whiteness for trans children, while simultaneously denying any future at all to those who are structurally barred from its highly managed shelter. The Fractures wrought by reducing trans children to a reservoir of racial plasticity, persist into the present day, as scholars' work on the contemporary pediatric endocrine clinic shows. Claudia Castaneda argues that it is precisely the liberal edge of pediatric trans medicine that leverages children for ends other than their own, promising through puberty suppression therapy a form of transition at an early age that is aimed against those trans people who transition as adults. In this developmental framework, visible trans difference produced by transitioning after puberty is increasingly cast as an atavistic relic, so that adult transitioning becomes a kind of lesser version of transgender, because less completely transgendered in a bodily sense than the child who pauses puberty. While there is no inherent reason to confine puberty suppression therapy to this particular narrative, Sahar Sadjadi and Tay Meadows' important ethnographic work in the contemporary clinic shows how the desire and extreme pressure to find a biological etiology for trans life by locating gender's development in the brain has packaged profoundly normalizing rhetoric as scientific and progressive. An early and gender normative transition has become the valuable insofar as it uses children's exceptional plasticity to promise a future that erases trans visibility itself, 
a disturbing reconsolidation of the sex gender binary that evokes eugenic echoes of the proper racial phenotype of phenotypes of human sex from early 20th century endocrinology. Rather than resisting a binary system, in this case, plasticity continues to reinforce and even strengthen it. While the concept of plasticity today organizes trans medicine to leverage trans children's supposed act success against trans adults' supposedly tragic failure, Anne Travers' ethnographic work with a racially and economically diverse group of North American trans children also reminds that the meticulously medicalized narrative of trans childhood is massively unrepresentative, displacing low income, non-binary, and trans children of color from ostensibly trans affirmative discourse, when in reality, they probably constitute by far the demographic majority of trans children, limiting, limiting, the, fra public, limiting the public framing of trans children to the medical establishment extends the general infantilization of these children by its discourse and rationality. If that is the case, then what does the history of racial plasticity tracked across this book suggest about the future of pediatric trans medicine? Can the concept of plasticity contribute to what Dean Spade and Eric A. Stanley call gender self-determination, or what Paisley Carra calls transgender rights without a theory of gender? Histories of the transgender child argues that it cannot, for plasticity is too entrenched as a vehicle for making trans children into figurative frameworks, or etiologies, for transness, if not gender itself. The critique of racial plasticity as the unspoken ground of trans medicine and, more broadly, of sex and gender as a living system whose administration forms a key axis of modern biopolitical governmentality, as a vital starting point for the rethinking and, re and transforming pediatric medicine. That critique, which this book has undertaken for the 20th century, confronts us with an array of immediate possibilities for reimagining the clinic, which would resolve around actually listening to what trans children say about themselves, grounding medical care in their desires, and abandoning binary models of transition and dysphoria to continue to confuse, confine children to developmental teleo teleologies, ending in heterosexual masculinity or femininity. Rather than serving as a potential etiology for transgender diagnosis writ at large, rather than serving as a potential etiology for transgender diagnosis writ large, or as living laboratories for harnessing plasticity, trans children need to have access to an enfranchised voice to articulate situated knowledge to which medical practice is held accountable. As simple as it sounds, pediatric trans medicine would be radically transformed by actually asking trans children what they want and truly basing care on that knowledge. Giving up the etiological paradigm would disarm the transphobic pretenses in construing children's social transitions, puberty pauses, and hormonal prescriptions as drama or crisis. This reframing of trans pediatric medicine requires adult authorities to recognize that the very feeling that trans children's medical decisions require the conceit of panic and emergency is a way to disavow the fact that cisgender children never have to justify their gendered lives to this extent. Dismantalizing the racialized, class stratified structure of institutional U.S. medicine is a broader political project with high stakes for trans children, the vast majority of whom lack access to competent, responsible, and affordable care in whatever form they may have ideally asked for it. Removing infantilizing instruments like the medical age of consent would also enfranchise them to make self-determined decisions, particularly when being closeted or fearing reprisal and rejection from parents, guardians, and peers limits their ability to live a trans life. And decolonializing transgender childhood 
means marking and working to displace the centering of whiteness and its expert and popular representation, producing and centering the situated knowledge of black, indigenous, and trans of color childhoods. This book has provided only one example of how all Western biomedicine continues to be eugenicist in practice, hoarding resources, stratifying quality of care, and normalizing the individual and population through highly granular racialized concepts of health that actively rely on differential calculus of exhaustion, illness, and death for entire groups of people deemed undeserving. The dethroning of institutional medicine and the transfer of the wealth and authority of insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, doctors, and researchers into the hands of communities would go a long way towards ameliorating many of the most egregious forms of planned neglect that affect trans children and adults, especially those of color. While plasticity is a key concept through which to critically open up the underlying structures that produce those problems, it is far from an ideal political ground for imagining trans children and medicine differently. Plasticity has become so central to the flexible regime of neoliberal economics, where continuous adaption and change is leveraged for near inf infinitesimal value extraction and the expansion of laboring to all productive biological and cultural processes that it cannot easily be adapted for different ends. Indeed, children in particular are quite easily folded back into labor and the extraction of value in ways that are ostensibly prohibited by law in new effective economies that are meant to supplement the diminishing returns of income, inequality, or biologically enhanced children's development through medical means. What's more, the racialization of plasticity as white is by now so abstract and invidious that it even projects like Paul B. Preciado's triumphalist call for an auto-experimental form of do-it-yourself bioterrorism of gender and its dissident medical protocols. As I've suggested at several points in this book, are incapable of reckoning with the racial politics that float their model of voluntary embodied political action. What plasticity can do is call upon us to re-examine whether it's worth holding on to the sex and gender binary at all. Another way to read the medical history that this book recounts is as a series of increasingly desperate attempts by doctors and scientists to save binary sex and gender from the threat of collapse that plasticity activated. Trans children have been forced to keep alive over the past century a tension between indeterminacy and form at the heart of plasticity. But this has always been a fragile and unfinished compromise. As numerous moments in this book show, the attendant point is that the transness of trans childhood changed across the 20th century, as any social form would, rather than being defined by a binary, in the early 20th century, as the concept of plasticity migrated into the medicalization of sex, childhood transness was articulated largely through a discourse of intersex embodiment, and, to a lesser extent, the concepts of inversion and homosexuality. By the 1950s, as I argued in Chapter 3, binary sex had so badly strained other, under the plastic framework that united these discourses and their ha inhabitation by trans adults and children that the category gender was invented to try to save it for the post-war era. Yet even the introduction of gender could only defer the paradox rather than resolve it. By the 1960s and 70s, as more and more children transitioned, it became clear that the developmental framing of the core gender identity was more often than not backfired upon the most transphobic clinicians at places like the University of California, Los Angeles, where failed attempts to eradicate trans identity in young children gave way to a consensus that teenagers could be allowed to transition and live as trans with support from doctors. While this narrative of change over the 20th century 
might seem on the surface to reinforce a succession from a pre- to post-transsexuality paradigm. In reality, the only through line is the rich variability of trans childhood as a plastic state of being, in spite of its many colonizations by medicine. In chapter 2, I suggest that the ways that trans childhood was archived in the early 20th century multiplied definitions of transness out of the singular connotation of the post-war medical model. In the 1970s, as the final chapter showed, the multiplicity of transness had not actually been replaced by transsexuality standardizing model of binary transition. The anti-black fractures of the discourse of transsexuality, which illustrated themselves in that decade to the rejection of black trans girls from the medical model in the very same moment that white trans boys and girls were being recognized as distinct constituencies, reminds that multiple modes of transness defined even the most intense domains of gatekeeping. While it may seem like the trans boys and girls in, the, in this book in the 1960s and 1970s, black and white, represent a more binary, congealed experience of transness than those from the 5th, 30s, or 40s, my argument historicizes this easily made misreading. Any binary impression to the extent that it exists is in actuality an ideological effect of the incredibly limiting medical discourse of transsexuality, as well as the invention of gender, both, with, both which have been deeply invested in passing off the gender binary as m much more natural than it ev has ever proved to be in medical practice or lived experience. The arc of plasticity's indeterminacy from the first to last chapter of this book is not offered as an adjudication of proper childhood transness either. The resistance of embodied plasticity to binary categories was hardly the redemption of trans children. As a complex and elusive place, it occupied their letters to doctors' shows. In chapter 4, I argued that Vicky whose rural tr trans girlhood in Ohio in the late 1960s was translated into a long series of letters to Harry Benjamin's office, invites us to recognize non-teleological forms of growth that move outward and away from what has typically been defined as binary gender or growing up into a tangled account of embodied tr knowledge about trans femininity, the limits of plasticity, and medical discourse that takes the form of fatness in her writing. The unanticipated significance of Vicky's letters communicates some of the ways that trans childhood grow beyond the narrow medical, social, and, above all, binary parameters to which adults have restricted them. In the interval generated by these deferrals, whether of medical support or recognition of her gender, Vicky experienced a profound indecision between growing feminine and growing fat. The palpable emotional pain and lack of autonomy expressed in her letters was, if anything, magnified by her embodied plasticity. As much as it resisted the medical model of gender, then, her embodied plasticity also resisted her effort efforts to find a livable life during childhood. For Vicky, the non-binary tendencies of plasticity were not a source of resistive politics that made her life easier to live. On the contrary, the indeterminacy of her growth through childhood was a source of great pain. Rather than calling for an affirmative politics of childhood, plasticity aligned with gender self-determination, which is frankly hard to imagine. I argue instead for confronting the limits of plasticity in its eruptive tendency to refuse and disobey both medicine and the auspices of rational subjectivity, because that should lead us to question why we continue to focus our questioning of gender on trans children rather than on the system of binary gender and cisgender embodiment. Plasticity is a good example of how under what Rebecca Sheldon terms somatic capitalism. The extraction of value from children's biology encounters its own limit in the threat of life withdrawal.
a runaway animacy activated at the point where too much life tips over into a rogue and inhuman force. Biopolitics can alter much life. Biopolitics can alter life, but, as Sheldon points out, it cannot make life. For that reason, the function of the figure of the child is to reconsolidate humanness, where the wayward agency of life itself is the actual object of governmental technique, produces an inevitable and uncontrollable surplus through its reliance on concepts like plasticity. Sheldon points to how the figure of the child's living body unwittingly generates in the 21st century a wayward and insurgent Zoe, as resistant to stewardship and the politics of care as it, as it is to the mass production processes premised on a pliable natural world. This book points to the 20th, 20th century activation of children's plasticity in a similar vein as the introduction of a biological problem that cannot ever fully be fully managed, one that makes plasticity resistant to any medical or political reclamation. If plasticity as is unlikely to obey trans-affirmative politics any better than it has obeyed medical science, then it does provide a powerful example of why the desire to cling to binary sex and gender as natural forms is, ultimately, built upon a house of cards. If that is so, then it is all the more unacceptable to continue to ask trans children to serve as an etiology for transness not to mention sex and giant gender more broadly when cisgender children and the entire binary model of gender do not receive the same level of scrutiny. With a sense of responsibility to Vicky's and so many other trans children's experience of medicine, I argue that plasticity is too, combusti too combustible a concept to animate trans children in any way that does not also do them harm for it ultimately reinforces the immense pressure they already hear, they already bear, to either prove an etiology for transgender embodiment or else serve by way of developmental suppression as a means to fulfill the genocidal fantasy that trans life does not exist. What's more, plasticity cannot easily serve to remedy its own historical damage because it has proven time and time again to resist any and all attempts at stabilization. Rather, this book has striven above all to set aside altogether the question of trans children as an etiology for sex, gender, or transgender life. If that makes the definition of children's transness less easy to grasp, all the better, as perhaps this is an index of trans childhood losing its status as a stable, singular concept and gaining its reality as an internally diverse field of experience. Plasticity is a useful lens through which to see that very etiological impulse around trans children. The question of what constitutes their transness or how their transness would explain sex and gender is impossible to answer. Plasticity continually resists the stabilization that would be required of it to provide such a truth. Even when medicine succeeded in instrumentalizing trans children's bodies in the service of a normalizing binary medical model, neither that project nor the ostensibly binary trans identities of children in the post-war era overcame their indebtedness to a non-binary embodied plasticity. In reality, embodied plasticity has been a force doctors could count upon only to a limited extent without ever controlling it. For that reason, plasticity at best reminds us that we need to dethrone singular definitions of transness, including trans childhood, and that the multiplication of what transness means is an urgent project for trans children's livelihood. As trans children have been forced to give up the knowledge gained from experiences to stand in for an explanation of trans life for more than a century, trans children, especially black trans and trans children of color, have been forced to pay what amounts to perhaps the highest material price for the modern sex and gender binary. To begin to reckon with the immense damage that has caused 
would mean giving up the obsessive need to see trans children as representatives of something they are not, either indeterminate or binary creatures, and instead greet them as people whose transness is not up for investigation before they are listened to and recognized. To conclude, histories of the transgender child calls for an ethical aperture of relation, one oriented toward a different future for trans children that might still draw on the past, but from a moment in the archive that does something utterly different from all the doctors, parents, and other adults that have populated this book. In the 1940s and 1950s, Louise Lawrence was, un was an unrivaled, if underrecognized, expert on transvestism. Living in the San Francisco Bay Area, she carried on a carefully cultivated correspondence that became the central relay in a nationwide network of trans people in those decades, just before the rapid ascendancy of transsexuality. The people in her network wrote to one another for advice, to share their life experiences, to gossip, to organize, and for companionship. Lawrence was also an archivist, and by felt necessity, carefully collecting and preserving her massive correspondence compiling bibliographies and translations of titles on transvestism and transsexuality, and urging her peers not to destroy their letters, writers, or personal effects out of fear of exposure. Among the materials left behind after her death are a series of photo albums of mid-20th century trans life, before the medical model of transsexuality overtook the spotlight and hoarded attention. Studio portraits of female impersonators from San Francisco nightclubs fill many of the albums, and for most part they depict an overwhelmingly white, urban social world. Nevertheless, they offer a rare visual record of a moment prior to the ascendance of transsexuality that would colonize and erase many of the heterogeneous social forms of trans life that predated it. One of Lawrence's albums contains everyday photos sent to her by correspondents from around the country. Most pages are covered by a few pictures by a few pictures of trans person at home or at a social gathering, annotated in pen of the person's first name. One such entry is attributed to B. There, se there are several domestic photos of B comfortably at home as a woman but the rest of her submission to Lawrence is a collection of small prints dated August 1956 and November 1957. She took the photos during two masquerade parades in Uniondale, a suburban hamlet on Long Island, New York. Evidently, B. knew Lawrence well enough to write witty captions on the backs of many photos, each sig signed affectionately, B. The series of about a dozen photos shows groups of children none much older than 10 or 12, masquerading down the streets of Uniondale in a variety of costumes. What is notable is that most of the children are dressed as the opposite sex. This kind of public spectacle was relatively commonplace in that era, drawing on an older tradition of mummer parades from late 19th century or the ragamuffin masquerades around Thanksgiving that were particular to the New York City area. Several photos in a row profile the most flamboyantly cross-dressed masquerade, masqueraders who pose for the camera and show off their hair and makeup rather convincingly. At the end of the series of photos is a small newspaper clipping, co clipping commemorating the August 1956 parade, which was held to mark the end of the summer. Two children are pictured. One seated on a table, the other standing, each looking to in, into each other's eyes. One is dressed in pants and crew neck shirt, the other in a dress. The caption notes that the two had been awarded best prize for their respective cross-dressed outfits. On the back of this photo is another faction from B to Lawrence, handwritten, budding transvestite. The photo's captioning speaks to a desire to locate in the parlance of this era, transvestism in the child, coming from within the trans community. It speaks to a desire to see in the child a form of futurity based upon an affirmative place for trans life to grow.
While the pretense of the caption is also humorous, the location of this photo today, stored next to the medical archives of many of the doctors credited with founding transsexual medicine, is evocative of the trajectory of this book, which has, uh, which has investigated the grain of the medical archive to critically lay the groundwork for diverging from its rationality and authority. B's hope that this child might be a budding transvestite performs a feat so monumental in its smallness that we might miss it if we were to brush past it too quickly. By wanting there to be trans children, by desiring that trans life should grow in children, she makes a powerful claim that runs against the tide of 20th century medicine and fittingly makes a competing claim against the new discourse of transsexuality that was being assembled at the same moment in the 1950s. Unlike nearly every adult that has appeared in this book, B wished for trans children simply to be, not to exist as a means to another end or as an explanation for transness. In How to Bring Your Kids Up Gay, Eve Sedgwick ends with a powerful warning against either trivializing or apologetics or, much worse, a silkily camouflage complicity and oppression by calling for a strong, explicit, erotically invested affirmation of many people's felt desire or need that there be gay people in the immediate world. In Chapter 5, I pointed out how many of the clinicians that Sedgwick skillfully took to the task for their dangerous anti-gay therapy, practice upon effeminate boys, also saw trans children, in the very same clinic, to be precise. Knowing that the trans ch child was therefore already a companion of the gay child in her essay, I end with a similar call, rooted through B's small but profound archived wish for trans life to grow in, the, grow in the child in the 1950s. There is certainly more than enough advice on how to bring your kids up trans today, but has, has been confined to a harmful medical narrative that cannot see trans children's growth and flourishing as ends in, in themselves. For that reason, this book, in fact, argues precisely against the spirit of the formulation. How to bring your kids up trans. For that reason, this book, in fact, argues precisely against the spirit of the formulation, how to bring your kids up trans. Such a proposal remains widely wildly. Such a proposal remains wildly insufficient, leaving trans children in the impossible position of living under the sign of a question mark placed on their existence by medicine. If, in the 21st century, we adults really desire to learn to care for the many transgender children in our midst, we need to first learn from B. What it means to wish that there be trans children, that to grow trans and live a trans childhood, is not merely a possibility, but a happy and desirable one. And we need to come into this desire now, not in the future. Acknowledgements. This book is for Vicky and the innumerable, unnameable trans children whose lives have made piercing beauty out of a heavy world inimical to their survival. This project found its beginning during my time as a graduate student at Ru Rutgers University. I remain grateful for the contributions of the faculty and my fellow graduate students there, especially Fran Bartkowski, Ed Cohen, Jasper Poir, and Whitney Strub, on my dissertation committee. I am also indebted to the Rutgers Institute for Research on Women Seminar, Trans Studies Beyond Hetero and Homonormativities, and especially to Erin Izura for shaping my thinking about trans studies. My colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh, both in the English Department and in Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies program, have been incredibly generous in their support of this work. <laughs>
Immense gratitude goes to my incredible colleagues in children's literature, Tyler Bickford and Kurt Courtney Weichel Mills. Tyler Bickford and Courtney Weichel Mills to Peter Campbell, Paul Johnson, and Mammy Owens, and Elizabeth Rodriguez Felder, Fielder for writing with me, to Todd Reeser, Julie Buliao, Natalie Corey Tao, and Lisa Brush for being interloc interlocutors in gender studies, and to Don Bielostowski for supporting my research and writing as, gender, as jun junior faculty. The students in my graduate seminars, The Body Now and Gender and the Child, as well as those in the undergraduate seminar, Literature, Medicine and Sexology, have left indelible marks on my thinking and on this book. I am grateful to have the privilege of working with brilliant and courageous students from whom I have learned so much, especially Gabby and Brooke. Further thanks also go to Todd for his transformative mentorship and to Julie for teaching me how I could be a queer slash trans child and a professor at the same time. The archival research for this book and time to write here and time to the archival research for this book and time to write were made possible by John Melly Mo, John Money Fellowship from the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University, the, the Dietrich School of Arts and Sciences, the Office of Provost, and a Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at Faculty Fellowship. The labor of many librarians and archivists went into the research of this book and I am forever in their debt for being patient with my unusual itineraries through archives that had not previously yielded the stories of trans children. At the Kinsey Institute, Liana Zhao and Sean C. Wilson were instrumental in helping me find the heart of this project, as well as securing permission for the image of this book. Gian Vaccaro, Vaccaro opened her home to me while I was in Bloomington, providing a wondrous place to dream the project into being. At the LGBT Community Center National History Archive in New York City, the incomparable Rich Wendell gender, uh, generously shared his first-hand knowledge of early trans activism while bringing me boxes. I am particularly indebted to the incredible labor of the staff at the Alan Mason Chesney Medical Archive and the Medical Records Office of the Johns Hopkins Medical Hospital in Baltimore. Marjorie Kehoe and Phoebe evans Latocha worked with me at every stage of the long process of the developing a research protocol and applying to the privacy board of the hospital and throughout the exhilarating but meandering research process. I cannot thank them enough. Linda Carson worked tirelessly to welcome me to the already possibly overtaxed medical records office, not to mention helping me navigate the overwhelmingly bureaucracy, the overwhelming bureaucracy at Hopkins. The staff at the office were likewise incredibly welcoming when I had to disrupt their day by using the cranky microfilm machine in the middle of their workplace. I also owe thanks to the librarians at the Charles E. Young Special Collections at the University of California, Los Angeles, and to Jennifer Needham at the Special Collections of Hill Man Library at the University of Pittsburgh. I further want to thank Laura Wexler for sharing her archival research in Maryland with me. I owe a debt of gratitude to everyone who read, listened to, and provided to feedback on parts of this project at many stages and in many venues. Kaji Amin, Natalia Cesare, Sear, Emma Heaney, Meredith Cruz, Brie Owen, Eliza Steinbeck, and Eliza Steinbeck organized important panels and seminars for the growth of this book. Roderick Ferguson's and Wine Huffer's feedback at our MLA panel, Foucault and the Queer of Color Critique, has been invaluable, as has Rod's support of the project more broadly. The Child Matters Conference, hosted by Indiana University Bloomington and organized by Rebecca Sheldon, was a profoundly important moment in the development of this book, and I thank P Paul Amar, Sarah Chin, Anna May Duan, Clifford Roski, Catherine Bond Stockton, 
and Mary Zaborski's for the two days well spent. The Trans Asterix Studies Conference at the University of Arizona in 2016 was also a watershed moment in showing the true power and ethic of care of trans studies. Toby Buchamp, Jack Halberstam, Benji Cahan, Katrina Karkazis, Karkazis, Tay Meadow, Jennifer Nash, Robert P- Reed Farr, Gabrielle Rosenberg, Gail Rubin, Gail Salomon, and Jane Ward all passed through Pitt as at decisive moments in my thinking, generously sharing their time and work. I am grateful for conversations with Claudia Castaneda, Ayn Treyers, Elias Fatuli, and Elizabeth Wilson as similarly key moments that have informed my thinking. Kyla Schuler has been a true fellow traveler into the strange historical archives of the body and the reader of my dreams. And Mahina's brilliant reading took this book's conclusion where it needed to go. Catherine Bond Stockton is a cherished friend, incomparable mentor, and profoundly important voice in shaping the ways that the child touches queerness and transness in this book. For reading the entire book, in more than one form, and for making me think the thinker and writer that I am through a special kind of friendship, I can never fully convey my gratitude to Rebecca Sheldon and Sean Thomas Tremblay, my co- closest of kin in these pages. With the University of Minnesota Press, I have been the lucky recipient of Daniel Kasprak's brilliant editorial vision for this book from day one. I am ever dazzled by how Danny has seen this book in the moments when I could not. The anonymous readers provided incredible feedback on the manuscript, particularly at a critical stage to help me propel the project, the project into its full form. Any shortcomings in the final version of this book are very much my own. There are many, many people whose lives intertwine with mine in and outside academia, to whom I am grateful for the ways, quantifiable and unquantifiable, that they have made the work and life behind this book possible. I cannot possibly name them all, but I hope they will know, each in their own way, how much their part in my life matters. Marisa Brostoff, Summer Kim Lee, John Thomas Tremblay, and Hella Sakonas knit together. A special kind of cohort that transcend time and institutional form. Aaron English gave me the gift of of a vision of what capacious, rigorous, queer thinking looks like at just the right moment when I was a baby graduate student, a baby queer, and a baby New Yorker. There are gorgeous queers all over this country, but especially in Brooklyn, to whom I owe my voice and confidence. It's hard to express just how profoundly Bryn's genius, shared during her haircuts, means to how I see transness. I think about Mama often, wondering how I would translate all this for her, but certain that she would return it with love. I hope this book offers my mom a special insight into what beautiful things, like a book, can come out of a queer and gender expansive childhood, mine lived in the affirmative world that she built for me. There is much I have learned about what it means to grow and give back across the generations from my dad. I count myself lucky to have the wisdom of a brother who has taught me, by always seeing things more clearly than I do, and long before I ever do, the concept of age and childhood don't make people. The constant, furry, and cuddly company of B and H while writing this book leave this imprint in my sheer happiness about the time they are spent, as do multiple vegetable gardens now long gone, and to Jay, who has fiercely championed my growth and vision, and this book as in all things in our lives, I thank you most of all. And as the narrator, I thank you for listening. Good luck!